Zap. Download it now. Reporting from the aftermath of the Maui fires, I'm Melissa Adon. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. You're looking live at Gaza, where the Palestinian Ministry of Health says more than 2,700 people have been killed. Israel has been launching strikes for over a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attack that killed more than 1,300 people. Now the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced, as Israeli forces say they're preparing for a major ground assault. Welcome to ABC News Live First. I'm Diane Macedo, along with foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says there is no truce and no ceasefire in place as civilians attempt to flee. Egypt is blaming Israel for not allowing the only border crossing out of Gaza from Egypt to open from the Palestinian side. So far, civilians are still in line to get out. And the State Department confirms at least 30 Americans were killed in Hamas's attack on Israel and at least 13 U.S. nationals are still missing. Now hundreds of Americans are evacuating Israel. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Tel Aviv meeting with Netanyahu today. He says the U.S. stands with Israel as it defends itself and that Hamas does not care if Palestinians suffer. The IDF says special forces have conducted small raids inside Gaza, but regular infantry, artillery, tanks, armored divisions and battalions are massing around the Israel-Gaza border ahead of this expected ground assault. This is where learning more hostages were taken in that Hamas attack than initially thought. Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell has the latest. Gaza facing a mounting humanitarian crisis as Israel gears up for a possible ground invasion. Israeli troops amassing at the border with Gaza poised to strike. The country's mobilized around 360,000 reservists vowing to crush Hamas, the militant group behind last week's bloody attack in Israel. The death toll now rising to more than 1,400, including 30 Americans. And the number of people taken hostage, also including Americans, now confirmed as 199. We will strike Hamas from the top through its institutions, all the way down to the individuals that conducted the butchery of our babies. Israel's already reduced many parts of Gaza to rubble since last week's attack. More than 2,700 Palestinians killed in just over a week and nearly 10,000 wounded. With a ground invasion looming, Israel calling for residents of northern Gaza, up to a million people, to flee south. Hamas has a dense network of tunnels to hide and move men and munitions in the north. It could also be hiding some of the hostages there. With booby traps and mines, any land assault is likely to be extremely difficult and dangerous. Gaza is awash with grief and despair. This ice cream truck turned into a makeshift morgue. Palestinians are lining up for whatever resources they can get as Israel's completely cut off food and electricity and limited water to the territory. Outside one bakery, desperation setting in. Hospitals are overwhelmed as the UN warns that the fuel that keeps those critical facilities open will soon run out. There's a lot of concerns at the same time, but the biggest concern right now is to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe beyond what we're actually witnessing right now. We need to have water installed back to the entire Gaza Strip, not only to the south, but to everyone. We need to have the siege fully lifted so people can have access to food, electricity. President Biden saying in an interview on 60 Minutes that he believes Israel will follow the democratic rules of war. I'm confident that there's going to be an ability for the innocents in Gaza to be able to have access to medicine and food and water. But the president also saying he won't support a move to take over the land. I think that uh, it would be a mistake to, uh, for Israel to occupy Gaza again. We've been following Tala Imad Hutzala. A student at the Islamic University of Gaza, her family tried to flee, but without a car, they're stuck. I love you. You see, I love you. Among those trapped in the strip, upwards of 600 Palestinian Americans. The US is in touch with many of them, but getting out is proving hard. 
I spoke on the phone with Maha Barakat, an aid worker from New Jersey. She managed to flee south, but says she's already run out of water and only has enough gas to make one attempt to leave. You had to leave your home? I did. I left with my nephews and nieces. My brother could not leave because I have an older sister who she has a disability and she cannot move. So she had to stay with her. And in the north of Israel, fears that the war could spread to other countries. ABC's Mola Lengi reporting from Lebanon by Israel's northern border. Is there a fear of, of, of uh, a, a, an oncoming war? Yes, there is a fear. People here are afraid. This comes as Israel has been exchanging fire with Hezbollah, the militant group based out of Lebanon and also backed by Iran. 28 communities in the north being evacuated for their own safety. The IDF releasing this new video, they say, shows an Israeli strike on a Hezbollah military target. They should be very cautious of crossing that threshold because we are determined to defend the state of Israel. Well, Diane, a couple of updates for you this morning. The Israelis have turned back on the water in parts of Gaza. We understand it's just one pipe, and humanitarian organisations are saying the water for the entirety of the Gaza Strip needs to be returned. People are really struggling right now. Um, the second update is from Maha in New Jersey, the woman who we spoke to who's trapped inside Gaza. Now, she only has enough fuel in her car, enough gas to get to the border once. And she got an email this morning from the State Department quoting media reports that perhaps the border will open. And clearly, she's confused because she's expecting a clear directive from the State Department who's been involved in negotiations, we understand. Obviously, the Israelis, the Palestinians and the Egyptians are mostly involved in this. She wants clear instructions about whether or not to go. And she sent us a message saying simply, I don't know what to do. Diane? Just a horrific situation inside Gaza. Uh, Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel, thank you. Diane? James, thanks. Meanwhile, the sole border crossing between Gaza and Egypt could open for a few hours today. That could give some Palestinians a chance to get out before the ground incursion, but most have nowhere to go. Thousands are already gathered at the Rafah crossing trying to get into Egypt. Now the Egyptian foreign minister is blaming Israel for not allowing Rafah to open. ABC's Matt Rivers is in Cairo with the latest. Hi, Matt. Yeah, Diane, there's been a lot of confusion surrounding this border crossing from Gaza into Egypt. Is it open? Is it closed? Are American citizens being allowed to leave and cross over? As of now, the answer is no. The border crossing remains closed. This is a crossing called Rafah that has been at the center of diplomatic efforts by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and others to get Egypt to open it up to allow U.S. citizens trapped in Gaza to get out. But Egypt has been steadfast in saying it will not do so unless Israel allows aid to flow into Gaza, calling on the Americans to pressure the Israelis into letting that happen. So far, it has not, which means hundreds of U.S. passport holders, as well as thousands and thousands of Palestinians trapped on that side of the border. It's important to remember that if you want to leave Gaza by land, there's only two ways to do so. One is by crossing into Israel. Another is by crossing into Egypt. Now, overnight, a source in Egypt's security forces telling us that there had been at least a temporary deal reached to temporarily open that border crossing, but so far that has not materialized. Clearly, Diane, a fluid situation here in Egypt as this humanitarian crisis continues. All right, Matt Rivers in Cairo, thank you. James? And American citizens are hoping to get out of Israel, and they're gathering at the port city of Haifa, where a ship is expected to take them to Cyprus in a few hours. Americans there are trying to leave, fearing an imminent attack on Gaza. Foreign correspondent Britt Clement is in Haifa with the latest. Americans racing to get out of Israel, fearing an imminent attack on Gaza. Around 2,000 Americans are expected to leave from here today. They might have different reasons for leaving, they might have different plans, but all of them are fearing an escalation. The U.S. citizens leaving by ship from the port city of Haifa on their way to Cyprus. Adela Schotzberg making the journey with her two children. Well, yesterday morning I made the final decision. Adela leaving her husband behind, expecting to join her family in Dallas by Wednesday. I'm constantly on edge and uh, I can't do that to my kids. I can't let them live like this. Many of the evacuees taking everything they own with them in a desperate rush to leave. I just left all my belongings, everything packed up. This is it. This is my life.
Brick Leonard in Haifa, Israel, thank you. Now, of course, all this began with that horrific attack on Saturday, which left so many Israelis dead and kidnapped. And here with me now is Avichai Broduk, whose wife and children were kidnapped by Hamas. Avichai, thank you so much for being here. I can't imagine that the difficulty that you're feeling at the moment, that you're going through. Can you just tell me what it's like been, been for you the last few days? Well, I can't really because uh, I don't really know what I'm feeling. Uh, it's been really hard for me. Uh, first uh, day and a half, I was sure they were dead. So uh, I started crying and I just got a message from, uh, from the kibbutz that they were being seen alive, being led by a Hamas uh, person in the kibbutz, so, and they didn't find any dead bodies or anything. Uh, at that moment, I felt like I won the lottery, and uh, from that moment up till now, I haven't been crying, just uh, full of hope that the situation will end, and uh, me and all the rest will get their families back. And that's all you have to go on at the moment, this eyewitness account that your wife and children were taken. I believe it's Hagar, your children, Ofri, Yuval, and Yuria, 10, 8, and 9 years old. Have you had any other, have you seen any footage, any of the videos or anything like that? Or? Oh, uh, actually it's 10, 8 and, and 4 and a half, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. Uh, there hasn't been anything, well at least I haven't gotten anything. Uh, but I'm still, uh, you know, living on hope. I believe, uh, you know, the Hamas are a, a Muslim organization, they believe in the Islam. And I know the Islam uh, is a religion that, you know, is against the killing of women and children, so... I'm sure they're being protected and you know, being cared for by uh, this religion or religious organization. And has the, have the Israeli authorities been keeping you updated? Do, do you know what they believe has happened to your family? Not really. Uh, I think uh, we, we don't really have uh, uh, that information yet. Uh, the Hamas is uh, known for keeping that information secret uh, in past attempts or uh, successes in uh, kidnapping Israelis, so I'm sure they're keeping it safe, so only they know. Uh, I'm hoping to get any information, uh, maybe from the Red Cross or something, but for me and for the authorities, I guess uh, there's still nothing. And you've been holding vigil outside the Defense Ministry here in Tel Aviv. Can I ask why you feel you want to be there? Uh, you know, I just uh, woke up one night. I, I, everybody told me I had to go to a psychiatrist because I haven't been crying or anything. And uh, she gave me a Clonex pill, so I took it, woke up in the morning. Uh, not in the morning, I woke up 2 a.m. with my head spinning and didn't know what to do. Just decided to go uh, anywhere so somebody will hear my voice. And the uh, center of Tel Aviv, the defense ministry, is where decisions are being made. So I just made up a little sign. My, my family's in Gaza and went up sitting there. And this whole big mess began around it. And I'm, uh, I have to say I'm glad for it. Uh, if you're interviewing me, and it's good, I'm, I'm getting my message over the world. And your message to the, the government of Israel is, is what? You know, I just want them to have me as their primary cause, just to think about me and all the children and the women, which is a, just a humanitarian thing, you know, it's all through humanity, religions, everything. You have to care for, for the little children and, you know, women and children. So I just want them to prioritize this and all the rest after. So that's all I'm hoping for. And what's going through your mind when you're seeing these images of Gaza? Well, I have to say, uh, I'm really, I, I don't watch TV. Of my, even at home, when I had a home, my TV was only connected to my son's Xbox, and that's it, nothing else. I never watch TV and still don't. I'm not a political man, never go to protests, never done anything in my life, political-wise. Don't even vote. Mm. So uh, still, I just don't want to watch it. I want to keep it in my mind that my family is safe mm. over there. I'm sorry, we've kept you out. With the, ra the heavens have suddenly opened here. We're getting absolutely soaked. Thank you for staying with us. Just one more, one more question. If, if there is a chance that they see this, if there's a message you can send to your family, what would you like it to be? Just for Hagar, uh, you know, please keep the kids safe. I know you love them and, you know, I know you care for them. Just, you know, do your best. I love you. And, uh, you know, keep, it, keep going. Keep doing what you've always been doing. Thank you. All right. I love you and keep going. That's Avichai's message today. But here from the rain in Tel Aviv, we'll send it back to you, Diane. All right, James, thank you. What a story.
And the Pentagon says it's expanding the U.S. military presence in the eastern Mediterranean. A second aircraft carrier is now on its way to the region as a show of force to Hamas and Hezbollah. Secretary of State Blinken is also reaffirming the United States' commitment to Israel as he meets with Middle East officials, including Prime Minister Netanyahu. Earlier on Good Morning America, George Stephanopoulos spoke to top national security spokesman John Kirby about the Biden administration's next step as this war escalates. We heard the president say on 60 Minutes that it would be a mistake for Israel to occupy Gaza, but what can the U.S. do to shape Israel's response? Well, obviously, these are operations that the Israelis have to speak to. They have to plan. They have to they have to articulate what they're trying to do. But uh, we obviously are keeping in touch with our Israeli counterparts literally every day, if not by the hour, uh, and uh, continue to stress to them uh, that it's really important uh, that innocent civilian lives be protected, that humanitarian assistance can get in. And so uh, what I can tell you is that this is a very active scene of conversation and discussion between us and Israel. Can Israel destroy Hamas without going into Gaza, without occupying Gaza? Gaza? Well, again, I'd let the Israelis speak for what their intentions are in terms of occupation or invasion. That's really up to them. Uh, they have every right, of course, to go after Hamas, uh, to target uh, their headquarters, target where they're resourcing and training, uh, certainly target their individual leadership, and they're, and they're trying to do that. Now, it's very difficult, George, in, uh, in Gaza, because it's so heavily populated, 2.3 million people, very urban uh, environment. Uh, that makes the targeting very, very tricky. There's also the concern also of a wider war. We've seen the U.S. moving those aircraft carriers into the region. What has been the message to Iran and others? Don't get involved. Do not try to widen or deepen this conflict any more than it already has. Uh, we have very serious national security interests in the region. Uh, the presence of those military forces is meant to signal that we take our obligations to defend those interests seriously. If, a, if another actor, be it a terrorist group or a nation state, is thinking about uh, jumping in here uh, and making a, a second or third front for Israel, our advice to them is not to do it. So does that mean those carriers would strike if Iran enters? I don't ever talk about future operations one way or another, and I'm certainly not going to start speculating. I'm just telling you that uh, we're going to make sure we have sufficient force and capability in the region to protect our interests. Finally, what more do we know about whether or not this Rafah passageway is actually going to open today? Well, we sure hope so, George. Secretary Blinken has really been uh, on a whirlwind trip trying to, to negotiate for safe passage out of Gaza. Now, the key interlocutors in that discussion are Egypt and Israel. Obviously, uh, we're going to keep talking to them. Uh, we, we're hopeful that that, uh, that gate can open as soon as sometime today. But again, it hasn't yet, uh, and we just got to keep working at it. Our thanks to George Stephanopoulos and John Kirby for that interview. Coming up, the six-year-old killed in a suspected hate crime in Illinois. What we're learning about the attack and why the FBI is warning of a surge in threats in the U.S. amid Israel's war with Hamas. Also ahead, Republicans nominated another candidate for speaker, but does he have the votes? Why the chaos in Congress could be far from over after this. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Okay.
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. An Israeli military spokesperson confirms to ABC News that Israeli special forces, infantry, and armored divisions are conducting raids in the peripherals of Gaza. That same spokesperson says the military is ready to go in and just waiting for the government's orders now. And our James Longman is in Tel Aviv. He'll be with us throughout the morning. But right now, new warnings of potential threats here in the U.S. are fueling fears that the war could lead to trouble at home. This comes after a horrific attack in Illinois that left a six-year-old boy dead and his mother critically injured. Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas is in Washington with more. Hi, Pierre. I want to warn you and our friends at home that what I'm about to tell you is incredibly heart-wrenching. It's fresh evidence that the FBI is right to fear that the carnage from the Israeli-Hamas war could spill over here at home. We learned that a 71-year-old landlord in a Chicago suburb viciously attacked two of his renters, fatally stabbing a six-year-old boy and wounding his mother, simply because they were Muslim and apparently because of pure hatred about what's happening in Israel. Police say he stabbed that little boy, Wadia al-Fayyum, 26 times with a military-style knife. Attorney General Merrick Garland said late last night he was, quote, heartbroken and announced a federal hate crimes investigation. The FBI says the most immediate concern is so-called lone wolves and other unstable individuals inflamed by the Israeli conflict acting out and harming whoever's near. I was in a telephone briefing with the FBI director and a couple of senior FBI officials yesterday, and Christopher Way warned that he cannot discount the possibility that Hamas and other terrorist organizations could call on supporters here to attack the U.S. homeland. Ray says reported threats to Jewish and Muslim institutions and houses of worship are surging because of the war. These are intense times. Diane? They sure are. Pierre Thomas in Washington, thank you. Meanwhile, Republicans are still searching for a Speaker of the House. The vote is scheduled for tomorrow, but nominee Jim Jordan does not appear to have enough votes to actually get elected. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest from Capitol Hill. Hi, Rachel. Hey, Diane. Well, Republicans are going to try and push past all the chaos and dysfunction and elect a new Speaker of the House tomorrow, but that is going to be a challenge. The leading and only Republican candidate right now is Congressman Jim Jordan of Ohio. The conservative firebrand is backed by Donald Trump. He's one of the Republicans leading the impeachment inquiry into President Biden. He won the GOP nomination for the job, but 55 Republicans voted against him, and he could only afford to lose the support of four Republicans to become the next Speaker of the House. We know Jordan spent the weekend working the phones, reaching out to the those Republican holdouts. The conference is set to meet again tonight, but optimism is quickly fading. One Republican told me he doesn't believe anyone could get enough votes to become the next Speaker of the House. Meanwhile, the chamber has been at a standstill for nearly two weeks, and the deadline to keep the government funded just around the corner, about a month away. Diane. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. Coming up, a possible new gag order for former President Trump, why the judge in his federal election case is considering it, and why Trump says it would violate his First Amendment rights. Also ahead, remembering TV star Suzanne Summers, what we're learning about her death over the weekend, and a look at her legacy after this. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head. That night, everything changed. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. from the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Olivia Rubin. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. You're looking at a live shot of Gaza where we have been seeing plumes of smoke all morning as the Israeli military tells ABC News they are just waiting for government orders to go in. We will have more on the war between Israel and Hamas coming up. But first, here are some of the other stories we're following for you today. Pharmacy chain Rite Aid has filed for bankruptcy. The brand is facing falling sales, big debt, and lawsuits related to the opioid crisis. Rite Aid settled up to $30 million in lawsuits that allege their pharmacies oversupplied prescription opioids. The chain says it plans to close some underperforming stores. The federal judge in former President Trump's election interference case will hear arguments today about what Trump can say publicly about the case. Special counsel Jack Smith is requesting a limited gag order pointing to the former president's conduct on social media regarding people in his various legal cases. Trump posted attacks on Judge Tanya Chutkin on his Truth Social platform as recently as last night. Trump's attorneys opposed the potential gag order, calling it a limit on Trump's First Amendment rights. The former president has pleaded not guilty. And we're remembering actress Suzanne Summers. The TV icon died Sunday at 76 years old. Summer shot to fame on the classic sitcom Three's Company. She then returned to TV in the 90s in the series Step by Step. And as a spokeswoman for the Thigh Master, which made her a fortune, she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2000 and announced in July that cancer had returned. Summers died the day before her 77th birthday. Coming up, the soldiers making their way back to Israel. What they're saying about answering the call of duty. Also ahead, the latest on the emergency evacuations of Americans desperate to leave Israel. Plus, Russia's major new offensive. While the world is watching Israel and Gaza, how the Kremlin is trying to turn the tide in Ukraine. This is ABC News Live. To crush the families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Fine. Welcome to ABC News Live First. I'm Diane Macedo. You're taking a live look at Gaza as the Israeli military tells ABC News it is ready to go in. An Israeli military spokesperson says they're just waiting for the government's orders at this point. Foreign correspondent James Longman is joining me throughout the day from Tel Aviv. Hi, James. Hi, Diane. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner has told ABC News efforts to pursue and destroy Hamas leadership in Gaza will continue. That same official has told has said that the U.S. is working hard to get Egypt to open the Rafah crossing, which is still closed. He's added that the U.S. is open to involving State Department officials to help with the flow of people. Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri has blamed Israel for not allowing the opening of the Rafah border crossing. He's called the situation faced by Palestinian people in Gaza dangerous. Meanwhile, some Americans are sharing their stories after making their way back to Israel to answer the call of duty. Two U.S. citizens say they joined Israeli Defense Forces when they heard the news of the Hamas terror attack. Now they say they're ready to perform any mission as the country prepares for a possible ground invasion of Gaza. Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell has their story in this ABC News exclusive. They are a band of brothers reservists, friends and comrades. On the eve of what's expected to be a brutal and bloody battle inside Gaza, they spoke exclusively to ABC News. Dan, 35 years old, from North Israel. Avi, 32, from Arizona. Moshe, 45, from Ashkelon in southern Israel. And Schrager, 38, from Chicago. When they heard the news of the terrible Hamas attack on their country, the slaughter of over 1,400 Israelis, it was a call to arms. My first reaction was just total shock. Right away, I ran to the airport, got on my first flight here. People that I know were killed um, and are missing. And, uh, you know, the first, the only thing on my mind was just to, to come back to Israel, get, get to Israel. What does a battle mean for you? And what does Gaza mean for you? We let them kill us one by one, again and again, terror attacks. But this just... Yeah, topped it all. Okay, I do not see the Gaza civilians' population as my enemy. You don't? No, I don't. The objective here is to be, is being um, to wipe out Hamas, to um, end the, the terror that they continue to inflict on us, on their own people, and we need to stand up to them and um, show them that it's not something that we're going to take and no people should have to take. I stood uh, in Auschwitz-Birkenau in full uniform and I had tears in my eyes when uh, our commander spoke and told us that we are, we the, the soldiers of Israel, we are the promise that never again. And in this, in this past week, then we, could, we didn't fulfill our promise, and we're here to fulfill it. 
And to honor that promise, Israel's promise, this brotherhood knows it can't underestimate a determined enemy fighting on home turf. It's not about revenge. It's about making sure those people that had to leave their houses, had to watch their community being slaughtered, uh, they can come back and they can sleep at night peacefully knowing this can't happen again. Hamas knows that you're coming. We've heard all about their infrastructure, their preparations, the booby traps, the tunnels. As soldiers, as infantrymen, how do you face that threat on the ground? We are getting ready to perform any mission we take because this is a battle for our house, for our home. You're a soldier, but you're also a man, a human. What about fear? Well, of course there's fear. Only idiots did not feel fear. Uh, we embrace it. We learn to manage it. That's part of our training. There are those voices there across this region and elsewhere who say the price of military action is too great, that too many civilians are now dying, too many Palestinians are already dying. We're in a full war here, and the responsibility isn't on us. You should take that question straight back to Hamas. We are here because we have no other choice. Different men with so very different lives, but they're brothers in arms who've known each other for 15 years. It's crucial, the feelings that we have, the for each other, the responsibility that we feel for each other. A lot of my confidence comes from a long-lasting life relationship right. and camaraderie that we have between us. We always, uh, when we say goodbye, we say, I love you very much. I hope I won't see you in a long, long time. <laughs> And Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel joins us now from near the Gaza border for more. Ian, so many of these reservists coming from all around the world, chiefly from the United States, presumably without that much recent combat experience, how ready can they be? Yeah, interestingly, I asked them about that, and they kind of said that every year or so, they, they still actually have to do a month. I mean, I've met a lot of reservists, and it means different things in, in different countries. Here, uh, they actually have a reasonable amount, and, and even these guys have known each other for 15 years, and they have very different lives. One is a high school teacher, another's involved in sports uh, development back in Chicago. Uh, they said that they've fought together before in the West Bank and elsewhere, uh, and that because they do train together, that, that they know each other, and that means when they go into fight, that they're, they're ready, and they kind of know how each other is going to respond. It's clearly not the same as a standing army, but there are also 360,000 of them. Um, we have to see how long. They're in this process now of coming together, of last-minute checks, uh, but also kind of refreshing training as well and procedures. And this is going to be a long, difficult battle ahead. And they certainly feel that they're ready, but, but you're right. Having reservists is not the same as having a standing army, but certainly for these guys that I spoke to, they certainly seem ready and uh, feel that this is something not that they chose, but something that they will absolutely perform to the best of their ability. And you and I have been here all week. We've seen the emotion here in Israel. We've seen this need to fight, to take up arms. People coming from all over the world now to join to defend Israel. But are people on the front, down where you are, really con aware of the risks? Do they know what they're about to face inside Gaza? Can they know? It, it's a good question and, and one that we kind of discussed. I mean, we're here, it's just a, a gas station and there's a military base on the other side. And, uh, you know, the local population come out to basically provide free food and haircuts. And so you get the sense that this is a nation coming together. And they also feel that things have to be different this time because of the attack that was perpetrated by Hamas terrorists. Now, the risks on the other side, we talked about that. We know that Hamas has got a very developed network of tunnels, that there will be booby traps, it does have arms, there will be IEDs, these roadside bombs, and that urban battle is one of the hardest fighting environments that you could possibly conceive of. We were in Mosul during the attempt to take it back from ISIS, uh, and there it was just incredibly brutal and costly for the Iraqi army with American support. And Israel knows that, you know, it, Historically, it's tried to minimize the losses of its soldiers. This time round, again, because of what Hamas perpetrated here, 
This time round, I think there's a sense that they know that there are going to be potentially heavy casualties. That some of the people that we met, some of these people, may not be coming back without some kind of injury, and many people may not be coming back at all. Uh, so, yes, they are aware of it, but what that means when they're on the ground is very different. There you're fighting on Hamas's home turf. Hamas know they're coming. They've had years to prepare, and it's going to be very difficult, potentially very long, and certainly very brutal battle. And we've been watching these images now out of Gaza, women and children, uh, casualties of the bo these bombardments. Are these men that you're speaking to now also conscious that there are a lot of innocent people inside Gaza? How do they feel about the potential for them to get, to get caught up in all this? Yeah, again, it was a question I wanted to, to put to all of them. They had a number of points that they really wanted to get across, that, that for them, this was not about the Palestinian people. It was not about the people of Gaza. This was just purely about Hamas. But they, the, the, the man who came from Chicago, he's, I mean, you could see he was visibly angry. And he said, I, I'm furious with, as well as everything else that had happened, that he was furious with Hamas for having put him and his brothers in arms in that situation, but also having put the Palestinian people in that situation whereby they are under fire because Israel feels that it has to respond because it can't allow its citizens to be unprotected. It can't allow another attack like this to happen. So there's a real sense of purpose here that, that the status quo is unsustainable, that things have to change, and that does mean bombing. Again, he said to me, did Hamas give the victims in southern Israel any notice? Did they send them any text messages? Did they drop any leaflets about what their intentions were? Obviously referring to the fact that the IDF says that it's gone out of its way to minimise civilian casualties. It accuses Hamas of using civilians as human shields because, of course, Hamas is inside uh, places like Gaza City, which is where civilians live. Um, but also, there was no warning, whereas Israel has told civilians to leave those areas. But the truth is, it's ugly. You know, war, war is ugly and it is painful and it's always civilians who suffer the most. And this is really the story of the last week and it's why we wanted to meet the soldiers to go into battle because it's not just the camouflage, it's the people behind it, civilians on both sides now losing their lives. James, Diane. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ian. And I'm sure you'll, you'll follow the story of those men that you met. Diane, back to you. James, thank you. And the U.S. is expanding its military presence near the Middle East as a show of force. A second aircraft carrier is now on its way to the eastern Mediterranean. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze joins me now from the Pentagon with more on that. Elizabeth, what do we know about this second aircraft carrier? Hey, Diane. Well, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin ordered the USS Eisenhower to depart for the eastern Mediterranean. That order was on Saturday, and it'll take about a week to arrive. This is a massive show of firepower from the U.S. It comes along with the USS Ford, which is already in that region. And really what it's aimed to do, Diane, is send a message of deterrence. In addition to that aircraft carrier, it also includes missile interceptors. There's firepower to aim to show a message to especially Iran that the U.S. is there in the region and they don't want this to escalate. Why send these ships there now? Who is this show of force aimed at? Right, so Iran and Hezbollah. And that message has been explicit from Defense Secretary Austin. In the statement, he said that this is a aim to show that any hostile actor that's trying to take advantage of what we're seeing between Israel and Hamas just don't. And that's something we've heard across the administration, Diane, this, this attempt to try to say the U.S. is backing Israel's defense right now. It doesn't want any other actor, especially Hezbollah, with those clashes that we've seen in northern Israel between Hezbollah and Israeli forces. Really what the U.S. wants to try to do is, is say do not take advantage of this moment to try to get this escalated uh, any further. Diane. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. is also actively working to ensure the people of Gaza can get out of harm's way and get the assistance they need. So what message is the U.S. conveying to Israel about avoiding civilian casualties? You know, and, and publicly, the, the message from Secretary Blinken and President Biden and across the administration is that the U.S. fully supports the right of Israel to defend itself against the atrocious attacks by Hamas. But of course, there is this question of as Hamas has escalated its airstrikes, and, we, and we've been talking about it, that humanitarian crisis in Gaza and the human loss of life, and how do you avoid those civilian lives lost? And essentially, what Secretary Blinken said is, he understands and hopes and expects 
that Israel will continue to follow the rules of war, the international rules of law that would minimize human life losses. And, and we saw in a statement, Secretary Blinken said overnight that he, that he hopes that the U.S. can continue to provide the aid that's needed to people in Gaza. So that's food, that's water, that's continued uh, support uh, for hospitals that have, have, had, have said that they need help. But ultimately, getting that aid there continuing to be a sticking point, getting those humanitarian corridors opened up, not exactly clear how the administration is going to be able to do that. It's not, you know, at this point, Diane. Now, Egypt's president has accused Israel of collective punishment and has made clear that he doesn't want refugees from Gaza flooding into his country. So what else has come out of Blinken's meetings with Arab leaders and what's the solution here? Well, and these have been tense exchanges between Secretary Blinken and some of those other Arab leaders. We understand that the meeting with Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, he left Blinken waiting for hours before it even started in the meeting with Egypt's president. Uh, you know, we the exchange was very obviously tense. And part of the reason for that, Diane, is that these Arab leaders are calling for a de-escalation. They want, in many ways, a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. And that's not something that the Biden administration is backing right now. The Biden administration continues to say that Israel has a right to continue this, these strikes against Hamas. And, and until that kind of positioning changes, we're going to continue to see those clashes and at least kind of a sense of tense uh, interactions between these diplomats at the highest level, like Secretary of State Blinken and some of those Arab leaders. All right, ABC's Elizabeth Chelsea from the Pentagon, thank you. Coming up, Russia ramps up its offensive in Ukraine, how Ukraine is fighting back to defend a strategic city after this. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. Back to ABC News Live first. As the conflict rages on between Israel and Hamas, Russia is waging a major new offensive in eastern Ukraine. It's Russia's biggest offensive since last winter as troops try to encircle a strategic city. ABC News' Patrick Revel is in Kyiv with the latest on that. Uh, Patrick, what are you hearing right now? Yeah, hi, Diane. With the world's attention glued on Israel and Gaza, Russia has been waging its biggest offensive since last winter. It's focused on the strategic city of Avdivka and further north up to Kupyansk in eastern Ukraine. And we've seen 
Basically, thousands of Russian troops and hundreds of Russian tanks and armored vehicles launched an onslaught for the past six days onto these cities. And really, I think the scale of this offensive does show that the, the Kremlin right now is trying to turn the tide after months of defending against Ukraine's counteroffensive. But what we are hearing is that Ukrainian forces are inflicting very heavy casualties on Russia in these frontal assaults. We're seeing videos that seem to show dozens of Russian armored vehicles being destroyed. Ukraine claims that thousands of Russian soldiers have been killed in just the last six days. Because of the scale of the losses, supposedly the intensity of the assault has uh, drawn back somewhat today. But they expect this assault to keep continuing. And it is obviously um, remarkable that we're talking about now Russia on the offensive when we've been talking for months about Ukraine's counteroffensive and its hopes to try and have a victory in this war. Patrick, we're getting reports that Russian President Vladimir Putin will discuss the war between Israel and Hamas uh, in a telephone uh, conversation with several regional leaders. What are you hearing about those conversations? Yeah, the Kremlin says that Vladimir Putin is supposed to have calls with five leaders, including from Egypt, as well as with Benjamin Netanyahu and the, um, and the leader of the Palestinian Authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. We know as well that he's already had a call with Iran's president. In that call, um, according to the Kremlin, the president of Iran said that if, if Israel continues the siege of Gaza, that could lead to a large-scale uh, military confrontation, which seems again to be this threat coming from Iran that potentially it could become involved somehow if, uh, if the ground offensive from Israel is to go ahead. I mean, the Kremlin itself is continuing to repeat its position, which is there should be an immediate ceasefire. And basically, the Kremlin is trying to balance this difficult line where it has a very close relationship that's become even closer with Iran because of the war here in Ukraine where Iran has been providing weapons, but also it doesn't want to spoil its relations with Israel. And so right now, we can see that Putin's trying to position Russia as a mediator, but he doesn't really have that much influence at the moment. Now, is the timing coincidental here uh, of this Russian offensive, or is this linked to the Israel-Hamas war? Is Putin trying to exploit what's happening in Gaza to his advantage? You know, I, th I think that's a very good question. I think it would be unlikely that the exact timing of this offensive is directly linked to what's happening in Gaza, simply because this is a very large operation that must have taken a lot of planning and preparation. Um, but, you know, what's without question is that the crisis in Gaza is most definitely an opportunity for Vladimir Putin because it simply it pulls the world's attention from Ukraine onto Israel and, and that easily plays into to the Kremlin's plan for Ukraine and its best hope at the moment that Western support will fade and that it will eventually leave Ukraine face to face with Russia and that is essentially the Kremlin's plan right now is to try and just continue waiting out the West and so obviously with the world's attention diverted onto Israel that's good news for Vladimir Putin. All right Patrick Rival in Kiev. Patrick thank you. Coming up, a possible new gag order for former President Trump, why the judge in his federal election case is considering it, and why Trump says it would violate his First Amendment rights. Also ahead, our parent company Disney is celebrating its 100th anniversary. How Walt Disney set the stage for an entertainment dynasty after this. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? 
So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head. That night, everything changed. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from the auto workers picket lines in Michigan. I'm Faith Abube. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. We will have more on the war between Israel and Hamas. But first, here are some of the other stories we're following today. Pharmacy chain Rite Aid has filed for bankruptcy. The brand is facing falling sales, big debt, and lawsuits related to the opioid crisis. Rite Aid settled up to $30 million in lawsuits that allege their pharmacies oversupplied prescription opioids. The chain says it plans to close some underperforming stores. The federal judge in former President Trump's election interference case will hear arguments today about what Trump can say publicly about the case. Special counsel Jack Smith is requesting a limited gag order pointing to the former president's conduct on social media regarding people in his various legal cases. Trump posted attacks on Judge Chanya Tutkin on his Truth Social platform as recently as last night. Trump's attorneys opposed the potential gag order, calling it a limit on Trump's First Amendment rights. The former president has pleaded not guilty. And today marks the 100th anniversary of our parent company, Disney. Exactly 100 years ago, Walt Disney and his brother Roy launched the company that would change entertainment. Walt Disney's early achievements include the first cartoon with synchronized sound, which introduced the world to Mickey Mouse, and the first full-length animated movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Today, the company's portfolio includes 12 theme parks around the world, beloved franchises like Star Wars and Marvel, and of course, ABC News. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. We'll be right back. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. 
From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're looking live at Gaza, where the Palestinian Ministry of Health says more than 2,700 people have been killed. Israel has been launching strikes for over a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Now the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced, as Israeli forces say they are preparing for a major ground assault. Welcome to ABC News Live First. I'm Diane Macedo, along with foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is warning Iran and Hezbollah not to test Israel. He says there is no truce and no ceasefire in place as civilians attempt to flee. Egypt is blaming Israel for not allowing its only border crossing out of Gaza into Egypt to open from the Palestinian side. A senior State Department official says Egypt has informed the United States that there are acute security threats preventing officials from aiding Americans inside Gaza. And the State Department confirms at least 30 Americans were killed in Hamas's attack on Israel, and at least 13 U.S. nationals are still missing. Now hundreds of Americans are evacuating Israel. Netanyahu is inviting President Biden to visit Israel, but the White House hasn't confirmed yet whether or not he will go. The IDF says special forces have conducted small raids inside Gaza, but regular infantry, artillery, tanks, armored divisions and battalions are massing around the Israel-Gaza border ahead of the expected ground assault. This, as we're learning, more hostages were taken in that Hamas attack than initially thought. Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell has the latest. Gaza facing a mounting humanitarian crisis as Israel gears up for a possible ground invasion. Israeli troops amassing at the border with Gaza, vowing to crush Hamas, the militant group behind last week's bloody attack in Israel. The death toll now rising to more than 1,400, including 30 Americans. And the number of people taken hostage, also including Americans, now confirmed as 199. We will strike Hamas from the top, through its institutions, all the way down to the individuals that conducted the butchery of our babies. Israel's already reduced many parts of Gaza to rubble since last week's attack. More than 2,700 Palestinians killed in just over a week and nearly 10,000 wounded. 
With a ground invasion looming, Israel calling for residents of northern Gaza, up to a million people, to flee south. Hospitals are overwhelmed as the UN warns that the fuel that keeps those critical facilities open will soon run out. The biggest concern right now is to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe beyond what we're actually witnessing right now. We need to have the siege fully lifted so people can have access to food, electricity. Among those trapped in the Strip, upwards of 600 Palestinian Americans. The US is in touch with many of them, but getting out is proving hard. I spoke on the phone with Maha Barakat, an aid worker from New Jersey. She managed to flee south, but says she's already run out of water and only has enough gas to make one attempt to leave. You had to leave your home? I did. I left with my nephews and nieces. My brother could not leave because I have an older sister who she has a disability and she cannot move. So she had to stay with her. Well, Diane, a couple of updates for you this morning. The Israelis have turned back on the water in parts of Gaza. We understand it's just one pipe, and humanitarian organisations are saying the water for the entirety of the Gaza Strip needs to be returned. People are really struggling right now. Um, the second update is from Maha in New Jersey, the woman who we spoke to who's trapped inside Gaza. Now, she only has enough fuel in her car, enough gas to get to the border once. And she got an email this morning from the State Department quoting media reports that perhaps the border will open. And clearly, she's confused because she's expecting a clear directive from the State Department who's been involved in negotiations. We understand, obviously, the Israelis, the Palestinians and the Egyptians are mostly involved in this. She wants clear instructions about whether or not to go. And she sent us a message saying simply, I don't know what to do. Diane? Respondent Ian Panel. Thank you, Ian. Stay safe. Thanks. Thanks, Diane. ABC News contributor and former senior CIA operations officer Daryl Blocker joins us now for more on all this. Daryl, an Israeli military spokesperson has said they're just waiting for the government's orders to enter Gaza. What would an Israeli ground incursion into Gaza look like, do you think? It's going to be a slow, arduous and very, very dangerous path forward. Uh, we've been speaking the past couple of days about uh, the, how dangerous rescue operations are, but rescue operations are are very, very uh, tactical. You go in, you hit it, uh, you're in and out within minutes. Um, but a sustained door-to-door, -door, um, block by block um, clearing of the ground is going to take some time and it's going to be very, very dangerous the entire way. Well, I mean, talking about danger, that same Israeli military spokesperson has told ABC News that efforts are underway to pursue and destroy Hamas leadership in Gaza. But, Daryl, we've seen all these images of women and children being killed in these bombardments. How do you pursue Hamas on the ground and in the same breath avoid more civilian casualties? Well, they've been tracking Hamas leadership for a very long time, so they probably have very specific units who are responsible for tracking certain individuals, certain team members, certain leaders within uh, within the Hamas military and possibly on the political wing. So they're not starting from scratch. Um, of course, knowing where they are after the uh, events of 7 October might be a little more difficult than beforehand, but it'll be very methodical. Any Hamas leader who is within the country and outside the country needs to be looking over their shoulder because the Israelis are coming after them, whether they're in the territories or whether they're in other countries. Turning to the situation faced by uh, people in Gaza at the moment and the humanitarian situation, the Egyptian foreign ministry is blaming Israel for not allowing the opening of the Rafah border crossing. And they have called the situation faced by Palestinian people in Gaza dangerous. What, in your experience, is the intelligence work that goes into the opening or closing of a border in wartime? It's, it's less intelligence and more logistics in nature. Uh, typically, border crossings during war are, are not manned by border security in a, in, a, in, a, in a very normal or typical sense. But the Rafah border crossing has been under European monitoring, and uh, clearly it's the responsibility of both the Egyptians and the Israelis. So for them to say that it's only the Israelis is is disingenuous, but I'm confident that the border will open. 
um, how quickly and how long it will be maintained is another question. Former CIA uh, senior CIA operations officer Daryl Blocko, thank you so much. Diane, back to you in New York. James, thank you. Meanwhile, the sole border crossing between Gaza and Egypt, as Daryl and James were saying, it could open for a few hours today. That could give some Palestinians a chance to get out before the ground incursion, but most have nowhere to go. Thousands are already gathered at the Rafah crossing trying to get into G Egypt. And as James mentioned, the Egyptian foreign minister is now blaming Israel for not allowing Rafah to open. ABC's Matt Rivers is in Cairo with the latest. Hi, Matt. Yeah, Diane, there's been a lot of confusion surrounding this border crossing from Gaza into Egypt. Is it open? Is it closed? Are American citizens being allowed to leave and cross over? As of now, the answer is no. The border crossing remains closed. This is a crossing called Rafah that has been at the center of diplomatic efforts by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and others to get Egypt to open it up to allow U.S. citizens trapped in Gaza to get out. But Egypt has been steadfast in saying it will not do so unless Israel allows aid to flow into Gaza, calling on the Americans to pressure the Israelis into letting that happen. So far, it has not, which means hundreds of U.S. passport holders, as well as thousands and thousands of Palestinians trapped on that side of the border. It's important to remember that if you want to leave Gaza by land, there's only two ways to do so. One is by crossing into Israel. Another is by crossing into Egypt. Now, overnight, a source in Egypt's security forces telling us that there had been at least a temporary deal reached to temporarily open that border crossing, but so far that has not materialized. Clearly, Diane, a fluid situation here in Egypt as this humanitarian crisis continues. All right, Matt Rivers in Cairo. Matt, thank you. And U.S. citizens hoping to get out of Israel are gathering at the port city of Haifa, where a ship is expected to take them to Cyprus today. Americans there are trying to leave the country, fearing an imminent attack on Gaza. Foreign correspondent Britt Clenet is in Haifa with the latest. Americans racing to get out of Israel, fearing an imminent attack on Gaza. Around 2,000 Americans are expected to leave from here today. They might have different reasons for leaving, they might have different plans, but all of them are fearing an escalation. The U.S. citizens leaving by ship from the port city of Haifa on their way to Cyprus. Adela Schatzberg making the journey with her two children. Well, yesterday morning I made the final decision. Adela leaving her husband behind, expecting to join her family in Dallas by Wednesday. I'm constantly on edge and uh, I can't do that to my kids. I can't let them live like this. Many of the evacuees taking everything they own with them in a desperate rush to leave. I just left all my belongings, everything packed up. This is it. This is my life. Well, this ship is leaving later today and there's hope also for Americans in Gaza as an Egyptian-controlled border crossing has now opened. Diane. All right, Britt Clinton in Haifa, Israel. Thanks, Britt. And Israelis living near the Lebanon border are set to evacuate today. Israeli defense forces say they attacked military infrastructure that belongs to the terrorist organization Hezbollah in that region. ABC's Inez Delacuatara joins me now from Jerusalem for more on this. And as earlier today, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu warned Iran and Hezbollah not to, quote, test us. So what's the latest on concerns of other actors getting involved here? Hey, Diane. Yeah, so we are seeing the IDF continuing to engage with Hezbollah on Israel's northern border. Like you say, they're striking military infrastructure there belonging to Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. The, an IDF spokesperson, spokesperson also had a warning uh, for Hezbollah, saying that any provocation would be met with a deadly response and saying that here uh, Hezbollah and Iran are trying to essentially prevent Israel from waging war on Gaza, but that that approach would not work. We are also learning that Israeli communities in uh, northern Israel Israel are being evacuated. These are people that are, are living uh, within a mile, roughly, of the Lebanese border. So I think that is, is um, you know, it's an interesting development. There are concerns as to what that may mean, if that could foreshadow any kind of, um, you know, m m more intense fighting there on the uh, northern border. We had seen uh, Israeli communities in southern Israel being, being evacuated prior to uh, the military buildup there uh, in Gaza and, and that imminent uh, ground incursion. So concerns that the situation there on the northern border 
border could escalate and concerns that, yeah, this could spill over to other parts of the Middle East. Um, and that's why you're seeing so many officials, you know, U.S. officials in particular, Israeli officials as well, of course, warning other actors hostile to Israel not to get involved, not to try and take advantage of the situation with uh, Israel potentially appearing, uh, you know, weak here uh, or at least more vulnerable than it typically does and warning them, yeah, not to take advantage of the situation. And as the State Department has also arranged chartered flights for U.S. citizens stuck in Israel, over the weekend I know you spoke to some Americans trying to evacuate. What are they telling you? Yeah, so we were at the airport, the Tel Aviv airport there, which is the main international airport here in Israel, speaking to Americans trying to get out. We understand, uh, according to the State Department, that uh, roughly 20,000 Americans have reached out to the State Department asking for help. Uh, and so the State Department has chartered flights to try and get them out. We understand that they've chartered four flights a day. They'll have the capacity to evacuate about 800 American citizens every day. I'll let you listen to what one woman, one American citizen, had to say. And this woman, Christine, was from New Jersey. She had been in Zderot visiting family when everything happened. She talked about, um, you know, having to hunker down in a safe room for over 20 hours. And you can hear the, the, the tears there. She was in tears when she spoke to us. She was so relieved to be at the airport heading home. Uh, so what are the logistics on these flights, Ines? How is it working? Yeah, so the State Department is chartering these flights, but people are being asked to agree and, and sign paperwork that says that they will reimburse the, the State Department um, uh, for, for the, the cost of these flights. We also know that the State Department is chartering boats. Uh, you heard it there from Brit's report uh, out of Haifa to Cyprus. They will also have to reimburse the cost of, of the boats. Um, and these uh, flights and boats are not taking people all the way back to the U.S. They're taking people to other parts of Europe. So we spoke to one young man who was uh, being, you know, put on one one of those flights. He was taken to Athens. He was trying to get back to New York. He was going to have to pay for his own way back to New York and find his own flight back to New York. Same for those people heading to Cyprus. They are, are uh, you know, uh, unloading the boat in Cyprus and then will have to figure out their own travel plans back to the U.S. All right, Inez de la Quattara in Jerusalem, thank you. Coming up, President Biden is meeting with his national security team about Israel's war with Hamas, how the administration is approaching diplomatic efforts and the humanitarian crisis. Also ahead, more chaos in Congress. Could House Republicans' new nominee for speaker meet the same faith as their last candidate? We have a live report from Capitol Hill after this. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Welcome back. President Biden's trip to Colorado is postponed just hours before he was set to depart. A White House official says the president will stay at the White House for national security meetings instead. ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang joins me now from the White House with more. Selena, what are you hearing about these meetings and the rest of the president's schedule? Good morning, Diane. That's right. The president's planned trip to Colorado has been delayed at the very last minute. The White House says he is staying here for those national security meetings. We've also learned from the White House they are confirming that Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu has invited President Biden to visit Israel. But the White House is not giving any indication as to whether or not he will take up that offer. Now, any possible trip by President Biden to the region, that would be a strong show of support to Israel. As we have seen the administration try to prevent this from becoming a broader and wider war. This would be a clear message to Iran and Hezbollah not to get further involved. We've already seen the U.S. deploy two aircraft carriers towards the region as a strong signal of deterrence. However, a possible trip, it would also come with high risk. Tensions are running high with the prospect of a possible ground invasion that would worsen the already very dire humanitarian crisis. In an interview over the weekend, President Biden said that it would be, quote, a big mistake for Israel Israel to occupy Gaza. This was a clear message from the president that there has to be some limit to how far Israel can go when it comes to retaliation. The president and his administration have also been trying to draw this distinction that Hamas does not represent all the Palestinian people who are also suffering. Uh, so what's the administration doing about the humanitarian disaster unfolding in Gaza right now and those U.S. citizens trying to leave? Well, as you were talking about in the earlier segment, there are Americans that are currently on their way out of Israel towards Cyprus on that cruise-like ship. The State Department has also said that there are charter flights that will continue to leave Israel on a rolling basis on Monday and Tuesday. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, he has been traveling throughout the region to try and push Israel and Egypt to come to an agreement and open that Rafah border crossing. As of now, those efforts have not been successful. The White House says they are hoping that they can open this later today, but there has been no success yet. All right, ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang from the White House. Thank you. Meanwhile, Republicans are still searching for a Speaker of the House. The vote is scheduled for tomorrow, but nominee Jim Jordan doesn't appear to have enough support to get elected. Let's bring in ABC News contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade on Capitol Hill for more on that. Rachel, what's the latest here? We already saw Steve Scalise nominated and then stepped down. Are we in for a replay with Jordan now? Diane, it's certainly possible. Jim Jordan ran as this candidate who could actually unify the Republican conference between conservatives and moderates, but 55 House Republicans actually said that they wouldn't vote for him even after he received the nomination to be Speaker last week. And that's a big problem for him. Remember, he can only lose four votes. We were hearing over the weekend that a group of appropriators in defense hawks, people who want to see the government stay open, who don't like shutdowns, which Jordan has cheered in the past, and who want to see defense spending increase, are talking about voting as a block to sort of keep him from the gavel. Now, Jordan has two things that Steve Scalise actually didn't. One is time. He actually had three days to work people over the weekend, and we just saw how, uh, not Hal Rogers, pardon me, Mike Rogers, uh, who is the chair of the Armed Services Committee, just flipped his vote. He was a strong Jordan opponent, and now he says he's going to back him. Jordan also has the, the uh, perception, or at least public pressure, that conservatives are behind him right now. He has Donald Trump's endorsement. There are a lot of people, Republicans in the base, who love him and who have been calling Republicans' phones over the weekend and last week, saying that they want their lawmaker to support him. And so the Jordan camp's belief, from what I'm hearing from them, is that these opponents will actually cave when the bright lights are on them and they have to call out a name for speaker and that they will vote for Jordan. All right, interesting. Contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade. Rachel, thank you. Coming up, Israeli forces are massing on the border with Gaza ahead of a potential major ground assault. The latest on the humanitarian crisis inside Gaza after this. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it.
with me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from the Federal District Courthouse in Washington, D.C., I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo in New York, joined by James Longman in Tel Aviv. And Israel has been launching strikes for over a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Now, the U.N. reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced, as Israeli forces say they're preparing for a major ground assault. And again, foreign correspondent James Longman is in Tel Aviv, joining me now throughout the day. James? Yeah, thank you, Diane. We're going to take you inside Gaza now. Uh, Tala Hetzala is a 21-year-old student at the Islamic University in Gaza. She's been in touch with us throughout the ongoing airstrikes that have been hitting Gaza, uh, and we're fortunate enough to be able to speak to Tala. Tala, you're now in Gaza. Please just tell us, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Uh, what, I'm seeing, what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling can be described in words. Uh, we are like every night uh, saying that this night will be the last night for us. Uh, we don't guarantee safety in any place. Every and each place in Gaza is targeted by the Israeli airstrikes. Uh, they are targeting children, they are targeting women. Uh, we are now talking about more than uh, 2,800 killed people. We are talking about more uh, than uh, more and more people are killed who, and they are under the rubble and no one can get to them because the ambulance has gone, can uh, get to these people because the bombing uh, in the streets uh, 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 everywhere actually. Um, every now and, and then we hear a bomb and we don't know where it is because of the lack of the uh, media coverage we have nowadays. Uh, there is no good internet connection. Uh, most of the houses are now uh, without water, but, uh, 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 without electricity. All of the houses are without electricity, without water, and we are suffering from food supplies, from water, from uh, from everything, from gas, from everything, from fuel. Uh, we have nothing, and I I said, and I'm. Repeating it, we will not die because of the uh, bombs. We will die. We will die because of the lack of everything around us. Tala, you've been trying to leave Gaza City. Uh, we saw that the Israelis dropped leaflets, telling people to try to get south. Did you see those leaflets? Um, what has it been trying to move? I think uh, the connection to Tala is very well, imagine, but you said you said about the. Uh... 
Tyler, if you can hear me, I'm just asking, we understand that you have tried to move. You're, I don't know where you are currently, but you've tried to move south. Have you been successful? What's it like for people trying to go south, as the Israelis have asked them to do? Um, I think you're still asking about the evacuating from place to another. I'm asking you if, uh, if you've been able to try to me? move south. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I mean, you can, you yes, can understand yes, yes, uh, yes. The, the situation. In, you can hear me okay. Okay. We're going to try this again. You've been... Where, where are you now? And have you been trying to move south? What is it yes. like trying to go south in Gaza? Let me tell you that uh, before we one day, we, we, like, followed the orders that they told us to do and we moved to the south. Uh, the journey was very hard. We, like, walked for more than one and a half hour because we don't have car, a car and no one uh, who have cars are able to get you and take you to the south because all cars are full with people. Uh, now the problem was while we were walking they actually bombed the street that is full, literally full of people. Um, people these people are were following the orders that they give to us. Uh, they uh, there were in the street. Uh, they bombed us, and uh, this bomb caused like uh, more, uh, 70 people who are killed, and more than 200 injured people. Um, so, although they bombed us, uh, we continued our journey, and we reached to an Osirat camp, the place where they claim to be safe, again, they claim to be safe, because uh, they are literally uh, bombing everywhere in Gaza, whether south, whether east, whether north, west, every single point in Gaza is being bombed. So uh, after one night there, uh, they, they, uh, we actually, they bombed the uh, So we decided to move and to return to Tel El Hawa, uh, my, my, my place, my, my my house, because uh, there's nothing can be guaranteed in any place. Uh, there's no safety in anywhere. Uh, they are bombing every place. So why to just flee and leave your house? Uh, that's why we decided to return to to Tel El Hawa, to our house, and not follow their instructions because they themselves are not following their their words. Uh, they're bombing everywhere. They're bombing the north everywhere. Uh, that's why we returned to uh, our house. And can I ask, we've heard reports that Hamas has asked people to stay where they are or is stopping people from going south. Is that your experience? No, no. No, no, Hamas uh, did not, uh, like, didn't say anything to anyone uh, in Gaza. Uh, I myself uh, didn't encounter any of Hamas's men. Um, they allow everyone to go wherever they want. Uh, if you find safety in any place, then go. But as I tell, as I tell you, there is no safety in anywhere. Uh, Hamas uh, is allowing everyone to go everywhere or anywhere. Uh, so th we don't have any restrictions about where to go or when to go uh, if it's in the side of Hamas. So you have you have decided to stay where you are in Gaza City, dis uh, and because you don't feel safe anywhere in Gaza, but. Israeli bombs are falling, but they may be followed by an Israeli ground invasion. There might be Israeli soldiers on the streets where you are now. How do you feel about yes, that but, possibility? Uh, nothing. Um, let me tell you, bombs are the same as if they are, make, if they are going to do invasions. Uh, the result is one. You are going to be killed. You are going to be. You are going to die. Uh, simply speaking. So, if the result is one, why to fear from anything else? Um, it's just uh, another way to kill us. That, that that's literally the simplest words to say. It's, it's it's really another way they are trying to kill Palestinians with. So, um, yeah, we are fearing that. Yeah, we are scared of this. Uh, but nothing to do. Uh, we are killed in both ways. 
Well, I hope hopefully this connection can stay. I, um, thank you so much for staying with us. I, I can appreciate it's an incredibly dangerous and difficult situation for you. We've been reporting here today that the uh, border crossing in the south, Rafah, the border crossing between G uh, Gaza and Egypt, may be opened at some point. If sometime in the future there's a possibility for you to seek refuge in Egypt, is that something that you and your family would want to do? No, no, absolutely no. Uh, we won't leave our our land. We won't leave our houses. It's not something that is a choice. Let me say, uh, it's our land. We are Palestinians, born born in Palestinians in Palestine. Our ancestors are Palestine. So we won't leave our land, even if we had the chance, even if we had the options option to leave our land and to go to another. Let me. They say we, to be a refugee is not something good. It's not something like make that makes you feel good. So why to do this? Uh, I hope we've still uh, got you, Tala. But um, I think the connection is is uh, very weak. To, to let people. Yeah. Oh. Tala. We're going to let you go you for the moment, but now? please, please try and stay in touch with us. Yeah, we can, we can hear you now, but it's coming in and out. Look, I, I, all I can say is we, we really do hope that you can stay as safe as possible. Uh, thank you for speaking to, uh, to us. Uh, but for the moment, Diane, back to you. Yeah, thank you, James. And our big thanks to Tala for, for keeping in touch with us throughout this entire story. Tala, thank you and stay safe. And thank you at home for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. Hello, hello. Selfie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden, please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, OK? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome to ABC News Live First. I'm Diane Macedo. You're taking a live look at Gaza as the Israeli military tells ABC News it is ready to go in. An Israeli military spokesperson says they're just waiting for the government's orders at this point. Foreign correspondent James Longman is joining me throughout the day from Tel Aviv. Hi, James. Hi, Diane. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner has told ABC News efforts to pursue and destroy Hamas leadership in Gaza will continue. That same official has told has said that the U.S. is working hard to get Egypt to open the Rafa crossing, which is still closed. He's added that the U.S. is open to involving State Department officials to help with the flow of people. Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri has blamed Israel for not allowing the opening of the Rafa border crossing. He's called the situation faced by Palestinian people in Gaza dangerous. Meanwhile, some Americans are sharing their stories after making their way back to Israel to answer the call of duty. Two U.S. citizens say they joined Israeli Defense Forces when they heard the news of the Hamas terror attack. Now they say they're ready to perform any mission as the country prepares for a possible ground invasion of Gaza. Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell has their story in this ABC News exclusive. They are a band of brothers reservists, friends and comrades. On the eve of what's expected to be a brutal and bloody battle inside Gaza, they spoke exclusively to ABC News. Dan, 35 years old, from North Israel. Avi, 32, from Arizona. Moshe, 45, from Ashkelon in southern Israel. And Schrager, 38, from Chicago. When they heard the news of the terrible Hamas attack on their country, the slaughter of over 1,400 Israelis, it was a call to arms. My first reaction was just total shock. Right away, I ran to the airport, got on my first flight here. People that I know were killed um, and are missing. And, uh, you know, the first, the only thing on my mind was just to, to come back to Israel, get, get to Israel. What does a battle mean for you? And what does Gaza mean 
for you. We let them kill us one by one, again and again, terror attacks. But this just uh, topped it all. Okay, I do not see the Gaza civilians' population as my enemy. You don't? No, I don't. The objective here is to be is being um, to wipe out Hamas, to um, end the, the terror that they continue to inflict on us, on their own people, and we need to stand up to them and um, show them that it's not something that we're going to take and no people should have to take. I stood uh, in Auschwitz-Birkenau in full uniform, and I had tears in my eyes when uh, our commander spoke and told us that we are, we, the, the soldiers of Israel, we are the promise that never again. And in this, in this past week, then we, could, we didn't fulfill our promise. And we're here to fulfill it. And to honor that promise, Israel's promise, this brotherhood knows it can't underestimate a determined enemy fighting on home turf. It's not about revenge. It's about making sure those people that had to leave their houses, had to watch their community being slaughtered, uh, they can come back and they can sleep at night peacefully knowing this can't happen again. Hamas knows that you're coming. We've heard all about their infrastructure, their preparations, the booby traps, the tunnels. As soldiers, as infantry men, how do you face that threat on the ground? We are getting ready to perform any mission we take because this is a battle for our house, for our home. You're a soldier, but you're also a man, a human. What about fear? Well, of course there's fear. Only idiots do not feel fear. Uh, we embrace it. We learn to manage it. That's part of our training. There are those voices there across this region and elsewhere who say the price of military action is too great, that too many civilians are now dying, too many Palestinians are already dying. We're in a full war here, and the responsibility isn't on us. You should take that question straight back to Hamas. We are here because we have no other choice. Different men with so very different lives, but they're brothers in arms who've known each other for 15 years. It's crucial. The feelings that we have uh, for each other, the responsibility that we feel for each other. A lot of my confidence comes from a long-lasting life relationship and camaraderie that we have between us. We always, uh, when we say goodbye, we say, I love you very much. I hope I won't see you in a long, long time. <laughs> And Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell joins us now from near the Gaza border for more. Ian, so many of these reservists coming from all around the world, chiefly from the United States, presumably without that much recent combat experience, how ready can they be? Yeah, interestingly, I asked them about that, and they kind of said that every year or so, they, they still actually have to do a month. I mean, I've met a lot of reservists, and it means different things in, in different countries. Here, uh, they actually have a reasonable amount, and, and even these guys have known each other for 15 years, and they have very different lives. One is a high school teacher, another's involved in sports uh, development back in Chicago. Uh, they said that they fought together before in the West Bank and elsewhere, uh, and that because they do train together, that, that they know each other, and that means when they go into fight, that they're, they're ready, and they kind of know how each other is going to respond. It's clearly not the same as a standing army, but there are also 360,000 of them. Um, we have to see how long. They're in this process now of coming together, of last-minute checks, uh, but also kind of refreshing training as well and procedures. And this is going to be a long, difficult battle ahead. And they certainly feel that they're ready, but, but you're right. Having reservists is not the same as having a standing army, but certainly for these guys that I spoke to, they certainly seem ready and uh, feel that this is something not that they chose, but something that they will absolutely perform to the best of their ability. And you and I have been here all week. We've seen the emotion here in Israel. We've seen this need to fight, to take up arms. People coming from all over the world now to join to defend Israel. But are people on the front, down where you are, really con aware of the risks? Do they know what they're about to face inside Gaza? Can they know? 
It's, it's a good question and, and one that we kind of discussed. I mean, we're here. It's just a, a gas station and there's a military base on the other side. And, uh, you know, the local population come out to basically provide free food and haircuts. And so you get the sense that this is a nation coming together. And they also feel that things have to be different this time because of the attack that was perpetrated by Hamas terrorists. Now, the risks on the other side, I, we talked about that. We know that Hamas has got a very developed network of tunnels, that there will be booby traps. It does have arms. There will be IEDs, these roadside bombs. And that urban battle is one of the hardest fighting environments that you could possibly conceive of. We were in Mosul during the attempt to take it back from ISIS. Uh, and there it was just incredibly brutal and costly for the Iraqi army with American support. And Israel knows that, you know, it, Historically, it's tried to minimize the losses of its soldiers. This time round, again, because of what Hamas perpetrated here, this time round, I think there's a sense that they know that there are going to be potentially heavy casualties. That some of the people that we met, some of these people may not be coming back without some kind of injury, and many people may not be coming back at all. Uh, so, yes, they are aware of it, but what that means when they're on the ground is very different. There you're fighting on Hamas's home turf. Hamas know they're coming. They've had years to prepare, and it's going to be very difficult, potentially very long, and certainly very brutal battle. And we've been watching these images now out of Gaza, women and children, uh, casualties of the bo these bombardments. Are these men that you're speaking to now also conscious that there are a lot of innocent people inside Gaza? How do they feel about the potential for them to get, to get caught up in all this? Yeah, again, it was a question I wanted to, to put to all of them. They had a number of points that they really wanted to get across. That, that for them, this was not about the Palestinian people. It was not about people of Gaza. This was just purely about Hamas. But they, the, the, the man who came from Chicago, he's, I mean, you could see he was visibly angry. And he said, I, I'm furious with, as well as everything else that had happened, that he was furious with Hamas for having put him and his brothers in arms in that situation, but also having put the Palestinian people in that situation, whereby they are under fire because Israel feels that it has to respond because it can't allow its citizens to be unprotected. It can't allow another attack like this to happen. So there's a real sense of purpose here that, that the status quo is unsustainable, that things have to change, and that does mean bombing. Again, he said to me, did Hamas give the victims in southern Israel any notice? Did they send them any text messages? Did they drop any leaflets about what their intentions were? Obviously referring to the fact that the IDF says that it's gone out of its way to minimize civilian casualties. It accuses Hamas of using civilians as human shields because, of course, Hamas is inside uh, places like Gaza City, which is where civilians live. Um, but also, there was no warning, whereas Israel has told civilians to leave those areas. But the truth is, it's ugly. You know, war, war is ugly and it is painful, and it's always civilians who suffer the most. And this is really the story of the last week, and it's why we wanted to meet the soldiers to go into battle, because it's not just the camouflage, it's the people behind it, civilians on both sides now losing their lives. James, Diane. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ian, and I'm sure you'll, you'll follow the story of those men that you met. Diane, back to you. James, thank you. And the U.S. is expanding its military presence near the Middle East as a show of force. A second aircraft carrier is now on its way to the eastern Mediterranean. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze joins me now from the Pentagon with more on that. Elizabeth, what do we know about this second aircraft carrier? Hey, Diane. Well, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin ordered the USS Eisenhower to depart for the eastern Mediterranean. That order was on Saturday, and it'll take about a week to arrive. This is a massive show of firepower from the U.S. It comes along with the USS Ford, which is already in that region. And really what it's aimed to do, Diane, is send a message of deterrence. In addition to that aircraft carrier, it also includes missile interceptors. There's firepower to aim to show a message to especially Iran that the U.S. is there in the region and they don't want this to escalate. Why send these ships there now? Who is this show of force aimed at? Right, so Iran and Hezbollah. And that message has been explicit from Defense Secretary Austin. In the statement, he said that this is a 
aimed to show that any hostile actor that's trying to take advantage of what we're seeing between Israel and Hamas just don't. And that's something we've heard across the administration, Diane, this, this attempt to try to say the U.S. is backing Israel's defense right now. It doesn't want any other actor, especially Hezbollah, with those clashes that we've seen in northern Israel between Hezbollah and, and Israeli forces. Really what the U.S. wants to try to do is, is say, do not take advantage of this moment to try to get this escalated uh, any further. Diane. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. is also actively working to ensure the people of Gaza can get out of harm's way and get the assistance they need. So what message is the U.S. conveying to Israel about avoiding civilian casualties? You know, and, and publicly, the, the message from Secretary Blinken and President Biden and across the administration is that the U.S. fully supports the right of Israel to defend itself against the atrocious attacks by Hamas. But of course, there is this question of as Hamas has escalated its airstrikes, and, we, and we've been talking about it, that humanitarian crisis in Gaza and the human loss of life, and how do you avoid those civilian lives lost? And essentially, what Secretary Blinken said is, he understands and hopes and expects that Israel will continue to follow the rules of war, the international rules of law that would minimize human life losses. And, and we saw in a statement, Secretary Blinken said overnight that he, that he hopes that the U.S. can continue to provide the aid that's needed to people in Gaza. So that's food, that's water, that's continued uh, support uh, for hospitals that have, have, had, have said that they need help. But ultimately, getting that aid there, continuing to be a sticking point, getting those humanitarian corridors opened up. Not exactly clear how the administration is going to be able to do that. It's not, you know, at this point, Diane. Now, Egypt's president has accused Israel of collective punishment and has made clear that he doesn't want refugees from Gaza flooding into his country. So what else has come out of Blinken's meetings with Arab leaders and what's the solution here? Well, and these have been tense exchanges between Secretary Blinken and some of those other Arab leaders. We understand that the meeting with Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, he left Blinken waiting for hours before it even started in the meeting with Egypt's president. Uh, you know, we the exchange was very obviously tense. And part of the reason for that, Diane, is that these Arab leaders are calling for a de-escalation. They want, in many ways, a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. And that's not something that the Biden administration is backing right now. The Biden administration continues to say that Israel has a right to continue this, these strikes against Hamas. And, and until that kind of positioning changes, we're gonna continue to see those clashes and at least kind of a sense of tense uh, interactions between these diplomats at the highest level, like Secretary of State Blinken and some of those Arab leaders. All right, ABC's Elizabeth Chelsea from the Pentagon, thank you. Coming up, Russia ramps up its offensive in Ukraine, how Ukraine is fighting back to defend a strategic city after this. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. As the conflict rages on between Israel and Hamas, Russia is waging a major new offensive in eastern Ukraine. It's Russia's biggest offensive since last winter as troops try to encircle a strategic city. ABC News' Patrick Rievel is in Kyiv with the latest on that. Uh, Patrick, what are you hearing right now? Yeah, hi, Diane. With the world's attention glued on Israel and Gaza, Russia has been waging its biggest offensive since last winter. It's focused on the strategic city of Avdivka and further north up to Kupyansk in eastern Ukraine. And we've seen 
Basically, thousands of Russian troops and hundreds of Russian tanks and armored vehicles launched an onslaught for the past six days onto these cities. And really, I think the scale of this offensive does show that the, the Kremlin right now is trying to turn the tide after months of defending against Ukraine's counteroffensive. But what we are hearing is that Ukrainian forces are inflicting very heavy casualties on Russia in these frontal assaults. We're seeing videos that seem to show dozens of Russian armored vehicles being destroyed. Ukraine claims that thousands of Russian soldiers have been killed in just the last six days. Because of the scale of the losses, supposedly the intensity of the assault has uh, drawn back somewhat today. But they expect this assault to keep continuing. And it is obviously um, remarkable that we're talking about now Russia on the offensive when we've been talking for months about Ukraine's counteroffensive and its hopes to try and have a victory in this war. Patrick, we're getting reports that Russian President Vladimir Putin will discuss the war between Israel and Hamas uh, in a telephone uh, conversation with several regional leaders. What are you hearing about those conversations? Yeah, the Kremlin says that Vladimir Putin is supposed to have calls with five leaders, including from Egypt, as well as with Benjamin Netanyahu and the, um, and the leader of the Palestinian Authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. We know as well that he's already had a call with Iran's president. In that call, um, according to the Kremlin, the president of Iran said that if, if Israel continues the siege of Gaza, that could lead to a large-scale uh, military confrontation, which seems again to be this threat coming from Iran that potentially it could become involved somehow if, uh, if the ground offensive from Israel is to go ahead. I mean, the Kremlin itself is continuing to repeat its position, which is there should be an immediate ceasefire. And basically, the Kremlin is trying to balance this difficult line where it has a very close relationship that's become even closer with Iran because of the war here in Ukraine where Iran has been providing weapons, but also it doesn't want to spoil its relations with Israel. And so right now, we can see that Putin's trying to position Russia as a mediator, but he doesn't really have that much influence at the moment. Now, is the timing coincidental here uh, of this Russian offensive, or is this linked to the Israel-Hamas war? Is Putin trying to exploit what's happening in Gaza to his advantage? You know, I, I think that's a very good question. I think it would be unlikely that the exact timing of this offensive is directly linked to what's happening in Gaza, simply because this is a very large operation that must have taken a lot of planning and preparation. Um, but, you know, what's without question is that the crisis in Gaza is most definitely an opportunity for Vladimir Putin because it simply it pulls the world's attention from Ukraine onto Israel. And, and that easily plays into to the Kremlin's plan for Ukraine and its best hope at the moment that Western support will fade and that it will eventually leave Ukraine face to face with Russia. And that is essentially the Kremlin's plan right now is to try and just continue waiting out the West. And so obviously, with the world's attention diverted onto Israel, that's good news for Vladimir Putin. All right, Patrick Rival in Kiev. Patrick, thank you. Coming up, a possible new gag order for former President Trump, why the judge in his federal election case is considering it, and why Trump says it would violate his First Amendment rights. Also ahead, our parent company Disney is celebrating its 100th anniversary. How Walt Disney set the stage for an entertainment dynasty after this. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from Bedminster, New Jersey, I'm Mary Bruce. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. We will have more on the war between Israel and Hamas. But first, here are some of the other stories we're following today. Pharmacy chain Rite Aid has filed for bankruptcy. The brand is facing falling sales, big debt, and lawsuits related to the opioid crisis. Rite Aid settled up to $30 million in lawsuits that allege their pharmacies oversupplied prescription opioids. The chain says it plans to close some underperforming stores. 
The federal judge in former President Trump's election interference case will hear arguments today about what Trump can say publicly about the case. Special counsel Jack Smith is requesting a limited gag order pointing to the former president's conduct on social media regarding people in his various legal cases. Trump posted attacks on Judge Chanya Tutkin on his Truth Social platform as recently as last night. Trump's attorneys opposed the potential gag order, calling it a limit on Trump's First Amendment rights. The former president has pleaded not guilty. And today marks the 100th anniversary of our parent company, Disney. Exactly 100 years ago, Walt Disney and his brother Roy launched the company that would change entertainment. Walt Disney's early achievements include the first cartoon with synchronized sound, which introduced the world to Mickey Mouse, and the first full-length animated movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Today, the company's portfolio includes 12 theme parks around the world, beloved franchises like Star Wars and Marvel, and of course, ABC News. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Mo Lenghi in Beirut, and wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. You were looking at the Gaza skyline where just moments ago a rainbow appeared amid another explosion. The Palestinian Ministry of Health says more than 2,700 people have been killed in the Israeli strikes. Israel has been launching those strikes for over a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Now the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces say they're preparing for a major ground assault. Welcome to ABC News Live First. I'm Diane Macedo along with foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv. And earlier sirens sounded in Jerusalem, central Israel and here in Tel Aviv as Israeli lawmakers met in the Knesset. Prime Minister Netanyahu addressed them saying there'll be a thorough investigation into the Hamas attacks and he warned Iran and Hezbollah that they'd pay a heavy price if they test Israel. Meanwhile, Egypt is blaming Israel for not allowing the only border crossing out of Gaza and into Egypt to open from the Palestinian side. A senior State Department official says Egypt has informed the U.S., quote, there are acute security threats preventing officials from aiding Americans inside Gaza. And the IDF says special forces have conducted small raids inside Gaza, but regular infantry, artillery, tanks, armored divisions and battalions are all massing around the Israel-Gaza border ahead of the ground assault. Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell has the latest. 
Gaza facing a mounting humanitarian crisis as Israel gears up for a possible ground invasion. Israeli troops amassing at the border with Gaza, vowing to crush Hamas, the militant group behind last week's bloody attack in Israel. The death toll now rising to more than 1,400, including 30 Americans, and the number of people taken hostage, also including Americans, now confirmed as 199. We will strike Hamas from the top, through its institutions, all the way down to the individuals that conducted the butchery of our babies. Israel's already reduced many parts of Gaza to rubble since last week's attack. More than 2,700 Palestinians killed in just over a week and nearly 10,000 wounded. With a ground invasion looming, Israel calling for residents of northern Gaza, up to a million people, to flee south. Hospitals are overwhelmed as the UN warns that the fuel that keeps those critical facilities open will soon run out. The biggest concern right now is to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe beyond what we're actually witnessing right now. We need to have the siege fully lifted so people can have access to food, electricity. Among those trapped in the Strip, upwards of 600 Palestinian Americans. The US is in touch with many of them, but getting out is proving hard. I spoke on the phone with Maha Barakat, an aid worker from New Jersey. She managed to flee south, but says she's already run out of water and only has enough gas to make one attempt to leave. You had to leave your home? I did. I left with my nephews and nieces. My brother could not leave because I have an older sister who she has a disability and she cannot move. So she had to stay with her. And Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell, thank you. Now, uh, there are many people who've been covering this conflict for many years, but Martha Radatz, ABC's Chief Global Affairs anchor, has been doing it for longer than most, and I'm very pleased that Martha joins us here now. Martha, first of all, you know, you've been here a few days now. You went down to those kibbutzes. What was it like? I think all of us are struggling to find the words of how horrific it is. What you've seen, what I've seen, what Ian's seen, what, what we have all seen over this past week is, is simply atrocious. I, I think of all the conflicts I've ever covered, too, I, I, I find myself really struggling to describe this and, and absolutely how horrific it is. I mean, you cannot, no matter how many conflicts you've covered, Imagine people doing that to other people. Imagine looking them in the eye, looking a child in the eye, looking an elderly person in the eye, and then shooting them, or knifing them, or mowing them down with assault rifles, whatever they can do, grabbing them out of their cars. Uh, I, I, it, it is really a devastating experience, but the Israelis, as you know, want the world to see, want the world to hear about this, and, and we are bearing witness as well. Mm. You've been covering this conflict for a long time. You yes, said to I me have. Before many Exper decades. Experience. Yes, we call that experience. Um, what's 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 it been? What was it like then when you first started coming here? And what's changed over the many years? Everything and nothing has changed. I I, I was first here covering the first Intifada in 1988. I had really no idea anything about the region, anything about Israel. But to me. It, it was my first lesson in what conflict is about. I remember just being in, in Jerusalem mostly and thinking, and the West Bank, and thinking, I understand it now. This small, small country, people are fighting over it, and there's really nowhere to go if they all want this. So I started um, with the IDF back then on a patrol into Ramallah, into other areas, and I heard them then talking about how Palestine. Palestinian children would look them in the eyes with hatred and then was in the West Bank in some of the Palestinian villages and, and happened on a wedding and Palestinians celebrating but wanting to have more children wanting to wanting to have more land so you you really understand uh, understood what was going on here Americans I talked to there were Americans from Massachusetts who had who had moved uh, into the West Bank kind of hippies, you know, just so happy to be here, peace and love, we can get along with our neighbors, we, you know, the Palestinians are great, we're not fearful, it's wonderful. But then, 
I started coming back again and again. I came back in the year 2000. Things would deteriorate on, on both sides. There was a little more suspicion. And of course, you started having horrific suicide bombings. You, you started having protests where the Israelis weren't using just tear gas. It was then rubber bullets. So the sides were separating more and more. Came back in 2012, even worse. The last time I really saw um, the young Palestinian woman, who, you know, 30 years later, and the family in the West Bank and Efrat, the Massachusetts family, they were completely divided. They had the family in the West Bank, the American Jewish family in the West Bank had four children. They were, you know, little kids, but teens by then. And during the interview, the parents, who had been so idealistic, were saying horrific things about the Palestinians. And I said, do you want to talk to your children like that in front of them? And they said, oh, my children were raised here. They are much, much more suspicious of the Palestinians. So this time, found them again, and two of them, and any, any chance of peace or reconciliation between these two sides. I don't, I don't see it happening. I think you're going to be standing here in 35 years mm. in the way I am mm -hmm. and, and feeling completely defeated about any chance for it. Just a hardening over the years, hardening of positions. And briefly also just the U.S. position. You know, you will know that the world watches this conflict and watches the United States always come out for Israel. Do you think that D.C. is conscious of that? Do you think the Biden administration is, is conscious of, of, of that view of America? Is that ever likely to change? Is there nuance? I, I think, you know, we, we have heard absolute support from the Biden administration for Israel. They have a right to defend themselves. We are all so horrified by what we have seen. But you also quite clearly hear the administration explaining you have to be cautious. You cannot take civilian lives. Not all Palestinians support Hamas. Hamas is Hamas, and there are the Palestinians. They are not in intertwined completely. So I, I think that is something that we've heard quite clearly from the administration, that they want Israel to be careful in, in any ground incursion, in any sort of war, uh, given the number of people who've already died. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for your perspective. Okay. And uh, we'll be standing here on standby waiting to see if that ground incursion does indeed take place. Diane, for the moment, back to you in New York. All right, James, Martha, thank you both. Meanwhile, the sole border crossing between Gaza and Egypt could open for a few hours today. That could give some Palestinians a chance to get out before the ground incursion, but most have nowhere to go. Thousands are already gathered at the Rafah crossing trying to get into Egypt. Now the Egyptian foreign minister is blaming Israel for not allowing Rafah to open. ABC's Matt Rivers joins me now from Cairo with more on this. Matt, what's happening at the Rafah border crossing right now? That has been the question that everybody here in Egypt has been asking going back a few days now. As best we can tell at this moment, the border remains closed. This despite the fact uh, that the Egyptian foreign minister said they would like to open it, but as you just mentioned, Diane, blaming Israel for not allowing the conditions on the ground, as he put it, to allow Egypt to, to open that border crossing. Uh, what we are seeing, though, also from the Egyptian side is that they're not going to allow that border crossing to be open unless aid here in Egypt is allowed to be sent north into Gaza to help the people there. So it's a very evolving situation. But as of now, uh, we know that the border remains closed. Effectively, what that means is that people are trapped on the other side. When you think about the people on the other side, think about two separate groups of people. You have uh, people who live in Gaza who don't have foreign passports, like the United United States or a British passport, and then you have those that do. We saw Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State of the U.S., here yesterday trying to urge the Egyptians to at least temporarily open that border to allow for those with foreign passports to leave. Uh, but so far, that has not happened. The American Secretary of State not able to convince the Egyptians to let that happen. Matt, Egypt has said that it won't open the border unless Israel cooperates with delivery of aid into Gaza. What's happening with that, and what does that mean for foreigners and Palestinians trying to leave? That, that has really been the line in the sand for the Egyptians. They have said, and they've held fast to this, that they will not allow people to come out of Gaza unless they can send aid in. And what you have the Egyptians saying is, look, we've already got aid lined up. We've got uh, the, the Red Crescent crews who are already in place. They've got UN crews already in place. The U.S. State Department says that it has its people as close to that area as they can get in order to facilitate the transfer of U.S. citizens 
out of Gaza, and yet that isn't happening. But that does seem to be the line in the sand that the Egyptians have have, have uh, drawn here, basically saying we're not going to open up our side of the border unless the Israelis allow aid in. They've asked the Americans to pressure the Israelis to allow that to happen, but so far that hasn't happened. Israel basically saying that they don't want that to happen, and so until the Israelis allow that to happen on their side of the border, it seems like the Egyptians are going to hold fast and keep this border shut. That could change at any moment, but that is the way things are, at least at this hour. Uh, Matt, Israel has maintained throughout that they're not targeting civilians and, in fact, trying to spare civilian casualties as much as possible. So how are they explaining why they won't allow that aid in? Well, basically, I mean, you've seen them cut off aid all across the entire, uh, uh, the, all of Gaza at this point. No food, no water, no electricity. And so if that is the stated policy from Israel, that is not going to be changed along the Egyptian border, at least for now. That is consistent with what we've seen from Israel through all of this time so far. Uh, and that doesn't seem like it's going to change, uh, at, at least for now. Israel saying that it doesn't want to target civilians, that it is doing this uh, because it is fighting Hamas. But the fact of the matter is, that means that aid is not getting into people who desperately need it and who didn't have anything directly to do with the terrorist attack that was carried out uh, in parts of Israel. All right, Matt Rivers in Cairo. Matt, thank you. And James, over to you. The desperate situation in Gaza continues, but Palestinians and the occupied West Bank are looking on in horror. And I want to take you there. I want to introduce you to Palestinian journalist and activist Basil Adra, uh, who is in, uh, in the West Bank right now. And I believe, Basil, uh, that a cousin of yours was shot in uh, recent uptick in uh, violence there. What's been going on? Can you just tell us what's happening where you are at the moment? Yes, so I am in a village called Twani, in a town called Masafriyata, it's southern of the West occupied West Bank. And we live in a small village called Twani. Near, uh, near of my village, there is a settlement and uh, dozens of illegal Israeli outposts where settlers are settled and living on our land and stealing our land and like just dig it and build for themselves like homes and uh, whatever, like huge farms, that infrastructure they got from the government. So I want to speak about the, the, the attack that my community got on last Friday. Uh, two settlers and one Israeli soldier approached to one of the houses in the village from the illegal outpost Habat Ma'on, and one of the one of the settler was armed. He ran inside one of the homes, and he attacked a man and his nephew, uh, beating him up with a rifle in their uh, heads and steal their phones because they're filming the settlers like moving around uh, the the land. And the moment he just ran in the house with the, with the, with his gun, the women and children start to scream very high. Uh, other like children in the streets who saw this action like start to scream. I ran out with my camera. Uh, people who were just praying in the mosque next by to that home uh, also start to walk up from the mosque to see what's happening, what these settlers want. And I filmed this in video, actually, and well, I didn't believe that I'm filming my cousin being, like, shot in this, like, in this attack. I was so afraid, and everyone, it was intense that settler just approached him, hit him in, with a ruffle in his head, and then shot him in the, in the stomach. And then just, like, a soldier was, like, backing the settler and watching him. And after he shot my cousin, they, the soldier called the settler and they walked back to the outpost where nothing going on there except they approached to the village and armed settlers. This is very scary and this is happening a lot in the last 10 days uh, to the communities in, in the West Bank, in Masafriyatta, next to Ramallah, in Bethlehem, all the cities. The villages around the cities are, we are really, really scared. I, I witnessed uh, families leaving their homes because they're afraid from these settlers attacks. Settlers set up fire in Palestinian homes and they destroyed like Palestinian homes and farms and agricultural fields. This like the past two hours in a community next by here, the settlers destroyed three water wells that existence in this community since the, uh, the Romanian empire. What we are facing in Basel. the cities, in the, sorry, in the, yes. 
Sorry, I, I mean, I, I don't want to cut you off. I just wanted to just ask you some more questions. Given this uptick in violence, as you describe it, uh, in your community, do you have a message for Israel at the moment? A message not for Israel. I don't know what I have to tell to Israel. We, uh, we as a Palestinians and young generations, we are tired of living under the occupation and under this apartheid because it's it's like going on since long time and now uh, more than ever they're giving the the, the this like these terrorist settlers uh, all the opportunity it's it's very cra crazy and scary for myself and the people in my community that the settlers who used to attack our communities and burning hawara and burning like uh, turmus aya and the army israeli army spokesperson like naming them terrorists are now allowing them to be in the military reserves and wearing uniform and taking guns and they came and shot in the in my village for example on thursday settlers who i know them as settlers as committing attacks they came on thursday with uniform and shot in inside my village luckily no one were injured but on friday my cousin got shot by these settlers so this is like mm. we are tired of living under uh, con uh, foreign military controls. Uh, Israel should end this like opposing on us, and this should come from the Western governments, who's like always claiming that they're protecting the international community, that these settlements are illegal, these outposts are illegal. But these ten days, hundreds of Palestinians were were escaping and running out of their communities, and settlers destroyed their homes and burned their. Uh, tents and destroyed their water wells in order to 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 kick us out of our land and to, to steal it this should be this should stop and should stop now yeah. more than ever uh, because it's like it's it's so so insane to continue and the international community should and must act against the settlements and Basel. outposts and not allow their companies Basel. and their money to be invest in these settlements and yeah. for these settlers Basel. Basel, thank you, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Make it clear that Hamas is obviously in control of Gaza, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank, but Palestinians across this uh, area are feeling uh, in increasingly uh, worried about this devastating situation. But Diane, back to you in New York. James, thank you. Coming up, millions of civilians are attempting to evacuate ahead of a potential ground assault in Gaza. What the invasion could look like and what comes next after this. Whenever news breaks. To crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, a major ground assault in Gaza by Israeli forces could happen at any moment. The Israeli military tells ABC News it's ready to go into Gaza and just awaiting government orders. Earlier, Prime Minister Netanyahu told lawmakers there's, quote, uh, lawmakers there, rather, quote, we are going to war and we will win. We will not stop until we won. Retired U.S. Lieutenant General William Troy joins me now with more. General, thanks for coming on. Netanyahu says that the goal of a ground assault here is to, in his words, demolish Hamas. What would it take to make that happen? What does that look like? Yeah, good morning. Uh, I think what it looks like is, first of all, you've got to take out the, the top leadership uh, and possibly several layers down. And I'm, I'm sure that's uh, one of their top priorities for the uh, IDF. 
Um, I also think that there's weapon uh, storage areas, there's ammunition, there's command and control headquarters, uh, intel processing centers. Um, I think all of those things would be on target lists that uh, either the ground, air, or some combination of those forces will be going after. Now, Israel has been accusing Hamas of using civilians as human shields during airstrikes. So how do you account for that during a ground assault? Well, it's extremely difficult. There's just no, no two ways about it. Uh, in a urban area that is this dense, uh, there's uh, going to be a large number of civilians on the battlefield. And it seems inevitable and tragic, uh, but civilians are going to get caught up uh, in this fighting. Uh, you know, for example, if if uh, Israeli soldiers are taking fire from, say, an apartment window, they're going to return that. They're going to return fire, uh, and they're going to eliminate that threat to their forces. And quite often, that's going to involve more destruction and more casualties. Um, than anyone would have wanted. But when that when you're fighting in that kind of dense urban terrain, it seems inevitable that uh, there's going to be a significant number of civilian casualties. Now, the IDF has already started carrying out special forces raids inside Gaza. How are those raids setting the stage for this larger ground assault? I think that uh, those kinds of raids are extremely uh, helpful for gathering intelligence. Um, there's nothing quite like having uh, boots on the ground, uh, observing what's actually going on in real time and, and getting that information uh, back to the planners. Um, I also think that there's probably a chance that they are going to strike certain targets, uh, try and take out um, some of the uh, eyes and ears of the defenders, um, and that will be an important mission for them. Uh, so I, I expect that uh, they're going to play a pivotal role as the invasion goes forward. All right, retired Lieutenant General William Troy, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, more chaos in Congress. Could House Republicans' new nominee for speaker meet the same fate as their last candidate? We have a live report from Capitol Hill after this. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden, please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. I'm Rebecca Jarvis reporting from the New York Stock Exchange and wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Welcome back. Republicans are still searching for a Speaker of the House. The vote is scheduled for tomorrow, but nominee Jim Jordan does not appear to support, to have enough support, rather, to get elected. Let's bring in ABC News contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade on Capitol Hill for more. Uh, Rachel, what happens if Jordan fails to win the gavel this week? Not an unfair question, Diane, given that 55 House Republicans said last Friday that they would not support him even after he became the House Republican nominee. I've been hearing from allies of some people like House Majority Whip Tom Emmer, who's a Minnesota Republican. They want him to have a shot. Even uh, Mike Johnson, uh, a Louisiana Republican, who also is thinking about making a run himself. And I think one of the big problems Republicans have right now in the House is that one leader's downfall is another person's opportunity. And that's what happened with Kevin McCarthy when he was out. Uh, Steve Scalise, his right-hand man, his allies pushed for him, but then allies of Jim Jordan went in and tried to undercut Scalise. Now Jordan is up, and the allies of some other Republicans who want the job themselves are, are frankly looking at sabotaging him behind the scenes to keep him from the 217 votes he needs to actually win the gavel. It kind of feels a little bit like uh, Mean Girls up here in Congress. Uh, we'll just have to see if they're able to rela rally around someone, but right now it's not looking good. So could acting speaker Patrick McHenry potentially stay in this job permanently? So there's been a lot of talk behind the scenes with Republicans about what happens if Jim Jordan goes down? Could they empower Patrick McHenry to actually use the speaker's gavel and have the normal authority of a typical speaker? Right now, McHenry only can oversee a speakership election. He doesn't actually have a lot of power, but they can actually force a vote in the House, and there's been talk about forcing a vote to make sure that he can bring up government funding bills, a, a, a package for Israel since the war is going on in the Middle East right now. So that would actually take 217 votes, and chances are McHenry is actually not uh, close with conservatives at all. He'll have the same problem that uh, Kevin McCarthy had and Steve Scalise had. They're going to need Democrat votes to do that, but it's certainly a possibility. All right, Rachel Bade, thank you. On Capitol Hill there, and we are awaiting an address from the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. We will bring that to you as it comes, and it looks like looks like the Secretary is having a meeting there. But again, we will bring you more details on this as we get it. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank 
pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, you're looking live at Gaza as the sun sets on the ninth day of Israel's war with Hamas. The Palestinian Ministry of Health says more than 2,700 people have been killed in the Israeli airstrikes. Israel's been launching those strikes for over a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Now the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces say they're preparing for a major ground assault. I'm Diane Macedo, along with foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv. We're learning new details on the hostages taken in that Hamas attack. The IDF says at least 199 people were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists since their attack last Saturday. The Israeli Hostages and Missing Families Forum reports they're enduring extreme conditions as time runs critically short. Meanwhile, Hezbollah is claiming to have hit targets in Israel with direct weapons. The IDF says Hezbollah fired small arms and anti-tank weapons near the border with Lebanon, but says there were no casualties. Israeli forces say they returned fire with artillery. Meanwhile, the IDF says special forces have conducted small raids inside Gaza, but regular infantry, artillery, tanks, armored divisions and battalions are amassing around the Israel-Gaza border ahead of this expected ground assault. Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell has the latest. Gaza facing a mounting humanitarian crisis as Israel gears up for a possible ground invasion. Israeli troops amassing at the border with Gaza poised to strike. The country's mobilized around 360,000 reservists vowing to crush Hamas, the militant group behind last week's bloody attack in Israel. The death toll now rising to more than 1,400, including 30 Americans. And the number of people taken hostage, also including Americans, now confirmed as 199. We will strike Hamas from the top through its institutions all the way down to the individuals that conducted the butchery of our babies. Israel's already reduced many parts of Gaza to rubble since last week's attack. More than 2,700 Palestinians killed in just over a week and nearly 10,000 wounded. With a ground invasion looming, Israel calling for residents of northern Gaza, up to a million people, to flee south. Hamas has a dense network of tunnels to hide and move men and munitions in the north. It could also be hiding some of the hostages there. With booby traps and mines, any land assault is likely to be extremely difficult and dangerous. Gaza is awash with grief and despair. This ice cream truck turned into a makeshift morgue. Palestinians are lining up for whatever resources they can get as Israel's completely cut off food and electricity and limited water to the territory. Outside one bakery, desperation setting in. Hospitals are overwhelmed as the UN warns that the fuel that keeps those critical facilities open will soon run out. There's a lot of concerns at the same time, but the biggest concern right now is to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe beyond what we're actually witnessing right now. We need to have water installed back to the entire Gaza Strip, not only to the south, but to everyone. We need to have the siege fully lifted so people can have access to food, electricity. President Biden saying in an interview on 60 Minutes that he believes Israel will follow the democratic rules of war. I'm confident that there's going to be an ability for the innocents in Gaza to be able to have access to medicine and food and water. But the president also saying he won't support a move to take over the land. I think that uh, it would be a mistake to, uh, for Israel to occupy Gaza again. We've been following Tala Imad Hutzala a student at the Islamic University of Gaza. Her family tried to flee, but without a car, they're stuck. I don't know if 
We'll see you love. No. Among those trapped in the Strip, upwards of 600 Palestinian Americans. The US is in touch with many of them, but getting out is proving hard. I spoke on the phone with Maha Barakat, an aid worker from New Jersey. She managed to flee south, but says she's already run out of water and only has enough gas to make one attempt to leave. You had to leave your home? I did. I left with my nephews and nieces. My brother could not leave because I have an older sister who she has a disability and she cannot move. So she had to stay with her. And in the north of Israel, fears that the war could spread to other countries. ABC's Mola Lengi reporting from Lebanon by Israel's northern border. Is there a fear of, of, of uh, an oncoming war? Yes, there is a fear. People here are afraid. This comes as Israel has been exchanging fire with Hezbollah, the militant group based out of Lebanon and also backed by Iran. 28 communities in the north being evacuated for their own safety. The IDF releasing this new video, they say, shows an Israeli strike on a Hezbollah military target. They should be very cautious of crossing that threshold because we are determined to defend the state of Israel. Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel, thank you. Diane. All right, James, thanks. And we're learning that a Knesset session in Jerusalem was interrupted earlier today after the sounding of sirens. This is tensions grow at the Israel-Lebanon border as well. ABC's Inez de la Quattara joins me now from Jerusalem with more. And as earlier today, Prime Minister Netanyahu met with Secretary Blinken, who also just spoke alongside Israel's defense minister. So what do we know about these meetings with the U.S. Secretary of State? Hey, Diane. Yeah, so U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was here in Jerusalem. He was also in Tel Aviv. He is back in Israel after a swing through the Middle East. He was in Israel uh, last week. Today, he did meet with the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. He met with the opposition leader as well, along with a number of other Israeli leaders. All of those meetings were closed press, but uh, we did get a readout from uh, Blinken. We know that he reaffirmed the U.S.'s unwavering support for Israel. He uh, reiterated that Israel has a right to defend itself and that the U.S. would be providing providing Israel with, you know, whatever help it, it needs. Um, but Blinken is in a tricky position here. So as much as he wants to reaffirm his support for Israel, he also has to deal with this issue of humanitarian aid uh, getting into Gaza. Negotiations, uh, you know, to, to try and negotiate with Egyptian and Israeli officials to try to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. Israel has been uh, reluctant to, to allow that. Um, and Blinken also, uh, you know, uh, focused with on uh, hostages as well, American hostages uh, uh, currently in Gaza and of course the humanitarian uh, situation um, you know opening up these humanitarian corridors important because important because there are uh, Palestinian Americans currently in Gaza that are trying to get out and, and as uh, more than a week later we're also still learning new details about that terror attack by Hamas uh, I know you spoke to someone over the weekend who says her family had to hide out during the attack what did she tell you that's right. Yeah, this was a woman from New Jersey, actually, who was, you know, she lives in the U.S. She was in Zderat in southern uh, Israel, just on vacation visiting family when the attacks broke out. And she had to take cover. And she said she described how, how they heard the militants. Um, so she had to go into a safe room with her two-year-old and her husband for over 20 hours. I'll let you listen to what she had to say. <laughs> I was praying the whole entire time, but we definitely feared for our lives, for our children. We had to hold them quiet so no one comes in. You just hear everything out there all night, all day. And you can hear the fear there in her voice. We met her at the airport in Tel Aviv. She was one of, you know, so many Americans who were stranded in Israel who were now trying to get out. She was going to be boarding a flight chartered by the, by the State Department to get back to, uh, to get to other parts of Europe. And then she would have to find her own way back to New Jersey. But uh, she was among those being evacuated by the State Department. We know uh, over 20,000 Americans have reached out to the State Department for help uh, with, their, with their evacuations. All right. And as Israelis living near the Lebanon border, 
are now set to evacuate today. So what's the latest on that front and the general concerns that this war could trickle over another border? Yeah, so we are learning that uh, Israeli citizens who live within roughly a mile of the Lebanese border are being told to evacuate. I think that is concerning in that it, it, you know, it raises questions as to whether they're being evacuated because the IDF anticipates that the situation there with Hezbollah is going to get worse. We know the IDF has been engaging with uh, Hezbollah with, uh, you know, they, they targeted military infrastructure belonging to Hezbollah inside uh, Lebanon. And, and so the, the fighting there continues. It's been continuing for days. The, the, the you know, that northern kind of front, so to speak, hasn't fully turned into a front. It's just been kind of back and forth, um, target struck here and there. But there is a real concern that it could turn into a second front and that this could um, spill over into other parts of the region. Um, and and uh, Hezbollah, of course, backed by Iran. And in many ways, Hezbollah is more of a threat to Israel than Hamas is because they are more equipped um, and, and, and just have more experience and, and the fighters are, are better trained. So um, the IDF certainly keeping a close eye on that. But yeah, the, the fact that these communities are being evacuated um, you know, is, is raising concerns uh, as to whether the IDF may, may, may anticipate um, more and more fighting coming on the Lebanese border. So Inez, what are you watching for next? So definitely watching that border, the uh, Lebanese border, uh, and of course what happens on the Gaza Strip. You know, we know that uh, a ground invasion is just uh, imminent, so it's a matter of, of time now. We don't know at this point whether it could be hours away or, or days away. Um, and then, I mean, we're here in Jerusalem, so I'm watching everything that's going on in the West Bank um, to see how, how Palestinians there respond to what happens in Gaza. If and when there is a ground invasion of Gaza, Palestinians in the, in the West Bank will have, you know, some kind of reaction, um, as will Palestinians in East Jerusalem and so you know we spoke to, to, to residents of old the old city uh, Jerusalem yesterday and and they were telling us that they're praying for peace but that they fear that the worst could be yet to come Diane all right Inez de la Quattara in Jerusalem Inez thank you meanwhile the sole border crossing between Gaza and Egypt could open for a few hours today that could give some Palestinians a chance to get out before the ground incursion but most have nowhere to go Thousands are already gathered at the Rafah crossing trying to get into Egypt. Now the Egyptian foreign minister is blaming Israel for not allowing Rafah to open. ABC's Matt Rivers joins me now from Cairo with more on this. Matt, what's happening at the Rafah border crossing right now? That has been the question that everybody here in Egypt has been asking going back a few days now. As best we can tell at this moment, the border remains closed. This despite the fact uh, that the Egyptian foreign minister said they would like to open it, but as you just mentioned, Diane, blaming Israel for not allowing the conditions on the ground, as he put it, to allow Egypt to, to open that border crossing. Uh, what we are seeing, though, also from the Egyptian side is that they're not going to allow that border crossing to be open unless aid here in Egypt is allowed to be sent north into Gaza to help the people there. So it's a very evolving situation, but as of now, uh, we know that the border remains closed. Effectively, what that means is that people are trapped on the other side. When you think about the people on the other side, think about two separate groups of people. You have uh, people who live in Gaza who don't have foreign passports, like the United States or a British passport, and then you have those that do. We saw Antony Blinken, the Secretary of State of the U.S., here yesterday trying to urge the Egyptians to at least temporarily open that border to allow for those with foreign passports to leave. Uh, but so far, that has not happened. The American Secretary of State not able to convince the Egyptians to let that happen. Matt, Egypt has said that it won't open the border unless Israel cooperates with delivery of aid into Gaza. What's happening with that, and what does that mean for foreigners and Palestinians trying to leave? That, that has really been the line in the sand for the Egyptians. They have said, and they've held fast to this, that they will not allow people to come out of Gaza unless they can send aid in. And what you have the Egyptians saying is, look, we've already got aid lined up. We've got uh, the, the Red Crescent crews who are already in place. They've got UN crews already in place. The U.S. State Department says that it has its people as close to that area as they can get in order to facilitate the transfer of U.S. citizens out of Gaza, and yet that isn't happening. But that does seem to be the line in the sand that the Egyptians have, have, have uh, drawn here, basically saying we're not going to open up our side of the border unless the Israelis allow aid in. They've asked the Americans to pressure the Israelis to allow that to happen, but so far that hasn't happened. Israel basically saying that they don't want that to happen, and so until the Israelis allow that to happen on their side of the border, it seems like the Egyptians are going to hold fast and keep this border shut. That could change at any moment, but that is the way things are, at least at this hour.
Uh, Matt, Israel has maintained throughout that they're not targeting civilians and in fact trying to spare civilian casualties as much as possible. So how are they explaining why they won't allow that aid in? Well, basically, I mean, you've seen them cut off aid all across the entire, uh, uh, the, all of Gaza at this point. No food, no water, no electricity. And so if that is the stated policy from Israel, that is not going to be changed along the Egyptian border, at least for now. That is consistent with what we've seen from Israel through all of this time so far. Uh, and that doesn't seem like it's going to change, uh, at, at least for now. Israel saying that it doesn't want to target civilians, that it is doing this uh, because it is fighting Hamas. But the fact of the matter is, that means that aid is not getting into people who desperately need it and who didn't have anything directly to do with the terrorist attack that was carried out uh, in parts of Israel. All right, Matt Rivers in Cairo. Matt, thank you. Coming up, Russia ramps up its offensive in Ukraine. How Ukraine is fighting back to defend a strategic city after this. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shot. Mrs. Kennedy said, stay her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. The commentator was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now president of the United States. That was when the enormity struck me. I was walking on to the stage for a part I had never rehearsed. I ought to record this. Dr. King's been shot. Senator Kennedy had been shot, but Vietnam dominated the news. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. As the conflict rages on between Israel and Hamas, Russia is waging a major new offensive in eastern Ukraine. It's Russia's biggest offensive since last winter as troops try to encircle a strategic city. ABC News' Patrick Rievel is in Kyiv with the latest on that. Uh, Patrick, what are you hearing right now? Yeah, hi, Diane. With the world's attention glued on Israel and Gaza, Russia has been waging its biggest offensive since last winter. It's focused on the strategic city of Avdivka and further north up to Kupyansk in eastern Ukraine. And we've seen basically thousands of Russian troops and hundreds of Russian tanks and armored vehicles launch an onslaught for the past six days onto these cities. And really, I think the scale of this offensive does show that the, the Kremlin right now is trying to turn the tide after months of defending against Ukraine's counter Offensive. But what we are hearing is that Ukrainian forces are inflicting very heavy casualties on Russia in these frontal assaults. We're seeing videos that seem to show dozens of Russian armored vehicles being destroyed. Ukraine claims that thousands of Russian soldiers have been killed in just the last six days. Because of the scale of the losses, supposedly the intensity of the assault has uh, drawn back somewhat today. But they expect this assault to keep continuing. And it is obviously um, remarkable that we're talking about now Russia on the offensive when we've been talking for months about Ukraine's counteroffensive and its hopes to try and have a victory in this war. Uh, Patrick, we're getting reports that Russian President Vladimir Putin will discuss the war between Israel and Hamas uh, in a telephone uh, conversation with several regional leaders. What are you hearing about those conversations? 
Yeah, the Kremlin says that Vladimir Putin is supposed to have calls with five leaders, including from Egypt, as well as with Benjamin Netanyahu and the, um, and the leader of the Palestinian Authority, uh, Mahmoud Abbas. We know as well that he's already had a call with Iran's president. In that call, um, according to the Kremlin, the president of Iran said that if, if Israel continues the siege of Gaza, that could lead to a large-scale uh, military confrontation, which seems again to be this threat coming from Iran that potentially it could become involved somehow if, uh, if the ground offensive from Israel is to go ahead. I mean, the Kremlin itself is continuing to repeat its position, which is there should be an immediate ceasefire. And basically, the Kremlin is trying to balance this difficult line where it has a very close relationship that's become even closer with Iran because of the war here in Ukraine where Iran has been providing weapons, but also it doesn't want to spoil its relations with Israel. And so right now we can see that Putin's trying to position Russia as a mediator, but he doesn't really have that much influence at the moment. Now, is the timing coincidental here uh, of this Russian offensive, or is this linked to the Israel-Hamas war? Is Putin trying to exploit what's happening in Gaza to his advantage? You know, I, I think that's a very good question. I think it would be unlikely that the exact timing of this offensive is directly linked to what's happening in Gaza, simply because this is a very large operation that must have taken a lot of planning and preparation. Um, but, you know, what's without question is that the crisis in Gaza is most definitely an opportunity for Vladimir Putin because it simply it pulls the world's attention from Ukraine onto Israel and, and that easily plays into to the Kremlin's plan for Ukraine and its best hope at the moment that Western support will fade and that it will eventually leave Ukraine face to face with Russia and that is essentially the Kremlin's plan right now is to try and just continue waiting out the West and so obviously with the world's attention diverted onto Israel that's good news for Vladimir Putin. All right Patrick Rival in Kiev. Patrick thank you. Coming up, a possible new gag order for former President Trump, why the judge in his federal election case is considering it, and why Trump says it would violate his First Amendment rights. Also ahead, our parent company Disney is celebrating its 100th anniversary. How Walt Disney set the stage for an entertainment dynasty after this. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. America. 
America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Boston, I'm Whit Johnson. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. We will have more on the war between Israel and Hamas. But first, here are some of the other stories we're following today. Pharmacy chain Rite Aid has filed for bankruptcy. The brand is facing falling sales, big debt, and lawsuits related to the opioid crisis. Rite Aid settled up to $30 million in lawsuits that allege their pharmacies oversupplied prescription opioids. The chain says it plans to close some underperforming stores. The federal judge and former President Trump's election interference case will hear arguments today about what Trump can say publicly about the case. Special counsel Jack Smith is requesting a limited gag order pointing to the former president's conduct on social media regarding people in his various legal cases. Trump posted attacks on Judge Chanya Tutkin on his Truth Social platform as recently as last night. Trump's attorneys opposed the potential gag order, calling it a limit on Trump's First Amendment rights. The former president has pleaded not guilty. And today marks the 100th anniversary of our parent company, Disney. Exactly 100 years ago, Walt Disney and his brother Roy launched the company that would change entertainment. Walt Disney's early achievements include the first cartoon with synchronized sound, which introduced the world to Mickey Mouse, and the first full-length animated movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Today, the company's portfolio includes 12 theme parks around the world, beloved franchises like Star Wars and Marvel, and of course, ABC News. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. We'll be right back. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Everything you need to know. You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live.
You are looking live at Tel Aviv as the Israeli military tells ABC News it is ready to go into Gaza. An Israeli military spokesperson says they're just waiting for the government's orders. Now the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces prepare for that ground assault. Welcome to ABC News Live First. I'm Diane Macedo along with foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv. The Israel Defense Forces says its soldiers have killed Hamas's head of general intelligence in the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, Hezbollah is claiming to have hit targets in Israel with direct weapons. The IDF says Hezbollah fired small arms and anti-tank weapons near the border with Lebanon, but there were no casualties. Israeli forces also say they returned fire with artillery. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is also meeting with Israeli officials, reiterating U.S. support for Israel's right to defend itself from Hamas terrorism. You know our deep commitment to Israel's right, indeed its obligation, to defend itself and to defend its people. And in that, you have and will always have the support of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. The State Department says they also discussed this coordination underway to protect civilians placed in harm's way by Hamas. Meanwhile, the IDF says special forces have conducted small raids inside Gaza, but regular infantry, artillery, tanks, armored divisions and battalions are massing around the Israel-Gaza border ahead of this expected ground assault. Well, the International Committee of the Red Cross says the evacuation order on Gaza has triggered catastrophic humanitarian consequences. The spokesperson for the uh, International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, Tommaso Della Longa, joins me now with the latest from Geneva. The Palestinian Red Crescent Society and uh, the Magen David Adom in Israel have been working around the clock to provide critical assistance, including ambulance and health services to those affected by the war. What are your key objectives in the region right now? Well, yeah, as you said, first of all, I just want to commend the life-saving word of both the Magen David Adom in Israel and the Palestine Red Crescent in the Gaza Strip and in West Bank. At the moment, we are particularly worried about the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. What we are hearing from our colleagues of Palestine Red Crescent is that the situation, as you said, is... Uh, I mean, as we already said, it's catastrophic in the sense that medicine are running out, uh, hospitals uh, um, um, don't have any more fuel, and then there is, of course, shortages of water and food. So our main main call at the moment is to have a safe and unhindered access to the to the Gaza Strip. How have your efforts? Well, how's your work in Gaza uh, being stopped? Is it being stopped by this ongoing fighting uh, by the airstrikes? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't want to say that it was stopped because actually Palestine Red Crescent teams are working around the clock. Of course, uh, with uh, limited capacity in the sense that all the humanitarian stocks are deeply depleted. And then, of course, there is a big issue of safety, safety of civilians as well as safety of healthcare workers. So at the moment, uh, even uh, ambulances, uh, of course, are suffering uh, all the situation that all the Gaza Strip are suffering. I want just to remember that since the beginning of these hostilities, we lost uh, seven members, so three of the Magen David Adom in Israel last week, and then four paramedics of Palestine Crescent to different incidents. And this is really a stark reminder of the level of violence and the fact that uh, even the respect of rules, the respect of humanitarian workers uh, is not there. And this is why we call all the parties uh, to respect civilians, to respect healthcare facilities, to respect healthcare workers. This is a legal obligation under international humanitarian law, and it is not negotiable. We've heard uh, conflicting reports about the water situation in Gaza. Uh, it was, of course, turned off by the Israeli authorities. Now there's a suggestion that it may be back on in the south, but it's m very difficult for people to get hold of it. I mean, what is your understanding at the moment on whether or not people can get water in the Gaza Strip at this point? Yeah, our understanding from our uh, colleagues in the Gaza Strip is the situation is it's really complicated, and, and even uh, uh, I mean, w I mean, w they are facing a huge shortage. Uh, of water. But uh, I mean, the, the reality here is really what I, I want to highlight is that there is a urgent need to have safe and unneeded access for humanitarian aid. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of people who will need medicine for treatments, who will need food, who will need a, a lot of different uh, humanitarian uh, 
uh, aid. So at this stage, it's really critical to have the possibility to have a safe and unhindered access to the Gaza Strip. I think everybody watching is hoping that that humanitarian aid can get in. Tommaso Della Longa, spokesperson for the International Federation uh, of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. Thank you. Diane, back to you. James, thank you. And the U.S. is expanding its military presence near the Middle East as a show of force. A second aircraft, excuse me, second aircraft carrier is now on its way to the eastern Mediterranean. ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey joins me now from the Pentagon with more on that, along with ABC News national security and defense analyst and former deputy assistant secretary of defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy. Elizabeth, what do we know so far about this second aircraft carrier and its purpose? Diane, the purpose of this second aircraft carrier is to continue to send this message from the U.S. to other countries, specifically to Iran and to Hezbollah, the militant group backed by Iran in Lebanon, to not escalate this crisis. This is a very deliberate signal on behalf of the administration to say any actor trying to take advantage of the situation that we're seeing between Israel and Hamas do not take advantage. And, and it's important to emphasize how rare it is to have these two aircraft uh, vehicles in the same place at the same time, Diane. This is really a show of force that also doesn't just include um, the aircraft carriers. There's also missiles uh, that are coming alongside them. So really what this does is to try to say anyone who's looking at this moment and saying this could be an opportunity, and we have seen some clashes already between Israel and Lebanon in the northern border of Israel, anyone trying to take advantage, the U.S. is standing ready in, a, in really an, an unprecedented way. Diane. Mick, meanwhile, people are lined up at the Rafah border crossing uh, between Gaza and Egypt trying to get away from the fighting. The Egyptian foreign minister is blaming Israel for not allowing the opening of that Rafah border crossing from the Palestinian side. Uh, talk about what's going on there, how we, how we landed here, why Egypt is blaming Israel, and, and how this plays out. So, Diane, I don't know if that's accurate, but if it is, it might be that Israel of course, their main military objective when they go into Gaza is going to be to destroy Hamas, its leaderships, its fighters, it, and, of course, its storage of missiles and rockets and everything else that goes into waging war. So they might want to have an ability to prevent the, the Hamas fighters and leadership from leaving in Rafah. That said, uh, I think they can do both. I think there's a way that innocent civilians should be allowed to leave, certainly foreign nationals, and that uh, humanitarian aid can get in through the South, because there needs to be a safe haven set up either inside uh, Gaza in the southern part or inside Egypt, because this is going to be a massive displacement of civilians that are going to need food, water, medicine, and everything that sustains life, and it's going to go on for quite some time. So that needs to be worked out quickly as possible. Elizabeth, the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, also says the U.S. is actively working to ensure the people of Gaza can get out of harm's way and get the assistance they need. How? And that's the question that they can't answer right now, Diane. Clearly, the Biden administration and Secretary of State Blinken, in his meeting with Israel's defense minister today, tried to make the point that this is something that Israel needs to try to help with, to try to get that humanitarian aid through. It's something that the president said as well. But ultimately, it's not something that the U.S. has a lot of control over, Diane. And, and one of the messages that Secretary Blinken continued to send alongside uh, Israel's defense minister is, we support your right to fully defend yourself taking this position publicly that Israel needs to defend itself from the atrocious attacks by Hamas. But in doing that, that does make it a lot more difficult to get that humanitarian aid across and ultimately what it's going to take to up and up those corridors. The Secretary of State had other meetings with the president of Egypt, with other Arab leaders. They are saying that Israel needs to scale back its airstrikes against Hamas in order for some of that aid to get through. And so far, that is, that is not happening, Diane. So, Mick... How do you see a way forward here? Israel is saying that they're not targeting civilians and that they're going out of their way to spare civilians. So is there a way to navigate this where that border crossing can open so people can get out, where aid can get in, but where Israel doesn't feel like they're losing ground to Hamas as a result? I think so, and we need to figure out a way because these two things are going to happen. When, when Israel, when the IDF does invade Gaza, it's going to be extraordinarily violent, and if civilians don't get out of the way, they're likely going to be killed. So they're going to be moving even in lar larger numbers than we've already seen to the south, and the international community, working with Egypt, uh, working with Israel, needs to set up everything we can now to facilitate this uh, incoming uh, you know, flow of 
essentially refugees into this area because this is going to take a long time. It's not going to be over in a week. It's, Israel's going to have to go uh, block by block, floor by floor, and it's going to take a long time to do what they want to do there. All right. ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey from the Pentagon, ABC News National Security Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy. Thank you both. Coming up, President Biden is meeting with his national security team about Israel's war with Hamas, how the administration is approaching diplomatic efforts, and that humanitarian crisis. Also ahead, more chaos in Congress. Because how could House Republicans' new nominee for speaker meet the same fate as their last candidate? We have a live report from Capitol Hill after this. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back. President Biden's trip to Colorado is postponed just hours before he was set to depart. A White House official says the president will stay at the White House for national security meetings instead. ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang joins me now from the White House with more. Selena, what are you hearing about these meetings and the rest of the president's schedule? Good morning, Diane. That's right. The president's planned trip to Colorado has been delayed at the very last minute. The White House says he is staying here for those national security meetings. We've also learned from the White House they are confirming that Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu has invited President Biden to visit Israel. But the White House is not giving any indication as to whether or not he will take up that offer. Now, any possible trip by President Biden to the region, that would be a strong show of support to Israel. As we have seen the administration try to prevent prevent this from becoming a broader and wider war. This would be a clear message to Iran and Hezbollah not to get further involved. We've already seen the U.S. deploy two aircraft carriers towards the region as a strong signal of deterrence. However, a possible trip, it would also come with high risk. Tensions are running high with the prospect of a possible ground invasion that would worsen the already very dire humanitarian crisis. In an interview over the weekend, President Biden said that it would be, quote, a big mistake for Israel Israel to occupy Gaza. This was a clear message from the president that there has to be some limit to how far Israel can go when it comes to retaliation. The president and his administration have also been trying to draw this distinction that Hamas does not represent all the Palestinian people who are also suffering. Uh, so what's the administration doing about the humanitarian disaster unfolding in Gaza right now and those U.S. citizens trying to leave? Well, as you were talking about in the earlier segment, there are Americans that are currently on their way out of Israel towards Cyprus on that cruise-like ship. The State Department has also said that there are charter flights that will continue to leave Israel on a rolling basis on Monday and Tuesday. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, he has been traveling throughout the region to try and push Israel and Egypt to come to an agreement and open that Rafah border crossing. As of now, those efforts have not been successful. The White House says they are hoping that they can can open this later today, but there has been no success yet. All right, ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang from the White House. Thank you. Meanwhile, Republicans are still searching for a speaker of the House. The vote is scheduled for tomorrow, but nominee Jim Jordan doesn't appear to have enough support to get elected. Let's bring in ABC News contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade on Capitol Hill for more on that. Rachel, what's the latest here? We already saw Steve Scalise nominated and then stepped down. Are we in for a replay with Jordan now? Diane, it's certainly possible. Jim Jordan ran as this candidate who could actually unify the Republican conference between conservatives and moderates. But 
55 House Republicans actually said that they wouldn't vote for him even after he received the nomination to be speaker last week. And that's a big problem for him. Remember, he can only lose four votes. We were hearing over the weekend that a group of appropriators and defense hawks, people who want to see the government stay open, who don't like shutdowns, which Jordan has cheered in the past, and who want to see defense spending increase, they're talking about voting as a block to sort of keep him from the gavel. Now, Jordan has two things that Steve Scalise actually didn't. One is time. He actually had three days to work people over the weekend, and we just saw how, uh, not Hal Rogers, pardon me, Mike Rogers, uh, who is the chair of the Armed Services Committee, just flipped his vote. He was a strong Jordan opponent, and now he says he's going to back him. Jordan also has the, the uh, perception, or at least public pressure, that conservatives are behind him right now. He has Donald Trump's endorsement. There are a lot of people, Republicans in the base, who love him and who have been calling Republicans' phones over the weekend and last week, saying that they want their lawmaker to support him. And so the Jordan camp's belief, from what I'm hearing from them, is that these opponents will actually cave when the bright lights are on them and they have to call out a name for speaker and that they will vote for Jordan. All right, interesting. Contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade. Rachel, thank you. Coming up, Israeli forces are massing on the border with Gaza ahead of a potential major ground assault. The latest on the humanitarian crisis inside Gaza after this. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting in Philadelphia, I'm Trevor Ault. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo in New York, joined by James Longman in Tel Aviv. And Israel has been launching strikes for over a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Now, the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced, as Israeli forces say they're preparing for a major ground assault. And again, foreign correspondent James Longman is in Tel Aviv, joining me now throughout the day. James? Yeah, thank you, Diane. We're going to take you inside Gaza now. Uh, Tala Hetzala is a 21-year-old student at the Islamic University in Gaza. She's been in touch with us throughout the ongoing airstrikes that have been hitting Gaza, uh, and we're fortunate enough to be able to speak to Tala. Tala, you're now in Gaza. Please just tell us, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Uh, what, I'm seeing, what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling can be described in words. Uh, we are like every night uh, saying that this night will be the last night for us. Uh, we don't guarantee safety in any place. Every and each place in Gaza is targeted by the Israeli airstrikes. Uh, they are targeting children, they are targeting women. Uh, we are now talking about more than uh, 2,800 killed people. We are talking about more uh, than uh, more and more people are killed who, and they are under the rubble and no one can get to them because the ambulance can't can, can, uh, get to these people because the bombing uh, in the streets uh, 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 everywhere actually. Um, every now and, and then we hear a bomb and we don't know where it is because of the lack of the uh, media coverage we have nowadays. Uh, there is no good internet connection. Uh, most of the houses are now uh, without water, but, uh, 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 without electricity. All of the houses are without electricity, without water, and we are suffering from food supplies, from water, from uh, from everything, from gas, from everything, from fuel. Uh, we have nothing, and I I said, and I'm. I'm repeating it that we will not die because of the uh, bombs we will die we will die because of the lack of everything around us Tala you've been trying to leave Gaza City uh, we saw that the Israelis dropped leaflets 
telling people to try to get south. Did you see those leaflets? Um, what has it been trying to move? I think uh, the connection to Tarbes very well, imagine, but you said very you said about the. Uh... Tala, if you can hear me, I'm just asking, we understand that you have tried to move. Yeah. You're, I don't know where you are currently, but you've tried to move south. Have you been successful? What's it like for people trying to go south, as the Israelis have asked them to do? Um, I think you're still asking about the evacuating place to another. I'm asking you if, uh, if you've been able to try to me? move south. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I mean, you can, you yes, can understand yes, yes, uh, yes. The, the situation. In, you can hear me okay. Okay. We're going to try this again. You've been... Where, where are you now? And have you been trying to move south? What is it yes. like trying to go south in Gaza? Let me tell you that uh, before the war, before one day we we like followed the orders that they told us to do and we moved to the south uh the journey was very hard we like walked for for more than one and a half hour because we don't have car a car and no one uh who have cars are able to get you and take you to the south because all cars are full with people uh, now the problem was while we were walking they actually bombed the street that is full literally full of people and um, people these people are were following the orders that they give to us uh, they were uh, there were in the street uh, they bombed us and uh, this bomb caused like uh, more, uh, 70 people who are killed and more than 200 injured people. Um, so although they bombed us, uh, we continued our journey and we reached to an Nusayrat camp, the place where they claim to be safe. Again, they claim to be safe because uh, they are literally uh, bombing everywhere in Gaza, whether south, whether east, whether north, west, every single point in Gaza is being bombed. So uh, after one night there, uh, they, they, uh, we actually, they, they bombed the, the uh, So we decided to move and to return to Tel El Hawa, uh, my, my, my place, my, my, my house, because uh, there's nothing can be guaranteed in any place. Uh, there's no safety in anywhere. Uh, they are bombing every place. So why to just flee and leave your house? Uh, that's why we decided to return to, to Tel El Hawa, to our house, and not follow their instructions because they themselves are not following their, their words. Uh, they're bombing everywhere. They're bombing the north everywhere. Uh, that's why we returned to uh, our house. And can I ask, we've heard reports that Hamas has asked people to stay where they are or is stopping people from going south. Is that your experience? No, no. No, no, Hamas uh, did not, uh, like, didn't say anything to anyone uh, in Gaza. Uh, I myself uh, didn't encounter any of Hamas's men. Um, they allow everyone to go wherever they want. Uh, if you find safety in any place, then go. But as I tell, as I tell you, there is no safety in anywhere. Uh, Hamas uh, is allowing everyone to go everywhere or anywhere. Uh, so th we don't have any restrictions about where to go or when to go uh, if it's in the side of Hamas. So you have you have decided to stay where you are in Gaza City, dis uh, and because you don't feel safe anywhere in Gaza, but. Israeli bombs are falling, but they may be followed by an Israeli ground invasion. There might be Israeli soldiers on the streets where you are now. How do you feel about yes, that possibility? Uh, uh, nothing. Um, let me tell you, bombs are the same as if they are, make, if they are going to do invasions. Uh, the result is one. You are going to be killed. You are going to be. You are going to die. Uh, simply speaking, uh, 
So if the real is one, why to fear from anything else? Um, it's just uh, another way to kill us. That, that, that's literally the simplest words to say. It's, it's, it's really another way they are trying to kill Palestinians with. So, um, yeah, we are fearing that. Yeah, we are scared of this. Uh, but nothing to do. Uh, we, are, we are killed in both ways. Nothing to do with Well, I hope hopefully this connection can stay. I, um, thank you so much for staying with us. I can appreciate it's an incredibly dangerous and difficult situation for you. We've been reporting here today that the uh, border crossing in the south, Rafah, the border crossing between G uh, Gaza and Egypt, may be opened at some point. If sometime in the future there's a possibility for you to seek refuge in Egypt, is that something that you and your family would want to do? No, no, absolutely no. Uh, we won't leave our our land. We won't leave our houses. It's not something that is a choice. Let me say, uh, it's our land. We are Palestinians, born born in Palestinians in Palestine. Our ancestors are Palestine, so we won't leave our land, even if we had the chance, even if we had the options option to leave our land and to go to another. Let me. They say we, to be a refugee is not something good. It's not something like make that makes you feel good. So why to do this? Uh, I hope we've still uh, got you, Tala. But um, um, I think the connection is is uh, very weak. To, to let people. Yeah. Oh. Tala. We're going to let you go for the moment, but now? please, please try and stay in touch with us. Yeah, we can, we can hear you now, but it's coming in and out. Look, I, I, all I can say is we, we really do hope that you can stay as safe as possible. Uh, thank you for speaking to, uh, to us. Uh, but for the moment, Diane, back to you. Yeah, thank you, James. And our big thanks to Tala for, for keeping in touch with us throughout this entire story. Tala, thank you and stay safe. And thank you at home for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for non-stop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. You are looking live at Tel Aviv as the Israeli military tells ABC News it is ready to go into Gaza. A military spokesperson now says they're just waiting for the government's orders. Prime Minister Netanyahu is telling leaders there, quote, we are going to win, we will win, we will not stop until we've won. Welcome to ABC News Live First. I am Diane Macedo along with foreign correspondent James Longman in Tel Aviv. The IDF says they've exchanged fire with Hezbollah near the Lebanese border. Hezbollah claims to have achieved a direct hit on a tank, but the IDF says there were no casualties. The renewed fighting is raising concerns over the war expanding to another front. Meanwhile, the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced ahead of the expected ground assault. Civilians are trying to leave, but a source tells ABC News an Israeli airstrike hit a road close to Gaza's border crossing into Egypt. And the IDF says special forces have killed Hamas's head of general intelligence. ABC's Ines de la Quitara has the latest. Israeli troops and tanks have been massing at the border with Gaza, poised to potentially move into the Palestinian territory. 360,000 reservists ready for a ground war as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vows to demolish Hamas. We will strike Hamas from the top through its institutions all the way down to the individuals that conducted the butchery of our babies. Americans racing to get out of Israel, around 2,000 leaving on a ship to Cyprus. We're leaving because uh, it's unsafe here. We have two kids. Uh, it's very scary to wake up, wake them up in the middle of the night, running to the shelter room. The State Department also says there will be charter flights today and tomorrow. Meanwhile, for people in Gaza, a growing humanitarian crisis. Palestinians lining up for basic necessities, with Israel cutting off food, water, and electricity. Hospitals overwhelmed. Israel urging the more than one million people in northern Gaza to flee south, but the Egyptian border crossing remains closed, despite pleas from Secretary of State Blinken to Egypt's president. Egypt refusing to open the border unless Israel allows food and water to flow back into Gaza. Tala Imad Herzala is a student at the Islamic University of Gaza. Her family tried to flee, but without a car, they're stuck documenting her experience through voice memos. They have been bombing for uh, 12 hours. Um, they didn't stop. They didn't take breaks. It was just a bomb after a bomb after a bomb. The death toll expected to keep going up. Already more than 1,400 killed in the Hamas terror attack on Israel, including 30 Americans. More than 2,700 Palestinians killed by the Israeli retaliation in just over a week and nearly 10,000 wounded. And officials now say 199 Israelis are believed to be held hostage after Hamas's attack on Israel. And there could be some relief for Gaza with Egypt opening up a border crossing to allow some people to get into Egypt and humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. James. Inez de la Qatara, thank you. And the U.S. is expanding its military presence near the Middle East as a show of force. A second aircraft carrier is now on its way to the eastern Mediterranean. ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey joins me now from the Pentagon for more on this, along with ABC News National Security and Defense Analyst, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East, Mick Mulroy. Elizabeth, why send these ships to this location? Who is this show of force aimed at? Diane, it's a direct show of force aimed at Iran and Hezbollah, the militant group backed by Iran that we've seen clashes between Hezbollah and Israeli forces on Israel's northern border in recent days. And the message here is that the U.S. is trying to say, do not escalate this war. Uh, we know that the USS Eisenhower was ordered by Defense Secretary Austin to depart on Saturday. It should take about a week before it arrives in the eastern Mediterranean. It will join the USS Ford there. And it really is uh, unprecedented for these two aircraft 
aircraft carriers to be in the eastern Mediterranean at the same time. So it is a strong signal. Ultimately, Defense Secretary Austin is trying to say, we have this, this firepower there, and we are trying to say to anyone trying to take advantage of this situation right now, just don't. Uh, Mick Netanyahu says the goal here is to demolish Hamas. Considering the conditions in Gaza, how can they accomplish that, and how can they try to minimize civilian casualties in the process? So, Diane, I think it's going to come from the north. I think they're going to move in the bulk of their main effort uh, via, via those entry points up there, and then they're going to systematically go south, block by block, building by building, tunnel by tunnel. And the tunnels are going to be very complicated. Hamas claims to have around 300 miles. They can come up, it, uh, fighters can come up behind IDF forces. They have hospitals, arsenals, food supplies. So it's going to be very difficult even if there was no civilians involved in the area. But there will be, unfortunately. And that'll make it exceedingly difficult to avoid civilian casualties. They must try to, as that is the requirement of any uh, uh, army in the, in the world. But it will be difficult, because it is hard to tell friend or foe when, you're, when your foe wears the same clothes as uh, civilians do. And that's going to make it exceedingly difficult. Elizabeth, the State Department says they discussed the coordination underway to protect civilians. What does that coordination look like? Well, and as Mick points out, it is very difficult. We know that Secretary of State Antony Blinken is again in Israel trying to basically have a, send the message that while the U.S. continues to fully support Israel's right to defend itself against Hamas, it also wants to minimize the loss of civilian lives. So, so sending this message to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, to Israel's defense minister to say that Israel should follow the rule of law, the international norms, to make sure that innocent lives are not lost. But as Mick says, Hamas uses civilians to shield itself. So this is proving to be uh, difficult in itself. And ultimately, uh, we've, seen sec we've seen Secretary of State Blinken meeting with Arab leaders, trying to also get them to help in the effort to get a corridor for those civilians. So far, that is not yielding any results, Diane. Mick, meanwhile, hostages are also caught in the middle of this, Americans among them. What can the U.S. do to try to secure their safety right now? So this is the most difficult uh, form of combat operations that I've been involved with, is hostage rescue. Uh, and so right now, I think the U.S. has sent their best folks over, JSOC, CIA, to work directly with the IDF uh, special operations. And they're going to try to get the intelligence necessary to facilitate a rescue operation. Then, of course, they have to have almost seamlessly perfect execution. But that's what they're likely doing ahead of the main effort moving through block by block, as we already talked about. And then if that doesn't work, they'll be looking for these hostages as they go systematically uh, south from the north, looking for hostages that they can rescue. So they'll be, this will not stop. This will be a continuous effort on the part of the IDF, supported I would imagine, by the United States military and intelligence services. All right, ABC's Elizabeth Shelsey from the Pentagon, ABC News National Security and Defense Analyst Mick Mulroy. Thank you both. James? Diane, thank you. Uh, I want to go back into Gaza. A few days ago, we spoke to Jason Shawa, father of two, who is based there. And since then, he has now relocated his family. Uh, Jason, thank you for speaking to us again. What is your situation at the moment? Well, I think uh, Jason's uh, line is, is coming in and out there, I'm afraid. We're going to try and clear that up. Um, no, I don't think we're going to have to go back to Diane. We'll, go, we'll try and get back to you, Jason, just as soon as we can. Diane? James, thank you. We will try to get Jason back up. In the meantime, coming up, millions of civilians are attempting to evacuate ahead of a potential ground assault in Gaza. What the invasion could look like and what comes next after this. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. President Biden's trip to Colorado is postponed just hours before he was set to depart. A White House official says the president will stay at the White House for national security meetings instead. ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang joins me now from the White House with more. Selena, what are you hearing about these meetings and the rest of the president's schedule? Good morning, Diane. That's right. The president's planned trip to Colorado has been delayed at the very last minute. The White House says he is staying here for those national security meetings. We've also learned from the White House they are confirming that Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu has invited President Biden to visit Israel. But the White House is not giving any indication as to whether or not he will take up that offer. Now, any possible trip by President Biden to the region, that would be a strong show of support to Israel. As we have seen, the administration try to prevent prevent this from becoming a broader and wider war. This would be a clear message to Iran and Hezbollah not to get further involved. We've already seen the U.S. deploy two aircraft carriers towards the region as a strong signal of deterrence. However, a possible trip, it would also come with high risk. Tensions are running high with the prospect of a possible ground invasion that would worsen the already very dire humanitarian crisis. In an interview over the weekend, President Biden said that it would be, quote, a big mistake for Israel Israel to occupy Gaza. This was a clear message from the president that there has to be some limit to how far Israel can go when it comes to retaliation. The president and his administration have also been trying to draw this distinction that Hamas does not represent all the Palestinian people who are also suffering. Uh, so what's the administration doing about the humanitarian disaster unfolding in Gaza right now and those U.S. citizens trying to leave? Well, as you were talking about in the earlier segment, there are Americans that are currently on their way out of Israel towards Cyprus on that cruise-like ship. The State Department has also said that there are charter flights that will continue to leave Israel on a rolling basis on Monday and Tuesday. The Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, he has been traveling throughout the region to try and push Israel and Egypt to come to an agreement and open that Rafah border crossing. As of now, those efforts have not been successful. The White House says they are hoping that they can open this later today, but there has been no success yet. All right, ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang from the White House. Thank you. Meanwhile, Republicans are still searching for a Speaker of the House. The vote is scheduled for tomorrow, but nominee Jim Jordan doesn't appear to have enough support to get elected. Let's bring in ABC News contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade on Capitol Hill for more on that. Rachel, what's the latest here? We already saw Steve Scalise nominated and then stepped down. Are we in for a replay with Jordan now? Diane, it's certainly possible. Jim Jordan ran as this candidate who could actually unify the Republican conference between conservatives and moderates, but 55 House Republicans actually said that they wouldn't vote for him even after he received the nomination to be speaker last week. And that's a big problem for him. Remember, he can only lose four votes. We were hearing over the weekend that a group of appropriators and defense hawks, people who want to see the government stay open, who don't like shutdowns, which Jordan has cheered in the past, and who want to see defense spending increase, they're talking about voting as a block to sort of keep him from the gavel. Now, Jordan has 
two things that Steve Scalise actually didn't. One is time. He actually had three days to work people over the weekend, and we just saw how, uh, not Hal Rogers, pardon me, Mike Rogers, uh, who is the chair of the Armed Services Committee, just flipped his vote. He was a strong Jordan opponent, and now he says he's going to back him. Jordan also has the, the uh, perception, or at least public pressure, that conservatives are behind him right now. He has Donald Trump's endorsement. There are a lot of people, Republicans in the base, who love him and who have been calling Republicans' phones over the weekend and last week, saying that they want their lawmaker to support him. And so the Jordan camp's belief, from what I'm hearing from them, is that these opponents will actually cave when the bright lights are on them and they have to call out a name for speaker and that they will vote, vote for Jordan. All right, interesting. Contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade. Rachel, thank you. Coming up, Israeli forces are massing on the border with Gaza ahead of a potential major ground assault. The latest on the humanitarian crisis inside Gaza after this. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from the border of Texas and Mexico, I'm Mireya Villargal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo in New York, joined by James Longman in Tel Aviv. And Israel has been launching strikes for over a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Now, the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced, as Israeli forces say they're preparing for a major ground assault. And again, foreign correspondent James Longman is in Tel Aviv, joining me now throughout the day. James? Yeah, thank you, Diane. We're going to take you inside Gaza now. Uh, Tala Hetzala is a 21-year-old student at the Islamic University in Gaza. She's been in touch with us throughout the ongoing airstrikes that have been hitting Gaza, uh, and we're fortunate enough to be able to speak to Tala. Tala, you're now in Gaza. Please just tell us, what are you seeing? What are you feeling? Uh, what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling can be described in words. Uh, we are like every night uh, saying that this night will be the last night for us. Uh, we don't guarantee safety in any place. Every and each place in Gaza is targeted by the Israeli airstrikes. Uh, they are targeting children, they are targeting women. Uh, we're now talking about more than uh, 2,800 killed people. We're talking about more uh, than one, uh, more and more people ki are killed who, and they are under the rubble and no one can get to them because the ambulance does can, can uh, get to these people because the bombing uh, in the streets, uh, 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 everywhere actually. Um, every now and, and then we hear a bomb and we don't know where it is because of the lack of the uh, media coverage we have nowadays. Uh, 
there is no good internet connection. Uh, most of the houses are now uh, without water, but, uh, 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 without electricity. All of the houses are without electricity, without water, and we are suffering from food supplies, from water, from uh, from everything, from gas, from everything, from fuel. Uh, we have nothing, and I I said, and I'm. I'm repeating it that we will not die because of the uh, bombs we will die we will die because of the lack of everything around us Tala you've been trying to leave Gaza City uh, we saw that the Israelis dropped leaflets telling people to try to get south did you see those leaflets um, what has it been trying to move I think uh, the I connection to Tala is well, but you said very you said about the uh, Tala, if you can hear me, I'm just asking. We understand that you have tried to move. You're, I don't know where you are currently, but you've tried to move south. Have you been successful? What's it like for people trying to go south, as the Israelis have asked them to do? Um, I think you're totally asking about the evacuating from place to another. I'm asking you if, uh, if you've been able to try to me? move south. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay. I, I mean, you can uh, you yes, can understand yes, yes, uh, yes. The, the situation. In, you can hear me. Okay. Okay. We're going to try this again. You've been. Where, where are you now? And have you been trying to move south? What is it yes. like trying to go south in Gaza? Let me tell you that uh, before one day we we like followed the orders that they told us to do, and we moved to the south. Uh, the journey was very hard. We like walked for more than one and a half hour because we don't have car, a car, and no one. Uh, who have cars are able to get you and take you to the south because all cars are full with people. Uh, now the problem was while we were walking, they actually bombed the street that is full, literally full of people. Um, people, these people are were following the orders that they give to us. They uh, there were in the street. Uh, they bombed us, and uh, this bomb caused like uh, more, uh, 70 people who are killed, and more than 200 injured people. Um, so, although they bombed us, uh, we continued our journey, and we reached to an Osirat camp, the place where they claim to be safe, again, they claim to be safe, because uh, they are literally uh, bombing everywhere in Gaza, whether south, whether east, whether north, west, every single point in Gaza is being bombed. So uh, after one night there, uh, they, they, uh, we actually, they bombed them. Uh, so we decided to move and to return to Tal El Hawa, uh, my, my, my place, my, my my house, because uh, there's nothing can be guaranteed in any place. Uh, there's no safety in anywhere. Uh, they are bombing every place. So why to just flee and leave your house? Uh, that's why we decided to return to to Tal El Hawa, to our house, and not follow their instructions because they themselves are not following their their words. Uh, they're bombing everywhere. They're bombing the north everywhere. Uh, that's why we returned to uh, our house. And can I ask, we've heard reports that Hamas has asked people to stay where they are or is stopping people from going south. Is that your experience? No, no. No, no, Hamas uh, did not, uh, like, didn't say anything to anyone uh, in Gaza. Uh, I myself uh, didn't encounter anything of Hamas's men. Um, they allow everyone to go wherever they want. Uh, if you find safety in any place, then go. But as I tell, as I tell you, there is no safety in anywhere. Uh, Hamas uh, is allowing everyone to go everywhere or anywhere. Uh, so th we don't have any restrictions about where to go or when to go uh, if it's in the side of Hamas. So you have you have decided to stay where you are in Gaza City. 
dis uh, and because you don't feel safe anywhere in Gaza, but Israeli bombs are falling, but they may be followed by an Israeli ground invasion. There might be Israeli soldiers on the streets where you are now. How do you feel about yes, that possibility? But, uh, uh, nothing. Um, let me tell you, bombs are the same as if they are make, if they are going to do invasions. Uh, the result is one: you are going to be killed. You are going to be you are going to die. Uh, simply speaking. So, if the result is one, why to fear from anything else? Um, it's just uh, another way to kill us. That, that that's literally the simplest words to say. It's, it's it's really another way they are trying to kill. Palestinians with. So, um, yeah, we are fearing that. Yeah, we are scared of this. Uh, but nothing to do. Uh, there, are, there are cultures in both ways. Doesn't do this. Well, I hope hopefully this connection can stay. I, um, thank you so much for staying with us. I, I can appreciate it's an incredibly dangerous and difficult situation for you. We've been reporting here today that the uh, border crossing in the south, Rafa, the border crossing between G uh, Gaza and Egypt, may be opened at some point. If sometime in the future there's a possibility for you to seek refuge in Egypt, is that something that you and your family would want to do? No, no, absolutely no. Uh, we won't leave our our land. We won't leave our houses. It's not something that is a choice. Let me say, uh, it's our land. We are Palestinians, born born in Palestinians in Palestine. Our ancestors are Palestine, so we won't leave our land, even if we had the chance, even if we had the options option to leave our land and to go to another. Let me. They say we, to be a refugee is not something good. It's not something like make that makes you feel good. So why to do this? Uh, I hope we've still got you, Tala. But um, I think the connection is is very weak. To, to let people. Yeah. Oh. Tala. We're going to let you go you for the moment, me but please, please try and stay in touch with us. Yeah, we can, we can hear you now, but it's coming in and out. Look, I, I, all I can say is we, we really do hope that you can stay as safe as possible. Uh, thank you for speaking to, uh, to us. Uh, but for the moment, Diane, back to you. Yeah, thank you, James. And our big thanks to Tala for, for keeping in touch with us throughout this entire story. Tala, thank you and stay safe. And thank you at home for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live, Israel at war with Hamas. Live pictures for you out of Tel Aviv as the IDF announces it killed the head of Hamas's intelligence, a rocket strike in Israel preparing for a ground invasion inside Gaza now. Oh, running, I'm straight. All right, and James uh, Longman will be joining us there momentarily from Tel Aviv. The air sirens just going off. We will bring him back as soon as it's safe. Meanwhile, Israel has been launching strikes for more than a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people earlier. Sirens sounding in Jerusalem. We're telling you about right now in Tel Aviv. We just heard them. Israeli lawmakers actually met in the Knesset before the Knesset even stopped its session today. Prime Minister Netanyahu rather speaking and saying that there will be a thorough investigation into the Hamas attacks and warning that Iran and Hezbollah well they will pay the heavy price if they continue to test Israel the Palestinian Ministry of Health says that more than 2,700 people now have been killed in the Israeli strikes while the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces prepare for a major ground assault Egypt also blaming Israel for not allowing the only border border crossing out of Gaza and into Egypt to open from the Palestinian side. Now we want to head over to the head of, uh, or just to the north of Israel rather, to Lebanon, where there are fears now that the war could spread beyond Israel's borders. I want to bring in our Mola Lange from Beirut. Mola, uh, Israel has been exchanging fire with Hezbollah. There have been evacuations throughout that region. You've been reporting on all of that. Just tell us where things stand right now and, and how how worried, you know, should we all be right now about this ex escalation in the north? Well, yeah, Kira, escalation would be uh, would be beyond that, especially when you consider the the potential domino effect throughout the region, the the countries throughout the region, and perhaps even throughout the world that may get dragged into uh, a broader conflict. And 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 while the the threat is real, it is very real. Uh, there, and while there has been, you know, certainly a lot of tough talk. Uh, uh, from all the players involved, you know, Hezbollah, uh, Israel, the United States, Iran, a lot of tough talk that, that should be uh, taken seriously. One also gets the sense that, that no one actually wants to see an escalation of war, that it would be in no one's best interest for uh, a broader conflict uh, to break out. And, and that is what makes, you know, this, the, these skirmishes that we're seeing along the border uh, so significant and so dangerous. It is the potential for escalation, and it really only takes one misstep, one miscalculation, uh, one wrong move uh, for the two sides to, to really stumble into uh, a broader conflict. Those skirmishes continuing again today, uh, seeing uh, clashes from both sides, uh, Hezbollah and Israel, uh, both continuing uh, to shell each other today, but a much quieter day than we saw this weekend that saw pretty intense uh, flare-ups, especially yesterday. Uh, Hezbollah uh, saying that they uh, took out with some snipers, took out uh, Israeli uh, surveillance cameras along the border, uh, Israeli fighter jets taking out some military infrastructure. Uh, so we certainly saw some intense fighting today. Calmer today, uh, certainly good news for folks living along the border, but a lot of those towns, as you mentioned, a lot of folks uh, living in northern Israel and southern Lebanon in those border towns uh, already getting out of town, fleeing their homes, trying to find someplace safer. So let's talk about the time you have been spending along the Lebanese-Israeli border in a little more detail here. What are you hearing from people there on the ground? I know you've been talking with military, uh, but what about just, you know, every day, what it's been like for people as they are getting the news, uh, you know, in bits and pieces? 
Yeah, we visited a small town in southern Lebanon just yesterday. Uh, a town close enough to, you know, you could see uh, the Israeli border from, from people's front doorsteps. Uh, you could hear occasional uh, missile fire in the distance, uh, especially yesterday, as we mentioned, since there was that pretty intense uh, flare-up. And we spoke with people who were essentially living uh, on the front lines, families who have uh, been there for, for, for generations, and they all fear escalation. You know, they unfortunately, a lot of these folks have been living there, as I mentioned, for generations, so they, they have seen warfare on their front doorsteps, and they've been seeing it on and off uh, for decades. So the, the, the threat of war is constantly, uh, constantly there. Uh, one gentleman we spoke to told me that he is you know, far too used to this, that they have been seeing it, as I mentioned, for years, and still they want no part of it. That uh, sort of elderly gentleman we spoke to, he's kind of a, a village elder, if you will, uh, lives there with his family, uh, lives uh, it, you know, just within uh, a you know, viewing distance of the Israeli border. As I mentioned, you can see it from his front doorstep. Uh, they farm, his family farms uh, olives and, and bananas, and they just want to get back to uh, doing that, doing that with their lives. But they have to do that with the threat of, of this escalation uh, looming over them. Uh, and, you know, his story was one of many, just average people who were caught in the crossfire, Kira. Those are the stories that we need to hear and we want to hear. It humanizes everything that's going on across the region right now. Mola, thank you so much. And as we told you just at the beginning uh, of the newscast, uh, I was supposed to take you right to James Longman there in Tel Aviv. Uh, the sirens went off. Uh, he immediately had to, to step into the shelter, but he is back with us. James, tell us what happened. Yeah, Kira, look, these sirens are actually getting more and more frequent here in Tel Aviv. They don't often sound. This is a city which is far enough away from Gaza to be out of the reach, usually from Hamas rockets, but that has not been the case this week. So more and more often now we have had to get into the shelters. And I should say this is, you know, not like in Ukraine. I spent a lot of time in Ukraine the last year or so, and we hear... Uh, ra you know, raid alarms quite often, missile alarms quite often, and a lot of regular Ukrainians, if you're out on the street, they've gotten so used to the sounds of those alarms that often they don't do anything because often the risk uh, of, of one of these missiles landing uh, isn't uh, as immediate. But here it really is. And when, a, when an alarm goes, everyone goes inside. Israelis do not mess about. So we have to immediately get off this balcony. We go to a shelter. There's one uh, on this floor. And every building here is equipped with either a shelter, which is reinforced on, on, on the floor they're on, or they go down into the basements, or they go into the stairwells. And so this is just a constant risk now uh, from uh, Gaza. The Israelis will say that is part of the reason why they've got to go in to Gaza in this ground incursion, which we're all waiting to see uh, whether that happens, and specifically into the north of Gaza, because they say that's where most of Hamas's infrastructure is, that's where their ability is to fire these rockets, that's where it comes from. And so, uh, clearly, Hamas remains operative inside Gaza, clearly they remain a threat firing these rockets, and that is clearly the reason why the IDF wants to go in. The great test will be whether or not they manage to remove Hamas, as they say they want to, and whether they're able to remove this threat of uh, rocket attacks that currently this entire country uh, worries about. Kira. And James, let's just talk about how this ground invasion could unfold. Uh, you and I have been talking to Mick Mulroy, our national security um, expert, uh, former um, um, part of the Department of Defense, uh, particularly focused on the Middle East. And he's saying here that um, with regard to the ground invasion, it may likely start in the north with elements of the IDF coming in via ground, sea, and air, and that the IDF may attempt to envelop Hamas and attack from unpredictable directions using speed and surprise to create a tactical dilemma. Is that what you're hearing? Is that what you're expecting? I know that you've got a number of sources there as, you know, we thought something was going to happen over the weekend. And um, clearly there was some pretty bad weather that hit the region as well. What do you know? Well, that's the hope, Kira, certainly. You know, our teams have actually been speaking to soldiers down on the front line, which is turning into a front line. Those kibbutzim, by the way, the kibbutz that were attacked, uh, were killing fields, those execution chambers, essentially those shelters where people were killed. 
have now become the front line of, of Israel's war into Gaza. They're waiting to go in. Uh, and there, remember, there are a lot of reservists. There, there's an IDF, a standing army, which is all professionals, but tens of thousands of people have come, they've called, they've answered the call to war, have come out of kind of civilian life to go into Gaza. And our, co our colleague, Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel, was speaking to some of them about just what they worry about when they go in. Can they really know what they're going to face? Because Hamas, uh, you know, took the world by surprise with this offensive. Do we really know what their defensive capabilities are? One imagines they'll have booby-trapped entire buildings. One imagines they will be operating in the network of tunnels that we know that they use. How much does Israel know about all those tunnels and the, the network that Hamas uh, operates in? How much does uh, uh, Israel know about the firepower that Hamas has at its disposal? And I think every single one of those uh, IDF, uh, either reservists or members of the standing army, will be thinking about the hostages. Are they able to locate them? Are they going to be able to extract them? We know that there have been small raids that have been carried out in Gaza so far. One imagines that's for reconnaissance, to check out the land, check out the terrain before people move in properly. But we're in for a very, very long campaign, I think, here, Kira. I think, I think you are right. James, will be... Uh anchoring this uh, show for the next couple of hours. Uh, depending on what happens with the sirens, we'll be in touch uh, again shortly. We're also following news out of federal court here in Washington, D.C. The judge overseeing former President Trump's federal election uh, interference case uh, partially granted the government's request for a gag order, actually restricting the former president from making disparaging statements uh, relating to this case. Our senior reporter, uh, Catherine Falders was inside the courtroom, joins us now with more. So, Catherine, just kind of break down what we know at this hour. The most restrictions uh, that President Trump has had on his speech to date. You've heard him on the campaign trail, on the stump, his stump speech. He often refers to special counsel Jack Smith as deranged. He's called his staff thugs, for example. Those words were heavily used in this courtroom today with this order that this judge ultimately imposed. She said that the former president, that Trump cannot use those words as it relates to the special counsel, as it relates to to his staff. He can't disparage witnesses, for example. He's allowed to broadly attack the government. He can say he believes that the investigation, for example, is politically motivated, uh, but he also can't speak about former Vice President Mike Pence's role in January 6th, for example. And you know when Trump uh, attacks Pence, that is mostly what he focuses on. So it, it really was a stunning ruling from the judge, given that the government, of course, had asked for this limited gag order. She believes, and she said that this is more limited, given that he can still attack the Biden administration if he so wishes. He can say it's politically motivated. But the big question now becomes, what happens if he violates this? His top attorney, John Loro, said in the courtroom today that whatever order was issued, that the Trump legal team would likely uh, appeal it, for example. They haven't issued an appeal yet. But when do they do that? How fast does this get appealed? Does he violate it? And if he does violate it, what are the sanctions that the judge said she would impose? There's lots of questions here. Uh, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from Trump's team on this order here today, Kira. All right. So, you know, in light of all this gag order uh, discussion, Trump and his lawyers, are they responding in any way? Well, look, I think they haven't said anything yet. His lawyers are still inside uh, this courthouse uh, behind me. They said during oral arguments that they intended to appeal any order. I asked his top uh, lawyer who was arguing John Laura this after she issued the order. I said, do you intend uh, to appeal this? He wouldn't say it outside of the courtroom, but said that what he said inside the courtroom still stands. He stands by those comments. So that likely signals an appeal, something we're likely to see, I'm sure, from Trump's team, whether it's in the coming hours or the coming days. All right, and then what's next, Catherine? Look, I think we need to see the actual physical paper order from uh, the judge and go through that. She said from the bench what she intends to do, so she still needs to issue that paper order. What's next, we'll probably see appeals, for example, what that appeal specifically looks like. We don't know yet, so we'll be looking for what the Trump team says on his language as it relates to the special counsel, as it relates to witnesses. So those are the next steps, at least at this point in this case. All right, Catherine, thanks so much. Also here at home, Jim Jordan going for the gavel, uh, even saying that he will force a vote by tomorrow if he has to. We are live on the Hill as we follow the uphill battle to elect a House speaker.
whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us here in Washington. Congress still is in complete disarray as the House spends yet another day without a speaker. Republicans still coalescing behind Ohio Representative Jim Jordan after he won a vote among Republicans behind closed doors last week. But does Jordan even have enough support to win a full vote tomorrow? Our contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade is on Capitol Hill. So Rachel, what do you think? How's it looking for Jordan? Kira, the opposition to Jim Jordan, it's already starting to crumble, and we're still a full day out from this vote. He picked up three major endorsements this morning. The first one from Congresswoman Ann Wagner. This is an ally of Steve Scalise's who said that Jordan basically sabotaged her friend when he tried to get the gavel. She was asked last week if she would support Jim Jordan. Her response was, quote, H-E double hockey sticks, no, uh, except she said the real word, not uh, <laughs> what I said just there. Uh, she, he's also getting the backing from Mike Rogers, who who is the House Armed Services House Armed Services Committee chairman and another top defense hawk uh, who also had come out and said that he would not support Jordan. This is three huge gets for Jordan. And you might look back to last week. Yes, there were 55 House Republicans who, even after he won the nomination, said they would not back him on the floor. Sure, this is only three lawmakers. Uh, he has a lot more to go. But the thing to keep in mind about these people is these were some of the most vocal members of the House who were coming out against Jordan. So if they're coming out now and saying they'll back Jordan, it certainly shows that he has momentum on his side. And again, a full day of phone calls and whipping that he can do before this vote comes to the floor. So let, let's talk about what Jordan really has to do, though, to shore up, you know, enough support among skeptical members. He was even caught up in, in the hallway, I, I saw, and he said no matter what, he's going to force a vote uh, definitely by tomorrow. But he has a lot of work to do to convince folks to flip. He does. And it looks like, you know, we've we've seen these lawmakers come out and say why they're changing their vote and they're now going to support Jordan. They mentioned things like increased defense money. Jordan had not actually answered a question by Republicans when they met privately last week about whether he would support more money for the Pentagon. That seems to be something they talked about. They all talked about uh, keeping the government open. Jordan in the past has cheerleaded uh, government shutdowns, trying to use them to win concessions from Democrats. Uh, he basically has been talking to Republicans who don't like shutdowns about this and, and saying he will go uh, do a different tact here. But I think beyond 
policy concessions, it's important to keep in mind about the political pressure uh, Jordan is and his allies are putting on these members. The difference between Jordan and Steve Scalise and even Kevin McCarthy before him is that he is loved by the base. He is the conservative darling of the far right, the founder of the Freedom Caucus. He has Donald Trump's endorsement. And a lot of Republicans right now are calling Republican offices and saying you need to back Jim Jordan for speaker. So, you know, there's this belief in the Jordan camp that this public pressure is actually going to help move votes. Even Sean Hannity uh, from Fox News has been reaching out to Republican lawmakers that he thinks might not vote for Jordan, saying, why aren't you with him? So there's a pressure campaign here that I think is going to move people more than anything Jordan could possibly give folks. Well, if Congressman Jordan does not appear to have enough support, will the House bring the floor to the vote tomorrow anyway, you think? Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. I mean, he just told reporters that here in the hallway a couple of hours ago. And it's really interesting because just a couple of days ago, Jordan was backing this change to House rules saying that you shouldn't go to the floor for a full vote on speaker until you have at least 217 votes uh, to actually get the gavel. Now, he's singing a different tune now that he is the nominee. He's saying they're going to go to the floor regardless. And the theory, again, from his camp, is that when lawmakers are put on record in public, Public in the spotlight um, that they will call out Jordan's name for speaker because they'll be too afraid to, to support anyone else. All right, so where does the Senate stand on all of this? I mean, what can they realistically do without a functioning House, right? A whole bunch of nothing, Kira. You're absolutely right. I mean, the House has been paralyzed for, what, two weeks now? Uh, if Jordan doesn't get this, uh, it could be going into a, a third week, potentially. And this comes as the Senate is going to be starting to debate and potentially vote on a package of aid for Israel, since the Middle East uh, is in total turmoil right now. The government runs out of money in a couple of weeks as well. And the House, they can't do anything. And this, again, I think is going to help Jordan in his pitch this week. I mean, there's a lot of lawmakers and I'm hearing from them myself, even people who don't like Jordan are concerned about the gridlock here in the House and the fact that they are doing nothing, that they could potentially lose the majority in 2024. And this all helps Jordan. Uh, it gives him the benefit of saying, look, we got to stop messing around and get our stuff together and actually legislate for the American people. It helps him. All right, Rachel Bade, we'll keep following uh, every move there, clearly from the Hill. Just monitoring the vote and support if indeed it comes through for Jim Jordan. Also coming up, game on. Five new sports added to the Summer Olympics. We will tell you which ones right after a quick break. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. customized to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. 
Reporting from the front lines of the war in Israel, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Other headlines that we're tracking this hour. Pharmacy chain Rite Aid says it's filed for bankruptcy protection. That brand facing falling sales, big debt, and lawsuits related to the opioid crisis. Rite Aid settled up to $30 million in those suits that allege their pharmacies oversupplied prescription opioids. Well, she became a household name, starring as the effervescent Chrissy Snow in the sitcom Three's Company, later talking thousands of women and some men into buying her signature exercise apparatus, the Thighmaster, so we could all try to look as amazing as she did for seven decades. Suzanne Summers passing away Sunday after her battle with breast cancer. The TV icon had returned to the screen in the 90s for the series Step by Step, even performing in Vegas with her cabaret show, Suzanne Sizzles. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2000, announced in July that it had returned. She died just one day before her 77th birthday. Five sports added to the 2028 Los Angeles Games. The International Olympic Committee announcing that cricket, baseball, softball, and lacrosse will all return, while flag football and squash are making their Olympic debut. 2028 Games will be LA's third time hosting, becoming the third three-time host city after London and Paris. Another live look inside Gaza where thousands of people are already gathered at the southern border near the Rafah crossing, desperately trying to get into Egypt before Israel begins its ground invasion there. Our foreign correspondent James Long also co-anchoring with me from Tel Aviv. James, the war, it's constantly changing, as we know. It's even changing whether you can join us live or not due to the sirens we keep hearing there where you are and across the region. So what are you hearing? What's the latest on this ground evasion, invasion rather, as of right now? Well, yeah, the sirens do keep going off, and actually we had to shelter in place. We know that the press corps following Secretary of State Blinken, who's back here in Israel, currently meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet, they had to shelter in place as well. Uh, so the uncertainty here in Tel Aviv continues, but we are all waiting to see when this ground invasion might begin. And meantime, people inside Gaza desperate for help, desperate for that humanitarian aid. A lot of questions about when. I think it's a question of when that border crossing with Egypt might open for at least a little while to get some of this badly needed humanitarian aid in and possibly some foreign nationals out of Gaza. But I think we're, we're all waiting to see when that might happen. I don't think it can happen soon enough, if I'm honest, Kira. All right. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context and analysis. And as you know, the news never stops. Neither does the coverage there from Israel. James and I will be right back. More news right after this. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live, Israel at war with Hamas. Live pictures for you out of Tel Aviv as the IDF announces it killed the head of Hamas's intelligence, a rocket strike in Israel preparing for a ground invasion inside Gaza now. Israel has been launching strikes for more than a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people earlier. Sirens sounding in Jerusalem, we're telling you about right now in Tel Aviv, we just heard them. Israeli lawmakers actually met in the Knesset before the Knesset even stopped its session today. Prime Minister Netanyahu rather, speaking and saying that there will be a thorough investigation into the Hamas attacks and warning that Iran and Hezbollah, well, well, they will pay the heavy price if they continue to test Israel. The Palestinian Ministry of Health says that more than 2,700 people now have been killed in the Israeli strikes, while the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces prepare for a major ground assault. Egypt also blaming Israel for not allowing the only border crossing out of Gaza and into Egypt to open from the Palestinian side. Now we want to head over to the head of, uh, or just to the north North of Israel, rather, to Lebanon, where there are fears now that the war could spread beyond Israel's borders. I want to bring in our Mola Lange from Beirut. Mola, uh, Israel has been exchanging fire with Hezbollah. There have been evacuations throughout that region. You've been reporting on all of that. Just tell us where things stand right now and, and how worried, you know, should we all be right now about this ex escalation in the north? Oh yeah, Kira, escalation would be uh, would be beyond that, especially when you consider the, the potential domino effect throughout the region, the, the countries throughout the region, and perhaps even throughout the world that may get dragged into uh, a broader conflict. And, and, and while the, the threat is real, it is very real, uh, there, and while there has been you know, certainly a lot of tough talk uh, uh, from all the players involved, you know, Hezbollah, uh, Israel, the United States, Iran, uh, a lot of tough talk that, that should be uh, taken seriously. One also gets the sense that, that no one actually wants to see an escalation of war, that it would be in no one's best interest for uh, a broader conflict uh, to break out. And, and that is what makes, you know, this, the, these skirmishes that we're seeing along the border uh, so significant and so dangerous. It is the potential for escalation, and it really only takes one misstep, one miscalculation, uh, one wrong move uh, for the two sides to, to really stumble into uh, a broader conflict. Those skirmishes continuing again today, uh, seeing uh, clashes from both sides, uh, Hezbollah and Israel, uh, both continuing uh, to shell each other today, but a much quieter day than we saw this weekend that saw pretty intense uh, flare-ups, especially yesterday. Uh, Hezbollah uh, saying that they uh, took out with some snipers, took out uh, Israeli uh, surveillance cameras along the border, uh, Israeli fighter jets taking out some military infrastructure. Uh, so we certainly saw some intense fighting today. Calmer today, uh, certainly good news for folks living along the border, but a lot of those towns, as you mentioned, a lot of folks uh, living in northern Israel and southern Lebanon in those border towns uh, already getting out of town, fleeing their homes, trying to find someplace safer. 
So let's talk about the time you have been spending along the Lebanese-Israeli border in a little more detail here. What are you hearing from people there on the ground? I know you've been talking with military, uh, but what about just, you know, every day, what it's been like for people as they are getting the news, uh, you know, in bits and pieces? Yeah, we visited a small town in southern Lebanon just yesterday, uh, a town close enough to, you know, you could see uh, the Israeli border from, from people's front doorsteps. Uh, you could hear regional uh, missile fire in the distance, uh, especially yesterday, as we mentioned, since there was that pretty intense uh, flare-up. And we spoke with people who were essentially living uh, on the front lines, families who have uh, been there for, for, for generations, and they all fear escalation. You know, they unfortunately, a lot of these folks have been living there, as I mentioned, for generations, so they they have seen warfare on their front doorsteps, and they've been seeing it on and off uh, for decades. So the, the, the threat of war is constantly, uh, constantly there. Uh, one gentleman we spoke to told me that he is you know, far too used to this, that they have been seeing it, as I mentioned, for years, and still they want no part of it. That uh, sort of elderly gentleman we spoke to, he's kind of a, a village elder, if you will, uh, lives there with his family, uh, lives uh, it, you know, just within uh, a you know, viewing distance of the Israeli border. As I mentioned, you can see it from his front doorstep. Uh, they farm, his family farms uh, olives and, and bananas, and they just want to get back to uh, doing that, doing that with their lives. But they have to do that with the threat of, of this escalation uh, looming over them. Uh, and, you know, his story was one of many, just average people who were caught in the crossfire, Kira. Those are the stories that we need to hear and we want to hear. It humanizes everything that's going on across the region right now. Mola, thank you so much. Just at the beginning uh, of the newscast, uh, I was supposed to take you right to James Longman there in Tel Aviv. Uh, the sirens went off. Uh, he immediately had to, to step into the shelter, but he is back with us. James, tell us what happened. Yeah, Kira, look, these sirens are actually getting more and more frequent here in Tel Aviv. They don't often sound. This is a city which is far enough away from Gaza to be out of the reach, usually from Hamas rockets, but that has not been the case this week. So more and more often now we have had to get into the shelters. And I should say this is, you know, not like in Ukraine. I spent a lot of time in Ukraine the last year or so, and we hear... Uh, ra you know, raid alarms quite often, missile alarms quite often, and a lot of regular Ukrainians, if you're out on the street, they've gotten so used to the sounds of those alarms that often they don't do anything because often the risk uh, of, of one of these missiles landing uh, isn't uh, as immediate. But here, it really is. And when, a, when an alarm goes, everyone goes inside. Israelis do not mess about, so we have to immediately get off this balcony. We go to a shelter, there's one uh, on this floor, and every building here is equipped with either a shelter which is reinforced on, on, on the floor they're on, or they go down into the basements, or they go into the stairwells. And so this is just a constant risk now uh, from uh, Gaza. The Israelis will say that is part of the reason why they've got to go in to Gaza in this ground incursion, which we're all waiting to see uh, whether that happens, and specifically into the north of Gaza, because they say that's where most of Hamas's infrastructure is, that's where their ability is to fire these rockets, that's where it comes from. And so, uh, clearly, Hamas remains operative inside Gaza, clearly they remain a threat firing these rockets, and that is clearly the reason why the IDF wants to go in. The great test will be whether or not they manage to remove Hamas, as they say they want to, and whether they're able to remove this threat of uh, rocket attacks that currently this entire country uh, worries about. Kira. And James, let's just talk about how this ground invasion could unfold. Uh, you and I have been talking to Mick Mulroy, our national security um, expert, uh, former um, um, part of the Department of Defense, uh, particularly focused on the Middle East. And he's saying here that um, with regard to the ground invasion, it may likely start in the north with elements of the IDF coming in via ground, sea, and air, and that the IDF may attempt to envelop Hamas an attack from unpredictable directions using speed and surprise to create a tactical dilemma. Is that what you're hearing? Is that what you're expecting? I know that you've got a number of sources there as, you know, we thought something was going to happen over the weekend. And um, clearly there was some pretty bad weather that hit the region as well. What do you know? Well, that's the hope, Kira, certainly. You know, our teams have actually been speaking to soldiers down on the front line, which is turning into a front line. Those kibbutzim, by the way, the kibbutz that were attacked 
uh, were killing fields, those execution chambers, essentially those shelters where people were killed, have now become the front line of, of Israel's war into Gaza. They're waiting to go in. Uh, and there, remember, there are a lot of reservists. There, there's an IDF, a standing army, which is all professionals, but tens of thousands of people have come, they've called, they've answered the call to war, have come out of kind of civilian life to go into Gaza. And our, co our colleague, Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell, was speaking to some of them about just what they worry about when they go in. Can they really know what they're going to face? Because Hamas, uh, you know, took the world by surprise with this offensive. Do we really know what their defensive capabilities are? One imagines they'll have booby-trapped entire buildings. One imagines they will be operating in the network of tunnels that we know that they use. How much does Israel know about all those tunnels and the, the network that Hamas uh, operates in? How much does uh, uh, Israel know about the firepower that Hamas has at its disposal? And I think every single one of those uh, IDF, uh, either reservists or members of the standing army, will be thinking about the hostages. Are they able to to locate them? Are they going to be able to extract them? We know that there have been small raids that have been carried out in Gaza so far. One imagines that's for reconnaissance, to check out the land, check out the terrain before people move in properly. But we're in for a very, very long campaign, I think, here, Kira. I think, I think you are right. James will be uh, anchoring this uh, show for the next couple of hours. Uh, depending on what happens with the sirens, we'll be in touch uh, again shortly. We're also following news out of federal court here in Washington, D.C. The judge overseeing former President Trump's federal election uh, interference case uh, partially granted the government's request for a gag order, actually restricting the former president from making disparaging statements uh, relating to this case. Our senior reporter, uh, Catherine Falders, was inside the courtroom, joins us now with more. So, Catherine, just kind of break down what we know at this hour. Yeah, Kara, it's a stunning moment because this order that the judge imposed is the most restrictions uh, that President Trump has had on his speech to date. You've heard him on the campaign trail, on the stump, his stump speech. He often refers to special counsel Jack Smith as deranged. He's called his staff thugs, for example. Those words were heavily used in this courtroom today with this order that this judge ultimately imposed. She said that the former president, that Trump cannot use those words as it relates to the special counsel, as it relates to his staff. He can't decide disparage witnesses, for example. He's allowed to broadly attack the government. He can say he believes that the investigation, for example, is politically motivated, uh, but he also can't speak about former Vice President Mike Pence's role in January 6th, for example. And you know when Trump uh, attacks Pence, that is mostly what he focuses on. So it, it really was a stunning ruling from the judge, given that the government, of course, had asked for this limited gag order, she believes, and she said that this is more limited given that he can still attack the Biden administration if he so wishes. He can say it's politically motivated. But the big question now becomes, what happens if he violates this? His top attorney, John Loro, said in the courtroom today that whatever order was issued, that the Trump legal team would likely uh, appeal it, for example. They haven't issued an appeal yet. But when do they do that? How fast does this get appealed? Does he violate it? And if he does violate it, what are the sanctions that the judge said she would impose? There's lots of questions here, uh, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from Trump's team on this order here today, Kira. All right, so, you know, in light of all this gag order uh, discussion, Trump and his lawyers, are they responding in any way? Well, look, I think they haven't said anything yet. His lawyers are still inside uh, this courthouse uh, behind me. They said during oral arguments that they intended to appeal any order. I asked his top uh, lawyer who was arguing, John Laura, this after she issued the order. I said, do you intend uh, to appeal this? He wouldn't say it outside of the courtroom, but said that what he said inside the courtroom still stands. He stands by those comments. So that likely signals an appeal, something we're likely to see, I'm sure, from Trump's team, whether it's in the coming hours or the coming days. All right, and then what's next, Catherine? Look, I think we need to see the actual physical paper order from uh, the judge and go through that. She said from the bench what she intends to do, so she still needs to issue that paper order. What's next, we'll probably see appeals, for example, what that appeal specifically looks like. We don't know yet, so we'll be looking for what the Trump team says on his language as it relates to the special counsel, as it relates to witnesses. So those are the next steps, at least at this point in this case. 
All right, Catherine, thanks so much. Also here at home, Jim Jordan going for the gavel, uh, even saying that he will force a vote by tomorrow if he has to. We are live on the Hill as we follow the uphill battle to elect a House Speaker. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us here in Washington. Congress still is in complete disarray as the House spends yet another day without a speaker. Republicans still coalescing behind Ohio Representative Jim Jordan after he won a vote among Republicans behind closed doors last week. But does Jordan even have enough support to win a full vote tomorrow? Our contributing political correspondent, Rachel Bade, is on Capitol Hill. So, Rachel, what do you think? How's it looking for Jordan? Kira, the opposition to Jim Jordan, it's already starting to crumble, and we're still a full day out from this vote. He picked up three major endorsements this morning. The first one from Congresswoman Ann Wagner. This is an ally of Steve Scalise's who said that Jordan basically sabotaged her friend when he tried to get the gavel. She was asked last week if she would support Jim Jordan. Her response was, quote, H-E double hockey sticks, no, uh, except she said the real word, not uh, <laughs> what I said just there. Uh, she, he's also getting the backing from Mike Rogers, who who is the House Armed Services House Armed Services Committee chairman and another top defense hawk uh, who also had come out and said that he would not support Jordan. This is three huge gets for Jordan. And you might look back to last week. Yes, there were 55 House Republicans who, even after he won the nomination, said they would not back him on the floor. Sure, this is only three lawmakers. Uh, he has a lot more to go. But the thing to keep in mind about these people is these were some of the most vocal members of the House who were coming out against Jordan. So if they're coming out now and saying they'll back Jordan, it certainly shows that he has momentum on his side. And again, a full day of phone calls and whipping that he can do before this vote comes to the floor. So let, let's talk about what Jordan really has to do, though, to shore up, you know, enough support among skeptical members. He was even caught up in, in the hallway, I, I saw, and he said no matter what, he's going to force a vote uh, definitely by tomorrow. But he has a lot of work to do to convince folks to flip. 
He does, and it looks like, you know, we've, we've seen these lawmakers come out and say why they're changing their vote and they're now gonna support Jordan. They mentioned things like increased defense money. Jordan had not actually answered a question by Republicans when they met privately last week about whether he would support more money for the Pentagon. That seems to be something they talked about. They all talked about uh, keeping the government open. Jordan in the past has cheerleaded uh, government shutdowns, trying to use them to win concessions from Democrats. Uh, he basically has been talking to Republicans who don't like shutdowns about this and, and saying he will go uh, do a different tact here. But I think beyond policy concessions, it's important to keep in mind about the political pressure uh, Jordan is and his allies are putting on these members. The difference between Jordan and Steve Scalise and even Kevin McCarthy before him is that he is loved by the base. He is the conservative darling of the far right, the founder of the Freedom Caucus. He has Donald Trump's endorsement. And a lot of Republicans right now are calling Republican offices and saying you need to back Jim Jordan for speaker. So, you know, there's this belief in the Jordan camp that this public pressure is actually going to help move votes. Even Sean Hannity uh, from Fox News has been reaching out to Republican lawmakers that he thinks might not vote for Jordan, saying, why aren't you with him? So there's a pressure campaign here that I think is going to move people more than anything Jordan could possibly give folks. Well, if Congressman Jordan does not appear to have enough support, will the House bring the floor to the vote tomorrow anyway, you think? Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. I mean, he just told reporters that here in the hallway a couple of hours ago. And it's really interesting because just a couple of days ago, Jordan was backing this change to House rules saying that you shouldn't go to the floor for a full vote on speaker until you have at least 217 votes uh, to actually get the gavel. Now, he's singing a different tune now that he is the nominee. He's saying they're going to go to the floor regardless. And the theory, again, from his camp, is that when lawmakers are put on record in public, in the spotlight um, that they will call out Jordan's name for speaker because they'll be too afraid to, to support anyone else. All right, so where does the Senate stand on all of this? I mean, what can they realistically do without a functioning House, right? A whole bunch of nothing, Kara. You're absolutely right. I mean, the House has been paralyzed for, what, two weeks now? Uh, if Jordan doesn't get this, uh, it could be going into a, a third week, potentially. And this comes as the Senate is going to be starting to debate and potentially vote on a package of aid for Israel, since the Middle East uh, is in total turmoil right now. The government runs out of money in a couple of weeks as well. And the House, they can't do anything. And this, again, I think is going to help Jordan in his pitch this week. I mean, there's a lot of lawmakers and I'm hearing from them myself, even people who don't like Jordan are concerned about the gridlock here in the House and the fact that they are doing nothing, that they could potentially lose the majority in 2024. And this all helps Jordan. Uh, it gives him the benefit of saying, look, we got to stop messing around and get our stuff together and actually legislate for the American people. It helps him. All right, Rachel Bade, we'll keep following uh, every move there, clearly from the Hill. Just monitoring the vote and support if indeed it comes through for Jim Jordan. Also coming up, game on. Five new sports added to the Summer Olympics. We will tell you which ones right after a quick break. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. 
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from federal court in downtown Miami, I'm Aaron Katursky. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. you're streaming with us other headlines that we're tracking this hour pharmacy chain Rite Aid says it's filed for bankruptcy protection that brand facing falling sales big debt and lawsuits related to the opioid crisis Rite Aid settled up to 30 million dollars in those suits that alleged their pharmacies oversupplied prescription opioids well she became a household name starring as the effervescent Chrissy Snow in the sitcom Three's Company later talking thousands of women and some men into buying her signature exercise apparatus, the thigh master, so we could all try to look as amazing as she did for seven decades. Suzanne Summers passing away Sunday after her battle with breast cancer. The TV icon had returned to the screen in the 90s for the series Step by Step, even performing in Vegas with her cabaret show, Suzanne Sizzles. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2000, announced in July that it had returned. She died just one day before her 77th birthday. Five sports added to the 2028 Los Angeles Games. The International Olympic Committee announcing that cricket, baseball, softball, and lacrosse will all return, while flag football and squash are making their Olympic debut. 2028 Games will be LA's third time hosting, becoming the third three-time host city after London and Paris. look inside Gaza where thousands of people are already gathered at the southern border near the Rafah crossing desperately trying to get into Egypt before Israel begins its ground invasion there. Our foreign correspondent James Long also co-anchoring with me from Tel Aviv. James the war it's constantly changing as we know it's even changing whether you can join us live or not due to the sirens we keep hearing there where you are and across the region so what are you hearing what's the latest on this ground evasion invasion rather as of right now well, yeah, the sirens do keep going off, and actually we had to shelter in place. We know that the press corps following Secretary of State Blinken, who's back here in Israel, currently meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet, they had to shelter in place as well. Uh, so the uncertainty here in Tel Aviv continues, but we are all waiting to see when this ground invasion might begin. And meantime, people inside Gaza desperate for help, desperate for that humanitarian aid. A lot of questions about when. I think it's a question of when that border crossing with Egypt might open for at least a little while to get some of this badly needed humanitarian aid in and possibly some foreign nationals out of Gaza. But I think we're, we're all waiting to see when that might happen. I don't think it can happen soon enough, if I'm honest, Kira. All right. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm James Longman in Tel Aviv. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context and analysis. And as you know, the news never stops. Neither does the coverage there from Israel. James and I will be right back. More news right after this.
at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden, please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting in St. Petersburg, Florida, in the aftermath of Hurricane Adelia, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. on ABC News. Oh, that's right. Today on ABC News Live, Israel at war with Hamas. Pictures for you out of Tel Aviv now. This hour, the IDF announcing it killed the head of Hamas's intelligence with a rocket strike as Israel prepares for that ground invasion inside Gaza. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips here in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And I'm James Longman in Tel Aviv. Israel has been launching strikes for more than a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Earlier, sirens sounded in Jerusalem, central Israel, and here in Tel Aviv as Israeli lawmakers met in the Knesset before it stopped its session. Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke, saying there will be a thorough investigation into the Hamas attacks, and he warned Iran and Hezbollah that they would pay a heavy price if they test Israel. The Palestinian Ministry of Health saying more than 2,700 people have been killed in the Israeli strikes, while the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces prepare for that major ground assault. Egypt is blaming Israel for not allowing the only border crossing out of Gaza into Egypt to open from the Palestinian side. Well, from the old city of Jerusalem, one of the world's most revered and visited sites, it is now all but abandoned. Rows and rows of businesses have closed up shop near sites which are regarded as holy in Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Such sites like the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Western Wall and the church that stands where Christians believe Jesus was buried and resurrected. All these places are mostly empty now. Inez de la Cueta is reporting for us in Jerusalem. Inez, good to see you. First up, the Secretary of State met one-on-one -on -one with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his war cabinet. He's on his way to meet with the Israeli President Herzog. What can we expect from these meetings? Hey, James. Yeah, so Secretary of State Antony Blinken back in Israel. He was here uh, last week. He then embarked on a tour of the Middle East. He went to Saudi Arabia, for instance, to Egypt to try and shore up support for Israel and try and deter actors hostile to Israel from uh, getting involved here. And Blinken now back in Israel. He did touch down earlier today. He was here in Jerusalem. He was also in uh, Tel Aviv meeting with the prime minister, meeting with the opposition leader as well, and meeting with a number of Israeli leaders. Uh, we 
understand that sirens went off as uh, Blinken was meeting with Netanyahu, with uh, the traveling press, with Blinken, Blinken having to uh, shelter in place. And uh, we do know that uh, sirens also went off in Jerusalem while the Knesset was meeting, and, and leaders there had to shelter in place. The prime minister also had to shelter in place. Now, as far as prob uh, what, what, as to what came out of these meetings, um, we do know that uh, Blinken reiterated his firm support, the U.S.'s firm support for Israel. Uh, he reiterated that Israel has a right to defend itself. But Blinken is in a tricky position because as he is trying to, uh, you know, reiterate the U.S.'s unwavering support for Israel, he also has, uh, the, you know, the, these uh, Palestinian Americans who are inside Gaza on his mind. He's trying to negotiate for uh, Israel and Egypt to open up humanitarian corridors to uh, possibly allow some of these people into Egypt and to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza. Growing calls around the world for humanitarian aid to be allowed into Gaza and the U.S. trying to, uh, you know, pressure Israel there and Egypt to, to come to, to some sort of, of agreement. Um, and, and Blinken, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking about the hostages as well. We know a number of Americans are still being held hostage inside Gaza. Jerusalem is tense at the best of times. I've spent a fair bit of time there. You've been there now for a couple of days. How is it different right now? Uh, you know, I know there's also been some violence on the occupied West Bank as well. You know, the, the atmosphere there must be pretty different at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's surreal to see anyone who's been here to the old city in Jerusalem knows just how bustling it is, how much activity there typically is, how loud it typically is. And uh, we were there, uh, you know, yesterday, and, and it was um, a ghost town. There are rows and rows of shops that have closed down. We spoke to some residents who were talking about how they had never seen it like this before in their lifetimes. Uh, others who were drawing comparisons to the COVID-19 pandemic. We uh, went to the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Like you mentioned off the top there, it's the church where Christians believe that Jesus was... Uh, uh, buried in and, and then resurrected and that's typically a site uh, that is packed and there's a long line to, to get into some of these sites and that it, I mean it was it was completely empty it felt like we were getting a private tour of you know one of, of the the holiest and, and, and most visited uh, sites uh, for Christians so um, really a, a surreal site to see I think there's a lot of tensions here uh, Palestinians here worried about what's to come uh, they were telling us they they are hoping for the best they're hoping for peace but they are worried that you know what's happening in, in the Gaza Strip will have an impact here as well. Um, tensions have been rising in the West Bank. We do know that at least 50 Palestinians now have been killed in the West Bank and East Jerusalem since this all uh, first started. And, uh, you know, growing concerns that it's just going to get worse. Now, we're talking to you now, and I can see these, these images of the Damascus Gate. It's pretty startling to see these, these places completely empty of people, the old town of Jerusalem as well. It's usually a divided city. But there have been people coming out on the streets of Arab cities around the world in support of the Palestinians. And yet in Jerusalem, there haven't. Uh, tell us why. What, what, is, what, what is stopping Palestinians from coming out in massive numbers? Because I think we did expect that on Friday, and it didn't happen to the degree that I think a lot of people expected. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a real fear here. Um, there is a, a, a very, very heavy police presence here on the streets of Jerusalem. We know that police have set up checkpoints in a number of different parts of the city. Uh, Palestinians we spoke with were telling us that they, you know, are, are reluctant to come to the old city because of all these checkpoints that they have to go through. At Damascus Gate that you mentioned, um, you know, that there have always been, there's always been a heavy security presence there, but it's been ramped up. And we saw, I mean, we saw it for ourselves, young Palestinian men being, uh, you know, uh, stopped and, and taken into some of these um, uh, kind of guard houses to be searched and 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 it's a, a tense atmosphere and so I think you know people were telling us that there is fear and we've seen videos surfacing of, of Palestinians being uh, arrested and searched and beaten and um, yeah I think there, there are real uh, concerns here there, there's fear and so people telling us that as of right now they they prefer to stay home and that's likely why we didn't see uh, you know a, a massive uh, any kind of massive demonstrations on uh, Friday on that day of rage. Inez de la Qatar in Jerusalem. Thank you. Kira, I'll throw it back to you. James, thanks so much, Inez, and thank you. And joining us uh, now is contributor and former State Department official Steve Ganyard. Steve, Israel could begin this ground assault, really at any moment. How do you expect that to unfold? Just from your experience, we thought it was going to happen over the weekend. Now everybody is sort of wondering what it's going to take uh, to get this going. 
Yeah, Carrie, I think there are going to be um, some some uh, factors that wouldn't necessarily uh, what we wouldn't necessarily see in say uh, a major U.S. Uh, kickoff here. I think most of the element of surprise is gone. Uh, everyone knows that the uh, that the Israelis plan to go into Gaza. Uh, so I think what they're waiting for is to continue with the bombardment, to continue to hit the targets that they can, uh, do what they can to take out Hamas with the bombardments. But also, uh, the Israelis operate very differently uh, in and around Gaza. It's a very small area, as you know. Uh, and when the aircraft attack, the aircraft are actually releasing ordnance inside of Israel. So they don't have to fly over uh, fly over Gaza. Uh, there's some reports that there are some uh, handheld surface to air missiles that uh, Hamas has. Uh, and so they're just protecting those aircraft uh, by using drones. So they have different kinds of drones and they have big drones, small drones uh, of all sorts, but they tend to stack them over Gaza. And each of these drones have a different function. So some are intelligence gatherers, some are used for targeting, for lasing, uh, some are used just for general uh, intelligence gathering purposes. So they have all these drones and all these intelligence collection assets over uh, Gaza. Uh, some of them need clear weather. And so the weather is beginning to clear up in the next few days, should be clearer. So if there's a reason to hold back on the on the uh, invasion of Gaza due to weather, uh, I think that that'll clear up and, and we may see it in the next couple of days. And just, you know, put into perspective, how do you mm -hmm. execute a hostage rescue uh, at, at the same time, you, you want to go into an area and just blow out all Hamas cells. Um, do you enter in an, a, a total ground invasion before, I guess, tracking or, or having some type of intelligence to know where those hostages are being held? Well, your, your last point is the hardest point, Kira, and that is where are they being held? Uh, no doubt they're being held underground. Uh, Hamas is very smart about intelligence. Uh, they totally surprised the, uh, the Israelis uh, in the invasion. Uh, so they're going to be very smart on uh, not using things that can be uh, uh, sort of cell phones or radios or anything that can be picked up that would give away the location of any of the hostages. So uh, they're going to be held underground. Remember that in Gaza, there's all sorts of tunnels. Hamas has had years to tunnel uh, so that they could stay out of uh, Israel's sight. Uh, and they can also store arms underneath the uh, in these tunnels. And so there are lots of ways for Hamas to hold these these prisoners uh, in ways, these hostages in ways that uh, the Israelis really have no good uh, ability to uh, to track them. Uh, now, human intelligence, Israeli human intelligence is quite good. Uh, but to your other point here, just the chaos of conducting a conventional uh, campaign of any kind while well, bombing is going on and to coordinate that with special operations, uh, extraordinarily difficult. And, and you know, I know John Kirby said today that there's nothing, uh, there are no options off the table about U.S. boots on the ground. <clears throat> there is no way that I think that that uh, that any special operations command kinds of capabilities uh, that the U.S. had would be allowed, first of all, by Israel into Gaza. Uh, second of all, the degree of cooperation and coordination that would be required would be extraordinary. Uh, and if the Israelis can't do it, you know, they've got a lot more people in there than we do, uh, then I don't know who is. Uh, I've also, uh, in talking to folks who have worked with the special ops folks in Israel, they are much more open to risk than U.S. Uh, in extremis, extremis hostage rescue teams are. And so they'll go in if they know they may lose some hostages, but they'll be able to kill all the kidnappers. Uh, the Israelis have a much higher risk profile. In other words, they would go in at times when most U.S. teams would not go in. So all those factors combined, I, it's just it's just hard to imagine how anything could be going on unless they had some very, very specific intelligence and they were to stop the uh, the conventional bombing and had create a corridor for these special ops folks to get in. Yeah, that would be the only way to, to target those tunnels, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when you were talking about the complexity of those tunnels and that's where they'd be hiding weapons and leaders and even hostages, I was thinking about after 9-11 and remember the air campaign to just mm -hmm. totally take out Tora Bora and, and all the tunnels, believing that Osama bin Laden and all his henchmen you know, were hiding uh, there uh, within all those caves and tunnels that they had created. This is a totally different story. 
Yeah, it, the, again, Hamas has had years to dig these tunnels <clears throat> because they've had to. No other way to hide their weapons, no other way to uh, find ways in and out. They tunnel under the uh, uh, the fences to going into Egypt, so they move supplies in and out that way. Uh, so it, it's a, it's very, very tough not for the Israelis to track uh, crack from an intelligence perspective, and it's why that they will have to put troops on the ground. You cannot bomb your way to to killing uh, all of Hamas, to, to bringing down Hamas. They're going to have to put troops on the ground. They're going to have to do very dangerous things. You remember back during Vietnam, uh, Kira, that uh, that the uh, U.S. forces uh, faced the same thing in South Vietnam with uh, with the Viet Cong, uh, where they would have these massive uh, uh, underground networks. So you'd come across a village and you'd think, oh, it's a perfectly normal village. But there'd be a whole underground network where they'd be uh, hiding weapons caches. It also made it very tough for U.S. forces to uh, to uh, fight the Viet Cong that way because the Viet Cong could pop up. They'd see where the U.S. was going. And Hamas will do the same thing. They'll say, oh, the Israelis are over here on this street, but they'll have a tunnel entrance or an exit. They'll be able to pop up from behind uh, and, uh, and ambush the Israelis. So very, very tough. It's this it's this idea of the vertical dimension of urban warfare, where not only do you have this underground in Gaza, but you also have uh, this vertical uh, dimension to these tall buildings where uh, Israeli troops are going to have to fight their way to the top floor, all the while while they're being shot at from uh, from downward uh, from from Hamas. So it's going to be very very difficult. Uh, we'll see how much more bombing they want to do before they feel comfortable going in. Uh, but it's going to uh, it's going to be bloody for both sides. Yeah, and and I think the most gut wrenching thing I heard you say is that it may mean hostages are killed in the process. We'll continue to follow it. It's always great to have your insight and experience. Appreciate you so much, Steve. Thanks, James. I'll take it back to you. Thanks, Kira. Thank you, Kira. Uh, we have actually just learned. ABC News has just learned that the Red Cross, the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, has spoken to Hamas leadership, uh, and I want to bring you now in to. To tell us more about this is the spokesperson for the International Committee for the Red Cross, Jason Strazuso, apologies, Strazuso from the uh, ICRC headquarters in Geneva. Jason, thank you for being with us. Uh, I understand that you have, your organization has now had face-to-face -face meetings with the Hamas leadership. What, what did you learn? What can you tell us? This is a relationship that we've had for years, uh, perhaps decades, uh, and this is the kind of work that we do in conflicts around the world. We talk to all sides in order to advance humanitarian interests. So in this case, yes, we have had face-to-face -face talks with uh, the leadership of Hamas. Uh, we are insisting on three things. Uh, first of all, that the hostages be released immediately. Barring that, we're also asking for access to the hostages so that our teams can visit in person, assess the conditions they're being held in, check on their health conditions. And number three is we are advocating uh, for um, communication uh, between the hostages and the family members. And this is just um, a, a, an emotional alleviation for all the suffering that the families are going through, that the hostages are going through, a simple message back and forth uh, can bring a world of relief. It's a, an extremely basic uh, humanitarian um, initiative uh, that uh, we're advocating be carried out in this situation here. I mean, you may be the only organization on earth currently that is in direct contact with Hamas. Have they given you any indication of proof of life? Uh, any indication of how many hostages are uh, currently in captivity? All these questions that you're asking are, of course, natural, and uh, many people want to know the answers to these questions. Because of the way the International Committee of the Red Cross works, we say these two words very often inside our organiz organization, bilateral, meaning just between us and them, and confidential. So as natural it is to want to know the answers to those questions, that, that that's the kind of information that we don't share. Uh, we have our way of working. It's in, designed and intended to increase trust. Uh, and, and so all organizations, in this case Hamas, view us uh, reliably. So we wouldn't share those details. Uh, the only thing we would say publicly are those points I said earlier. We want to increase family contacts contacts. We want to visit and check, carry out health checks uh, with the hostages. And of course, we want them to be released.
And would you be in a position there then after that to facilitate a uh, hostage exchange, uh, some kind of deal between Hamas? Uh, because I think you know people here in Israel, obviously, as you well imagine, are desperate for news, desperate, desperately hope that they can get their loved ones out of Gaza. So if I could split the contents of your question in half, we would be in a position to facilitate the release in that we can come up with the modalities for it to happen. There might be an issue of a simultaneous something or other. Uh, I don't know what the details of that might look like. Um, that is to say, we have experience, we have experience um, facilitating hostage releases in a safe manner um, with uh, the trust of all sides involved. The other part of your question is, is much better addressed to the political leadership of the two sides. Uh, we, although we facilitate contacts between family members uh, and uh, we advocate for the, the good treatment of hostages, we do not get involved in the political negotiations. Uh, what might take place, uh, that's not our role at all. We're strictly on the humanitarian side of this equation. I completely understand. But in the meantime, Jason Stratziuso, thank you so much. I think that's going to give at least a tiny bit of hope to the families here in Israel to know that at least someone is in contact with Hamas at the moment. Kira, I'll send it back to you. Thank you. Jason, thanks so much. And James, thanks to you, of course. Coming up, Jim Jordan going for the gavel, even saying he will force a vote by tomorrow if he has to. We are live on the Hill as we follow the uphill battle to elect a House Speaker. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Glad you're streaming with us here in Washington, D.C. Congress still in complete disarray as the House spends yet another day without a speaker. Republicans are coalescing behind Ohio Rep Jim Jordan after he won a vote among Republicans for speaker last week behind closed doors. But does he still have enough support to win a full vote set for tomorrow? Our contributing political correspondent Rachel Bate is on the Hill, joins us with more. So, Rachel, how are we looking now? Kira, the Jim Jordan camp is sounding more bullish than I've heard them ever before. They had another uh, endorser come out just a few minutes ago, Congressman Vern Buchanan. This is a guy who said he wouldn't back Jim Jordan just a few days ago, is now tweeting that he will support him on the floor. And this is the fourth lawmaker we saw do this in the past just couple of hours. I mean, Ann Wagner, who was a top uh, ally of Steve Scalise, who was running for the speakership just a few days ago, had accused Jordan of basically sabotage and treachery and said that she would never back him. Uh, and now she also is back him. I think it's important to sort of uh, step back here and look at the difference between what's going on with Jordan today and what happened with Steve Scalise last week. The longer Steve Scalise's campaign stood out there to become speaker, the more we saw opponents come out and say they wouldn't support him to the point that it just became untenable for him and he withdrew. We're seeing the opposite happen right now. We're seeing people who were against Jim Jordan a couple of days tweet and come out publicly and say they have talked to him, talked about their concerns with him, uh, and that they are now going to back him on the floor. And I think the reasons for that are twofold. Number one, Jordan is the darling of the far right. The base loves him. And there is a major pressure campaign going on with House Republicans to get in line behind him. And number two, you also have to, have to think about the the types of Republicans that don't want Jordan to be speaker. These are Republicans who are team players, Republicans who are moderates, who don't want to see the institution be paralyzed. And so it just very much goes against their nature to say, no, we're not going to back you, and we're going to keep us in this logjam for a long time, Kira. 
And let's talk about why Jim Jordan and, and just his history in Congress and what actually brought him here. It's so fascinating, Kira, because, you know, I've been covering Jordan for more than a decade, and he used to be the most reviled member of the House Republican Conference. His own colleagues loathed him because he tormented Republican leaders for making deals with Democrats. He cheered shutdown showdowns and fiscal brinksmanship when it came to the debt ceiling. He wanted to impeach all these Obama officials when other Republicans thought there was no merit for that. So how do we get to this moment right now? He's really reformed himself over the past three years. He has become an ally of Kevin McCarthy, became a chairman on the House Judiciary uh, Committee. That means he's sort of expected to row with the team, as Republicans like to say, and he certainly has started to work better with these colleagues. However, it's important to note that if it was up to most Republicans in the House, Jordan would not be Speaker. They don't love him that much that they're super happy about that. But we are in a situation right now where there are about half a dozen to 12 conservatives who are basically holding the House hostage. And when it comes to a speaker they will actually support, Jordan right now seems to be the only person they will get behind. And so that's why he has such an advantage right now. You know, it's funny you mentioned that he used to be the most reviled and, and that he's sort of changed his temperament. But you know as well as I do, anytime you watch some type of hearing, committee hearing, yeah. you always know his voice. He's always one of the loudest <laughs> and he's always the one creating uh, so much debate. Uh, well, and here we are again. Uh, we'll see if uh, indeed the vote goes down tomorrow. We'll be talking. Rachel Bay, thank you so much. And coming up, Continuing coverage of the war between Israel and Hamas. Keep it right here after a short break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Joint Base Andrews, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Live pictures now at a Gaza there where thousands of people are already gathered at the southern border near Rafah crossing desperately trying to get into Egypt before Israel begins that ground invasion into Gaza. Our foreign correspondent James Longman joining us once again from Tel Aviv. You know, new warnings of potential threats here in the U.S. now uh, creating a lot of fear that we could have more problems here stateside, uh, James. And it happened after that horrific attack we reported on today in Illinois where that six-year-old Palestinian boy was stabbed to death, his mother critically injured after the landlord showed up at the front door um basically harassing them and saying horrible uh 
things and, and killing, killing her son. Yeah, that's right, Kira. I think President Biden said that he was uh, sickened by the murder and he condemned Islamophobia. He said this is a horrific uh, act of hate. The boy's uncle has been speaking at a press conference in place of his father, who's too emotional to speak. Have a listen. We're not in war. The war is overseas. You want war? It's overseas. It's not our war. It's not United States war. And we're gathering here to say we need to save our kids. James, it's just so heartbreaking. I was reading more about the family. They came here to the United States, like so many uh, immigrants do, for a better life, uh, to make a better life for their kids. Um, totally just innocent bystanders in, in all of this. I mean, it's, it's appalling. Kira, and it goes to show how this small strip of land here in the Middle East is just having such a huge effect all around the world. The impact here is reverberating uh, across the globe. I do, though, just want to bring you a couple of updates here from, from, from Tel Aviv. We heard just in the last few moments that we know that there's at least one organization, the International Community of the Red Cross, Committee of the Red Cross, that is in speaking face to face with Hamas about those hostages. That is not something I think anybody, any of us knew before. So the possibility of getting some of these hostages out of Gaza, I think, is at least on the table. Um, and that was surprising to me that, that already the International Committee of the Red Cross is, is speaking to Hamas about that. They wouldn't divulge the, the contents of their conversations, but I think it's heartening for families here. Also, we're hearing that uh, Khalid Meshal, who is the leader of Hamas based in Qatar, he has been speaking to Arab television, and he has said that among those prisoners uh, are soldiers of high military ranks from within the Gaza division. Uh, and I think a suggestion, perhaps, that uh, dual national hostages are, are not of uh, as much importance as those members of Israel's armed forces. So we'll see. I mean, we've got a lot more to discuss, but um, this is new on the hostages for the time being. I'll throw it back to you. And it sounds uh, like there could be uh, some hope within all of that. So glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. Thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Today on ABC News Live, Israel at war with Hamas. Live pictures for you out of Tel Aviv as the IDF announces it killed the head of Hamas's intelligence, a rocket strike in Israel preparing for a ground invasion inside Gaza now. Israel has been launching strikes for more than a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people earlier. Sirens sounding in Jerusalem, we're telling you about right now in Tel Aviv, we just heard them. Israeli lawmakers actually met in the Knesset before the Knesset even stopped its session today. Prime Minister Netanyahu rather, speaking and saying that there will be a thorough investigation into the Hamas attacks and warning that Iran and Hezbollah, well, 
well, they will pay the heavy price if they continue to test Israel. The Palestinian Ministry of Health says that more than 2,700 people now have been killed in the Israeli strikes, while the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces prepare for a major ground assault. Egypt also blaming Israel for not allowing the only border crossing out of Gaza and into Egypt to open from the Palestinian side. Now we want to head over to the head of, uh, or just to the north of Israel, rather, to Lebanon, where there are fears now that the war could spread beyond Israel's borders. I want to bring in our Mola Lange from Beirut. Mola, uh, Israel has been exchanging fire with Hezbollah. There have been evacuations throughout that region. You've been reporting on all of that. Just tell us where things stand right now and, and how worried, you know, should we all be right now about this ex escalation in the north? Oh yeah, Kira, escalation would be uh, would be beyond that, especially when you consider the, the potential domino effect throughout the region, the, the countries throughout the region, and perhaps even throughout the world that may get dragged into uh, a broader conflict. And, and, and while the, the threat is real, it is very real, uh, there, and while there has been you know, certainly a lot of tough talk uh, uh, from all the players involved, you know, Hezbollah, uh, Israel, the United States, Iran, uh, a lot of tough talk that, that should be uh, taken seriously. One also gets the sense that, that no one actually wants to see an escalation of war, that it would be in no one's best interest for uh, a broader conflict uh, to break out. And, and that is what makes, you know, this, the, these skirmishes that we're seeing along the border uh, so significant and so dangerous. It is the potential for escalation, and it really only takes one misstep, one miscalculation, uh, one wrong move uh, for the two sides to, to really stumble into uh, a broader conflict. Those skirmishes continuing again today, uh, seeing uh, clashes from both sides, uh, Hezbollah and Israel, uh, both continuing uh, to shell each other today, but a much quieter day than we saw this weekend that saw pretty intense uh, flare-ups, especially yesterday. Uh, Hezbollah uh, saying that they uh, took out with some snipers, took out uh, Israeli uh, surveillance cameras along the border, uh, Israeli fighter jets taking out some military infrastructure. Uh, so we certainly saw some intense fighting today. Calmer today, uh, certainly good news for folks living along the border, but a lot of those towns, as you mentioned, a lot of folks uh, living in northern Israel and southern Lebanon in those border towns uh, already getting out of town, fleeing their homes, trying to find someplace safer. So let's talk about the time you have been spending along the Lebanese-Israeli border in a little more detail here. What are you hearing from people there on the ground? I know you've been talking with military, uh, but what about just, you know, every day, what it's been like for people as they are getting the news, uh, you know, in bits and pieces? Yeah, we visited a small town in southern Lebanon just yesterday, uh, a town close enough to, you know, you could see uh, the Israeli border from, from people's front doorsteps. Uh, you could hear occasional uh, missile fire in the distance, uh, especially yesterday, as we mentioned, since there was that pretty intense uh, flare-up. And we spoke with people who were essentially living uh, on the front lines, families who have uh, been there for, for, for generations, and they all fear escalation. You know, they unfortunately, a lot of these folks have been living there, as I mentioned, for generations, so they, they have seen warfare on their front doorsteps, and they've been seeing it on and off uh, for decades. So the, the, the threat of war is constantly, uh, constantly there. Uh, one gentleman we spoke to told me that he is you know, far too used to this, that they have been seeing it, as I mentioned, for years, and still they want no part of it. That uh, sort of elderly gentleman we spoke to, he's kind of a, a village elder, if you will, uh, lives there with his family, uh, lives uh, it, you know, just within a, a you know, viewing distance of the Israeli border. As I mentioned, you can see it from his front doorstep. Uh, they farm, his family farms uh, olives and, and bananas, and they just want to get back to uh, doing that, doing that with their lives. But they have to do that with the threat of, of this escalation uh, looming over them. Uh, and, you know, his story was one of many, just average people who were caught in the crossfire, Kira. Those are the stories that we need to hear and we want to hear. It humanizes everything that's going on across the region right now. Mola, thank you so much. Just at the beginning uh, of the newscast, uh, I was supposed to take you right to James Longman there in Tel Aviv. Uh, the sirens went off. Uh, he immediately had to, to step into the shelter, but he is back with us. James, tell us what happened. 
Yeah, Kira, look, these sirens are actually getting more and more frequent here in Tel Aviv. They don't often sound. This is a city which is far enough away from Gaza to be out of the reach, usually from Hamas rockets, but that has not been the case this week. So more and more often now we have had to get into the shelters. And I should say this is, you know, not like in Ukraine. I spent a lot of time in Ukraine the last year or so, and we hear... Uh, ra you know, raid alarms quite often, missile alarms quite often, and a lot of regular Ukrainians, if you're out on the street, they've gotten so used to the sounds of those alarms that often they don't do anything because often the risk uh, of, of one of these missiles landing uh, isn't uh, as immediate. But here, it really is. And when, a, when an alarm goes, everyone goes inside. Israelis do not mess about, so we have to immediately get off this balcony. We go to a shelter, there's one uh, on this floor, and every building here is equipped with either a shelter which is reinforced on, on, on the floor they're on, or they go down into the basements, or they go into the stairwells. And so this is just a constant risk now uh, from uh, Gaza. The Israelis will say that is part of the reason why they've got to go in to Gaza in this ground incursion, which we're all waiting to see uh, whether that happens, and specifically into the north of Gaza, because they say that's where most of Hamas's infrastructure is, that's where their ability is to fire these rockets, that's where it comes from. And so, uh, clearly, Hamas remains operative inside Gaza, clearly they remain a threat firing these rockets, and that is clearly the reason why the IDF wants to go in. The great test will be whether or not they manage to remove Hamas, as they say they want to, and whether they're able to remove this threat of uh, rocket attacks that currently this entire country uh, worries about. Kira. And James, let's just talk about how this ground invasion could unfold. Uh, you and I have been talking to Mick Mulroy, our national security um, expert, uh, former um, um, part of the Department of Defense, uh, particularly focused on the Middle East. And he's saying here that um, with regard to the ground invasion, it may likely start in the north with elements of the IDF coming in via ground, sea, and air, and that the IDF may attempt to envelop Hamas an attack from unpredictable directions using speed and surprise to create a tactical dilemma. Is that what you're hearing? Is that what you're expecting? I know that you've got a number of sources there as, you know, we thought something was going to happen over the weekend. And um, clearly there was some pretty bad weather that hit the region as well. What do you know? Well, that's the hope, Kira, certainly. You know, our teams have actually been speaking to soldiers down on the front line, which is turning into a front line. Those kibbutzim, by the way, the kibbutz that were attacked, uh, were killing fields, those execution chambers, essentially those shelters where people were killed, have now become the front line of, of Israel's war into Gaza. They're waiting to go in. Uh, and there, remember, there are a lot of reservists. There, there's an IDF, a standing army, which is of professionals, but tens of thousands of people have come, they've called, they've answered the call to war, have come out of kind of civilian life to go into Gaza. And our, co our colleague, Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Pannell, was speaking to some of them about just what they worry about when they go in. Can they really know what they're going to face? Because Hamas, uh, you know, took the world by surprise with this offensive. Do we really know what their defensive capabilities are? One imagines they'll have booby-trapped entire buildings. One imagines they will be operating in the network of tunnels that we know that they use. How much does Israel know about all those tunnels and the, the network that Hamas uh, operates in? How much does uh, uh, Israel know about the firepower that Hamas has at its disposal? And I think every single one of those uh, IDF, uh, either reservists or members of the standing army, will be thinking about the hostages. Are they able to to locate them? Are they going to be able to extract them? We know that there have been small raids that have been carried out in Gaza so far. One imagines that's for reconnaissance, to check out the land, check out the terrain before people move in properly. But we're in for a very, very long campaign, I think, here, Kira. I think, I think you are right. James, we'll be uh, anchoring this uh, show for the next couple of hours. Uh, depending on what happens with the sirens, we'll be in touch uh, again shortly. We're also following news out of federal court here in Washington, D.C. The judge overseeing former President Trump's federal election uh, interference case uh, partially granted the government's request for a gag order, actually restricting the former president from making disparaging statements uh, relating to this case. Our senior reporter, uh, Catherine Falders, was inside the courtroom, joins us now with more. So, Catherine, just kind of break down what we know at this hour.
Yeah, Kara, it's a stunning moment because this order that the judge imposed is the most restrictions uh, that President Trump has had on his speech to date. You've heard him on the campaign trail, on the stump, his stump speech. He often refers to special counsel Jack Smith as deranged. He's called his staff thugs, for example. Those words were heavily used in this courtroom today with this order that this judge ultimately imposed. She said that the former president, that Trump cannot use those words as it relates to the special counsel, as it relates to his staff. He can't discuss disparage witnesses, for example. He's allowed to broadly attack the government. He can say he believes that the investigation, for example, is politically motivated. Uh, but he also can't speak about former Vice President Mike Pence's role in January 6th, for example. And you know when Trump uh, attacks Pence, that is mostly what he focuses on. So it, it really was a stunning ruling from the judge, given that the government, of course, had asked for this limited gag order, she believes. And she said that this is more limited given that he can still attack the Biden administration if he so wishes. He can say it's politically motivated. But the big question now becomes, what happens if he violates this? His top attorney, John Loro, said in the courtroom today that whatever order was issued, that the Trump legal team would likely uh, appeal it, for example. They haven't issued an appeal yet. But when do they do that? How fast does this get appealed? Does he violate it? And if he does violate it, what are the sanctions that the judge said she would impose? There's lots of questions here, uh, and I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more from Trump's team on this order here today, Kira. All right, so you know, in light of all this gag order uh, discussion, Trump and his lawyers, are they responding in any way? Well, look, I think they haven't said anything yet. His lawyers are still inside uh, this courthouse uh, behind me. They said during oral arguments that they intended to appeal any order. I asked his top uh, lawyer who was arguing John Laura this after she issued the order. I said, do you intend uh, to appeal this? He wouldn't say it outside of the courtroom, but said that what he said inside the courtroom still stands. He stands by those comments. So that likely signals an appeal, something we're likely to see, I'm sure, from Trump's team, whether it's in the coming hours or the coming days. All right, and then what's next, Catherine? Look, I think we need to see the actual physical paper order from uh, the judge and go through that. She said from the bench what she intends to do, so she still needs to issue that paper order. What's next, we'll probably see appeals, for example, what that appeal specifically looks like. We don't know yet, so we'll be looking for what the Trump team says on his language as it relates to the special counsel, as it relates to witnesses. So those are the next steps, at least at this point in this case. All right, Catherine, thanks so much. Also here at home, Jim Jordan going for the gavel, uh, even saying that he will force a vote by tomorrow if he has to. We are live on the Hill as we follow the uphill battle to elect a House speaker. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. 
Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us here in Washington. Congress still is in complete disarray as the House spends yet another day without a speaker. Republicans still coalescing behind Ohio Representative Jim Jordan after he won a vote among Republicans behind closed doors last week. But does Jordan even have enough support to win a full vote tomorrow? Our contributing political correspondent, Rachel Bade, is on Capitol Hill. So, Rachel, what do you think? How's it looking for Jordan? Kira, the opposition to Jim Jordan, it's already starting to crumble, and we're still a full day out from this vote. He picked up three major endorsements this morning. The first one from Congresswoman Ann Wagner. This is an ally of Steve Scalise's who said that Jordan basically sabotaged her friend when he tried to get the gavel. She was asked last week if she would support Jim Jordan. Her response was, quote, H-E double hockey sticks, no. Uh, except she said the real word, not uh, <laughs> what I said just there. Uh, she, he's also getting the backing from Mike Rogers, who is the House Armed Services House Armed Services Committee chairman and another top defense hawk uh, who also had come out and said that he would not support Jordan. This is three huge gets for Jordan. And you might look back to last week. Yes, there were 55 House Republicans who, even after he won the nomination, said they would not back him on the floor. Sure, this is only three lawmakers. Uh, he has a lot more to go. But the thing to keep in mind about these people is these were some of the most vocal members of the House who were coming out against Jordan. So if they're coming out now and saying they'll back Jordan, it certainly shows that he has momentum on his side. And again, a full day of phone calls and whipping that he can do before this vote comes to the floor. So let, let's talk about what Jordan really has to do, though, to shore up, you know, enough support among skeptical members. He was even caught up in, in the hallway, I, I saw, and he said no matter what, he's going to force a vote uh, definitely by tomorrow. But he has a lot of work to do to convince folks to flip. He does. And it looks like, you know, we've we've seen these lawmakers come out and say why they're changing their vote and they're now going to support Jordan. They mentioned things like increased defense money. Jordan had not actually answered a question by Republicans when they met privately last week about whether he would support more money for the Pentagon. That seems to be something they talked about. They all talked about uh, keeping the government open. Jordan in the past has cheerleaded uh, government shutdowns, trying to use them to win concessions from Democrats. Uh, he basically has been talking to Republicans who don't like shutdowns about this and, and saying he will go uh, do a different tact here. But I think beyond policy concessions, it's important to keep in mind about the political pressure uh, Jordan is and his allies are putting on these members. The difference between Jordan and Steve Scalise and even Kevin McCarthy before him is that he is loved by the base. He is the conservative darling of the far right, the founder of the Freedom Caucus. He has Donald Trump's endorsement. And a lot of Republicans right now are calling Republican offices and saying you need to back Jim Jordan for speaker. So, you know, there's this belief in the Jordan camp that this public pressure is actually going to help move votes. Even Sean Hannity uh, from Fox News has been reaching out to Republican lawmakers that he thinks might not vote for Jordan, saying, why aren't you with him? So there's a pressure campaign here that I think is going to move people more than anything Jordan could possibly give folks. Well, if Congressman Jordan does not appear to have enough support, will the House bring the floor to the vote tomorrow anyway, you think? Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. I mean, he just told reporters that here in the hallway a couple of hours ago. And it's really interesting because just a couple of days ago, Jordan was backing this change to House rules saying that you shouldn't go to the floor for a full vote on speaker until you have at least 217 votes uh, to actually get the gavel. Now, he's singing a different tune now that he is the nominee. He's saying they're going to go to the floor regardless. And the theory, again, from his camp, is that when lawmakers are put on record in public, Public in the spotlight uh, that they will call out Jordan's name for speaker because they'll be too afraid to, to support anyone else. All right, so where does the Senate stand on all of this? I mean, what can they realistically do without a functioning House, right? 
a whole bunch of nothing, Kira. You're absolutely right. I mean, the house has been paralyzed for, what, two weeks now? Uh, if Jordan doesn't get this, uh, it could be going into a, a third week, potentially. And this comes as the Senate is going to be starting to debate and potentially vote on a package of aid for Israel, since the Middle East uh, is in total turmoil right now. The government runs out of money in a couple of weeks as well. And the House, they can't do anything. And this, again, I think is going to help Jordan in his pitch this week. I mean, there's a lot of lawmakers and I'm hearing from them myself, even people who don't like Jordan are concerned about the gridlock here in the House and the fact that they are doing nothing, that they could potentially lose the majority in 2024. And this all helps Jordan. Uh, it gives him the benefit of saying, look, we got to stop messing around and get our stuff together and actually legislate for the American people. It helps him. All right, Rachel Bade, we'll keep following uh, every move there, clearly from the Hill. Just monitoring the vote and support if indeed it comes through for Jim Jordan. Also coming up, game on. Five new sports added to the Summer Olympics. We will tell you which ones right after a quick break. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh, my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting on Capitol Hill, I'm Devin Dwyer. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Other headlines that we're tracking this hour. Pharmacy chain Rite Aid says it's filed for bankruptcy protection. That brand facing falling sales, big debt, and lawsuits related to the opioid crisis. Rite Aid settled up to $30 million in those suits that alleged their pharmacies oversupplied prescription opioids. Well, she became a household name, starring as the effervescent Chrissy Snow in the sitcom Three's Company, later talking thousands of women and some men into buying her signature exercise apparatus, the Thighmaster, so we could all try to look as amazing as she did for seven decades. Suzanne Summers passing away Sunday after her battle with breast cancer. The TV icon had returned to the screen in the 90s for the series Step by Step, even performing in Vegas with her cabaret show Suzanne Sizzles. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2000, announced in July that it had returned. She died just one day before her 77th birthday. Five sports added to the 2028 Los Angeles Games. The International Olympic Committee announcing that cricket, baseball, softball, and lacrosse will all return, while flag football and squash are making their Olympic debut. 2028 Games will be LA's third time hosting, becoming the third three-time host city after London and Paris.
live look inside Gaza where thousands of people are already gathered at the southern border near the Rafah crossing, desperately trying to get into Egypt before Israel begins its ground invasion there. Our foreign correspondent James Long also co-anchoring with me from Tel Aviv. James, the war, it's constantly changing, as we know. It's even changing whether you can join us live or not due to the sirens we keep hearing there where you are and across the region. So what are you hearing? What's the latest on this ground evasion, invasion rather, as of right now? Well, yeah, the sirens do keep going off, and actually we had to shelter in place. We know that the press corps following Secretary of State Blinken, who's back here in Israel, currently meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet, they had to shelter in place as well. Uh, so the uncertainty here in Tel Aviv continues, but we are all waiting to see when this ground invasion might begin. And meantime, people inside Gaza desperate for help, desperate for that humanitarian aid. A lot of questions about when. I think it's a question of when that border crossing with Egypt might open for at least a little while to get some of this badly needed humanitarian aid in and possibly some foreign nationals out of Gaza. But I think we're, we're all waiting to see when that might happen. I don't think it can happen soon enough, if I'm honest, Kira. All right. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context and analysis. And as you know, the news never stops. Neither does the coverage there from Israel. James and I will be right back. More news right after this. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families front. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Fulton County, Georgia Courthouse, I'm Rena Roy. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live, Israel at war with Hamas. Pictures for you now out of Gaza this hour. The IDF announcing it killed the head of Hamas's intelligence with a rocket strike earlier as Israel is still preparing for that ground invasion inside Gaza. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips here in our nation's capital. And I'm James Longman in Tel Aviv. Israel has been launching strikes for more than a week now in retaliation for that Hamas terror attack that killed more than 1,400 people. Earlier, sirens sounded in Jerusalem, central Israel, and here in Tel Aviv as Israeli lawmakers met in the Knesset before it stopped its session. Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke, saying there will be a thorough investigation into the Hamas attacks, and he warned Iran and Hezbollah that they would pay a heavy price if they test Israel. 
The Palestinian Ministry of Health also saying more than 2,700 people have been killed in the Israeli strikes, while the U.N. reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced now as Israeli forces prepare for that major ground assault. James, uh, you've learned that the International Red Cross has actually been speaking with Hamas regarding those hostages. What do you know at this hour? Yeah, just a few moments ago, we spoke to the International Committee of the Red Cross and they confirmed to us that they are having face-to-face -face conversations with Hamas at the moment and their primary objective is to establish the well-being of those hostages. Now, they wouldn't give us any detail on what exactly they're talking about. They haven't given us detail on how many hostages they believe to be in captivity, where those hostages are, uh, or indeed if they've been given proof of life. But I think it is heartening to a lot of people to know that at least one organization is in contact with Hamas. This is an organization that prides itself on its ability to be a go-between in organizations like Hamas uh, in, in, around the world. Uh, and their member there uh, in Geneva did speak to us, telling us that they are in uh, communication with Hamas and their effort is to try and provide uh, humanitarian relief to those hostages and eventually, one assumes, uh, in, you know, help uh, create some kind of hostage negotiation or hostage swap at some point. So that is what we know about the hostages. M meanwhile, we are. M meanwhile, we know that the leader of Hamas uh, in Qatar has said that he believes that there is a difference between Israeli uh, IDF, uh, Israeli Defence Force personnel, Israeli soldiers, and civilians in Hamas captivity. Again, that gives perhaps some solace to the families of civilians who've been taken by Hamas, the possibility that Hamas might give them up. We don't know, of course, what they're planning, but that's just a tiny hint at this point uh, uh, on what might be down the line concerning these hostages. I want to move now, though, to our next guest. He is an Israeli living in the United States, uh, and he recently published an article in the progressive Jewish news site Jewish Currents calling Israel's bombing of Gaza, quote, a textbook case of suicide, of genocide, sorry. Raz Sigar is a professor of modern genocide and director of the Master of Arts in Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Stockton University in New Jersey. Raz, thank you so much for joining us. Now, in your article, you call Israel's response to the terror attacks, which were committed by Hamas on October 7th, quote, a textbook case of genocide. You also say Israel uses the distortion of the Holocaust to justify violence against Palestinians. And as an Israeli yourself and someone who studies the Holocaust, do you believe Israel has a right to attack targets in Gaza? What would, in your mind, be an appropriate response to what we saw on Saturday? I can't speak about uh, uh, what would be an appropriate uh, response. Uh, that's not that's not my role. And uh, 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 but uh, I can uh, definitely talk about the nature of uh, Israel's current response to uh, to what has happened. Uh, and as I said, I think I see it as a really as a textbook case of genocide. And by that, I mean that I mean according to the UN Genocide Convention from 1948, uh, we see the special intent, the intent to destroy. A group as such, that is not just individuals, but the group collectively. We see the proclamations that are very explicit from the top, from Israel's president, who said that the whole nation, the whole people of Gaza are responsible through Yoav Gallant's uh, uh, complete siege proclamations, Daniel Hagari, Israel uh, uh, army spokesperson, who talked about the focus on destruction and not accuracy, and on and on. There are many uh, uh, examples. It's quite explicit. It's quite direct. It's quite unashamed. Uh, together with that, we see the acts themselves, the, the, the dropping of thousands of thousands of bombs on Gaza within a few days, which is more than the U.S. has dropped over all of Afghanistan uh, in, us, in any single year of its criminal war there. Um, there's, there's no pretense even anymore to targeting military installations or militants or military targets. It's clear that this is genocidal killings, which is the first act according to the convention. And then there's also the, the second and third acts actually of genocide together again, once we've established the special intent here, which is very clear, as I said, and explicit. Um, so, uh, you know, I can't say what would be the proper response. I can say that the response now, which is definitely a result of the uh, use of Holocaust memory, and I can talk a bit more about that, is indeed genocidal. It's not a danger of genocide. We're witnessing genocide unfolding right now. In your article, you, you say President Biden used, quote, dehumanizing language 
uh, when he called Hamas's attack on Israeli civilians a, an act of sheer evil. You've argued that this language is clearly calculated to justify the wide-scale destruction of Palestinian lives. That's a quote from your article. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Sure. Um, we've, not, we've seen the language of evil in Israel's president's uh, uh, um, response. We've seen it in uh, the U.S. President Biden's response and EU leaders. It's not by accident. Evil is very much tied to discussions about the Holocaust and Nazism. And in all cases, it's meant to decontextualize and to demonize. Uh, and in this case, specifically, to help create the conditions for large-scale mass violence against Palestinians, which in this case would, would be really genocidal, as, as I argue. That is, it's dehumanizing. It's a really deeply dehumanizing uh, discourse. Now, yesterday, the former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said explicitly in his interview, which has become infamous by now, um, that uh, we're fighting Nazis. That's what he said. Israel, there, there's, a, there's a long history, of course, to the uh, use of the Holocaust in Israeli politics and society to justify and rationalize and deny and distort and disavow the uh, Israeli mass violence against Palestinians. And we see it. We see it right now as well uh, in these kind again very explicit responses of Naftali Bennett, for example. We're fighting Nazis. You see it across Israeli society, by the way, these days. You can't miss it, right? These kinds of fantasies. It's a pure fantasy, um, and it's again very dehumanizing. But it also is very important because if we're fighting Nazis, quote unquote, then everything is permissible. No law applies. And that's why we're seeing these kinds of explicit, unashamed genocidal proclamations, the special intent, and that's why we're seeing these kinds of genocidal killings and violence uh, unfolding in front of our eyes. I have to say, Holocaust memory was never, ever meant to rationalize and provide cover for state violence and genocide. It was meant to provide protection to people facing state violence, especially defenseless people, especially people under occupation, under siege for decades, right? That's the, that, that, that is the rationale of Holocaust memory. So what we're seeing now is deeply, deeply problematic, deeply sad uh, on so many levels. Look, I know this isn't about you, but it is interesting to see someone of your background right like this. You, you are Israeli, you were born in Israel, but you use words like genocide, you call Israel's government a racist regime of apartheid. Uh, you even referred to the exodus of Palestinians in 1948 as the Nakba, which is uh, the, the word that Arabs and Palestinians use. It means disaster or catastrophe. Um, and it, it, you've used it to describe the creation of, of the Jewish state. You say words are important. Why, why use those words? And um, I guess, do you feel uncomfortable um, being Israeli, having been born in this country and, 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 and using those words to describe this country? I don't think this is about me at all. I can speak as a, as a scholar. This is who I am, um, and I'm specifically a Jewish scholar, uh, uh, which is a very important part of my identity, and a Jewish Holocaust and Genocide Studies uh, scholar. I'm committed to research. I'm committed to the truth. Uh, I think that the truth here is in front of our eyes. The truth about Israeli apartheid is in front of our eyes. It's well documented. The truth of the history of mass violence against Palestinians is in front of our eyes. The truth about the Nakba is indisputable. I mean, these words are simply accurate descriptions of the reality in front of our eyes. It's now time to deal with it in a serious way. It's now, this is a watershed moment, what we're seeing. I think that today we're also seeing uh, some kind of uh, a, you know, shift in the discourse, in the media discourse, also in the West, th this day today specifically. I mean, this is a watershed moment, uh, and hopefully there's still a possibility to stop the genocidal violence that we're witnessing in front of our eyes, but also to think further about accountability and about trying to, to build on this shift that we're seeing, perhaps, I hope, in order to think about and imagine a completely different future in Israel and in Palestine for everyone who lives there. Raz Sigal, thank you so much. I think there's definitely going to be some soul searching here in Israel uh, about this, and definitely people want answers as to how this attack could have even taken place in the first place. Thank you so much for joining us. 
I do want to move now to our foreign correspondent, Britt Klenich. She's also here in Tel Aviv, been monitoring the situation when it comes to people leaving this country, U.S. nationals in particular. Britt, U.S. nationals were told over the weekend to head to the Israeli port of city of Haifa. 2,000 left on a boat headed to Cyprus. What happens next for them? Well, James, you were talking about soul-searching among Israelis with your former guest. That's certainly uh, been the case for the people that I've spoken to. I'm in Haifa, as you, as you just said, uh, in the northern port city. Uh, I saw hundreds of Americans, of Israelis, uh, board a cruise ship starting that 12-hour journey to Cyprus, fleeing for safety. From there, they don't know what happens next. They just know they needed to get out of here, and they're worried about a serious escalation in this war, that uh, this land invasion will take place, and things are going to get out of hand, perhaps a wider war. I met Adela Schatzberg as she's traveling with her two children. One baby was strapped to her chest. She was pushing the other in a stroller. And she hopes to join her family in Dallas by Wednesday. She said she fears for her kids. You know, they're running into the bunker almost every day. And she said yesterday she made the final decision to just do it, to just book and just to go. Uh, and, you know, she said she's constantly on edge, that she can't do that to her kids as well. She can't let them live like this. Uh, we also met a, a man called uh, Alan Cohen. And his frustration and it, it was, was really palpable. You know, he, she, he said that he has a feeling this time that this kind of thing happens every 10 years. But this time, uh, he said that Hamas got a lot smarter, that they have developed their technology, that Israel uh, got caught this time, and that they can't let that happen. Uh, he said that Israel has always gone for the knife, the knife first, that, and that this time, enough is enough. And I know today that you were at an IDF facility where you got a bit of a look at the world's best air defense system, the Iron Dome. I've been getting a lot of messages about that. People wonder what it is and how it works. And I think we want to know just how it could have failed uh, so catastrophically on Saturday to intercept quite so many missiles. What can you tell us about that? That's right. Well, IDF officials tell me they're very confident that it can, uh, you know, meet the mark and meet the task of the days ahead. Uh, you know, it has a more than 90 percent um, interception rate and, and 6,000 rockets, the IDF officials tell me, have been fired from uh, Gaza in the last week. Just to give you compa comparison, in 50 days in the conflict of uh, 2014, Hamas fired more than 5,000 rockets. So the challenge is huge. Um, but as I say, IDF officials are extremely confident uh, that they c it can face its ultimate task, James. Britt, thank you so much. And yeah, we're hearing it uh, come into uh, kind of activation when we're here in Tel Aviv, when we hear the booms overhead. That is the Iron Dome taking Hamas rockets out midair. Thank you, Britt. I'll, Kira, I'll send it back to you. All right, James, appreciate it so much. Britt, you as well. Now let's talk about what's happening here in our nation's capital. A State Department spokesperson now says that Secretary of State Blinken and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu have been forced to shelter in a bunker twice with the war cabinet after rocket sirens went off in Tel Aviv. Let's listen. Our senior White House correspondent, Selena Wang, is there at the White House, along with our Elizabeth Schulze, who is at the Pentagon. As we look at these pictures, Selena, this is coming as Netanyahu also invited President Biden to visit Israel. How do you think this could impact the president's potential trip? Well, Kira, any presidential trip abroad requires a huge amount of logistical planning and security. Add on top of that, the fact that this is an active war zone. However, if President Biden does go, this would be hugely symbolic as a show of support to Israel and a message of deterrence to the likes of Iran and Hezbollah not to get further involved. However, it could also complicate President Biden's message politically if he is there when Israel begins this potentially imminent ground invasion that would worsen the already very dire humanitarian circumstances in Gaza. In fact, I was just interviewing protesters who are gathered all around the White House just outside. It's still ongoing right now. And several Jewish protesters told me that they think President Biden's response has been catastrophic and shameful. They say if President Biden does go to Israel, he needs to speak directly with Prime Minister Netanyahu and demand for a ceasefire. Now, the president, he gave an interview over the weekend, and he said that it would be a big mistake for Israel to reoccupy Gaza and 
That is a clear sign that he does believe there are some limits to Israel's retaliation. But those protesters I spoke to, they say Biden's, the president's words are not enough, including his calls now to really differentiate the Palestinians from Hamas, from Hamas, and he recognizes that the Palestinians are also suffering. So, Elizabeth, what more do we know about this meeting between Blinken and Netanyahu? Well, Kara, we know this meeting has been going on for quite some time. It's been part of a diplomatic push by Secretary of State Antony Blinken as he's been meeting with top Israeli officials and also other Arab leaders trying to continue to show U.S.'s full support for Israel to defend itself while also making this push for humanitarian aid and to consider the civilian loss of life as Israel continues to carry out uh, the attacks in Gaza. Now, we know that when it comes to uh, the meeting that's taken place, that actually had to get moved to another location, Kira. A State Department spokesperson tells us that after those air sirens went off in Tel Aviv, uh, Secretary of State Blinken and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu moved to an area that was part of the IDF that was uh, guarded by them, and they are continuing to meet uh, after that, after they were forced to bunker for, for and be in the bunker for five minutes, Kira. So, Elizabeth, you know, many Americans are trying to leave both Israel and Gaza. Uh, can you talk more about U.S. efforts to assist? Right. And you heard Britt earlier mention this push to send a cruise-like ship that could accommodate a 2,000 U.S. citizens and their immediate family members to leave from Israel uh, over to Cyprus and then from there back to the U.S. The U.S. is also chartering flights that will leave from Tel Aviv's main airport, and that's happening over the next couple of days. Could go on a bit longer than that. But when you talk about leaving from Gaza, that's a very different story, Kira, and that's something that the U.S. has not had as much success uh, getting across, despite these high-level meetings from Secretary of State Blinken with lead the president of Egypt and other leaders. So far, no clear path for how those citizens can get out. So, Selena, the U.S. is also working with Egypt to open the Rafah crossing there in Gaza. Where do those talks stand at this point? Well, you just heard what Elizabeth said so far. Those diplomatic efforts have not been successful, even though we've seen the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, trying to push Egypt and Israel to open that Rafah border crossing. Now, no aid, that means, has been led into Gaza, as far as we know, and that means the people there are still trapped. There is no way out. A State Department official has told us that there are people that are near the border, as close to the border as they can get on the Egypt side, but they have not been able to get in to help America's inside Gaza because of very serious serious security threats. We have heard Egyptian officials, they are blaming Israel for not cooperating with bringing aid into Gaza. And then we've also heard that there are fears from Israel. We believe that they think Hamas may try to interfere with that flow of aid. Kira. All right, Selena Wang at the White House and Elizabeth Schulze there at the Pentagon. Ladies, thank you so much. And coming up, Jim Jordan going for the gavel, even saying he will force a vote by tomorrow if he has to. We are live on the Hill as we follow the uphill battle to elect a House Speaker. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Glad you're streaming with us here in Washington. Well, Congress still is in complete disarray as the House spends yet another day without a speaker. Republicans are coalescing, though, behind Ohio Rep Jim Jordan after he won that vote among Republicans for speaker last week behind closed doors. But does Jordan even have enough support to win a full vote tomorrow? I want to bring in our contributing political correspondent, Rachel Bade, again. She's on the Hill. So, Rachel, how's it looking for Jordan at this hour? And what happens if he fails to win the gavel this week? 
Kira, the Jordan allies are saying they're very confident right now and think that he's actually on the brink of winning the gavel. I mean, just a couple of days, if you think about it, there were a number of lawmakers, 55 House Republicans, in fact, who voted against him in a secret ballot election saying that they didn't want, want him to be speaker. And I was hearing from a number of these guys saying that they were in touch with each other. They were going to form some sort of collective uh, block, if you will, to make sure Jordan wouldn't get the votes uh, to, to actually win the gavel. But now, this morning and early afternoon, we're seeing his opponents basically tripping over themselves to say that they are now supporting him. A lot of these people who were out there last week saying they were a never Jordan person are now coming out and saying they will support him. People like Ann Wagner, who last week said, quote, hell no, she will never support him, now saying that she will actually vote for him. What does this mean? It means that the pressure campaign that the Jordan allies have been putting on House Republicans, it's working right now. And they're very, feeling very confident that they will lose less than five votes. They can only lose four, uh, and that he will ultimately get the gavel. And I think, you know, if he doesn't get this tomorrow, one thing I think we could actually see is that Jordan will actually fight for this. There was some talk, you know, just a couple of days ago, if Jordan went down and he couldn't win the speakership, could lawmakers empower this acting speaker, Patrick McHenry? Could they work with Democrats to elect some sort of moderate re speaker, moderate Republican speaker? I think now Jordan is going to be so close here uh, that he's actually going to fight for this. And we could see if he doesn't get on the, the, the first ballot that he goes over and over and over again as he tries to keep these members in a pressure cooker. So let's talk about Democrats and how they're reacting to House Republicans sort of falling in line here. Oh, yes. Uh, to say they're giddy is an understatement, I can say here. I was just texting with a Democratic campaign aide who told me that while a Jim Jordan speaker a speaker Jim Jordan would be bad for the country and bad for America. It would be pretty good for our 2024 election results. Democrats are already seizing on the idea that Jordan is going to be speaker. They've been blasting a number of Republicans in swing districts for coming out and saying that they will support Jim Jordan. And look, this is a guy Democrats think they can really hobble moderate Republicans with. He was one of Donald Trump's top allies on January 6th to try to overturn the election results here for the Electoral College. Um, he has been sort of embroiled in this scandal at Ohio State University regarding uh, a former doctor who was alleged to have um, uh, sexually, sexually misconduct uh, and, and sexually assaulted a number of wrestlers. Um, and he's close with Donald Trump. These are all things Democrats think they can use against him uh, and against, in particular, moderate Republicans in these swing districts. But at the same time, Democrats are going to have to work with this guy. If they thought Kevin McCarthy was bad and that Kevin McCarthy was their worst nightmare, well, they're really in for something else because Jim Jordan has cheered shutdowns in the past. He's cheered fiscal brinksmanship. And they're going to now have to negotiate with this guy if they want to keep the government open. All right, stay tuned. It's going to be an interesting 24 hours. Rachel, thank you. And coming Thanks. up, more continuing coverage of the war between Israel and Hamas. Back to Tel Aviv after a quick break. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. So glad you're streaming with us as we continue our can coverage of the war in the Middle East. Secretary of State Blinken and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu have been forced to shelter in a bunker twice with the war cabinet after these rocket sirens, as you can hear, went off in Tel Aviv. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, who's been anchoring along with me here, he is in Tel Aviv. So, I mean, just put this into perspective. Uh, James, you know, a few days ago, we weren't hearing them. And now you, a number of times, 
programs have had to jump off the air and shelter in place. And now even Netanyahu and the Secretary of State having to do the same thing. Yeah, Kira. Look, I mean, I think you and I were talking about this a little earlier. I've been to Ukraine a number of times over the last uh, year and a half, and you hear air sirens there, and Ukrainians tend actually just to get on with their day. They don't really respond because they're that used to hearing them. It's very different here in Israel. Israelis, when they hear those sirens, they don't mess about. They get in to bunkers because those rockets can hit very, very quickly. And people here in Tel Aviv, they're not used to hearing them that often. It's really only normally in the south where these rockets uh, are usually a menace to local Israeli communities. But up here in Tel Aviv, it's, it's less common. But this week, it's been getting more and more common. And yes, we've had uh, international delegations having to take cover. We know that uh, there's a possibility that President Biden might visit the region. And that's definitely part of, I think, the White House's calculations. Will he or won't he come? Because if he does, then will he be forced to end up going into a bunker? I think that must be part of, of their thinking as well. But look, you know, people here in Tel Aviv at the moment, they are sitting in anticipation, in real concern and worry about what's coming next because, yes, everybody here knew someone who was caught up in that attack on Saturday, but in the same way, everybody pretty much knows someone who is being called up to serve in some way, either as part of the standing army or as one of the reservists. And I think there are families up and down this country who are wondering what's next for their loved ones as they answer that call to serve uh, with the IDF. They don't know what Hamas has in store for them. We do think there's going to be a ground incursion, uh, but what, quite what that looks like, we don't know, and quite what Hamas's response is, we don't know. And of course, of course, the world's eyes are on Gaza, watching as the bombardments continue, watching as tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are on the move from the north, trying to get south to uh, avoid uh, this uh, incursion. And of course, women and children being caught up in these ongoing bombardments. It's a very fast-moving situation, uh, but we're all watching with real concern. Kira. And we'll keep moving through it uh, with you by our side. James, appreciate it so much. And thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips along with James Longman there in Tel Aviv. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis from breaking news to all the stories that matter to you. You can find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We have a lot more ahead. Stay with us. James and I will be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news.
Today on ABC News Live, Israel at war with Hamas. Pictures for you out of Tel Aviv now. This hour, the IDF announcing it killed the head of Hamas's intelligence with a rocket strike as Israel prepares for that ground invasion inside Gaza. Hello everyone, I'm Kira Phillips here in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And I'm James Longman in Tel Aviv. Israel has been launching strikes for more than a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Earlier, sirens sounded in Jerusalem, central Israel, and here in Tel Aviv as Israeli lawmakers met in the Knesset before it stopped its session. Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke, saying there will be a thorough investigation into the Hamas attacks, and he warned Iran and Hezbollah that they would pay a heavy price if they test Israel. The Palestinian Ministry of Health saying more than 2,700 people have been killed in the Israeli strikes, while the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces prepare for that major ground assault. Egypt is blaming Israel for not allowing the only border crossing out of Gaza into Egypt to open from the Palestinian side. Well, from the old city of Jerusalem, one of the world's most revered and visited sites, it is now all but abandoned. Rows and rows of businesses have closed up shop near sites which are regarded as holy in Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Such sites like the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Western Wall and the church that stands where Christians believe Jesus was buried and resurrected. All these places are mostly empty now. Inez de la Cueta is reporting for us in Jerusalem. Inez, good to see you. First up, the Secretary of State met one-on-one -on -one with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his war cabinet. He's on his way to meet with the Israeli President Herzog. What can we expect from these meetings? Hey, James. Yeah, so Secretary of State Antony Blinken back in Israel. He was here uh, last week. He then embarked on a tour of the Middle East. He went to Saudi Arabia, for instance, to Egypt to try and shore up support for Israel and try and deter actors hostile to Israel from uh, getting involved here. And Blinken now back in Israel. He did touch down earlier today. He was here in Jerusalem. He was also in uh, Tel Aviv meeting with the prime minister, meeting with the opposition leader as well, and meeting with a number of Israeli leaders. Uh, we understand that sirens went off as uh, Blinken was meeting with Netanyahu with uh, the traveling press with Blinken, Blinken having to uh, shelter in place and uh, we do know that uh, sirens also went off in Jerusalem while the Knesset was meeting and, and leaders there had to shelter in place the Prime Minister also had to shelter in place now as far as prob uh, what, what as to what came out of these meetings um, we do know that uh, Blinken reiterated his firm support the US's firm support for Israel uh, he reiterated that Israel has a right to defend itself but Blicken is in a tricky position because as he is trying to uh, you know reiterate the US's unwavering support for Israel he also has uh, the, you know the, these uh, Palestinian Americans who are inside Gaza on his mind he's trying to negotiate for uh, Israel and Egypt to open up humanitarian corridors to uh, possibly allow some of these people into Egypt and to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza growing calls around the world for humanitarian aid to be allowed into Gaza and the US trying to uh, you know pressure Israel there and Egypt to, to come to, to some sort of, of agreement. Um, and, and Blinken, of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, thinking about the hostages as well. We know a number of Americans are still being held hostage inside Gaza. Jerusalem is tense at the best of times. I've spent a fair bit of time there. You've been there now for a couple of days. How is it different right now? Uh, you know, I know there's also been some violence on the occupied West Bank as well. You know, the, the atmosphere there must be pretty different at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's surreal to see. Anyone who's been here to the old city in Jerusalem knows just how bustling it is, how much activity there typically is, how loud it typically is. And uh, we were there, uh, you know, yesterday, and, and it was um, a ghost town. There are rows and rows of shops that have closed down. We spoke to some residents who were talking about how they had never seen it like this before in their lifetimes. Uh, others who were drawing comparisons to the COVID-19 pandemic. We uh, went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Like you mentioned off the top there, it's the church where Christians believe that Jesus was... Uh, 
uh, buried in and, and then resurrected. And that's typically a site uh, that is packed and there's a long line to, to get into some of these sites. And that, it, I mean, it was, it was completely empty. It felt like we were getting a private tour of, you know, one of, of the, the holiest and, and, and most visited uh, sites uh, for Christians. So um, really a, a surreal sight to see. I think there's a lot of tensions here. Uh, Palestinians here worried about what's to come. Uh, they were telling us they, they are hoping for the best. They're hoping for peace. But they are worried that, you know, what's happening in, in the Gaza Strip will have an impact here as well. Um, tensions have been rising in the West Bank. We do know that at least 50 Palestinians now have been killed in the West Bank and East Jerusalem since this all uh, first started. And, uh, you know, growing concerns that it's just going to get worse. Now we're talking to you now, and I can see these, these images of the Damascus Gate. It's pretty startling to see these, these places completely empty of people. It's the old town of Jerusalem as well. It's usually a divided city, but there have been people coming out on the streets of Arab cities around the world in support of the Palestinians. And yet in Jerusalem, there haven't. Uh, tell us why. What, what is... What, what is stopping Palestinians from coming out in massive numbers? Because I think we did expect that on Friday, and it didn't happen to the degree that I think a lot of people expected. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a real fear here. Um, there is a, a, a very, very heavy police presence here on the streets of Jerusalem. We know that police have set up checkpoints in a number of different parts of the city. Uh, Palestinians we spoke with were telling us that they, you know, are, are reluctant to come to the old city because of all these checkpoints that they have to go through. At Damascus Gate that you mentioned, um, you know, that there have always been, there's always been a heavy security presence there, but it's been ramped up. And we saw, I mean, we saw it for ourselves, young Palestinian men being, uh, you know, uh, stopped and, and taken into some of these um, uh, kind of guard houses to be searched and 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 it's a, a tense atmosphere and so I think you know people were telling us that there is fear and we've seen videos surfacing of, of Palestinians being uh, arrested and searched and beaten and um, yeah I think there, there are real uh, concerns here there, there's fear and so people telling us that as of right now they they prefer to stay home and that's likely why we didn't see uh, you know a, a massive uh, any kind of massive demonstrations on uh, Friday on that day of rage. Inez de la Qatar in Jerusalem. Thank you, Kira. I'll throw it back to you. James, thanks so much, Inez, and thank you. And joining us uh, now is contributor and former State Department official Steve Ganyard. Steve, Israel could begin this ground assault really at any moment. How do you expect that to unfold? Just from your experience, we thought it was going to happen over the weekend. Now everybody is sort of wondering what it's going to take uh, to get this going. Yeah, Kerry, I think there are going to be um, some some uh, factors that wouldn't necessarily uh, what we wouldn't necessarily see in say uh, a major U.S. Uh, kickoff here. I think most of the element of surprise is gone. Uh, everyone knows that the uh, that the Israelis plan to go into Gaza. Uh, so I think what they're waiting for is to continue with the bombardment, to continue to hit the targets that they can, uh, do what they can to take out Hamas with the bombardments. But also, uh, the Israelis operate very differently uh, in and around Gaza. It's a very small area, as you know. Uh, and when the aircraft attack, the aircraft are actually releasing ordnance inside of Israel. So they don't have to fly over uh, fly over Gaza. Uh, there's some reports that there are some uh, handheld surface to air missiles that uh, Hamas has. Uh, and so they're just protecting those aircraft uh, by using drones. So they have different kinds of drones and they have big drones, small drones uh, of all sorts, but they tend to stack them over Gaza. And each of these drones have a different function. So some are intelligence gatherers, some are used for targeting, for lasing, uh, some are used just for general uh, intelligence gathering purposes. So they have all these drones and all these intelligence collection assets over uh, Gaza, uh, some of them need clear weather. And so the weather is beginning to clear up in the next few days, should be clearer. So if there's a reason to hold back on the on the uh, invasion of Gaza due to weather, uh, I think that that'll clear up and, and we may see it in the next couple of days. And just, you know, put into perspective, how do you <clears throat> execute a hostage rescue? Uh, at, at the same time, you, you want to go into an area and just blow out all Hamas cells. Um, do you enter in an, a, a total ground invasion before, I guess, tracking or, or having some type of intelligence to know where those hostages are being held? Well, your, your last point is the hardest point, Kira, and that is where are they being held? 
Uh, no doubt they're being held underground. Uh, Hamas is very smart about intelligence. Uh, they totally surprised the uh, the Israelis uh, in the invasion. Uh, so they're going to be very smart on uh, not using things that can be uh, uh, sort of cell phones or radios or anything that can be picked up that would give away the location of any of the hostages. So uh, they're going to be held underground. Remember that in Gaza, there's all sorts of tunnels. Hamas has had years to tunnel uh, so that they could stay out of uh, Israel's sight, uh, and they can also store arms underneath the uh, in these tunnels. And so there are lots of ways for Hamas to hold these these prisoners uh, in ways, these hostages in ways that uh, the Israelis really have no good uh, ability to uh, to track them. Uh, now, human intelligence, Israeli human intelligence, is quite good. Uh, but to your other point here, just the chaos of conducting a conventional uh, campaign of any kind while bombing is going on and to coordinate that with special operations uh, extraordinarily difficult and and you know I know John Kirby said today that there's nothing up there are no options off the table about U.S. boots on the ground <clears throat> there is no way that I think that that uh, that any special operations command kinds of capabilities uh, that the U.S. had would be allowed first of all by Israel into Gaza uh, second of all the degree of cooperation and coordination that would be required would be extraordinary uh, and if the Israelis can't do it you know they've got a lot more people in there than we do uh, then I don't know who is. Uh, I've also, uh, in talking to folks who have worked with the special ops folks in Israel, they are much more open to risk than U.S. Uh, in extremis, extremis hostage rescue teams are. And so they'll go in and if they know they may lose some hostages, but they'll be able to kill all the kidnappers. Uh, the Israelis have a much higher risk profile. In other words, they would go in at times when most U.S. teams would not go in. So all those factors combined, I, it's just it's just hard to imagine how anything could be going on unless they had some very, very specific intelligence and they were to stop the uh, the conventional bombing and had create a corridor for these special ops folks to get in. Yeah, that would be the only way to, to target those tunnels, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when you were talking about the complexity of those tunnels and that's where they'd be hiding weapons and leaders and even hostages, I was thinking about after 9-11 and remember the air campaign to just mm -hmm. totally take out Tora Bora and, and all the tunnels, believing that Osama bin Laden and all his henchmen, you know, were hiding uh, there uh, within all those caves and tunnels that they had created. This is a totally different story. Yeah, it, the, again, Hamas has had years to dig these tunnels <clears throat> because they've had to. No other way to hide their weapons, no other way to uh, find ways in and out. They tunnel under the uh, uh, the fences to going into Egypt, so they move supplies in and out that way. Uh, so it, it's a, it's very, very tough not for the Israelis to track uh, crack from an intelligence perspective, and it's why that they will have to put troops on the ground. You cannot bomb your way to to killing uh, all of Hamas to to bringing down Hamas. They're going to have to put troops on the ground. They're going to have to do very dangerous things. You remember back during Vietnam, uh, Kira, that uh, that the uh, U.S. forces uh, faced the same thing in South Vietnam with uh, with the Viet Cong, uh, where they would have these massive uh, uh, underground networks. So you'd come across a village and you'd think, oh, it's a perfectly normal village. But there'd be a whole underground network where they'd be uh, hiding weapons caches. It also made it very tough for U.S. forces to uh, to uh, fight the Viet Cong that way because the Viet Cong could pop up. They'd see where the U.S. was going. And Hamas will do the same thing. They'll say, oh, the Israelis are over here on this street. But they'll have a tunnel entrance or an exit. They'll be able to pop up from behind uh, and, uh, and ambush the Israelis. So very, very tough. It's this... It's this idea of the vertical dimension of urban warfare, where not only do you have this underground in Gaza, but you also have uh, this vertical uh, dimension to these tall buildings where uh, Israeli troops are going to have to fight their way to the top floor, all the while while they're being shot at from uh, from downward uh, from, from Hamas. So it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, we'll see how much more bombing they want to do before they feel comfortable going in, uh, but it's going uh, to be bloody for both sides. Yeah, and, and I think the most gut-wrenching thing I heard you say is that it may mean hostages are killed in the process. We'll continue to follow it. It's always great to have your insight and experience. Appreciate you so much, Steve. Thanks. James, I'll take it back to you. Thanks, Kira. Thank you, Kira. Uh, we have actually just learned, ABC News has just learned, that the Red Cross, the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, has spoken to Hamas leadership. Uh, and I want to bring you now in to, to tell us more about this as the spokesperson for the International Committee for the Red Cross. Jason, thank you for being with us. 
I understand that you have, your organization has now had face-to-face -face meetings with the Hamas leadership. What, what did you learn? What can you tell us? This is a relationship that we've had for years, uh, perhaps decades, uh, and this is the kind of work that we do in conflicts around the world. We talk to all sides in order to advance humanitarian interests. So in this case, yes, we have had face-to-face -face talks with uh, the leadership of Hamas. Uh, we are insisting on three things. Uh, first of all, that the hostages be released immediately. Barring that, we're also asking for access to the hostages so that our teams can visit in person, assess the conditions they're being held in, check on their health conditions. And number three is we are advocating uh, for um, communication uh, between the hostages and the family members. And this is just um, a, a, an emotional alleviation for all the suffering that the families are going through, that the hostages are going through. A simple message back and forth uh, can bring a world of relief. It's a, an extremely basic uh, humanitarian um, initiative uh, that uh, we're advocating be carried out in this situation here. I mean, you may be the only organization on earth currently that is in direct contact with Hamas. Have they given you any indication of proof of life? Uh, any indication of how many hostages are uh, currently in captivity? All these questions that you're asking are, of course, natural, and uh, many people want to know the answers to these questions. Because of the way the International Committee of the Red Cross works, we say these two words very often inside our organiz organization, bilateral, meaning just between us and them, and confidential. So as natural it is to want to know the answers to those questions, that, that, that's the kind of information that we don't share. Uh, we have our way of working. It's in, designed and intended to increase trust. Uh, and, and so all organizations, in this case Hamas, view us uh, reliably. So we wouldn't share those details. Uh, the only thing we would say publicly are those points I said earlier. We want to increase family contacts. Contacts. We want to visit and check, carry out health checks uh, with the hostages. And of course, we want them to be released. And would you be in a position there then after that to facilitate a uh, hostage exchange, uh, some kind of deal between Hamas? Uh, because I think you know people here in Israel, obviously, as you well imagine, are desperate for news, desperate, desperately hope that they can get their loved ones out of Gaza. So if I could split the contents of your question in half, we would be in a position to facilitate the release in that we can come up with the modalities for it to happen. There might be an issue of a simultaneous something or other. Uh, I don't know what the details of that might look like. Um, that is to say, we have experience we have experience um, facilitating hostage releases in a safe manner um, with uh, the trust of all sides involved. The other part of your question is, is much better addressed to the political leadership of the two sides. Uh, we, Although we facilitate contacts between family members uh, and uh, we advocate for the, the good treatment of hostages, we do not get involved in the political negotiations uh, what might take place, uh, that's not our role at all. We're strictly on the humanitarian side of this equation. I completely understand. But in the meantime, Jason Stratziu, so thank you so much. I think that's going to give at least a tiny bit of hope to the families here in Israel to know that at least someone is in contact with Hamas at the moment. Kira, I'll send it back to you. Thank you. Jason, thanks so much. And James, thanks to you, of course. Coming up, Jim Jordan going for the gavel, even saying he will force a vote by tomorrow if he has to. We are live on the Hill as we follow the uphill battle to elect a House Speaker. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts.
Glad you're streaming with us here in Washington, D.C. Congress in complete disarray. As the House spends yet another day without a speaker, Republicans are coalescing behind Ohio Rep Jim Jordan after he won a vote among Republicans for speaker last week behind closed doors. But does he still have enough support to win a full vote set for tomorrow? Our contributing political correspondent Rachel Bate is on the Hill, joins us with more. So Rachel, how are we looking now? Kira, the Jim Jordan camp is sounding more bullish than I've heard them ever before. They had another uh, endorser come out just a few minutes ago, Congressman Vern Buchanan. This is a guy who said he wouldn't back Jim Jordan just a few days ago, is now tweeting that he will support him on the floor. And this is the fourth lawmaker we saw do this in the past just couple of hours. I mean, Ann Wagner, who was a top uh, ally of Steve Scalise, who was running for the speakership just a few days ago, had accused Jordan of basically sabotage and treachery and said that she would never back him. Uh, and now she also is back him. I think it's important to sort of uh, step back here and look at the difference between what's going on with Jordan today and what happened with Steve Scalise last week. The longer Steve Scalise's campaign stood out there to become speaker, the more we saw opponents come out and say they wouldn't support him to the point that it just became untenable for him and he withdrew. We're seeing the opposite happen right now. We're seeing people who were against Jim Jordan a couple of days tweet and come out publicly and say they have talked to him, talked about their concerns with him, uh, and that they are now going to back him on the floor. And I think the reasons for that are twofold. Number one, Jordan is the darling of the far right. The base loves him. And there is a major pressure campaign going on with House Republicans to get in line behind him. And number two, you also have to, have to think about the, the types of Republicans that don't want Jordan to be speaker. These are Republicans who are team players, Republicans who are moderates, who don't want to see the institution be paralyzed. And so it just very much goes against their nature to say, no, we're not going to back you and we're going to keep us in this logjam for a long time, Kira. And let's talk about why Jim Jordan and, and just his history in Congress and what actually brought him here. It's so fascinating, Kira, because, you know, I've been covering Jordan for more than a decade, and he used to be the most reviled member of the House Republican Conference. His own colleagues loathed him because he tormented Republican leaders for making deals with Democrats. He cheered shutdown showdowns and fiscal brinksmanship when it came to the debt ceiling. He wanted to impeach all these Obama officials when other Republicans thought there was no merit for that. So how do we get to this moment right now? He's really reformed himself over the past three years. He has become an ally of Kevin McCarthy, became a chairman on the House Judiciary uh, Committee. That means he's sort of expected to row with the team, as Republicans like to say, and he certainly has started to work better with these colleagues. However, it's important to note that if it was up to most Republicans in the House, Jordan would not be Speaker. They don't love him that much that they're super happy about that. But we are in a situation right now where there are about half a dozen to 12 conservatives who are basically holding the House hostage. And when it comes to a speaker they will actually support, Jordan right now seems to be the only person they will get behind. And so that's why he has such an advantage right now. You know, it's funny you mentioned that he used to be the most reviled and, and that he's sort of changed his temperament. But you know as well as I do, anytime you watch some type of hearing, committee hearing, yeah. you always know his voice. He's always one of the loudest <laughs> and he's always the one creating uh, so much debate. Uh, well, and here we are again. Uh, we'll see if uh, indeed the vote goes down tomorrow. We'll be talking. Rachel Bay, thank you so much. And coming up, Continuing coverage of the war between Israel and Hamas. Keep it right here after a short break. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Memphis, I'm Steve Losanzani. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Live pictures now out of Gaza. There were thousands of people are already gathered at the southern border near Rafah, crossing desperately, trying to get into Egypt before Israel begins that ground invasion into Gaza. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, joining us once again from Tel Aviv. You know, new warnings of potential threats here in the U.S. now, uh, creating a lot of fear that we could have more problems here stateside, uh, James. And it happened after that horrific attack we reported on today in Illinois, where that six-year-old Palestinian boy was stabbed to death, his mother critically injured after the landlord showed up at the front door. Um, basically harassing them and saying horrible uh, things and, and killing, killing her son. Yeah, that's right, Kira. I think President Biden said that he was uh, sickened by the murder and he condemned Islamophobia. He said this is a horrific uh, act of hate. The boy's uncle has been speaking at a press conference in place of his father, who's too emotional to speak. Have a listen. We're not in war. The war is overseas. You want war? It's overseas. It's not our war. It's not the United States war. And we're gathering here to say we need to save our kids. James, it's just so heartbreaking. I was reading more about the family. They came here to the United States, like so many uh, immigrants do, for a better life, uh, to make a better life for their kids. Um, totally just innocent bystanders in, in all of this. I mean, it's, it's appalling. Kira, and it goes to show how this small strip of land here in the Middle East is just having such a huge effect all around the world. The impact here is reverberating uh, across the globe. I do, though, just want to bring you a couple of updates here from, from, from Tel Aviv. We heard just in the last few moments that we know that there's at least one organization, the International Community of the Red Cross, Committee of the Red Cross, that is in speaking face to face with Hamas about those hostages. That is not something I think anybody, any of us knew before. So the possibility of getting some of these hostages out of Gaza, I think, is at least on the table. Um, and that was surprising to me that, that already the International Committee of the Red Cross is, is speaking to Hamas about that. They wouldn't divulge the, the contents of their conversations, but I think it's heartening for families here. Also, we're hearing that uh, Khalid Meshal, who is the leader of Hamas based in Qatar, he has been speaking to Arab television, and he has said that among those prisoners uh, are soldiers of high military ranks from within the Gaza division. Uh, and I think a suggestion, perhaps, that uh, dual national hostages are not of uh, as much importance as those members of Israel's armed forces. So we'll see. I mean, we've got a lot more to discuss, but um, this is new on the hostages for the time being. I'll throw it back to you. And it sounds uh, like there could be uh, some hope within all of that. So glad you're streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm James Longman in Tel Aviv. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Hi everyone, I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live this hour, starting with Israel at war with Hamas. The IDF announcing it indeed killed the head of Hamas's intelligence in a rocket strike as Israel prepares for that ground invasion inside Gaza. Israel has been launching strikes for more than a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Earlier, sirens sounded in Jerusalem as lawmakers met within the Knesset. Take a listen. And just before the Knesset stopped its session, Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke, saying there will be a thorough investigation into all the Hamas attacks and warning Iran and Hezbollah that they will pay a heavy price. The Palestinian Ministry of Health saying more than 2,700 people have been killed in the Israeli strikes, while the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces prepare for that ground assault. All of this happening as at least 200 hostage, two hostages, actually 200 hostages remain in custody. Well, the closing bell ringing on Wall Street. Stocks rallied to start the week with all major averages jumping at about 1%. Investors appear to be optimistic about the state of the economy despite growing volatility from Israel's war against Hamas. And the judge overseeing former President Trump's federal election interference case partially granted the government's request for a gag order restricting the former president from making any disparaging statements related to this case. U.S. District Judge Tanya Chetkin ruling that the former president is prohibited from making or reposting statements publicly targeting special counsel Jack Smith, his staff, or the court. Trump is also barred from making statements about potential witnesses in the case and potential testimony. Former president, however, can still attack former Vice President Mike Pence as part of a political campaign against one another as they both pursue the 2024 presidential bid. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can also find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. Millions scrambling to escape a looming Israeli ground invasion in Gaza. Civilians caught in the crossfire in the widening humanitarian emergency. At least 30 Americans among the thousands killed and U.S. families among those racing to leave the region. ABC News Chief Global Affairs Correspondent Martha Raddatz joins us from Tel Aviv with the latest and a look inside one of the kibbutz communities decimated by the violence. Plus, excelling on the field and as a mom, a career full of goals met and mastered. Eva's conversation with women's national soccer team star Julie Ertz on her retirement, the broadcast exclusive. And we're celebrating 100 years of the Walt Disney Company. Our Ginger Z at Walt Disney World with a special preview of Jollywood Nights. <laughs> Plus, there's nothing like seeing Disney magic on stage. Frozen, The Lion King, Mary Poppins, and so much more. The leading ladies of Disney on Broadway are here in our studio with a medley of your favorite tunes. Also, we honor the century mark with the tip of the hat to the man who started it all, Walt Disney. Our tribute to him with his favorite Disney anthem. Plus, staying alive. The New York Liberty force a game four against the Las Vegas Aces. Lots of celebs cheering them to victory, including a familiar face. Now from Times Square, Eva Pilgrim and DeMarco Morgan with Dr. Jen Ashton and what you need to know. It's Monday. This feels like a uh, very high energy song for a Monday. Great start for the week. <laughs> Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome to What You Need to Know as we kick off a brand new week. We'll read back for DeMarco. So glad to be back and so much to look forward to on today's show, including that big Disney celebration. Dr. Jen Ashton, how you feeling? I know. I'm kind of disappointed that we weren't sent down to Disney World mm. to cover it. Also, the weather's better in Florida. I know. <laughs> but we're going to be super excited. To Year 150 will go. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's right. We're all still around. Yeah. <laughs> We do have some health headlines that we need to talk about. A lot of parents are struggling right now with how do you talk about what is happening in Israel and and in the Gaza area with their children? Yeah. Because the kids are either seeing this on TV or they're hearing about it at school. 
what should we keep in mind you know, here? And look, adults are having a hard time with it. So I think it's first important to understand you don't have to DIY this. There are professionals who can help you navigate these. But obviously, this should be age dependent. The conversation you're going to have with a five year old is going to be different than one you'd have with a 15 year old. Um, you also want to find uninterrupted time where there's no screens, no distraction, not right before you put your child to bed to have these potential conversations or give the child space to talk to you. Ask for open-ended kind of commentary, you know, so you want to ask questions and then just sit there and listen without necessarily feeding a lot of information. So finding out what your child knows is important. And then always emphasize the positive, right? And again, do not feel like you have to navigate the, these uncharted waters by yourself. If you have trouble, ask your child's pediatrician or mental health professionals. All hugely important yeah. and formative, Dr. Yeah. Jen. Thank you yep. for all that. We do have a lot of news to get to today. Rena Roy is here with all the latest headlines. Good afternoon, Rena. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Great to see you. And what a wonderful Monday it is. We might not be down at Disney, but we do have Disney princesses singing mm. in our hallways today and some fun performances. We do have a lot of news to get to, though. We start with developments overseas bombing for a tenth straight day as Israeli troops and tanks gather at the border with Gaza, the growing humanitarian crisis, as Israeli officials vowed to crush Hamas after last week's brutal terror attack. The big question, will Egypt open its border for a few hours to let some people in? A lot of confusion on that. American citizens desperate to avoid escalating tensions, racing to board a ship at a port in Haifa bound for Cyprus. The State Department offering charter flights as well today and tomorrow. And the investigation here at home into what authorities call a hate-related killing. An Illinois man is under arrest for the stabbing death of a six-year-old boy and accused of putting his mother in the hospital, allegedly attacking them for being Muslim. President Biden condemning such attacks as un-American. Now to ABC's Ginger Z with our weather. Another drencher of a weekend as we ad advertised last week. So you see Annapolis, Maryland there. The video shows the flash flooding and unfortunately another coast to coast storm developing. It will make its way to the Great Lakes by Thursday and then eventually here Friday through Saturday into the mid-Atlantic and northeast again leaving us some 200 percent plus of normal. Much cooler here in Florida and we'll talk more about the Mississippi River's record lows again in coming days. And finally here, the New York Liberty still in it, staying alive with this win against the Las Vegas Aces, forcing a game for back in Brooklyn. You can catch the action Wednesday night at 8 on ESPN. We are rooting for them. Yes, yeah. and Barclays is crazy when they play there, so yeah. it should be a good crowd. Our very own Robin Roberts was there yes. for game three, courtside. Yeah. Saw the that. Seat. There's her, her face in the place. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rena. There's much more ahead here on GMA3. On this Monday, our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz, has been covering the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for decades. She joins us from the region next with the latest. Plus, we're taking a trip to the Magic Kingdom. Ginger Z will join us as the Walt Disney Company celebrates its 100 anniversary. Stay with us on GMA3. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky. No match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California. On the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live.
my favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back to GMA3. It's been over a week since Hamas launched a deadly surprise attack on Israel. The conflict rages on as Israel and Hamas exchange airstrikes, and now Israel appears to be on the brink of a potential ground invasion of Gaza. The escalated response comes as more than one million people in northern Gaza run for their lives to evacuate and get out of harm's way. For more on the rising tensions, here's ABC's chief global, global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz. They came to kill, firing a barrage of rockets, raiding a music festival, and taking Israelis hostage. An attack so horrific, so inhumane, it echoed the Holocaust. The remnants of the terror still everywhere. This is where it all began, heavily armed terrorists coming over from Gaza. They now call this the road of death. The Israeli Defense Forces showing us where the infiltration first began. Cars littered with bullet holes off the side of the road where Hamas ambushed Israelis in their cars and executed them. Here's the car, one of hundreds of cars. As is, the guy's backpack is still sitting on the car. Hasn't been, I would say, returned to him, but there's, there's no him to return it to. He was slaughtered. Down that road, a quiet farming community of about 800 okay, so people is... right on the border with Gaza. This is where the kill zone. This is the kill zone begins here as you drive in. Hamas infiltrating this kibbutz, penetrating fences, swooping in on motorized paragliders. We are about a mile away from Gaza right now. It's over there. You can see those buildings and a little bit of smoke still coming up from there. And this is the gate where the Hamas terrorists broke through one of 30 locations where they gained access. This video from online showing Hamas begin its relentless gunfire, unleashing its brutality on residents, even taking captive the elderly, like this grandmother from the community. Some homes lit on fire to ensure anyone who had survived Hamas's intrusion didn't. Hamas in control here for hours. The community now a ghost town. None of its residents can live there. Mayor Morovia is unsure he, his wife and two kids will ever return. I can smell the, death, the stench of death from everywhere. This is where my kids play. This is where they grow up. They murdered entire families, our friends. They murdered the children, the, the, the parents. What they did uh, to the youth, the youth neighborhood. Uh, you know, I, I'm hearing all the stories and I'm... Uh, it's too much. Yes, it's, it's brutal, you know. No shalachem? Israeli soldiers are now stationed along the fence here with the bodies of some of the Hamas terrorists still littering the ground where they died. This community, this country, forever changed. It's Israel after Gaza and Israel before Gaza. This is it. Martha, let's start with this impending ground assault. How are Israeli defense forces preparing to carry this out? Well, you can see tanks lining the road. When we were up there by the border, you can see tanks off into the forest, into the trees hidden there. But it doesn't take long when you're up there to see these preparations are well underway. You've heard Israeli officials say it will come by, by land, by sea, by air. Obviously, that's part of it. They want to coordinate all of those elements before they go in. But they have promised the complete destruction of Hamas. Obviously, we've 
talked about this a lot. The complication there is there are civilians living there, millions of civilians who want to get out of harm's way, who the U.S. is, is, is making a huge point. You have to get those civilians out of the way. You have to go by the laws of war. Martha, the death toll continues to rise on both sides of this conflict as Israel prepares for a possible ground incursion into Gaza. What are the rules of engagement as far as Israel and Gaza are concerned? The, the rules of engagement, we, we don't really know. That's essentially when a soldier goes in and can decide when he can shoot or she can shoot and when they can't. But the laws of war, you can't go shooting civilians. You can't gun down civilians or innocent people, even when you're in the midst of war. And, and so those are the things they're really concentrating on. Now, the Israelis say they are taking as much care as possible. You just said the death toll. Over 2,300 have already died. It's very very, very difficult from the air to figure this out. And they have had very little time to evacuate there. And of course, there really is nowhere to go. This, this trip that Antony Blinken has taken has not been very productive. Uh, he is trying to get them to open some sort of corridor so people can get out, so aid can get in, uh, but very confusing, as you guys said before. ABC Chief Global Affairs Correspondent Martha Raddatz, thank you so much. We'll be back in just a moment. Yeah. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden, please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. No streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Give it to me. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. from Orange County, New York on the migrant crisis. I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. The Walt Disney Company is celebrating 100 years of enchanting entertainment, which means even more magic and surprises to honor the milestone anniversary. And our very own Ginger Z is at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom in Orlando, Florida, with some very special news for this celebration. Hi, Ginger. Hey, Will, Eva, 
I am here at the most magical place on earth. Just a few friends at the Disney 100 celebration sliding into the holiday season. Look how great everybody looks. Yes. There are a few more surprises that we can look forward to this year because Hollywood Studios will host a brand new nighttime holiday party, Disney Jollywood Nights. And here to give us the inside scoop is Disney Live Entertainment's creative development director, Tom Bizana. Tom, first how of all, you? you look fantastic all Thank holiday. You. Thank you. Happy holidays early. Thank We're glad you very to be much. here. Okay, so Jollywood Nights, it's a curated adult-only experience. Yes. What do we expect? Oh, we have the best party. It's like a date night. Bring your friends a date night. It's for grown-ups, and we have these curated events that are special just for you. Like, we have the Brown Derby as a speakeasy sing-along. Oh. Uh, at the Hollywood Tower Chair, we have a tip-top club where we created an ethereal evening. We also have new stage shows. So I'm really excited about this. Here at Theater of the Stars, the incomparable Miss Piggy and Kermit the Frog are part of the action with Tian and Belle. The Hyperion Theater has a whole new show, all dedicated to Tim Burton's Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, and there's food and fun everywhere. And of course, the attractions will be open for everyone. It's going to be a blast. Now, you've got your new outfits, but I know a lot of our favorite characters are also going to be donning new looks. So tell us about that for the celebration. Yeah, we are so excited about this, Ginger, because we've made these special costumes for Mickey, Minnie, Goofy, Pluto, Donald, and Daisy, one of a kind for this event. We want you to see it. It's going to be a blast. Mm. We also have some retro characters around Echo Lake at Disney's Hollywood Studios, so uh, Max will be there in yes. his power line. Come Max. on! Yes. Yes. <laughs> Rescue Rangers with Chip and Dale. Yes. Be a lot of fun. I, you want to make me excited. You get Max out. I, he's out. All he's, right. Yes. Well, what's happening? Okay. Now, this would not be Disney, and let's all move over here if we forgot about food. We cannot forget about festive food. So, something to look forward to Disney Hollywood Studios Chef de Cuisine, Thank you. B. Candelario, here with a sneak peek. B, there's always great food, but please tell us what's special. I know we're starting over here. Yeah, we are excited about our food and beverage offerings for Disney Hollywood night. Uh -huh. uh, and here we have the Yuca con Chicha. Room. That's oh. the one I want to take. Yeah, it's a savory combination of mm. pork belly fry, juca, and ají amarillo sauce, and uh -huh. finish with a zesty lime wedge. Oh. It's delicious. Mm. This we can find it at ABC Commissary. We have a party out there. It's a fiesta what? a la calle. This that spice right yeah, there. It's really oh. good, right? That's gonna make for a hot. You're going spice. <laughs> I want to go sweet. I think. Okay, okay. Oh. we should. So I know we want to do. That looks amazing. Right. Unbelievable. That frosting I could dive into. Tell me what we're looking this at. This is a, a creation mm -hmm. of our, uh, you can have it. This okay. is a creation for our pastry team. It's actually a replica of the Christmas tree at the Echo Lake. This is a delicious oh. stack yeah. of three vanilla cookies. I read the whole thing. <laughs> vanilla cookies uh, filled with pistachio, cranberries, and raspberry jam. Wonderful. Oh, my Thank gosh. Thank you so much, B and Tom. Eva will. You're going to need to get down here because you got to eat this stuff. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we didn't get any snacks. We got no snacks. <laughs> Ginger took all the food, had all the fun. Disney's great, though. Fun for the whole family, <laughs> yeah, right? Fun for the whole family. Thank yeah. you, Ginger. Yeah. Coming up right here next on GMA3, accomplishing incredible feats on and off the field. On winning, losing, and everything in between, my exclusive conversation with soccer star Julie Ertz. When we come back. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime. Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new streaming weeknights. Dr. Jen, America's favorite doctor, is back and we're looking at a new study about how it may be good for you to reduce the number of calories you eat as you get older. This does not make me happy. <laughs> I know, I know, but hold on. There's really good science behind it. And we've talked it before about this concept of calorie restriction. This has been well published, well studied, well documented. It started with animal research, then translated over to humans. So we're talking about anything from a few hundred calories less per day than you would average take to a lot of calorie restriction. The theory is that when you restrict calories, you kind of dampen down the inflammation that occurs with aging. You boost the mitochondria, which is, you know, remembering back to our high school biology. Powerhouse of the, the cell. Powerhouse <laughs> of the cell. <laughs> and, and important for anti-aging and longevity. This was a recent study published, uh, published in the journal Aging Cell, funded by the NIH. And it was interesting because it looked at middle-aged people, people in their 40s, cut only 12% of their caloric intake, followed them over two years with muscle biopsies, and actually found changes in gene expression in their muscles that indicated the function of their muscles was preserved. They lost about 20 pounds on average, but this really wasn't about the weight loss. It was just about shaving potentially just 200 calories from what they consumed during the day. So that's, that's doable, right? <laughs> yeah. Eva still looks terrified. It feels right? like minor cuts for uh, each. Listen, with beverages, you could potentially, depending on the beverage you drink, cut it just by removing one beverage a day. Hmm. It doesn't like take my, that much. You don't have to be miserable. It's my evening chocolate that I really enjoy. Well, don't give up that. <laughs> <laughs> don't yeah. give up that. But Find other places. Calorie restriction doesn't have to be severe. Okay. Um, there you go. Continue eating. We'll be right chocolate. back. I'm going to have some <laughs> calories right here. <laughs> When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Hello everyone, I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top he headlines we're watching for you this hour on ABC News Live, starting with Israel at war with Hamas. The IDF announcing it killed the head of Hamas's intelligence in a rocket strike as Israel prepares for that ground invasion inside Gaza. Israel has been launching strikes for more than a week now in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks that killed more than 1,400 people. Earlier, sirens sounded in Jerusalem as lawmakers met in the Knesset. Take a listen. Before the Knesset stopped its session, Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke, saying there will be a thorough investigation into all Hamas attacks, warning Iran and Hezbollah that they would pay a heavy price if they even test Israel. The Palestinian ministry saying that more than 2,700 people have been killed in Israeli strikes now, while the UN reports nearly half of Gaza's population has been displaced as Israeli forces prepare for that ground assault. All of this happening as at least 200 hostages remain in Hamas custody. The judge overseeing former President Trump's federal election interference case today partially granted the government's request for a gag order restricting the former president from making any disparaging statements related to the election case. U.S. District Attorney Tanya Chekin ruling that the former president is prohibited from making or reposting statements publicly targeting special counsel Jack Smith, his staff, or the court. Trump is also barred from making statements about potential witnesses in the case and their potential testimony. Former President Trump, however, can still attack former Vice President Mike Pence as part of their political campaign against one another for the 2024 presidential race. And back here in Washington, Congress still in complete disarray as the House sends yet another day without a speaker. Republicans coalescing behind Ohio Rep Jim Jordan after he won the vote among Republicans last week in a closed door get together. Well, the House Judiciary Chairman does plan to bring a public vote to the floor of the House tomorrow, but it's unclear whether or not he has the 217 votes needed to become speaker. House's unprecedented state of limbo comes as the war continues to rage on between Israel and Hamas, as well as in Ukraine, and a potential government shutdown looming just months away. President Biden preparing to request more than $2 billion in aid for Ukraine and Israel. Treasury Secretary uh, Yellen hopeful that the House will approve the additional funds once they have a speaker. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. More GMA3 right now. No, Taylor Swift's Eras Tour film already hitting a financial high note in the U.S., the biggest opening for a concert film ever, making $96 million since opening early last Thursday. Wow. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Good job, Taylor. She right. continues to dominate. I read a headline that says that that movie is making movie theaters into, like, dance halls. Yeah, definitely. Venue, right? <laughs> Super fun. Go. We'll have to go team field trip. Anyway, <laughs> Dr. Jen is here. She joins us with a viewer's question on nutrition, which is, what are low energy dense foods and how can they help with weight loss? That's what Sasha K wants to and know. And this is just a fancy word for describing low calorie, right? When we talk about the opposite, high energy dense foods, we're talking about foods that are packed with calories. One bite has way more calories than one bite of a low energy dense food. So if you're talking about attempting a weight loss program based on this approach, you're basically just doing a very low calorie um, kind of diet, which is a lot of vegetables because they're obviously incredibly low in calories and it fill you up with fiber um, and in general foods that are low in fat. The caveat is you have to make sure you're not, you know, substituting out the fat and just getting a lot of chemicals and processed foods. But, you know, it, it's possible that it could work for a lot of people. If you eat the actual vegetables. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but you still need some protein and you still need some fat, just less of it. And all calories are created equal, but not their source because that you mentioned the processed foods and all those things. Correct. Got it. Well. Okay.
All right, your prescription for wellness. All right, it has to do with ways to reduce your sugar intake because obviously we talk about the need to, you know, really keep an eye on our added sugar in particular. So you want to read those labels and you want to find products with the lowest amount of added sugar and that is a line on the nutritional profile so it's much easier to read and find it. Pick fruit that's canned in water or natural juice um, or even rinse that fruit out if it comes in a sugary liquid. Um, beverages is critical. So you want to swap out soda for sparkling water and you can add in some citrus if you want a little bit of flavor and then trying extracts like almond, vanilla, orange or lemon, you know, they come in the little dropper. Some people just need that taste or flavor in their beverages in particular in sparkling water, but you have to give yourself time. It takes weeks or months to retrain your taste buds. It is possible, but it's not going to happen. Overnight. And you guys like a retraining of the taste buds? Oh, for sure. But it's possible. And look, our friend Phil Lipoff did it. He kicked his sugar habit. Although he still had candy in his dressing room. Right. Oh. <laughs> At least that. it wasn't in his blazer. <laughs> <laughs> Baby steps. So <laughs> all right. Thanks, Dr. Jen. And hit us up on Instagram with all your medical questions at ABC GMA3. Well, just ahead here on GMA3, she's hanging up her cleats after giving it her all. My exclusive conversation with soccer star Julie Ertz. And 100 years of making magic. It's our Disney musical tribute that'll have you singing out loud wherever you are. GMA3 will be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Now, the GMA3 exclusive. Recently, Eva sat down with that woman behind us here, women's national team member Julie Ertz. It's her first interview since retiring from the game that she dominated for years. Yeah, Julie Ertz is a two-time Olympian, a two-time World Cup champion, and this summer she played, get this, every single minute of the Women's World Cup. Wow. Less than a year after giving birth to her son, Madden, and now after playing 10 years professionally, she's hanging up her cleats and opening up about it all in our candid conversation. To any young girl that's out there that dreams to be here, it's worth it. Every part of it. 
So let's go back to the very beginning. Why soccer? Soccer just embodied like who I was and like wanted to be. Luckily, I was able to go to an incredible college. I got to be on the youth national team. Once we won the under 20 World Cup, I was like, I don't want to do anything else but this for my life. You've had a lot of life happen while you were playing soccer. I mean, you got married. You have a baby. <laughs> you're, I mean, you're, your name was different in the beginning than it is now. <laughs> yes. I feel like I was so lucky to have soccer as an outlet, really, because I think it allowed me to, to learn so much um, on and off the field and share that with my family. It really is cool how sports can unify people and be an outlet and bring you know so much emotion and it's just all because of a sport i have to ask you about the world cup because there was a lot of discussion about the u.s women's team there it is a cool way to lose on penalties the reality is you could have finished it in the run of play and the u.s will know that there was criticism of like how y'all played how did you feel about that criticism I mean, tough. I mean, obviously, we didn't have the, the greatest of outcomes at all during this year. I think it's one of those, like, common saying is, like, effort's going to be talent. And not that we didn't have effort in there. It's just we didn't put a performance on to, to win the game. And at the end of the day, if you don't score goals, you don't win games. And we know that better than anybody else. And so game's about scoring more goals, and we didn't do that. I mean, I think personally about what I was doing eight months after I had my child. And it was not playing at a professional soccer game. <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to get back. I'm not going to lie. I am just as confused as you are. I feel like the saying is it takes a village to raise a child. I guess it also takes a village and a lot of support to get back pretty quickly after pregnancy because I, I got home and was like, I don't know what just happened. Like, I, I got home, I looked at my husband, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what I just did. At what point did you decide you were going to retire? It was pretty shortly after, I think, just understanding kind of the craziness that the year was and navigating being a first-time mom. This is the moment for Julie Ertz to bid farewell and bring the curtain down on a wonderful career. Sacrificing time was probably the biggest one for me, of just realizing, like, you know, if I have to drop off Madden um, and leave. Like, man, I just, I don't want to miss any of his first. And don't get me wrong, I, I love playing, but like obviously spending time with my family, there's just nothing like it. And so I think that was just like a moment for me of I can't balance enough of what I want to do. You said when you retired, mama can still play. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like I could step away and be like, it's not because mama can't play. Mama can play. <laughs> I did say that. People seem to really like that one. In well, but also lots of people were saying you're, you were playing some of the best soccer they've seen you play in your whole career. To be able to choose yourself, like this is the right time for me. I mean, gosh, I look at my kid's face and I'm like, I just, I want to put you down to, to bed every night. I want to wake you up. I'm stepping away and knowing that like, I feel like I was playing great soccer. But at the same time, like, I have been doing this for a long time. There's just also time that I just can't get back. So I'm just gonna let my, my heart lead the way. What's next for you? Exactly. <laughs> I think a clear one is motherhood. I've really enjoyed doing our work with our foundation. Also just be okay with maybe a little bit uncertainty too. I feel like normally I'd be pretty nervous about the unknown, but I'm actually very optimistic and excited to just venture out on what's next. And she's had some cool moments, you know, Madden, her little boy, took his first steps while they were at the World Cup because he was there with her. And this is the craziest, most mind-blowing part of it all to me. She wasn't sleeping during the World Cup because he wasn't sleeping. Oh, my God. And so she still played the whole time. Every minute of all the games. Wow. That's incredible. Great career. Our thanks to Julie Ertz and the best of luck to her on her next chapter. For sure. Coming up when we come back, celebrating 100 years of Disney. We've got favorites from five iconic Disney on Broadway shows. You're going to want to sing and maybe even dance along, so stay with us. Let's celebrate. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. 
you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Reporting from Mar-a-Lago in Florida, I'm Jay O'Brien. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Let it go. Let Welcome back. Go. We are celebrating 100 go, years of Disney magic with a special performance, a medley of favorites from five of the iconic Disney on Broadway shows. So get ready to sing along and belt out those tunes at home and in the studio with your perfect pitch. <laughs> Here are the leading ladies of Disney on Broadway. Patty Murin, Kissy Simmons, Ashley Brown, Carol Lindsay, Aisha Jackson, and Casey Levy. <laughs> To dream I'd find romance But for the first time in forever At least I've got a chance There's a calm surrender To the rush of day Where the heats of the road Enchanted moment, and it sees me through. It's enough for this restless warrior just to be with you. And can you feel the love tonight? How it's left. Kings and vagabonds believe the very best. In every 
every job that must be done there is an element of fun you find the fun and snap the jobs again and every task you undertake becomes a piece of cake a lark a spree it's very clear to see that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down the medicine go down medicine go down just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down in the most delightful in the most delightful Coming up on GMA3, a special tribute to Walt Disney with his favorite song. We'll be right back. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? 
Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Welcome back. We are celebrating Disney's 100th anniversary, and we're going to keep the fun going with another great performance. This is a special tribute to the man behind the magic, Walt Disney himself. So before we go, please also help us welcome Broadway's original Mary Poppins with a performance of Walt Disney's favorite song. And here now is Ashley Brown with Feed the Birds for all of us at ABC News. Make it a great Monday. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We've had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. 
It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from East Palestine, Ohio, I'm Alex Brechet. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. here in Los Angeles and right now on ABC News Live. The U.S. and allies racing to step up with diplomatic and humanitarian efforts as the world braces for an imminent Israeli ground invasion of Gaza. The Jewish state escalating its war against Hamas, gearing up for to strike it from the air, the land, and the sea, how Israeli forces are preparing, and how they say they took out a top leader with the terror group. Also, the humanitarian crisis growing by the hour in Gaza as hundreds of thousands of civilians try to evacuate south. We have the very latest there in the push to provide aid and allow families to escape through a critical border crossing. Also, the U.S. military putting thousands of troops on a heightened state of readiness, also sending a second carrier strike group to the eastern Mediterranean. The message America is sending to Iran and its other proxy groups in the region. Of course, our top story this hour is Israel's war with Hamas. Heavy Israeli bombardments of the Gaza Strip have continued in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th. The IDF announcing today that they have killed the head of general intelligence for Hamas. This as Israeli forces position themselves for a ground invasion of Gaza. On day 10 of the war, the death toll is rising. Israeli Health Ministry reporting more than 1,400 deaths and the Palestinian Health Authority there saying more than 2,700 people have been killed in Gaza. Thousands are injured on both sides. Gaza has been without electricity for five days. And we want to show you a live look here in a moment at the Gaza Strip where the United Nations says nearly half of Gaza's population of 2 million is displaced right now. Civilians are running out of medicine, shelter, food, and water. The UN says it's now concerned about the spread of waterborne diseases as people are now drinking water from agricultural wells. Right now, ABC News Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman is joining us. He's on the ground there in Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you so much for being here with us. And first of all, Israeli forces are saying that they're in a position for this ground assault on Gaza. You had the chance to speak with members of the IDF who told you they're ready and and they're essentially waiting for the government to give that green light. Matt, any sense of when and how they would deal with the extensive tunnel system that Hamas uses? We've been seeing that readiness for days now, just a massive amount of armor, tanks, Bradleys, armored personnel carriers, mobile uh, artillery, mobile missile launchers just streaming towards that border area. We saw in the Kibbutz of Be'eri today hundreds and hundreds of soldiers, paratroopers ready to go at any moment. And in many ways, it seems that that invasion, or at least a very small part of it, has begun. Um, Israeli military officials telling me today that they have had special forces units in infantry, artillery, and tanks inside the Gaza Strip and are operating inside the Gaza Strip. Um, and they say they're essentially waiting for the government's go-ahead for that big push that it seems everybody says is probable. Let's listen to it. So there are specialized Israeli units probing into the area in Gaza, pretty much as we speak. Uh, we have uh, special forces and regular infantry, uh, artillery, tanks, uh, armored divisions, and, and battalions that are operating in that area, in the peripheral areas, conducting raids. Is Israel ready to go right now, or are they just waiting for the order? 
we're ready. You know, we're, um, there are certain levels of readiness, but if the government says now, we'll go now. And one of the major... And one of the major concerns has been the tunnels that Hamas essentially has built over a couple of decades in the Gaza Strip that honeycomb the entirety of the Gaza Strip. Um, they are booby-trapped. That's where they have their militants. That's where they keep their weapons. It's believed they may be keeping hostages there. And I talked to former deputy chief of staff of the Israeli military today, um, right near the border, and he said that they're not going to go into those tunnels. This push when it happens is going to be, he said, very, very slow. It's going to be methodical. They expect booby traps, and they're not going to actually put troops into the tunnels. Um, they say they're going to trap Hamas in the tunnels, uh, I guess somehow sabotage them, blow them up, uh, set them on fire. Unclear exactly how they're going to do it tactically, but they know what's waiting for them, and that's why I think this is going to seem like a slower incursion than many anticipated. Not the shock and awe that we saw with the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, but something a little bit more creeping and methodical, Kena. Right, not the tanks that we saw back then. That's excellent reporting, Matt. And, you know, the Israeli defense minister said today to Secretary of State Antony Blinken, this will be a long war, long war, the price will be high, but we are going to win. Matt, this has already been bloody. You were able to screen this hour-long reel of video that was compiled by the IDF that shows this initial attack by Hamas on October 7th. What more did you learn in watching that? It was obviously incredibly disturbing watching an hour-long clip reel. Um, the Israeli military wanted us to see that what they're saying is not stories. It's not concocted. This is not conspiracy. It all happened. The atrocities that we've been described, we saw. Um, in addition to that, I would say, I was shocked by some of the leisurely nature of those Hamas terrorists. Um, those attackers coming into communities and just walking around, the time that they had to do what they did. Um, in addition, the masses of numbers, the preparedness, we've known that already, but seeing it through Hamas um, helmet cams, uh, mobile phone uh, videos, um, uh, selfies that were taken by victims, um, social media, they compiled it, surveillance video. It was just this mass of images. Uh, and it gave you a sense of the breadth of Hamas's attack and how many um, attackers they had. Some of them were wearing Israeli police uniforms. Some of them were wearing military uniforms. They had radios. They had phones. They were incredibly well organized. I mean, we knew that was the case, but seeing it visually with your own eyes definitely helps cement that side of the story, Kena. Right, and continuously leads us to question this intelligence failure. And, and Matt, the IDF says that now there's at least 199 hostages being held there in the Gaza Strip. So what is the latest there on these small raids that you talked about that they're conducting to look for these hostages? I should say where we are, Kena, uh, this is the wall uh, established by the families of the hostages. Um, each one of these posters is a picture of somebody who is still missing. Uh, Amelia, five years old, Ariel, 26, 38-year-old uh, Tamir, Tal, 54. This goes on and on um, for another 25 yards or so. Um, Israel has been doing those creeping raids into the Gaza Strip, and apparently they've been finding bodies. And through that, they're able to account for who's missing and who is still unaccounted for. And that's how they're whittling down the number. It's believed that there are still 300 bodies that aren't accounted for. Uh, they could be hostages or they could be missing. So the death toll is expected to rise. Um, and now we know that there are about 200 hostages being kept in the Gaza Strip, not all of them by Hamas, not even all of them by Islamic Jihad. There could be other groups holding them as well. Obviously, there is great concern in Israel for their welfare. Um, it's also unclear what will happen if Israel does launch this um, significantly large military incursion into the Gaza Strip, uh, how that will affect the hostages there and what Hamas will do with them. Okay, no. Right, and Matt, you rightfully point out here, we say hostages, but you point out these are children, these are families, these are women, these are elderly people. Uh, so also, Matt, let me ask you, as you described the video that you were watching, and you said that some of these Hamas terrorists were wearing, you know, Israeli badges and Israeli uniforms, how concerned are Israeli forces right now about some of these sleeper cells still inside their borders? 
I think they've managed to neutralize most of them, but it is shocking that every day we hear about some sleeper cell popping up and that there's a gunfight in one town or another near the southern border. It's certainly added to the jumpiness of Israeli soldiers. You know, we've been going down and spending a lot of time in the border. And as darkness falls, we have been told countless times, don't run anywhere. Don't appear like you're bursting out of anything. Even if there's a siren, walk to a shelter or walk to some sort of protection. Because if you run, we might mistake you for a militant or a terrorist and might open fire. So, you know, there's a tremendous amount of edginess and I think a lack of security for people living in Israel South, even though most of it has been evacuated of civilians by now. Um, but it's still going on and the, it just shows the level of that infiltration that happened on October 7th and how many militants not only managed to get in Israel, go back, how many were killed, but how many managed to stay here and just hide out for about a week. Kena. An utterly terrifying reality. Matt Gutman, uh, your reporting is excellent as always. Thank you so much. I want to now go to ABC News, Inez de la Katara. She's joining us now from Jerusalem, where most of the residents there are scared. They're leaving the streets desolate amid this fighting. Inez, I know that this is a place that you have been before, so describe to us what you're seeing now and what it's like there. Hey, Ken, I mean, it's such an eerie sight. I have been here before, and anyone who's ever been to Jerusalem's old city knows that this is a bustling place, that the streets are typically packed, it's loud, there's children running around, um, and it is now a ghost town, essentially. There are rows and rows of shops that have been closed. Streets are completely deserted. We went uh, by the church where Christians believe that Christ was uh, buried and then resurrected. That is one of the most visited, you know, sites in the world, and I had been before, and there, there was there's typically a long line. To, to get in, um, and there were just a handful of people inside. It was, you could just, you know, walk right in. Um, a, a surreal sight to see. It felt like we were getting a private tour of one of the world's, you know, uh, most visited sites. Um, we spoke to some residents in, in the old city there, uh, in the Muslim quarter, so Palestinian residents who tell us that they're uh, afraid of, of what's to come. They're, they're watching everything unfolding in the Gaza Strip, and they're uh, afraid of what a ground invasion is going to mean for them. They're afraid of, of the ramped up police presence. There are, you know, uh, more police. Uh, uh, on the streets of, of Jerusalem. There, there have been a number of checkpoints set up as well, and so a lot of Palestinians fear uh, being searched, and we witnessed that for ourselves outside of Damascus Gate, uh, a number of uh, young Palestinians being stopped and searched, and um, so a very tense atmosphere here in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank as well. And in as roughly 2,000 American nationals have now left Israel by boat, also some Israelis are leaving as well, but where do things stand with the process of getting civilians out of Gaza? Yes, yeah, so in terms of getting people out of Gaza, it is still, you know, I think we're, we're at a standstill here. We're, we're hoping for, for more developments there, but they don't seem to be making a whole lot of progress. The big issue is, you know, people in Gaza cannot leave. The borders are, are closed. There is the, the, the Rafah crossing that we're hoping Egypt and Israel will come to some kind of agreement on. Uh, the issue there is that Egypt, before it opens up the Rafah crossing, wants Israel to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza. And right now, Israel is reluctant. They are, are refusing to do that. And, and we've um, you know, now learned that President Biden may be considering a trip to Israel and a senior uh, U.S. official telling ABC News that if he does come, uh, the trip would only be to try and, and uh, soften up uh, hardliners within the Netanyahu government who are still opposed to having food and water entering Gaza. So that is very much a, a concern for Americans, a priority, I would even say. Um, they, they want humanitarian aid to be allowed into Gaza, and they want uh, you know, Palestinian Americans to be allowed out of Gaza. All right, Inez, thank you so much. And so for more on that, the U.S., of course, expanding its military presence in the eastern Mediterranean. Sources are telling that ABC News 2,000 American troops are on this heightened state of readiness to possibly deploy to the Middle East if they are needed. The Pentagon is also sending a second aircraft carrier to the region as a show of force. It's intended to act as a deterrent for Iran and Hezbollah not to get involved in this Israel-Hamas war. Also, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Tel Aviv pledging support for Israel as it prepares for a major military offensive there in Gaza. So joining me now is ABC News Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce. She's live at the White House. And ABC News Elizabeth Schulze, who is at the Pentagon. And Mary you just heard Inez talk about this. President Biden has been invited to Israel by Prime Minister Netanyahu. How significant would his presence be in the region during this ongoing war? And it, would that be the goal there for him to try to soften up those hardliners? 
Well, look, the symbolism would obviously be massive. It would be a tremendous show of support if President Biden were to go in person and visit Israel, meet with the Israeli prime minister and other officials there. But this is a decision that is extremely fraught. The president, you can expect him while he, if he were to visit, of course, would be underscoring again the need to do everything to address the humanitarian crisis, to try and get aid into Gaza. You would, I would assume he would also reiterate that call that we have heard him make for Israel to abide by the rules of war. Presumably, uh, the president would only visit if Israel were to postpone any kind of ground invasion until after President Biden has completed his trip. In some ways, that would then buy him more time, right, to try and get that aid into Gaza, get Americans out. Uh, it also, of course, would send a huge message uh, to those who may try and take advantage of this crisis, a message to, to, to Iran and Hezbollah. But obviously, the security concerns are massive, and there is a huge, huge risk that the president, if the humanitarian crisis were to worsen while he was there, violence escalate, that he would then be tied to that worsening crisis, politically tied to any additional bloodshed, Kena. Absolutely. And Elizabeth, to you, uh, what more can you tell us about this heightened state of readiness for American troops? Now, these are not combat troops, correct? So what role might they play? That's right, Kena. A U.S. official tells us that the U.S. has placed about 2,000 troops in a heightened state of readiness to possibly deploy to the Middle East in case they are needed. And this is not combat troops, as you point out. Instead, they would serve a wide range of military capabilities, advising, medical support. But importantly, this is not the infantry. You know, what we know in this language is very similar to what the Pentagon used for the state of readiness for troops after Russia invaded Ukraine. And really, the key role here, Kena, is one of deterrence, to try to send a message that the U.S. does not want this war to further escalate. All right. Thank you very much, Mary Bruce and Elizabeth Schulze. Our thanks to you. We're also now tracking some breaking news. This is out of Brussels. Belgian authorities are saying that two Swedish nationals have been shot dead. Belgium has now raised its terror alert to the highest level in Brussels after the prime minister suggested the attack was linked to terrorism. The shooting took place three miles from a soccer um, from a stadium where a soccer match was being held. The shooter right now remains at large and officials are now focused on getting civilians out of the stadium. We will, of course, continue to monitor that throughout the evening. Coming up next here, uh, Congressman Jim Jordan is asking for a speaker vote on the House floor tomorrow. So does he actually have the votes to succeed? We'll talk about that next. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
And welcome back. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Turning our focus now to Capitol Hill, where the role of House Speaker is still vacant. It's been nearly two weeks, and Republicans have not yet reached a consensus on who should lead them next. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan is the latest nominee for the speakership, but it remains unclear whether he will rally enough support on the House floor to win that gavel. In a letter sent to colleagues obtained by ABC News, Congressman Jordan wrote, the role of a speaker is to bring all Republicans together that is what I intend to do. So for more on this, I want to bring in ABC News contributing political correspondent and co-author of the Politico playbook, Rachel Bade. Rachel, thank you as always for being with us on Capitol Hill. So what are you hearing from your sources about what's going on behind the scenes today in preparation for tomorrow's vote on the House floor? Is he going to get it? Kena, it's looking likely right now, at least that's according to my sources. I will tell you, you, you mentioned it's been two weeks of total chaos here in the House, two weeks without a speaker. Republicans are now starting to say that they see the light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, every Republican I have talked to, talked to today or texted with, lawmakers and aides, both alike, people who like Jordan and people who don't, are telling me that by this time tomorrow, they think that he's going to be speaker. And that's because this morning we saw a whole bunch of movement toward Jordan, a whole bunch of Jordan critics who said last week that they would never support him come out and actually say they will. And that includes people like Ann Wagner, who said, quote, hell no, I won't back him, now saying they will. Uh, so so it's looking really good for Jordan. All right, Rachel Bade, our thanks as always to you. And we know you'll be watching that play out for us. Coming up next here, Global Affairs Chief Correspondent and co-anchor of This Week, Martha Raditz, introduces us to families that she has met over the decades of her reporting in the Middle East. We'll talk about their pleas for peace for over 35 years when we come back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Rob Marciano in Tampa, Florida, reporting in Hurricane Adalia. Wherever the weather may take you, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. One of the problems being a soldier in the territory is just that. They are soldiers, combat trained soldiers, but here they are fighting civilians. Uh, you can see in their eyes a lot of hatred. You can see sometimes a little child of, of, uh, of two years old, uh, three years old, who is uh, staring at you with the hatred. This kibbutz on the hill is a long way away from the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but the uprising is very much on the minds of the people who live here. 
Well, that was ABC News Chief Global Affairs Correspondent Martha Raddatz in Israel in 1988. It was the first conflict that she covered as a journalist, and she has been on the ground again and again. She's in the region today and filed this report for us, introducing us to some Israeli and Palestinian families who had hopes for the future and for peace. In 1988, Michael and Deborah Tobin, who had uprooted their young family in Massachusetts to move to Israel, were in the place they thought they were meant to be. I'd rather be in the middle of Jewish history than on the sidelines. The turning point for me was thinking about sort of imaging myself being 90 years old, sitting on my rocking chair, and not wanting to look back and have regrets. The Tobin settled in a front in the West Bank, an area controlled by Jordan until 1967, where the overwhelming majority of the population, Arab. I would like to feel that it's very possible that we two peoples can learn to live peacefully in a country that we both love. But 1988 was a time of constant clashes. I watched Palestinian villagers, angered by the growing settlements, throwing stones that Israeli soldiers met with tear gas. After just a few hours, the military pulled out and the village was reopened once again. The only signs that any conflict had occurred here were the piles of rock on the side of the road. But just hours after that protest, we happened on a wedding in the Palestinian town of Beit Sahur, a moment of promise for then 19-year-old Rana Itzak. People have to go on marrying and bringing more children because this is the only way that we Arabs, Palestinians, will stay in this country. So she's getting married, she'll bring another son, and he will be an Arab Palestinian. So it's our self-defense here. There would be more protests, more violence, and horrific suicide bombings. So years later, in 2014, I tracked down the Tobins and Rana Itzak again now further apart than ever. When you look at this land over the past 26 years, things better, things worse, how would you assess it? Um, difficult questions. In, in some ways it's better, in some ways it's, uh, it's worse. Sadly, we still live in, in one big prison. So you're not the idealistic couple I met 26 years ago? That old... Uh, ex-hippie, peace and love, let's just talk it all out and be good friends with the Arabs now. That's gone. The circumstances, unfortunately, have pushed each of us into our respective camps. It could change. But what changed things forever? October 7th. We reached out to the Tobins after the Hamas attack, still living in Israel, now with four children and 18 grandchildren. Their son, Aaron, called up for service. For Michael Tobin, the massacre that left Israelis slaughtered in their beds has ignited an anger that will never be diminished. The responsibility 100% lies in the hands of Hamas. They attacked us. They brutalized us. What did they think? We were going to come back and play, you know, and play some game hopscotch with them? They put their people in harm's way. We contacted Rana Itzak as well. She lives with her husband and two children in Ramallah on the West Bank, behind a wall that will surely never come down now. She did not want to speak on camera again, but told us, we are heartbroken for our people in Gaza. We are heartbroken how the world has turned a blind eye. I pray for a better future for my daughters. And of course, our thanks to Martha Raddatz for that report. We have a lot more ahead here, more coverage of the Israel-Hamas war on ABC News Live. In today's big story, there are growing fears of a potential wider conflict as Israel gears up for its expected ground invasion of Gaza. Can the U.S. and its allies deter Iran and its other proxies in the region? I'll be speaking with former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Edward Jarijan, about the next phase of the conflict and America's role as the crisis escalates. That's just ahead. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. 
Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. A potential Israeli ground invasion of Gaza looming at this hour as the U.S. takes new steps to support the Jewish state and help protect civilians caught in this crisis. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and that is our big story today. Israeli Defense Forces preparing to launch what is expected to be a massive strike on Hamas in response to the terror group's deadly surprise attack. Can America stand firm behind our Mideast ally while ensuring it follows the rules of war? I'll be speaking with former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Edward Jerigen, about our nation's latest diplomatic moves and fears the conflict could spread. Also, the Pentagon putting 2,000 U.S. troops on a heightened state of readiness after sending a second carrier strike group to the eastern Mediterranean. The message America is sending to Iran and its other proxies in the region. All right, our big story is where we start right now. Israel is expected to attack Hamas from the air, land, and the sea as the humanitarian crisis is growing there in Gaza. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians evacuating to the south as the death toll from this conflict rises by the hour. Israeli Health Ministry says that more than 1,400 people killed in Israel. While you look in Gaza, the Palestinian Health Authority there said that the number of dead is climbing beyond 2,700. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, Yahoo now inviting President Biden to visit the country. So joining us right now is the former U.S. ambassador uh, to Israel, Edward Jerigen. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate your time. And as we talk about this invitation that Netanyahu has extended to President Biden, uh, there was one senior official that told our Martha Raddatz that if Biden were to accept this invitation, essentially it would be to try to modulate decision making within the Israeli cabinet. So what do you what do you make of that? Is that essentially to sort of soften the hardliners, you think? That might be it, because, as you know, the uh, <clears throat> Israeli before the Hamas attack on Israel on October 7th, 
for months preceding Israel has been in an incredible historic internal turmoil over the uh, uh, reforms of the Constitution by Bibi Netanyahu's uh, very right-wing uh, uh, religious Zionist uh, uh, coalition. And therefore, the Israeli body politic is torn apart. And I think this is one of the reasons that Hamas decided to attack at this time, one of many, uh, because it perceived that there was disarray in Israel, and this might be a moment of opportunity. Uh, I'm not clear on the invitation of, uh, from Prime Minister Netanyahu to President Biden to visit uh, Israel. I think the United States is a posture of uh, defending Israel and supporting Israel at this time of troubles by the what you mentioned in your commentary, the two carrier task forces that are headed there and are there as a warning to Iran is a powerful signal in itself. Plus, Secretary Blinken has been in the region and the president himself has voiced very strong support for Israel. Uh, but this is uh, this this attack by Hamas uh, is also a uh, time to the uh, politics of the Israeli government, the continued uh, settlement activity, uh, uh, issues on the Temple Mount and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and uh, importantly, the, the tendency in the region to minimize the Palestinian issue and to focus on normalization agreements between Arab states and Israel by uh, subjugating the Palestinian issue to a, su a subjunctive or a subordinate tense. There are many reasons uh, why Hamas has moved now. But the important thing, again, as you mentioned in your commentary, uh, the Israeli armed forces, the IDF, is, is getting prepared for a major uh, land offensive, air and sea, on Gaza. But that in itself is going to bring on uh, very serious consequences for both sides. Certainly. And what are the overall diplomatic efforts for this region when you have people, you know, that are being told to leave Gaza, but they can't get out? Egypt has essentially kept its border closed or even limited those crossings. Well, that can turn into a humanitarian disaster. If, if Israel goes in full force into Gaza, there are going to be obviously many casualties. And uh, they're, they're certainly, if a humanitarian corridor, if I can call it that, is not established, uh, that's only going to increase the, uh, the, the number of dead and injured. So it becomes a big humanitarian issue uh, that will then uh, really uh, uh, be the uh, the spotlight of the news uh, and the original uh, Hamas attacks on is Israeli civilians uh, in the north that started all of this will be uh, maybe put into a more minor tent. So, and and also the Israelis have to think very hard that uh, that whatever military operations they commence in the next in the immediate future, there are over a hundred hostages that Hamas is holding. Uh, in the Gaza Strip. And what will they do with those hostages? Will they use them as a, a, a very uh, serious card to influence uh, Israel's military decisions? Uh, in a worst case scenario, will they threaten to kill the hostages? So the, the strategic options that Israel has to uh, contend with now are very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and the latest number, at least 199 hostages at this point. Let me ask you, is there ever a diplomatic solution at all in this region with Hamas at the table? Well, right now, it's uh, illusory to talk about a diplomatic solution. But uh, look, this is not the first time that there has been war between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip, going back to 2008, 2011, 12, now to 23. There have at least been four or five uh, ma major military confrontations between Israel and, and Hamas. And if there's a lesson that I think the Israelis have to draw from this is that the concept of a deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Hamas has simply not worked. It has worked for small pauses, for, for limited time pauses. But at the end of the day, the recurrence of these incredibly uh, uh, costly uh, military encounters uh, is very high. And this one, the October 7th one, I believe is is 
uh, up there with the Yom Kippur War of 1973. What we're witnessing today is going to really affect the political landscape, not only between Israel and 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 the Palestinians, but in the region as a whole. And I think you mentioned diplomatic efforts. Uh, the immediate diplomatic effort now is to contain this crisis so that it doesn't expand. What Israel is most concerned about, or should be most concerned about, and I know in my various encounters with military intelligence and 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 uh, and the Israeli military in, in the past has been a opening up a second front in the north of Israel with Hezbollah. Hezbollah over the last five years has increased its uh, uh, military stockpiles of rockets and other weaponry and capabilities. It is supported fully by Iran, of course. And that is a real threat because a two-front war uh, would be a, a very, very uh, dangerous uh, situation for Israel. Uh, I think the Israeli Defense Forces and their strategy, they think they can handle it. But let's face it, that would uh, if that happened, I think then it, the conflict could very well expand throughout the whole region. Absolutely. We have a region on edge. Uh, President Biden has said, yes, Hamas should be eliminated entirely when it comes to talks of uh, Israel, of course, going into that Gaza Strip. But this death toll is rising there in Gaza. And some critics are questioning if Israel's actions are now going beyond self-defense. But, you know, there's a lot of people also that argue not only should Israel be able to operate without restraint, but that anything that happens in Gaza is the responsibility of Hamas. So what role does the U.S play in these decisions? Well, I think we have our Secretary of State going throughout the region and speaking not only with the Israelis, but with Arab leaders, uh, and obviously coordinating with our, our, our allies in Europe and others. It shows you that uh, it, it does not serve uh, United States national security interests that this conflict uh, get out of control in a regional sense. Uh, that would be a very destabilizing factor, uh, not only in the Middle East, but it'll have an impact globally uh, on economies and and uh, political alignments. So uh, it's to be prevented, if at all possible, uh, uh, in a very serious way. So I think that's that's the first task of diplomacy. But if I may say something here, uh, what's really what's really important, uh, excuse me, what's really important is that. Uh, at the end of the day, there is no military solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It can only be a political solution. And ever since 2014, we have not had serious peace negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians writ large. And you just can't let this frozen conflict smolder because why? Because of what we're witnessing in the last week. It'll blow up in our collective faces with more, more serious consequences than previously. And so what after this, and this may sound like an illusion, but after we get through all of this, and hopefully it's contained and doesn't become a regional conflict, I think governments are going to have to step back, especially the Israelis and the Palestinians, and there is the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank that Israel has negotiated with. And they're going to have to step back and they're going to have to think about how to get back to the table of negotiations because there's only a political solution to this problem, not a military one. And that was yes, told it, to me when I was ambassador to Israel by Yitzhak Rabin, a very esteemed prime minister, who lost his life because he committed himself to peace between the Arabs and the Israelis. He was assassinated for that. But he he made it clear, not only to me, but publicly, that as a military man, there is only a political solution. 
And, and I've heard you put it, the unstable stability in the area uh, can no longer function, right? Yeah. Ambassador Edward Dejerian, I thank you so much for your time. I want to bring our big story now to our panel. Of course, joining us today is our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse, ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy, our former Republican chairman of the House and Homeland Security Committee, John Katko, and Democratic strategist Alencia Johnson. I uh, thank you all so much for being here with us. And John, as we start with you, senior U.S. official also told Martha Raddatz that the Biden administration is now getting warnings from some allies that if Israel moves aggressively and if this lasts for a long time, that they will be unable to support them publicly in the way that they have so far. So what is your reaction to that? Well, uh, this is I think this is exactly what Hamas wanted to have happen. If you really take a step back, they uh, they committed such atrocities and took all these hostages, knowing that is Israel would have no choice but to go into Gaza once and for all. And their hope is that this this chaos happens, that Israel oversteps somehow in Gaza, and that the world opinion turns against them. So, it's going according to Hamas's plan to some extent, but I don't see Israel being able to do anything else. So, uh, it, it, I don't really have an answer for you at this point. Right. Yeah, I understand. And Alicia, to you, you know, that same senior U.S. official also said that a lot of people feel like the longer Israel waits to actually go in, that the more difficult and dangerous it would be for these Israeli forces, and that there's a belief right now within the White House that only President Biden could successfully urge restraint. What's your take on that? Well, I think there's a lot of things that the Biden administration is weighing here, obviously wanting to support an ally in the region, but mm -hmm. they are very concerned about the very real humanitarian crisis in Gaza, the innocent Palestinians who are also losing their lives. I think the White House is also considering what they are dealing with domestically, the rise of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And so mm -hmm. I paint that picture and that the Biden administration knows that President Biden has a significant influence, but has a lot of different situations to weigh in his decision making. And on that note, Mick, to you, you know, Belgian authorities have raised their nation's terror alert to its highest level uh, in Brussels. This is today after the deadly shooting of two Swedes there. Also, as you know, investigators in Chicago say that a six-year-old was stabbed to death over the weekend. Uh, they say it was because he was Muslim. It's a hate crime. So how concerned should we be about these, you know, lone wolf isolated attacks? So, Kenna, we should be very concerned because it's very difficult to determine where they're going to come from since it's usually a one individual who's been radical, radicalized by watching what he's seeing on television. And the ground invasion hasn't even started yet. So this should be very concerning. Uh, the local governments, the federal government inside the United States and in Europe and elsewhere need to really focus on what they can do to protect their citizenship because this is just the beginning. This, these depraved acts are unfortunately mm -hmm. going to continue and may even increase. Absolutely. Again, as the defense minister said today there in Israel, uh, this will be a long war. The price will be high. Uh, Mike, to you, how do you see public opinion here in the U.S. potentially shifting as the world braces for what is already threatening to be a prolonged conflict there? The public opinion is going to be a very nuanced dynamic as we discuss what is happening in Israel and in Palestine as the humanitarian crisis heats up. It's going to be really interesting to see how does the public opinion, Kana, really shift to Egypt and what is Egypt's role in all of this? Because Egypt does have a strategic relationship and partnership with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but that does come with different diplomatic and policy ties, just as well as they do have a relationship with Israel when it comes to economic and security alliances and really pushing back a lot of Islam extremists along the peninsula is so that dynamic is but they still have a back channel contact with Hamas and so how does Egypt emerge in this space and what does the public really put the pressure on Egypt to become that moderator um, in this region to help soothe ties the big concerns I've been talking to my Egyptian sources is that they're concerned displacement of the Palestinian refugees they believe that yeah. once you start having refugees become displaced leaving their homeland it becomes a whole different political dynamic onto himself about their return. Right, and at this point, they have nowhere else to go. Mike Muse, Mick Mulroy, Alencia Johnson, and John Katko, thank you. And we'll be back with you throughout this show. Coming up next here, uh, U.S. warships on the way to the Middle East. Will troops be next? The U.S. is ramping up its involvement in this conflict, and we'll talk about that when we come back. Whenever news breaks, 
to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. will be a long way walk. The price will be high, but we are going to win for Israel, for the Jewish people, and, and for the values that both countries believe in. Well, in the big story, the U.S. expands its military presence in the Middle East. Pentagon officials telling ABC News that 2,000 military personnel could be deployed to that region. As a show of force, a second carrier strike group is headed to the eastern Mediterranean Sea as Israel prepares for this ground invasion of Gaza. The USS Eisenhower joining the USS Gerald Ford carrier strike group that arrived there last week. Officials say that both are intended to again act as a deterrent for both Israel Iran and Hezbollah. I want to bring back our panel, Mike Muse and Mick Mulroy, joined now by retired Lieutenant General William Troy and ABC News' Elizabeth Schulze there at the Pentagon. Thank you all for being here with us. And Lieutenant General Troy, starting with you, uh, the U.S. warships, again, not intended to join in this fighting as a deterrent, but what kind of message does it send to Iran and its proxies in this region as tensions are clearly flaring up ahead of Israel's expected ground invasion? Uh, th these are two powerful war fighting uh, capabilities, and I'm sure the message is uh, don't try to take advantage of this very tense, difficult, agonizing mm -hmm. situation. Um, we, uh, we mean to support our ally in the region. And, and Mick, to you, you know, Israel has said that its goal is to completely destroy Hamas. What impact does that have on this ground invasion, especially when it comes to the hostages? And noting that Matt Gutman is reporting that they already have various special force units on the ground in Gaza, and that's how they know this hostage count is now closer to 200. That's right, Kata. And, and obviously the IDF's uh, objective here is to completely destroy Hamas's political leadership and its capacity to fight. So that's going to take the size force that they have arrayed against it, and it's going to take quite a long time, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have to go block by block. They're going to have to fight in tunnels. So it's going to take it's going to take a while. It sounds like they told Matt Gutman they are prepared to do this methodically and slowly. Elizabeth, to you, a bipartisan delegation led by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer traveled to Tel Aviv over the weekend, saying the Senate will not wait on the House to choose a new speaker and will move forward in working to pass this new spending that combines aid for Israel and Ukraine. How does that work? 
I mean, look, the Senate can pass whatever it wants, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is making that clear that it would send a strong bipartisan message. But if it gets over to the House and there's no speaker, it's not going to go anywhere, and it will never make it to the president's desk. Hey, Kena. Oh, it's not a great way to get that ball rolling. Uh, Mike, to you, a U.N. official said that mediators you know, are struggling for a ceasefire. Should they want to get aid in, and they're waiting at the Egyptian border. So how can the U.S. get involved, should they get involved, to help this humanitarian crisis? Yes, it will be great for the U.S. to kind of get involved and help mediate so that we can open up aid to that particular area. But from all accounts, it's going to be difficult to have that ceasefire between Hamas and with Israel in order for that to happen. It's so hard to watch that video and think of those people just trying to get out. Mike Muse, Mick Mulroy, Lieutenant General William Troy, uh, and Elizabeth Schulze, thank you so much for being with us. And coming up next here, as we keep talking about this humanitarian crisis in Gaza, it is worsening by the minute. Right now, one million people are in peril. We'll talk about what is actually being done to help them when we come back. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. All right, as we continue with our big story here, with an Israeli ground invasion in Gaza expected, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is growing more dire. I want to bring back our panel to talk about this. Our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host, Mike Muse. Mick Mulroy is with us as well. Uh, also, we have our ABC News national security and defense analyst and former deputy assistant secretary of defense for the Middle East and retired Lieutenant General William Troy. Also joining us is Asma Khalid, ABC News contributor and NPR White House correspondent. Thank you for being here with us. Asma, as we start with you here, a senior State Department official says that Egypt has informed the U.S. that there are acute security threats, and that's what is preventing U.S. officials and others from aiding Americans inside Gaza. Uh, any idea on how they can get to those Americans and how they can get them home safely? You know, I was just speaking before we came out here to a lawyer that represents an American family from Massachusetts. They have a one-year-old child. They have been stuck in Gaza trying to exit from that Gaza-Egypt border. And he says as of now, uh, the administration, uh, State Department officials are not giving them any timeline on when that border may be open. That's utterly horrifying, and to think with families there with young children stuck at the border, there's so many of them. Uh, Lieutenant General Troy, uh, should the U.S. be taking a more forceful approach here to try to protect civilian lives? I feel sure that the U.S. is doing everything it can in conjunction with its ally, I Israel, 
uh, they are they are well aware of what's going on, and I'm sure behind the scenes they're doing everything they can. And Mick, to you, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that the goal, of course, is to demolish Hamas. But considering the conditions in Gaza, how, how do they approach that? Well, the first thing is to ensure that every civilian that can gets out of the gets out of the way of this assault that's coming, and that includes identifying a humanitarian corridor that leads to a safe haven that's monitored and protected. Uh, that needs to happen as soon as possible. The United Nations working with Israel and, and, and Egypt. And my humanitarian aid essentially has been stuck at this Rafah crossing there between Gaza and Egypt. It's been stuck there for days. Uh, what is it going to take to open the border, at least for this aid to go in? It's going to essentially take a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. But, Kena, as you and I both know, the odds of that is so challenging and so difficult. The thing I'm most concerned about is the number you mentioned previously, over one million possible individuals to be displaced. What do we do with that? What do we do? Mike Muse, Mick Mulroy, Lieutenant General William Troy, and Asma Khalid, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth, and you can follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact that they have on you. The news never stops, neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Marcus Moore covering the wildfires in Greece. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live.
I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles and right now on ABC News Live, the U.S. and allies racing to step up diplomatic and humanitarian efforts as the world braces for an imminent Israeli ground invasion of Gaza. The Jewish state escalating its war against Hamas, gearing up to strike it from the air, the land and the sea. How Israeli forces are preparing and how they say they took out a top leader with the terror group. Also, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is growing by the hour as hundreds of thousands of civilians try and evacuate south. The very latest in the push to provide aid and allow families to escape through a critical border crossing. Also, the U.S. military is putting thousands of troops on a heightened state of readiness and also sending a second carrier strike group to the eastern Mediterranean. The message America is sending to Iran and its other proxy groups in the region. Of course, our top story at this hour is Israel's war with Hamas. Heavy Israeli bombardments of the Gaza Strip have continued in retaliation for the Hamas terrorist attacks on October 7th. The IDF again announcing today that they have killed the head of general intelligence for Hamas. This as Israeli forces position themselves for this ground invasion of Gaza. On day 10 of the war, the death toll is rising. Israeli Health Ministry reporting that more than 1,400 deaths and the Palestinian Health Authority saying that more than 2,700 people have been killed in Gaza. Thousands are also injured on both sides of this. Gaza has now been without electricity for five days and the United Nations says nearly half of Gaza's population of two million is displaced. Civilians are running out of medicine, shelter, food and water. In fact, the UN says it's now concerned about the spread of waterborne diseases as people are now drinking water from agricultural wells. Our ABC News Inez de la Catara is joining us now from Jerusalem, uh, where most of the residents there say they're scared. They've just left the streets, you know, desolate amid this fighting. Uh, Inez, again, I know that this is a place you have been to before, so you have perspective here. What are you seeing now? What what is it like? Such a surreal sight here, uh, Kena. The streets completely deserted. It has turned into a ghost town, and this is typically a place that is, um, you know, so lively. There's children running around. There's people, you know, everywhere. The streets are typically packed, and we saw rows and rows of shops closed. We spoke to residents there who were telling us how they have never seen it like this in their lifetime. They talked about the tension, uh, how they're watching everything happening in, in the Gaza Strip, and they're worried about what that could all mean for them, what that could mean for the West Bank. Um, some people draw comparisons to the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdowns during the COVID pandemic. So it's a really tense atmosphere. Yeah, we walked around the, the old quarter, the, the, um, the, 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 the old city yesterday, and uh, we went to the church where uh, Christians believe that Christ was uh, buried and resurrected. That is typically one of the most visited sites in Jerusalem, and it was totally empty. You could just walk right in, no line. Um, it was surreal. It was like getting a private tour of one of the world's um, busiest sites. So um, a, a very very strange atmosphere here in East Jerusalem, in, in the West Bank. Um, you know, there, there are questions as to how Palestinians in the West Bank will respond to uh, the, the relentless strikes on Gaza, how they will respond to the, that imminent ground invasion of the Gaza Strip, um, and how settlers will respond as well in the West Bank, whether they might feel emboldened to go after Palestinians. There's certainly been a, an increased uh, police presence here on the streets of Jerusalem. We've seen checkpoints, um, and Palestinians telling us that they are preferring to, to stay home rather than have to deal with those police uh, checkpoints and 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 um, you know they, they don't want to get arrested and searched and, and there's been all sorts of videos circulating online showing Palestinians young Palestinian men uh, getting stopped and searched and, and we saw it for ourselves uh, in a Jerusalem's old, old city certainly concern and fear is spreading also uh, in as Israeli forces say you know they're in a position uh, for this ground assault in Gaza uh, we're told that they're ready and that they're essentially just waiting for the government to give them that green light so in as any sense of even when or how they would move in and once they do how do they deal with this extensive tunnel system that Hamas uses yeah, that's the big question here. So it would be a complex operation if and, and when they move in. At this point, this does appear to be uh, imminent. We know that Hamas has all sorts of tunnels throughout the Gaza Strip. That's what makes this so complicated. They kind of just pop up out of nowhere. Um, and the other issue is, of course, the fact that this is just such a densely populated area, one of the most mm -hmm. densely populated areas in the world. So many civilians there, and the IDF saying it wants civilians to get out, that it, uh, you know, that's why it called for so many Palestinians, over a million Palestinians, to flee 
flee northern Gaza and Gaza City and to head south. They're saying that it's because they want to avoid a, a, a loss of, of civilian life. But we know Hamas is telling people to stay back. And we also know that not everyone is able to get away. They're, they're, you know, we've been speaking to people inside the Gaza Strip who've been describing how the, the roads have been bombed and, and they're, you know, inoperable and, and people don't have cars and, and, and people don't have, you know, the, the right information because there's no electricity. There's no fuel for cars. Like, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, complex situation there for, for, for civilians to flee. And, and, and so, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see how quickly the IDF des decides to move in. Initially, they had given people just 24 hours to flee, which, um, you know, led to speculation that that ground assault could, could, could happen, you know, after that, that 24 hours. It does appear like they're giving people more time now, but um, still anybody's guess as to when they will decide to move forward. Right, that 24 hours has come and gone. Uh, also, in is Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, back in Israel today, and he spoke with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. They discussed these humanitarian efforts, but we also know that uh, during these conversations, they were actually forced to seek shelter amid strikes. Uh, so quite telling there. Have they come up with anything so far to address this humanitarian crisis? Yeah, so the, the sirens going off across Israel today, we heard them here in Jerusalem, which was very unusual. Since we uh, got here a few days ago, they haven't gone off. It's it's quite rare for them to go off in Jerusalem, but um, uh, they, they did go off here. Uh, they went off in Tel Aviv as well. And like you say, the prime minister, together with uh, the secretary of state, Antony Blinken, had to shelter in place for five minutes. We know that a, a meeting of the Knesset was also interrupted because of uh, sirens. Um, but as far as whether anything concrete came out of, this, of these meetings, uh, it doesn't seem seem like it yet. We know that uh, Blinken and the U.S. are in a tricky position here because they want to reaffirm the, the U.S.'s unwavering commitment to Israel. And they have, you know, gone out of their way to, to say that. We've seen a number of officials, U.S. officials here in the region to uh, show solidarity with Israel. The U.S. also uh, sending an aid to Israel. Um, but at the same time, they, they want to pressure Israel into, um, you know, allowing, specifically when it comes to, to these crossings uh, on the Gaza Strip, the, the Rafah crossing specifically, they want want Israel to allow for humanitarian aid to get into Gaza so that the Egyptians will allow for people to leave the Gaza Strip. And the Israelis right now are not agreeing to that. Um, we, we understand that that, uh, that you know that, that would be uh, contrary to the siege that they're trying to lay to Gaza right now, where they're not letting in any food, fuel, water, electricity to the region. So uh, we, you know, there were reports, uh, confirmed reports, that President Biden is um, looking into p potentially traveling to the region as well. Um, and, and we understand a According to a senior U.S. official telling ABC News that uh, part of that would be him trying to soften up some of the hardliners uh, in the Netanyahu government who uh, are continuing to block access uh, to food and water for Gaza. Right, and as it remains to be seen, if he will accept that uh, invitation from Netanyahu. Thank you so much for your reporting, and as also now our ABC News chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is on the ground as well, also in Tel Aviv, with more on the war and how prepared Israel actually is for in ground invasion of Gaza. Matt. Okay, now for days now we've been seeing this massive movement of Israeli forces towards the border. And when we've been down there, we've seen armored personnel carriers, tanks, Bradley fighting vehicles, mobile missile launchers, uh, mobile howitzers and artillery. But we've also been hearing today from Israeli officials that Israeli units, specialized units, um, regular infantry, armor, artillery even have been on the other side fighting inside Gaza itself. Now, this is not the main incursion. They've been sort of pushing in incrementally. And the sense I'm getting from speaking to multiple military officials is that this is going to be a slow moving invasion. It's not going to be the shock and awe we saw in Iraq in 2003. Israel is going to move in slowly and try to take out, go building by building, floor by floor in some cases. The main concern is the tunnels that honeycomb the Gaza Strip. That's where we are told Hamas militants hide. That's where they keep their weapons, possibly even hostages. And Israeli officials tell me they're not actually going to go inside the tunnels, that they're going to try to use them as a trap. That raises another major question, which is the hostages. I'm going to have our cameraman show this, this giant wall of pictures of the hostages. We now know that there are 200 of them. And the concern is their fate. What happens if there is an incursion and street-to-street -street fighting in Gaza? What is the effect going to be on those hostages? Are they going to survive? And right now, nobody has the answer to those questions. Kena.
It's utterly horrifying, Matt Gutman. Our thanks to you for your reporting. Now, the U.S. is expanding its military presence in the eastern Mediterranean, and sources are telling ABC News that 2,000 American troops are now available for a possible deployment in the Middle East if needed. The Pentagon also sending a second aircraft carrier to the region as a show of force. It's again attended to act as a deterrent for Iran and Hezbollah both not to get involved in this war with Israel and Hamas. Our Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Tel Aviv as well, pledging support for Israel as it prepares for a major military offensive in Gaza. And joining me now is ABC News' Elizabeth Schulze, who is at the Pentagon for us. And Elizabeth, what more can you tell us about this heightened state of readiness for these American troops? And you know, these are not combat troops, correct? So what role would they play? Right, Kana. So a U.S. official tells us that about 2,000 U.S. troops will be placed in this heightened state of readiness. So that means they could possibly deploy to the Middle East if they're needed. But you're absolutely right. These are not combat troops. Instead, they would serve in a wide range of military capabilities like medical assistance or advising. And really, the key here is deterrence. This is a similar message that the Pentagon sent when it prepared troops to be in a heightened state of readiness when Russia invaded Ukraine. And those troops were in the Eastern European region. And it's all about sending this message that the U.S. does not want this crisis to escalate even further, Kana. And Elizabeth, President Biden warned that a new Israeli occupation of Gaza would be, quote, a big mistake. So what are you hearing from your sources at the Pentagon regarding their concerns of this next phase of Israel's war on Hamas? Well, and officials are really trying to send a clear message here that there is a distinction between Hamas and many of the people who live in Palestine. They say that, as President Biden said, not all Palestinians are the extremist terrorists that we saw carry out the horrific attacks on Israel. So in the long term, as the president said, they do at least say that there should be a Palestinian state. But of course, right now, the message continues to be here at the Pentagon and across the Biden administration that the U.S. fully supports Israel's right to defend itself, that it stands by to, pr to, be, uh, to provide Israel with whatever aid is needed as it continues to defend itself against Hamas, and that right now the goal is to, as the president said, take out Hamas, Kana. Yeah, entirely. Uh, Elizabeth Schulze of the Pentagon, thank you very much. We're also tracking some breaking news out of Brussels. Belgian authorities are saying right now that two Swedish nationals have been shot dead. Belgium has now raised its terror alert to the highest level in Brussels. This is after the prime minister suggested that the attack was linked to terrorism. The shooting actually took place just three miles from a stadium where a soccer match was being held. The shooter right now remains at large. Officials are also now focused on getting civilians out of the stadium. And there's also new warnings of potential threats right here in the U.S. And they're rising after a horrifying attack on a mother and son near Chicago. It's now being investigated as a hate crime. Six-year-old Wadea Al-Fayoum was stabbed to death. His mother right now in serious condition after authorities say the family's landlord targeted them because they're Muslim. Now, authorities say that the suspect, 71-year-old Joseph Zuba, was motivated by the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas. And in a statement, President Biden said that he and the First Lady were shocked and sickened to learn about this brutal mur murder of the six-year-old, adding that this horrific act of hate has no place in America. Well, coming up next here, Congressman Jim Jordan scrambling for support with a vote scheduled for tomorrow. So the big question, can he actually win the battle for the gavel? We'll talk about that when we come back. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. 
30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh, my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We turn our focus now to Capitol Hill, where the role of House Speaker is still vacant. It's been nearly two weeks, and Republicans have not yet reached a consensus on who should lead them. So House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan is the latest nominee for the speakership, but right now it still remains unclear whether he will rally enough support on the House floor to win this gavel. In a letter sent to colleagues obtained by ABC News, Congressman Jordan wrote, the role of a speaker is to bring all Republicans Republicans together. That is what I intend to do. So for more on this, I want to bring in our ABC News contributing political correspondent and co-author of the Politico playbook, Rachel Bade, who's on Capitol Hill for us. So Rachel, you know, what are you hearing right now from your sources about what's going on behind the scenes today as they prepare for a huge day tomorrow, a vote on the House floor? Okay, now a lot of confidence from the Jim Jordan camp. They've been making a lot of phone calls over the weekend, all throughout the day, trying to line up the votes. 217 Republicans, they can only lose four, uh, for him to get the gavel. And they're feeling sublimely confident right now. I mean, saying that if he doesn't get it on the first round tomorrow, they think he will get it at some point. And I've got to tell you, I'm not just hearing this from the Jordan allies. I'm hearing it from people who don't like him and don't want their boss to support him or don't want to vote for him themselves on the House floor. They think he's going to get there because of this outside pressure campaign that has been going on since last Friday. People like Sean Hannity at Fox News reaching out to offices who have not weighed in. Uh, a lot of members of the base, Republican voters, calling and hounding lawmakers, telling them to vote this way or that way, or specifically for Jordan. And, you know, this morning we saw a number of Republicans who had said last week that they will never back Jordan actually flip-flop and come out and say that they will. So now, but remember, he can only lose four, and that's not a lot. Uh, so it's going to be, it could still be tight. Right. So when you have this razor thin margin there, uh, Rachel, and you keep hearing the word unity coming up over and over again. But I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about how Jim Jordan's approach to winning the seat is different from Steve Scalise's who had to step out. Yeah, big difference in terms of the pressure campaign he's putting on the membership right now. And it's interesting because just a week ago, Jim Jordan, when Steve Scalise was running and when he was ahead and likely to win the nomination, Jim Jordan was making this case that the Republicans should not get the nomination until they actually line up 217 votes to go to the House floor. This was an argument to basically say, we don't want another situation like what happened last January with Kevin McCarthy, which embarrassed Republicans and he had to go 15 rounds to get the gavel. But now that the shoe is on the other foot and Jordan is the one who is officially the nominee, he's going to be pressing forward with the House vote regardless of whether or not he has these votes. And again, it comes down to the strategy. His allies think that with the base behind them, with conservative media behind them, that they can pummel these Republicans into submission. We'll have to see if they're right, Kana. Yeah. All right, the clock is ticking. Rachel Bade, our thanks as always to you. And coming up next here, ABC's Ian Panel takes us behind the camouflage to see the Israeli soldiers, that includes Americans, that are headed right towards this ground invasion. That's when we come back.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Orange County, New York on the migrant crisis, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We've seen the movement of battleships and tanks, but with all eyes on a possible ground invasion of Gaza, ABC News chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel spoke with some IDF soldiers, and that includes Americans who have now returned to Israel, answering what they say is their call of duty. He brings us this exclusive report going behind as going as he says behind the camouflage to hear the stories of those preparing for battle. They are a band of brothers, reservists, friends and comrades. On the eve of what's expected to be a brutal and bloody battle inside Gaza, they spoke exclusively to ABC News. Dan, 35 years old, from North Israel. Avi, 32, from Arizona. Moshe, 45, from Ashkelon in southern Israel. And Schrager, 38, from Chicago. When they heard the news of the terrible Hamas attack on their country, the slaughter of over 1,400 Israelis, it was a call to arms. My first reaction was just total shock. Right away I ran to the airport, got on my first flight here. People that I know were killed um, and are missing. And, uh, you know, the first, the only thing on my mind was just to, to come back to Israel, get, get to Israel. What does a battle mean for you? And what does Gaza mean for you? We let them kill us one by one, again and again, terror attacks. But this just uh, topped it all. Okay, I do not see the Gaza civilians population as my enemy. You don't? No, I don't. The objective here is to be is being um, to wipe out Hamas, to um, end the, the terror that they continue to inflict on us, on their own people, and we need to stand up to them and um, show them that it's not something that we're gonna take and no people should have to take. I stood uh, in Auschwitz-Birkenau in full uniform and I had tears in my eyes when uh, our commander spoke and told us that we are, we, the, the soldiers of Israel, we are the promise that never again. And in this, in this past week, then we, could, we didn't fulfill our promise. And we're here to fulfill it. And to honor that promise, Israel's promise, this brotherhood knows it can't underestimate a determined enemy fighting on home turf. It's not about revenge. It's about making sure those people that had to leave their houses, had to watch their community being slaughtered, 
they can come back and they can sleep at night peacefully knowing this can't happen again. Hamas knows that you're coming. We've heard all about their infrastructure, their preparations, the booby traps, the tunnels. As soldiers, as infantrymen, how do you face that threat on the ground? We are getting ready to perform any mission we take because this is a battle for our house, for our home. You're a soldier, but you're also a man, a human. What about fear? Well, of course there's fear. Only idiots did not feel fear. Uh, we embrace it. We learn to manage it. That's part of our training. There are those voices there across this region and elsewhere who say the price of military action is too great, that too many civilians are now dying, too many Palestinians are already dying. We're in a full war here, and the responsibility isn't on us. You should take that question straight back to Hamas. We are here because we have no other choice. Different men with so very different lives, but they're brothers in arms who've known each other for 15 years. It's crucial, the feelings that we have there, for each other, the responsibility that we feel for each other. A lot of my confidence comes from a long-lasting life relationship right. and camaraderie that we have between us. We always, uh, when we say goodbye, we say, I love you very much. I hope I won't see you in a long, long time. <laughs> And our thanks to Ian Panel for that report. We have a lot more coverage of the Israel-Hamas war ahead here on ABC News Live. In today's big story, there are growing fears of a potential wider conflict as Israel gears up for its expected ground invasion of Gaza. Can the U.S. and its allies deter Iran and its other proxies in the region? I'll be speaking with a former ambassador to Israel about the next phase of this conflict and America's role as the crisis escalates. That's just ahead. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. A potential Israeli ground invasion of Gaza looming at this hour as the U.S. takes new steps to support the Jewish state and help protect civilians caught in this crisis. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and that is our big story today. Israeli Defense Forces preparing to launch what is expected to be a massive strike on Hamas in response to the terror group's deadly surprise attack. Can America stand firm behind our Mideast ally while ensuring it follows the rules of war?
I'll be speaking with former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, Edward Jerigen, about our nation's latest diplomatic moves and fears the conflict could spread. Also, the Pentagon putting 2,000 U.S. troops on a heightened state of readiness after sending a second carrier strike group to the eastern Mediterranean. The message America is sending to Iran and its other proxies in the region. All right, our big story is where we start right now. Israel is expected to attack Hamas from the air, land, and the sea as the humanitarian crisis is growing there in Gaza. Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians evacuating to the south as the death toll from this conflict rises by the hour. Israeli Health Ministry says that more than 1,400 people killed in Israel. While you look in Gaza, the Palestinian Health Authority there said that the number of dead is climbing beyond 2,700. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu Yahoo now inviting President Biden to visit the country. So joining us right now is the former U.S. ambassador uh, to Israel, Edward Jerigen. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate your time. And as we talk about this invitation that Netanyahu has extended to President Biden, uh, there was one senior official that told our Martha Raddatz that if Biden were to accept this invitation, essentially it would be to try to modulate decision making within the Israeli cabinet. So what do you what do you make of that? Is that essentially to sort of soften the hardliners, you think? That might be it, because, as you know, the uh, <clears throat> Israeli before the Hamas attack on Israel on October 7th, for months preceding Israel has been in an incredible historic internal turmoil over the uh, uh, reforms of the Constitution by Bibi Netanyahu's uh, very right-wing uh, uh, religious Zionist uh, 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 coalition. And therefore, the Israeli body politic is torn apart. And I think this is one of the reasons that Hamas decided to attack at this time, one of many, uh, because it perceived that there was disarray in Israel and this might be a moment of opportunity. Uh, I'm not clear on the invitation of, uh, from Prime Minister Netanyahu to President Biden to visit uh, Israel. I think the United States' uh, posture of uh, defending Israel and supporting Israel at this time of troubles by the what you mentioned in your commentary, the two carrier task forces that are headed there and are there as a warning to Iran is a powerful signal in itself. Plus, Secretary Blinken has been in the region and the president himself has voiced very strong support for Israel. Uh, but this is uh, this this attack by Hamas uh, is also a uh, time to the uh, politics of the Israeli government, the continued uh, settlement activity uh, uh, issues on the Temple Mount and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and uh, importantly, the, the tendency in the region to minimize the Palestinian issue and to focus on normalization agreements between Arab states and Israel by uh, subjugating the Palestinian issue to a, su a subjunctive or a subordinate tense. There are many reasons uh, why Hamas has moved now. But the important thing, again, as you mentioned in your commentary, uh, the Israeli armed forces, the IDF, is, is getting prepared for a major uh, land offensive, air and sea, on Gaza. But that in itself is going to bring on uh, very serious consequences for both sides. Certainly. And what are the overall diplomatic efforts for this region when you have people, you know, that are being told to leave Gaza, but they can't get out? Egypt has essentially kept its border closed or even limited those crossings. Well, that can turn into a humanitarian disaster. If, if Israel goes in full force into Gaza, there are going to be obviously many casualties. And uh, they're, they're certainly, if a humanitarian corridor, if I can call it that, is not established, uh, that's only going to increase the, uh, the, the number of dead and injured. So it becomes a big humanitarian issue uh, that will then uh, really... Uh, uh, be the uh, the spotlight of the news uh, and the original uh, Hamas attacks on is Israeli civilians uh, in the north that started all of this will be uh, 
maybe put it into a more minor tent. So, and and also the Israelis have to think very hard that uh, that whatever military operations they commence in the next in the immediate future, there are over a hundred hostages that Hamas is holding uh, in the Gaza Strip. And what will they do with those hostages? Will they use them as a a, a very uh, serious card to influence uh, Israel's military decisions? Uh, in a worst case scenario, will they threaten to kill the hostages? So the the strategic options that Israel has to uh, contend with now are very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and the latest number, at least 199 hostages at this point. Let me ask you, is there ever a diplomatic solution at all in this region with Hamas at the table? Well, right now, it's uh, illusory to talk about a diplomatic solution. But uh, look, this is not the first time that there has been war between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip, going back to 2008, 2011, 12, now to 23. There have at least been four or five uh, ma major military confrontations between Israel and, and Hamas. And if there's a lesson that I think the Israelis have to draw from this is that the concept of a deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Hamas has simply not worked. It has worked for small pauses, for, for limited time pauses, but at the end of the day, the recurrence of these incredibly uh, uh, costly uh, military encounters uh, is very high. And this one, the October 7th one, I believe is, is uh, up there with the Yom Kippur War of 1973. What we're witnessing today is going to really affect the political landscape, not only between Israel and, and, and the Palestinians, but in the region as a whole. And I think you mentioned diplomatic efforts. Uh, the immediate diplomatic effort now is to contain this crisis so that it doesn't expand. What Israel is most concerned about or should be most concerned about and I know in my various encounters with military intelligence and 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 uh, and the Israeli military in, in the past has been a opening up a second front in the north of Israel with Hezbollah. Hezbollah over the last five years has increased its uh, uh, military stockpiles of rockets and other weaponry and capabilities. It is supported fully by Iran, of course. And that is a real threat because a two-front war uh, would be a, a very, very uh, dangerous uh, situation for Israel. Uh, I think the Israeli Defense Forces and their strategy, they think they can handle it. But let's face it, that would uh, if that happened, I think then it, the conflict could very well expand throughout the whole region. Absolutely. We have a region on edge. Uh, President Biden has said, yes, Hamas should be eliminated entirely when it comes to talks of uh, Israel, of course, going into that Gaza Strip. But this death toll is rising there in Gaza. And some critics are questioning if Israel's actions are now going beyond self-defense. But, you know, there's a lot of people also that argue not only should Israel be able to operate without restraint, but that anything that happens in Gaza is the responsibility of Hamas. So what role does the U.S play in these decisions? Well, I think we have our Secretary of State going throughout the region and speaking not only with the Israelis, but with Arab leaders, uh, and obviously coordinating with our, our, our allies in Europe and others. It shows you that uh, it, it does not serve uh, United States national security interests that this conflict uh, get out of control in a regional sense. Uh, that would be a very destabilizing factor, uh, not only in the Middle East, but it'll have an impact globally uh, on economies and and uh, political alignments. So uh, it's to be prevented, if at all possible, uh, uh, in a very serious way. So I think that's that's the first task of diplomacy. But if I may say something here, uh, what's really what's really important, uh, excuse me, what's really important is that. Uh, at the end of the day, there is no military solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It can only be a political solution. 
And ever since 2014, we have not had serious peace negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians writ large. And you just can't let this frozen conflict smolder because why? Because of what we're witnessing in the last week. It'll blow up in our collective faces with more, more serious consequences than previously. And so what after this, and this may sound like an illusion, but after we get through all of this, and hopefully it's contained and doesn't become a regional conflict, I think governments are going to have to step back, especially the Israelis and the Palestinians, and there is the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank that Israel has negotiated with, and they're going to have to step back, and they're going to have to think about how to get back to the table of negotiations, because there's only a political solution to this problem, not a military one. And that was yes, told to me when I was ambassador to Israel by Yitzhak Rabin, a very esteemed prime minister, who lost his life because he committed himself to peace between the Arabs and the Israelis. He was assassinated for that. But he he made it clear, not only to me, but publicly, that as a military man, there is only a political solution. And I've heard you put it, the unstable stability in the area uh, can no longer function, right? Yeah. Ambassador Edward Dejerian, I thank you so much for your time. I want to bring our big story now to our panel. Of course, joining us today is our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host Mike Muse, ABC News national security and defense analyst Mick Mulroy, our former Republican chairman of the House and Homeland Security Committee, John Katko, and Democratic strategist Alencia Johnson. I thank you all so much for being here with us. And John, as we start with you, senior U.S. official also told Martha Raddatz that the Biden administration is now getting warnings from some allies that if Israel moves aggressively and if this lasts for a long time, that they will be unable to support them publicly in the way that they have so far. So what is your reaction to that? Well, uh, this is I think this is exactly what Hamas wanted to have happen. If you really take a step back, they uh, they committed such atrocities and took all these hostages knowing that Israel would have no choice but to go into Gaza once and for all. And their hope is that this, this chaos happens, that Israel oversteps somehow in Gaza, and that the world opinion turns against them. So it's going according to Hamas's plan to some extent, but I don't see Israel being able to do anything else. So uh, it, it, I don't really have an answer for you at this point. Right. Yeah, I understand. And Alicia, to you, you know, that same senior U.S. official also said that a lot of people feel like the longer Israel waits to actually go in, that the more difficult and dangerous it would be for these Israeli forces, and that there's a belief right now within the White House that only President Biden could successfully urge restraint. What's your take on that? Well, I think there's a lot of things that the Biden administration is weighing here, obviously wanting to support an ally in the region, but mm -hmm. they are very concerned about the very real humanitarian crisis in Gaza, the innocent Palestinians who are also losing their lives. I think the White House is also considering what they are dealing with domestically, the rise of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And so mm -hmm. I paint that picture and that the Biden administration knows that President Biden has a significant influence, but has a lot of different situations to weigh in his decision making. And on that note, Mick, to you, you know, Belgian authorities have raised their nation's terror alert to its highest level uh, in Brussels. This is today after the deadly shooting of two Swedes there. Also, as you know, investigators in Chicago say that a six-year-old was stabbed to death over the weekend. Uh, they say it was because he was Muslim. It's a hate crime. So how concerned should we be about these, you know, lone wolf, isolated attacks? So, Kenya, we should be very concerned because it's very difficult to determine where they're going to come from since it's usually a one individual who's been radical, radicalized by watching what he's seeing on television. And the ground invasion hasn't even started yet. So this should be very concerning. Uh, the local governments, the federal government inside the United States and in Europe and elsewhere need to really focus on what they can do to protect their citizenship, because this is just the beginning. This, these depraved acts are unfortunately mm -hmm. going to continue and may even increase. Absolutely. Again, as the defense minister said today there in Israel, uh, this will be a long war. The price will be high. Uh, Mike, to you, how do you see public opinion here in the U.S. potentially shifting as the world braces for what is already threatening to be a prolonged conflict there? 
The public opinion is going to be a very nuanced dynamic as we discuss what is happening in Israel and in Palestine as the humanitarian crisis heats up. It's going to be really interesting to see how does the public opinion, Kana, really shift to Egypt and what is Egypt's role in all of this? Because Egypt does have a strategic relationship and partnership with Saudi Arabia and the UAE, but that does come with different diplomatic and policy ties, just as well as they do have a relationship with Israel when it comes to economic and security alliances and really pushing back a lot of Islam extremists along the peninsula and so that dynamic is but they still have a back channel contact with Hamas and so how does Egypt emerge in this space and what does the public really put the pressure on Egypt to become that moderator um, in this region to help soothe ties the big concerns I've been talking to my Egyptian sources is that they're concerned displacement of the Palestinian refugees they believe that yeah. once you start having refugees become displaced leaving their homeland it becomes a whole different political dynamic onto himself about their return. Right, and at this point, they have nowhere else to go. Mike Muse, Mick Mulroy, Alencia Johnson, and John Katko, thank you. And we'll be back with you throughout this show. Coming up next here, uh, U.S. warships on the way to the Middle East. Will troops be next? The U.S. is ramping up its involvement in this conflict, and we'll talk about that when we come back. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020, winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA Life. will be a long war. The price will be high, but we are going to win for Israel, for the Jewish people, and for the values that both countries believe in. Well, in the big story, the U.S. expands its military presence in the Middle East. Pentagon officials telling ABC News that 2,000 military personnel could be deployed to that region. As a show of force, a second carrier strike group is headed to the eastern Mediterranean Sea as Israel prepares for this ground invasion of Gaza. The USS Eisenhower joining the USS Gerald Ford carrier strike group that arrived there last week. Officials say that both are intended to again act as a deterrent for both Israel Iran and Hezbollah. I want to bring back our panel, Mike Muse and Mick Mulroy, joined now by retired Lieutenant General William Troy and ABC News' Elizabeth Schulze there at the Pentagon. Thank you all for being here with us. And Lieutenant General Troy, starting with you, uh, the U.S. warships, again, not intended to join in this fighting as a deterrent, but what kind of message does it send to Iran and its proxies in this region as tensions are clearly flaring up ahead of Israel's expected ground invasion? Uh, th these are two powerful war fighting uh, capabilities, and I'm sure the message is uh, don't try to take advantage of this 
very tense, difficult, agonizing mm -hmm. situation. Um, we, we mean to support our ally in the region. And, and Mick, to you, you know, Israel has said that its goal is to completely destroy Hamas. What impact does that have on this ground invasion, especially when it comes to the hostages? And noting that Matt Gutman is reporting that they already have various special force units on the ground in Gaza, and that's how they know this hostage count is now closer to 200. That's right, Kana. And, and obviously the IDF's uh, objective here is to completely destroy Hamas's political leadership and its capacity to fight. So that's going to take the size force that they have arrayed against it, and it's going to take quite a long time, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have to go block by block. They're going to have to fight in tunnels. So it's going to take it's going to take a while. It sounds like they told Matt Gutman they are prepared to do this methodically and slowly. Elizabeth, to you, a bipartisan delegation led by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer traveled to Tel Aviv over the weekend, saying the Senate will not wait on the House to choose a new speaker and will move forward in working to pass this new spending that combines aid for Israel and Ukraine. How does that work? I mean, look, the Senate can pass whatever it wants, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is making that clear that it would send a strong bipartisan message. But if it gets over to the House and there's no speaker, it's not going to go anywhere, and it will never make it to the president's desk. Hey, Kena. That's oh, not a great way to get that ball rolling. Uh, Mike, to you, a U.N. official said that mediators, you know, are struggling for a ceasefire. Did they want to get aid in? And they're waiting at the Egyptian border. So how can the U.S. get involved? Should they get involved to help this humanitarian crisis? Yes, it will be great for the U.S. to kind of get involved and help mediate so that we can open up aid to that particular area. But from all accounts, it's going to be difficult to have that ceasefire between Hamas and with Israel in order for that to happen. It's so hard to watch that video and think of those people just trying to get out. Mike Muse, Mick Mulroy, Lieutenant General William Troy, uh, and Elizabeth Schulze, thank you so much for being with us. And coming up next here, as we keep talking about this humanitarian crisis in Gaza, it is worsening by the minute. Right now, one million people are in peril. We'll talk about what is actually being done to help them when we come back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, as we continue with our big story here, with an Israeli ground invasion in Gaza expected, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is growing more dire. I want to bring back our panel to talk about this. Our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host, Mike Muse, Mick Mulroy is with us as well. Uh, also, we have our ABC News national security and defense analyst and former deputy assistant secretary of defense for the Middle East and retired Lieutenant General William Troy. Also joining us is Asma Khalid, ABC News contributor and NPR White House correspondent. Thank 
thank you for being here with us. Asma, as we start with you here, a senior State Department official says that Egypt has informed the U.S. that there are acute security threats, and that's what is preventing U.S. officials and others from aiding Americans inside Gaza. Any idea on how they can get to those Americans and how they can get them home safely? You know, I was just speaking before we came out here to a lawyer that represents an American family from Massachusetts. They have a one-year-old child. They have been stuck in Gaza trying to exit from that Gaza-Egypt border. And he says as of now, uh, the administration, uh, State Department officials are not giving them any timeline on when that border may be open. That's utterly horrifying, and to think with families there with young children stuck at the border, there's so many of them. Uh, Lieutenant General Troy, uh, should the U.S. be taking a more forceful approach here to try to protect civilian lives? I feel sure that the U.S. is doing everything it can in conjunction with its ally, I Israel. Uh, they, are, they are well aware of what's going on, and I'm sure behind the scenes they're doing everything they can. And make to you, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that the goal, of course, is to demolish Hamas. But considering the conditions in Gaza, how, how do they approach that? Well, the first thing is to ensure that every civilian that can gets out of the gets out of the way of this assault that's coming, and that includes identifying a humanitarian corridor that leads to a safe haven that's monitored and protected. Uh, that needs to happen as soon as possible. The United Nations working with Israel and, and, and Egypt. And my humanitarian aid essentially has been stuck at this Rafah crossing there between Gaza and Egypt. It's been stuck there for days. Uh, what is it going to take to open the border, at least for this aid to go in? It's going to essentially take a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel. But Kena, as you and I both know, the odds of that is so challenging and so difficult. The thing I'm most concerned about is the number you mentioned previously, over one million possible individuals to be displaced. What do we do with that? What do we do? Mike Muse, Mick Mulroy, Lieutenant General William Troy, and Asma Khalid, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you all for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth, and you can follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact that they have on you. The news never stops, neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Manhattan, I'm Diane Macedo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, on the brink of a ground invasion. Thousands
Dozens have been killed, thousands more injured in the days since Hamas attacked Israel. And with hundreds of thousands mobilized, the world looks on as a ground war seems almost imminent, even as the humanitarian crisis in Gaza deepens. Plus... Way beyond anger, we are a scarred people. We could not imagine that this scale of attack could could happen on our soil. Running into danger, tonight Ian Panel brings us the story of a 21st century band of brothers, some journeying from America to the front lines in Israel, family, duty, fears, and why the impending battle is so important to them. And... We're not in war. The war is overseas. You want war? It's overseas. It's not our war. It's not United States war. He was just six years old and is now a symbol for the dangers violent rhetoric could pose on Muslims here in the U.S. Tonight, we bring you the story of Wadia Al-Fayyum, the life that was cut tragically short, the family he left behind, and the calls for calm and peace amid so much violence. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin this Monday night with Israel set to escalate its attack against Hamas. A ground invasion of Gaza could come any day now, but at what cost to the people who live there? And we are tracking the possibility of President Joe Biden visiting Israel. The IDF released new video today of an airstrike in Gaza. They say it shows the killing of a Hamas intelligence chief. More than a million people, nearly half the population of Gaza, is now displaced. Israel ordered everyone to leave the north, but no part of Gaza has been spared from airstrikes. It has been chaos at the Rafah crossing from Gaza to Egypt. It was supposed to open for a few hours to allow Palestinian Americans to leave Gaza, but that did not happen today. On the Egyptian side, trucks full of much needed aid and supplies lined up, set to enter Gaza. Egyptian security officials say if they had moved into Gaza, Israel would have struck them. Inside Israel, the State Department is helping Americans get away from Israel. Some 2,000 people boarded a cruise ship at the port of Haifa en route to Cyprus. Our teams are across the region tonight, and we begin with our national correspondent, Matt Gutman, who returned to that kibbutz he visited in the days after the attack, where hundreds were killed. It's now the staging ground for the impending invasion. Tonight, just a few miles from the Gaza border, what was once a peaceful kibbutz, now a staging ground for war. Kibbutz Be'eri, where Hamas terrorists massacred at least 112 Israelis, now the front lines of the looming ground invasion. This is the dining hall where one of the worst massacres and hostage situations happened. It has now become a giant barracks. The entire floor area here is covered with sleeping mats and sleeping bags and troops. Soldiers gathering here just a short ride from the battlefield. Is Israel ready to go right now? Or are they just waiting for the order? We're ready. We're prepared. Their mission, to root out Hamas, and also to find the 199 hostages the terrorists spirited across the border. Tonight, for the first time, we are hearing from one of them. Hamas releasing this video of 21-year-old Mia Shem, her family giving us permission to show these images. Taken from that dance party, we can see her arm wrapped in gauze. I'm on vacation. I just ask that you'll bring me home as soon as possible to my family, she says, to my parents, to my brothers. Please get us out of here as soon as possible. It comes with hundreds of thousands of Gazans on the run tonight, trying to stay ahead of Israel's troops and its bombs. The numbers are staggering. More than 2,700 Gazans have already been killed. More than 3,700 residential buildings flattened. According to local authorities, 1,000 bodies believed buried beneath them. Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta from Doctors Without Borders describing an apocalyptic scene. It's absolutely horrendous. The bodies are stacked up. People are too afraid to bury their dead. When you drive by one of the targeted buildings, there's the stench of decaying bodies. They no longer are able to take the bodies out from underneath the rubble. A million Palestinians have been warned to head south, away from the Israeli border. But they are trapped in a vice with nowhere to go. Gaza is just 25 miles long and 5 miles wide. Now the only possible way out is through the Rafah border crossing into Egypt. But those gates are now closed, even as thousands of Palestinians surge towards Rafah, hoping to escape. Now they are trapped with supplies rapidly dwindling. Israel has cut off all food, water and power. When you wake up in the morning and you 
see your lives completely change. The day is, it's all of them the same, just waiting for the rocket to hit you. That's it. For Israel, this is the price of war, retaliation for the brutal Hamas surprise attack that claimed more than 1,400 Israeli lives. Major General Yair Golan tells me when Israel invades, it won't be shock and awe. It'll be methodical, building by building, floor by floor, with an eye towards taking out the maze of tunnels Hamas has built below Gaza City. The minute you find, you know, uh, the gateway uh, or the exact location of a tunnel, then it becomes a trap mm. for Hamas. So, slowly, slowly, in a very deliberate manner, uh, we are going to beat them and kill them. And Matt Gutman joins us now from Tel Aviv. And Matt, under what circumstances would Egypt be willing to open up their borders for refugees? Egypt is asking that aid arrive before they open the border. They don't care where it comes from, but they want international aid. And you can imagine, Lindsay, the need, the incredible need that the people coming from the Gaza side of the border will have. They will have been without food, water, and electricity for over a week since Israel shut that off in the Gaza Strip. Um, unclear how many people Egypt would allow in. Right now, apparently just American citizens and some others. But if they open the floodgates, they are concerned that they will indeed be flooded with refugees from Gaza to Egypt, and it's unclear if those people would want to go back. Lindsay. Matt Gutman reporting for us from Tel Aviv once again. Thanks so much, Matt. Among those fleeing Israel for their safety are American citizens. Thousands are gathered at the Israeli port city of Haifa to board a cruise ship they hope will get them to safety. ABC's Britt Klenet is there with the details. Tonight, hundreds of American Israelis boarding this cruise ship in the northern Israeli port city Haifa, crossing the Mediterranean to Cyprus, desperate to escape as this war intensifies. The U.S. Embassy organizing this first evacuation of citizens by sea as many commercial airlines cancel flights in and out of Israel. Adela Schutzberg traveling with her two young children, hoping to reach her family in Dallas by Wednesday. I'm constantly on edge, and uh, I can't do that to my kids. I can't let them live like this. There are hundreds of American evacuees on this ship heading for Cyprus, fleeing for safety, many of them seriously concerned about an escalation in this war. And tonight, as Palestinian Americans race to flee war-torn Gaza, we know Americans are among the 199 hostages taken by Hamas. A medical report released by the Israeli Hostages and Missing Families Forum saying many of those abducted are facing life-threatening conditions. The report alleging a nine-month-old baby has no access to formula. A 23-year-old woman has untreated gunshot wounds. People have amputated limbs. And an 85-year-old woman suffering from heart failure is at risk of dying. The situation just so dire there. Britt Klenet joins us now from Haifa in Israel. Uh, Britt, what role has the Red Cross played in trying to secure the Americans being held hostage? Well, Lindsay, the people behind the hostage report I refer to, they passed along their information to the Red Cross. Now, we know the Red Cross has actually met with Hamas leadership, but we know nothing more about the condition of those hostages tonight. However, Lindsay, uh, tonight we did speak with one senior Israeli official who said the priority is the release of women, children and the sick. Lindsay. All right. Britt Klinet reporting in for us from Haifa. Thank you so much, Britt. As concerns grow about the possible scale of Israel's impending attack on Gaza and the possibility that the conflict could spread, tonight 2,000 American troops are on alert for possible deployment to the Middle East. ABC's Martha Raditz has those details. Tonight, 2,000 U.S. troops prepared to be on alert for possible deployment to the Middle East. The troops could provide intelligence and medical support. They would be deployed to bases outside Israel. All part of the rapidly growing show of U.S. force, a second carrier strike group soon joining the USS Ford and its warships in the Mediterranean. A senior U.S. official telling me that U.S. intelligence has now determined there have been a number of activities with Hezbollah and in Iran that are worrisome. This as President Biden huddled with his national security team to consider what would be a dangerous trip to Israel. 
the senior official, telling me that Biden would try to convince the Israelis to show restraint in their planned ground assault in Gaza. Biden, according to the official, would make the case to the Israelis that going in with too much force would play into the hands of Hamas. Certainly no easy choices here. Martha Raddatz joins us now from Tel Aviv. Martha, we've heard the administration's concerns about the scope of a possible ground invasion. What are your sources saying about why officials are so concerned? Lindsay, the official I talked to told me they believe the situation here is simply dire. The administration has thus far been unable to convince the Israeli hardliners to consider the fate of innocent Palestinians in Gaza and that they believe the only way to do it is for the president himself to come here. But if he does make the trip, it brings a whole host of other issues, the biggest one, of course, security concerns. Lindsay? Yeah, we know the Secret Service has many reservations about that. Martha Raddatz reporting in from Tel Aviv once again. Again, thanks so much, Martha. For more now on the situation on the ground, we're joined by Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Kenricus, spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces. Lieutenant Colonel, thank you so much for coming up back on the show. Uh, over the weekend, you said here on ABC News Live that Israel is working to, quote, prepare the battlefield. Obviously, we're aware that you can't go into operational details, but where do those preparations stand for a ground invasion of Gaza? Hi, thank you for having me again. Uh, you know, before maneuvering or any significant combat uh, activities, you have to take into consideration a number of variables, from the physical, like weather, rain, to the condition of your troops, to the situation of the enemy, and uh, other diplomatical and uh, political issues, and of course, humanitarian issues as well. So it's a complex and dynamic environment. We're assessing everything. And we will choose the time that is best from our perspective in order to ch achieve our military goals. Uh, Hamas is now claiming, as you're well aware, that they have at least 200 Israeli hostages, a mix between soldiers and civilians. How dire, it, with that situation, having them on the ground, how is that impacting the ability of the IDF to move forward with action on the ground in northern Gaza without risking their lives? We find ourselves in an unprecedented situation facing very, very serious dilemmas. Uh, we are committed to the return of all of the Israelis that are being held by this vicious terror organization. Most of our hostages are civilians, women, children, elderly, babies, and even an 80-year-old Holocaust survivor are being held, and we are committed to getting them back. The aim of our uh, operation here of the war is to completely dismantle Hamas and all of its military capabilities. And we will see to it that both of these objectives are achieved. Hamas also claims that 22 hostages were killed in Israeli airstrikes. Do you have any information at all that verifies that claim? Hamas is an organization of cowards and liars. And when they say something, I always treat it as a lie, and only if it's confirmed true by something else, then maybe they actually said something true. Uh, to the point, if you remember, on the third day of the fighting, Hamas issued like a panic warning. If the Israelis don't stop bombing, then we will execute uh, hostages and we will show it on video. So in my mind, I put those two statements together by Hamas the one that came before, that they were threatening, and the one now claiming that they're dead. And the obvious outcome is that Hamas is responsible for everything that happens to those hostages, and they'll be held accountable for their actions. As you know, many Palestinians in Gaza have faced limited resources and confusion over border crossings as they try to evacuate to the south. Do you think that they need to be given more time in order to evacuate areas that Israel plans to target? You know, we've given more than 72 hours to evacuate a distance that is less than seven miles. That's the longest walking distance from the northern part of Gaza, south of the Gaza River, seven miles. I think you and I can both agree that if a person wanted to do it, unless, of course, he is in a difficult physical situation, seven miles is very, very doable in 72 hours. And we have been very patient very clear, very patient, very tolerant about the humanitarian situation because we have said, and we stand by this, the civilians are not our enemies, Hamas is. And we don't have an issue with the civilians. We're just going to dismantle Hamas. 
and we will do it while minimizing civilian casualties. And to prove that these are not only talking points, we have given them more than 72 hours to evacuate. 600,000 or so have done so already, and I command them. There are still many left, probably because Hamas has, has actively tried to stop and undermine these evacuation efforts. Again, a testament to the fact that they simply want to use the civilians as their human shields. There are some, though, who argue that uh, the civilians are afraid to leave, to even go outside of their homes because of the, the airstrikes. So if you're asking someone, hey, move to the south, but we're still bombing these areas, is, is that difficult to have both? Well, you know, 600,000 people did, and they arrived safely south into the southern perimeter safe zone. Uh, so that's proof that it is definitely possible, viable, can and should be done. And again, we call on Palestinians, and I call on all the international institutions that are relevant, that instead of sounding alarm bells and saying that it's not possible, which serves only to confuse and delay, help get it done so that people, civilians who are not combatants, can get out of a fighting area so that anybody who is left is an active fighter, of course, if it's not in a hospital or a humanitarian situation, but then we'll have a better chance of operating in an area without killing civilians. We want to take out Hamas, not the civilians. IDF spokesperson Jonathan Canricus, once again, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Police are calling the murder of a six-year-old boy in Illinois and the attack that seriously injured his mother a hate crime. The two were stabbed dozens of times by their landlord, and officials say he targeted them simply because they're Muslim. Here's our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the vicious murder of this innocent six-year-old boy near Chicago is fresh evidence that the war between Israel and Hamas is spilling over into America. Attorney General Merrick Garland announcing a hate crime investigation into an unspeakable crime involving a landlord allegedly attacking his renters, that little boy and his mother. Police in Plainfield Township responding to a report of a stabbing on Saturday. The landlord has the child in another room and apparently is either stabbing or has stabbed the child. Prosecutors say Joseph Zuba fatally stabbed that six-year-old, Wadia Al-Fayumi, 26 times with a military-style knife and left his mother critically injured. Authorities claim the 71-year-old Air Force veteran attacked them because the child and his mother are Muslim and because of hatred tied to the Israeli Hamas war. The child's family laying him to rest today, outraged and heartbroken. We're not in war. The war is overseas. The boar's murder is precisely what the FBI says is the most immediate threat flowing out of the recent conflict in the Middle East. We've got to be on the lookout, especially for lone actors who may take inspiration from recent events to commit violence of their own. Lindsay, the FBI says since the terror attacks in Israel, there's been a surge in reported threats against Jewish and Muslim institutions right here at home. Looks like tense times ahead. Pierre, thank you. For more on the potential for hate-fueled incidents here in the U.S., Keith Ellison, Minnesota's attorney general, first Muslim lawmaker in Congress, and first Muslim American to be elected to statewide office in Minnesota, joins us now. Mr. Ellison, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, let's start with the concerns that the tensions in the Middle East are threatening to inflame hatred here in the U.S. Uh, first, I want to start by listening to what Ahmed Rahab, the executive director of the Council on American-Islamic Relations, said during a press conference following the fatal stabbing of that six-year-old little boy. To what extent was this person radicalized and brainwashed by this lopsided, one-sided atmosphere that has fan the flames of hatred against Muslims and Palestinians. It, to what extent do you see politicians fanning the flames of anti-Muslim, anti-Palestinian rhetoric? I think that uh, leaders, elected leaders, religious leaders, all leaders of all kinds can do a lot to help bring calm. I think inflammatory rhetoric really is not helpful in this situation. And you got to understand that people are listening to you. And uh, therefore, your words should be uh, producing calm. And we are at a heightened risk of attacks on Palestinians, Muslims, but also Jewish Americans, also mosques, synagogues, also churches. We are in a moment when 
responsible people of all walks of life have got to be sensitive to what uh, some, um, some others might hear and therefore act on. Uh, the man who uh, stabbed a five-year-old boy, I guess he had just turned six, uh, 25 times, according to police reports, um, it's just horrific. And sadly, um, irresponsible rhetoric, overblown rhetoric, contributes to this kind of horrible situation. There are also politicians who, while not citing violent rhetoric per se, are coming out against assisting Palestinians. Here's what Florida governor and 2024 hopeful Ron DeSantis had to say. We cannot accept people from Gaza into this country as refugees. I am not going to do that. Uh, if you look at how they behave, not all of them are Hamas, but they are all anti-Semitic. None of them believe in Israel's right to exist. None of the Arab states are willing to take, you know, any of them. The Arab states should be taking them if you have refugees. You don't fly people and import them into the United States of America. Your response to that, and, and do you think that the U.S. should consider taking refugees from Gaza? I think the United States has been a beacon of hope for the world. Uh, people need to understand that uh, most people who live in Gaza are under 18 years old. They are children. Um, you know, this is very important for people to understand. The United States cannot close its doors. Now, if you say that the whole world needs to be accommodating to refugees, I say that's true. But the United States is part of that world. And I just, I just cannot stand with the rhetoric that uh, is coming out of the governor's uh, mouth right there. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you. Joining us now for more on the heightened tensions, both abroad and right here at home, is Oren Siegel, the Vice President of the Center on Extremism with the Anti-Defamation League. Oren, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, today, the FBI released new hate crime data that showed anti-Jewish hate crimes increased by more than 37% in 2022. That's the highest in almost three decades. Is there a concern that the current state of things will only exacerbate that? We're very concerned that the rhetoric that we're seeing in our public discussion, at rallies around the country, in the aftermath of the massacre uh, that we saw in Israel, will only make people engage in more of that activity. In fact, we've already seen uh, spikes in anti-Semitic incidents reported to us at ADL, and this is a trailing indicator. We know that in the weeks and, and months ahead, there's going to be even more reporting for this moment in time. So the Jewish community is feeling vulnerable, and the incidents that are happening are backing that up. And we're seeing increased police presence at synagogues already. What are some of the biggest concerns you're hearing from the Jewish community right now? Some of the biggest concerns that I'm hearing are the over 250 rallies that have occurred throughout the country in, in major cities and smaller towns that have essentially included language that celebrates glorifies and legitimizes these Hamas terrorist attacks, right? Nothing will make people feel less vulnerable than knowing the people in their community are celebrating the murder and abduction of children and the elderly, even if it's 10,000 miles away. Uh, the ADL also tweeted out that they were disgusted and horrified that a young boy was murdered allegedly for being Muslim. Uh, we just had Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison on, who is also the first Muslim American ever elected to Congress. Explain to viewers why it's important for this organization to speak out about suspected Islamophobia as well. I mean, this is part of what we do at ADL. In order to fight anti-Semitism, you have to fight Islamophobia, racism, misogyny, and other forms of hatred. And in order to fight those hatreds, you have to stand up against the anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, as the FBI has already indicated, is that synagogues and mosques are in, particularly, are in particular vulnerable right now to potential attacks based on what we're seeing around the world. Our fight is often one that is together, even though much of the public discussion tries to divide us. Oren Siegel, Vice President of the Center on Extremism with the Anti-Defamation League, we thank you so much for coming on. Thank you.
Belgium is now on high alert after the fatal shooting of two Swedes in Brussels. New video shows the moment of the killings, which happened about three miles from a stadium where more than 35,000 fans were watching a Belgium-Sweden soccer match. The match was suspended halfway through. It was not immediately clear if the shooting was linked to the international uproar over the Israel-Hamas war. Russia is waging a major new offensive in eastern Ukraine, mounting the largest push it has attempted since last winter. Thousands of Russian troops and hundreds of tanks and armored vehicles have been sent into the offensive operations, which began around a week ago, after Russia suffered severe casualties, according to Ukrainian officials and independent researchers. The scale of the new offensive appeared to suggest the Kremlin is seeking to turn the tide of the war after months of defending against Ukraine's counteroffensive. And still ahead, the battle for the House Speaker on Capitol Hill, how Congressman Jim Jordan is trying to rally support within his own party. But next, the band of brothers heeding the call of duty for a country at war. How hard was the goodbye? I mean, I knew I had to go, but looking back at my, uh, my family, standing there on the front door in tears, walking out to a beautiful, peaceful street in, uh, in Chicago, it was just surreal. Whenever news breaks, to crush it. families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. With a ground invasion of Gaza seemingly imminent at this point, the Israel-Hamas war is nearing a new phase. And for the four Israeli soldiers you're about to meet, this band of brothers are heeding the call to duty. They say it's all about protecting the homeland, but it doesn't make their sacrifices any less difficult. Our chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel has their story. My first reaction was just total shock. Right away, I ran to the airport, got on my first flight here. I woke up, I checked my phone, and right away I knew something was wrong. They are a band of brothers, reservists, friends, and comrades. On the eve of what's expected to be a brutal and bloody battle inside Gaza, they spoke exclusively to ABC News. Dan, 35 years old, from North Israel. Avi, 32, from Arizona. Moshe, 45, from Ashkelon in southern Israel and Schrager, 38, from Chicago. When they heard the news of the terrible Hamas attack on their country, the slaughter of over 1,400 Israelis, it was a call to arms. They never, ever thought anything like this could ever happen. And then it kept getting worse. People that I know were killed and are missing. The only thing on my mind was just to, to come back to Israel, get, get to Israel. How hard was the goodbye? I mean, I knew I had to go, but looking back at my, uh, my family, standing there on the front door in tears, 
walking out to a beautiful, peaceful street in, uh, in Chicago, it was just surreal. The last few days have been awful. Some of the things that I've seen with my own eyes and the stories I'm hearing with the heroes, the real heroes, first responders, are horrific. As you're coming to realization, the scale of the attack that Israel has just suffered, what are the emotions? Way beyond anger. We are scarred people. Could not imagine that this scale of attack could, could happen on our soil. What does a battle mean for you? And what does Gaza mean for you? We let them kill us one by one, again and again, terror attacks. But this just uh, topped it all. Okay, I do not see the Gaza civilians' population as my enemy. You don't? No, I don't. The objective here is to wipe out Hamas, to um, end the, the terror that they continue to inflict on us on their own people. It's long overdue, and we need to stand up to them and um, show them that it's not something that we're going to take and no people should have to take. I stood uh, in Auschwitz-Birkenau in full uniform, and I had tears in my eyes when uh, our commander spoke and told us that we are, we, the, the soldiers of Israel, we are the promise that never again. And in this, in this past week, then we, could, we didn't fulfill our promise. And we're here to fulfill it. And to honor that promise, Israel's promise, this brotherhood knows it can't underestimate a determined enemy fighting on home turf. The Jewish people are rising up like they've never done before. And uh, we are ready to fight. I'm a commander of over 500 soldiers here. And I know that in their hearts, even when we're the most angry, there is not one here that is full of or motivated by hate to the Palestinian people. We are fighting this war because we have no choice but to bring peace back to the region. It's not about revenge. It's about making sure those people that had to leave their houses, had to watch their community being slaughtered, they can come back and they can sleep at night peacefully, knowing this can't happen again. You're a soldier, but you're also a man, a human. What about fear? Well, of course there's fear. Only idiots do not feel fear. Uh, we embrace it. We learn to manage it. That's part of our training. I'm a veteran. And when I told my wife that I'm coming back to active service, uh, she looked me in the eyes and said, I understand. A little fear, inevitably, but also anger for what they say Hamas has done to Israelis and now to its own people. Some of my anger on Hamas is that they are putting us through this, all of us, the Palestinian people and the Israeli soldiers, through what we're going to be going to in the next week. For us, every soul is important. It's in our DNA. There are those voices there across this region and elsewhere who say the price of military action is too great, that too many civilians are now dying, too many Palestinians are already dying. Did anyone in our border towns receive a text message from Hamas announcing what time they have to leave their towns by? No, we didn't get those messages. But that's what the IDF is doing. None of us want to engage in war. We are here because we have no other choice. I think that it's, we have a responsibility here to work according to international law, but we're in, a full, we're in a full war here, and the responsibility isn't on us. You should take that question straight back to Hamas. Different men with so very different lives, but they're brothers in arms who've known each other for 15 years. It's crucial. The feelings that we have the, for each other, the responsibility that we feel for each other. A lot of my confidence comes from a long-lasting life relationship. Right. and camaraderie that we have between us. Yeah. And it's a friendship and connection that is built over 20 years. We always, uh, when we say goodbye, we say, I love you very much. I hope I won't see you in a long, long time. <laughs>
they are seeing each other much sooner than they would have liked, I'm sure. Our thanks to Ian for bringing us that perspective. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime coming up. He serves as governor for one of America's least populous states, but tonight Doug Burgum is hoping his lack of name recognition won't be his Achilles heel as he tries to become the next president of the United States. How's the Achilles doing now? Well, today it's doing great and, uh, and uh, much better. And I don't know if you heard, I did, uh, I'm in the record books because it was voted the best presidential debate ever by someone standing on one leg. But next, a major pharmacy chain is filing for bankruptcy. We'll break down what factors drove the decision by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, yeah. every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shock. Mrs. Kennedy's there was staying her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. The greatest courage is to go about a day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Rite Aid, one of the nation's largest pharmacy retailers, announced on Sunday that it's filed for bankruptcy. So what does it mean for the future of the business and its customers? Let's take a look by the numbers. Philadelphia-based Rite Aid filed for voluntary Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in New Jersey as it seeks to restructure its business and reduce debt. Now, that doesn't mean Rite Aid is going out of business. In fact, the company says it secured $3.45 billion in new financing to support its business operations. But the company says it will be 
closing some of its 2,100 stores in 17 states, focusing on closing underperforming locations while still serving their customers at other Rite Aid stores. Founded in 1962, Rite Aid employs more than 45,000 people, including 6,100 pharmacists. The company says where possible, it's looking to move employees to still open locations. Rite Aid has faced slumping sales compared to larger rivals like CVS and Walgreens, with Rite Aid saying that it's projected to lose between 650 to 680 million dollars for its current fiscal year. Rite Aid has also faced more than a thousand federal, state, and local lawsuits claiming that its pharmacies allegedly filled thousands of illegal prescriptions for painkillers, helping to fuel the opioid epidemic. Justice Department filed suit against Rite Aid in the spring over unlawful opioid prescriptions, claims that Rite Aid has denied as it seeks to dismiss the lawsuit. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The potential plea deal involving Joran Vandersloot, the prime suspect in the disappearance of Natalie Holloway, plus the new events taking center stage of the 2028 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Why it could bring, bring in more big name athletes? What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The plea expected from the suspect in the disappearance of Natalie Holloway, the changes coming for the site of a deadly school shooting, and the new events just added to the Olympic Games. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown.
The prime suspect in the disappearance of Natalie Holloway in 2005 is expected to plead guilty this week for attempting to extort the young woman's mother. Joran Vandersloot was extradited from a Peruvian prison where he was serving time for murdering a different woman in 2010. The disappearance of Holloway in 2005 on a high school trip to Aruba sparked an investigation that captivated the world. She was last seen with Vandersloot leaving a bar on the island. A judge declared her dead, but her body was never found. I live to see this done. I think that's why I live so long. Police in Polk County, Florida, say they've cracked a case going back to 1986. Teresa Scalf, a nurse at a local medical center, was found dead in her apartment by her mother in 1986. Deputies said her throat was cut and wounds on her hands indicated a struggle at the time of death. Sheriffs say new DNA testing technology helped solve the case and found that Donald Douglas, an electrician, committed the murder. Douglas died from natural causes in 2008. Classes at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School have long since resumed, but the bullet-riddled and blood-spattered building where Nicholas Cruz opened fire in 2018, killing 17 people, has remained locked up and behind a fence. The building was locked up following the shooting to be preserved as evidence, but with Cruz now sentenced to life in prison, authorities say it'll be demolished next summer. I made a promise that there will never be a reason for us to get a divorce. We will work through whatever. Jada Pinkett Smith opening up on the Today Show about her marriage to fellow actor Will Smith. Ahead of her new memoir, she'd revealed that they'd been separated since 2016 and living separate lives. She clarified that they're not planning to get a divorce and are healing their relationship. In a profile on Jada for the New York Times, Will responded, saying the revelations in her book gave him a new appreciation for her resilience, intelligence, and compassion. The 2028 Olympics is adding new events and bringing back some old ones. Cricket will be returning for the first time since 1900. Baseball, softball, and flag football will also be featured in Los Angeles in 2028, setting the stage for some big-name athletes to make an appearance for their country. And a six-member team lacrosse was also added, marking its return to the games for the first time since 1908. For the first time ever, squash will have its Olympic debut in Southern California in 2028. Madonna kicked off her latest tour in London. The celebration tour will feature the legendary performer belting out four decades of hits. It was postponed earlier this year after Madonna was hospitalized. The 65-year-old singer is still the best-selling female artist of all time. The Biden administration and the American Civil Liberties Union have reached a proposed settlement agreement over separated migrant families under Trump. If approved, the settlement would provide benefits for thousands of migrant families separated under the Trump administration's controversial zero, zero tolerance policy to deter illegal southern border crossings. The Justice Department said if the proposed agreement passes, new standards would be established to limit migrant family separations in the future. We turn now to the latest from Capitol Hill, where it's now day 13 without a Speaker of the House. Republicans do appear to be making a bit of progress toward a vote on Congressman Jim Jordan's nomination to take the gavel. ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott joins us now. Rachel, where do things stand tonight? Well, we know Congressman Jim Jordan has been working the phones. He's meeting with Republicans once again tonight, trying to win over those holdouts. He's known here on Capitol Hill as a staunch supporter of former President Donald Trump. He has pushed false claims about the 2020 election. Now he is one step closer to becoming the next Speaker of the House. Several Republicans who initially expressed some reservations with Jordan have now said they will support him. Still, this is going to be an uphill challenge. Remember, he can only afford to lose four Republican votes, which means we could see this go multiple rounds. Jordan appearing confident, though, telling me by tomorrow there will be a new speaker, Lindsay. I don't know. It could be Groundhog's Day all over again, Rachel. <laughs> we'll see. Our thanks to you, as always. <laughs> Next tonight, to the race for the White House and the Republicans vying to become the next president of the United States, we go to North Dakota to meet Doug Burgum, the successful businessman turned governor and now candidate for president. A childhood friend says before Google, you would just ask Doug. So what inspired him to run for president? It's the latest in our series, Who Is?, which gives viewers a chance to hear from the people behind the politicians. In a few words, who is Doug Burgum? 
Doug Burgum's a kid that grew up in a small town, Arthur, North Dakota, 300 people. And what a fabulous place to grow up. The streets weren't even paved. I mean, there was no mail delivery. And everybody, like I said, neighbors helping neighbors. Had the gift of two amazing parents. My dad was a World War II Navy vet and learned from him courage and sacrifice. But he passed away when I was a freshman in high school. Mm -hmm. My mom went back to work to help pay the mortgage and make ends meet. And that was a great lesson from her because she had wisdom and perseverance and grace. Uh, incredible. I grew up playing basketball in an Arthur, my brother, my cousin. But then after undergrad, grad school, working in Chicago, I uh, saw my first computer and I said, wow, that's going to change the world. And literally bet the farm to become the seed capital for a startup called Great Plains Software. We went public, had this fantastic run as a public company, got acquired by Microsoft, and then I uh, joined that team and uh, helped uh, build Microsoft and to get it going on the track that it is today. Clearly, your roots go deep here in North Dakota. Rumor has it that your great-grandmother even tangled with Lieutenant Colonel George Custer and won. Yes. Any truth to that? <laughs> it's, it's absolutely, it's written in North Dakota history. <laughs> she was the postmistress at, a, at a Fort Lincoln Army Post where Custer was stationed and he tried to circumvent her responsibility taking the U.S. mailbags. He cut them open and she went to battle with him over that and she won. It's also written that she was the first woman in the country to vote uh, as a presidential elector uh, in one of the early conventions back in the 1890s. You mentioned also you were an avid basketball player in, in high school, still playing basketball now. Yes. Any regrets about that pickup game the night before the first debate? I have none, none at all. Uh, sport has been so good to me. The amount of basketball I've played over my lifetime, ran track, played football, played organized uh, you know, adult softball for 30 plus years, and all of the things, you know, climbed mountains, skied stuff that should have killed me. And <laughs> I've never had a ankle or knee injury, so I'm way past my mileage warranty. <laughs> I'm like, I am like just, I'm grateful for the, grateful for the gift I've had to be injury free for this long, and I'm fully confident I'll be, I'll be fully recovered and back at it. It's not gonna, not gonna stop me. How's the Achilles doing now? Well, today it's doing great and, uh, and uh, much better. And I don't know if you heard, I did, uh, I'm in the record books because it was voted the best presidential date ever by someone standing on one leg. Yes. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> I'm happy, happy we have that one, but hopefully don't have to do that again. Were you in a lot of pain while you were up there? Absolutely. And talk to anybody who's blown their Achilles and they'll confirm that. What do you think is the fairest criticism about you? That I'm not as polished as some of the other politicians. What do you say to critics who say that it was legally dubious, I believe was the term, for you to give the $20 gift cards in order to get a $1 donation. Well, first of all, that's a completely inappropriate and false statement because there's, there's nothing at all inappropriate about doing a promotion. You've got to get someone a reason to come and look, you know, come to your website and look. We've got, you know, thousands of people who gave a dollar to get the $20 gift card who come back and now donated because they've they got engaged with us. Mm. It was a smart way to get a, a campaign off the ground. As governor, you had uh, just this past year, you signed eight anti-trans bills into law. Uh, North Dakota also has uh, some of the strictest abortion laws of any of the states. How would you work across the aisle with people who may totally differ from your point of view on those and other issues? Well, I think this goes back to the 10th Amendment uh, and take the the whole issue of Dobbs, which I support, it returned it to the states, and that's where it should belong. That's not a federal responsibility, and what works in New York will never work in North Dakota and vice versa. So some of these things need to be left to the states, uh, and that's where they belong. Do you remember the moment where you said, I'm going to run for president of the United States? I do. I was out here and uh, with the family and kids and and um, I said, I'm, I'm, th I'm ready to make the decision today. And my yeah. oldest son, Joe, said, I think you should say it out loud. I think you should say it. You should just say it out loud. We went for a walk. We were out here um, in the, you know, in the beautiful walking through the tall grass and in the woods. And I said, and it was hard. And I said, I, to my own kids, I said, I'm Doug Burgum and I'm running for president. And at that moment, you can't make it up. 
an eagle flew down right over the top of us, like a big, beautiful bald eagle. We hadn't seen one all day. They don't live here. There's not one that we had propped, like cue the, you know, cue the bald eagle, but it literally like flew down like 20 feet over our head. And we all got the chills when that happened. I haven't shared that with anybody, but I'm sharing it with you. Thanks for asking, Lindsay. As I asked, you, you got a little choked up about it. What is that emotion? Well, I think about my dad. And I think about people like him. I think about him because I think about the, there's 80,000, a little over 80,000 MIAs in the history of America. So I, the decision to run is not about, you know, politics and hot button issues. It, it's about the security of our country, the future of our kids and our grandkids. And so it's a super big decision. I take super seriously and, and like I said, we're, we're in it out of a heart of service. Your greatest strength? Courage. Greatest weakness? Are you asking what my Achilles heel is? <laughs> but I'm pumped. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Apparently my Achilles heel is my Achilles yeah. heel. That's <laughs> Our thanks to Doug Burgum for that conversation. The beloved star of Three's Company, Suzanne Summers, died Sunday after her valiant battle with breast cancer, just one day shy of her 77th birthday. ABC's Rhiannon Alley has the story of her life and legacy. Suzanne Summers was a television icon, starring in one of the most popular sitcoms of all time and some of the most famous infomercials ever made. Then I found Thighmaster. She was a 31-year-old single mom when she landed the role that would make her a star, the stereotypical ditzy blonde Chrissy on Three's Company. Well, this is typical, getting a girl pregnant. Only a man would do a thing like that. <laughs> the role turning her into a household name and a sex symbol. Five seasons later, she has to be paid the same as her co-star, John Ritter. I'm not stupid. I just played one on TV. <laughs> I'm seeing that the men are being paid four, five, ten times more. That demand for pay equality backfiring. Summers was written off the show. My career was dead because the public got mad at me for being greedy. Her career faltered for years until in the 90s when she found her way back on the small screen. Hi, Master. We may not have been born with great legs, but now we can look like we were. Becoming the spokeswoman for the Thigh Master, a job that perhaps, surprisingly, would catapult her back onto network TV, appearing on Step by Step for seven seasons while launching a self-help empire. She wrote dozens of books on healthy living and aging. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2000 and decided to forego chemotherapy. Still, she fought on, even jiving on Dancing with the Stars. But in July, in a post featuring her husband of more than 45 years, Summers revealing her cancer had returned. And how would you like people to remember you? That I made a difference, that I affected people's lives positively. She certainly did. Our thanks to Rhiannon for bringing us that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, why a judge issued a partial gag order in the federal election interference case involving former President Trump. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 
three. What you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us afternoons for everything you need to know. I love that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin with Israel set to escalate its attack against Hamas. A ground invasion of Gaza could come any day now, but at what cost to the people who live there? The IDF released new video today of an airstrike in Gaza. They say it shows the killing of a Hamas intelligence chief. More than a million people, nearly half the population of Gaza, is now displaced. More than 2,700 people have now died. Israel ordered everyone to leave the north, but no part of Gaza Gaza has been spared from airstrikes. It's been chaos at the Rafah crossings from Gaza to Egypt. It was supposed to open for a few hours to allow Palestinian Americans to leave Gaza, but that did not happen today. On the Egyptian side, trucks full of much needed aid and supplies lined up set to enter Gaza. Egyptian security officials say if they had moved into Gaza, Israel would have struck them. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, leads us off with more on the impending ground invasion. Tonight, just a few miles from the Gaza border, what was once a peaceful kibbutz, now a staging ground for war. Kibbutz Be'eri, where Hamas terrorists massacred at least 112 Israelis, now the front lines of the looming ground invasion. This is the dining hall where one of the worst massacres and hostage situations happened. It has now become a giant barracks. The entire floor area here is covered with sleeping mats and sleeping bags and troops. Stop. Soldiers gathering here just a short ride from the battlefield. Is Israel ready to go right now? Or are they just waiting for the order? We're ready. We're prepared. Their mission to root out Hamas and also to find the 199 hostages the terrorists spirited across the border. Tonight, for the first time, we are hearing from one of them. Hamas releasing this video of 21-year-old Mia Shem, her family giving us permission to show these images. Taken from that dance party, we can see her arm wrapped in gauze. I'm on vacation. I just ask that you'll bring me home as soon as possible to my family, she says, to my parents, to my brothers. Please get us out of here as soon as possible. It comes with hundreds of thousands of Gazans on the run tonight, trying to stay ahead of Israel's troops and its bombs. The numbers are staggering. More than 2,700 Gazans have already been killed. More than 3,700 residential buildings flattened. According to local authorities, 1,000 bodies believed buried beneath them.
Dr. Ghassan Abusita from Doctors Without Borders describing an apocalyptic scene. It's absolutely horrendous. The bodies are stacked up. People are too afraid to bury their dead. When you drive by one of the targeted buildings, there's the stench of decaying bodies. They no longer are able to take the bodies out from underneath the rubble. A million Palestinians have been warned to head south, away from the Israeli border. But they are trapped in a vice with nowhere to go. Gaza is just 25 miles long and 5 miles wide. Now the only possible way out is through the Rafah border crossing into Egypt. But those gates are now closed, even as thousands of Palestinians surge towards Rafah, hoping to escape. Now they are trapped with supplies rapidly dwindling. Israel has cut off all food, water and power. When you wake up in the morning and you see your lives completely change. The day is, it's all of them the same, just waiting for the rocket to hit you, that's it. For Israel, this is the price of war, retaliation for the brutal Hamas surprise attack that claimed more than 1,400 Israeli lives. Major General Yair Golan tells me when Israel invades, it won't be shock and awe. It'll be methodical, building by building, floor by floor with an eye towards taking out the maze of tunnels Hamas has built below Gaza City. The minute you find, you know, uh, the gateway uh, or the exact location of a tunnel, then it becomes a trap mm. for Hamas. So, slowly, slowly, in a very deliberate manner, uh, we are going to beat them and kill them. Our thanks to Matt Gutman for that. Among those fleeing Israel for their safety are American citizens. Thousands are gathered at the Israeli port city of Haifa to board a cruise ship they hope will take them to safety. ABC's Brick Clenet is there with the details. Hi, Lindsay. Well, I'm in the northern port city of Haifa, where hundreds of American Israelis started a 12-hour journey to Cyprus, fleeing for safety. From there, not all of them know what's next. They just know that they needed to get out, and they're worried about a serious escalation in this war. I met Adela Schatzberg, who's traveling with her two children, one baby strapped to her chest. She's pushing the other in a stroller. She said she hopes to join her family in Dallas by Wednesday. She was telling me she fears for her kids. They're running into the bunker every day, and that she made the final decision yesterday. She said she's constantly on edge and she just can't do that to her kids, that she can't let them live like this. I also met a Massachusetts-bound Alan Cohen and his frustration was extremely obvious. You know, he said that he has a feeling this time that this kind of thing happens every 10 years, but this time Hamas is smarter, they have better technology and that Israel got caught this time. He said that can't happen, that Israel has always gone for the knife first, but that it, enough is enough. And like others we met, Lindsay Cohen, uh, he took everything Thing he owns with him in this kind of desperate rush to leave. Lindsay? Britt, thank you. And now we want to toss it over live to Antony Blinken, who spoke with Netanyahu today and continues to be in or Israel at this Gaza, time. Or otherwise preventing it from reaching the people who need it. If Hamas in any way blocks humanitarian assistance from reaching civilians, including by seizing the aid itself, we'll be the first to condemn it and we will work to prevent it from happening again. We welcome the government of Israel's commitment to work on this plan. The president very much looks forward to discussing it further when he's here on Wednesday. Thanks very much. And there you have the words just now from the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, saying uh, that the president will actually be there in Israel on Wednesday. We'll continue to keep you updated with that. About 2,000 U.S. military members across the armed services may deploy to the Middle East amid the Israel-Hamas war, broadening U.S. backing for Israel's military. The troops, if deployed, could serve in an advisory role or provide medical support and are not to be deployed for combat. The 2,000 personnel are stationed in and out of the Middle East, including some in Europe. And it's not clear where they will be sent or what needs to happen for the U.S. to deploy them. U.S. officials urge Iran and its allied militant group Hezbollah not to directly enter the Israel-Hamas conflict. While well, the world turns its attention to the Middle East, the war in Ukraine is still raging on. Our Patrick Rival is in Kyiv, Ukraine, with the latest on where the Ukrainian resistance stands. Patrick, Russia appears to be really taking advantage of the Israel-Hamas war by launching a new offensive in eastern Ukraine. What's happening on that front? 
Yeah, Lindsay, while the world's attention has been glued on Israel and Gaza, Russia has been waging a major new offensive in eastern Ukraine. It's the biggest push that's attempted since last winter. It's focused on the strategic city of Avdivka as well as further north to Kupiansk. And basically for the past week, it's been throwing in thousands of troops and hundreds of tanks and armored vehicles into this onslaught. And what this shows, I think, is that Russia is trying to turn the tide after months of facing Ukraine's counteroffensive and defending against it but so far it seems to have been going very badly for Russia from what we can see from videos that have been circulating of the attack we've seen that dozens of armored vehicles Russian armored vehicles have been destroyed and Ukraine claims that thousands of Russian troops have been killed and injured in just the past week but tonight as well we're hearing from Ukrainian troops that the offensive appears to have slowed for now but they believe that Russia is regrouping and will attempt to continue these assaults and turning to news now out of Poland, where there will be a historic election that will certainly have implications for Ukraine, explain to us what that is. Yeah, I mean, this is really, uh, this is being described as one of the most important elections in Poland's post-Cold War history. I mean, exit polls suggest that liberal parties in Poland have won enough votes to remove from power the authoritarian right-wing Law and Justice Party that's ruled Poland for eight years. Now, the final count will only come in on Tuesday, but if this is confirmed, this has major implications for Europe and Ukraine. This was being treated by many in, in Poland as a vote for whether their country would continue down a path of becoming a right-wing authoritarian regime similar to Russia or Hungary. And the stakes were reflected in this record high turnout there that was over 73 percent. That was more than actually in the first election in Poland after the end of communism. I mean, the Law and Justice Party has been pursuing this anti-democratic course, taking over Poland's judiciary and public media. And so the leader of the liberal opposition there, Donald Tusk, has hailed this as a victory for democracy in Poland. And this this matters ultimately for Ukraine here because the Law and Justice Party recently in the last few weeks has been increasingly criticizing support for Ukraine as they were courting the right wing vote in those elections. And so there's a belief that if the liberal parties there come to power now, they're more likely to pursue this continued support for Ukraine. Lindsay. Prof profound implications indeed. Patrick Rival, our thanks to you. The tensions in the Middle East are threatening to inflame hatred here in the U.S. Police believe that hate is what fueled the murder of a six-year-old boy in Illinois in a stabbing attack that seriously injured his mother. And officials say he targeted them simply because they're Muslim. Here's our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the vicious murder of this innocent six-year-old boy near Chicago is fresh evidence that the war between Israel and Hamas is spilling over into America. Attorney General Merrick Garland announcing a hate crime investigation into an unspeakable crime involving a landlord allegedly attacking his renters, that little boy and his mother. Police in Plainfield Township responding to a report of a stabbing on Saturday. The landlord has the child in another room and apparently is either stabbing or has stabbed the child. Prosecutors say Joseph Zuba fatally stabbed that six-year-old, Wadia Al-Fayumi, 26 times with a military-style knife and left his mother critically injured. Authorities claim the 71-year-old Air Force veteran attacked them because the child and his mother are Muslim and because of hatred tied to the Israeli Hamas war. The child's family laying him to rest today, outraged and heartbroken. We're not in war. The war is overseas. The boy's murder is precisely what the FBI says is the most immediate threat flowing out of the recent conflict in the Middle East. We've got to be on the lookout, especially for lone actors who may take inspiration from recent events to commit violence of their own. Our thanks to Pierre for that. In Washington, the federal judge overseeing the special counsel's election interference case imposed a narrow gag order on former President Trump, barring him from conducting a, quote, pretrial smear campaign against prosecutors, possible witnesses, and the judge's staff. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky has the details. Tonight, former President Trump is under a new and narrow gag order, a federal judge in Washington now limiting what Trump can say about his election interference case, potential witnesses, and the prosecutor, special counsel Jack Smith. I cannot imagine any other criminal case in which the defendant is permitted to call the prosecutor deranged or a thug, Judge Tanya Chutkin said, I will not permit it here. Trump has pleaded not guilty to conspiring to defraud the United States and obstruct the certification of the 2020 election results. And he has argued his social media posts and public statements about the case are protected political speech. Did you see today that deranged Jack Smith 
He's the prosecutor. He's a deranged person. The judge said Trump's presidential campaign does not give him carte blanche to vilify and implicitly encourage violence against public servants who are simply doing their job. But the judge is still allowing Trump to attack President Biden, the Justice Department, and argue the case is politically motivated. Our thanks to Aaron for that. Still much more to get to tonight on Prime coming up. The state of journalism in America as it finds itself between budget cuts and the front lines of war. My conversation with a former Washington Post executive editor. But next, the deadly shooting in Brussels prompting the city to raise its terror alert. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Oshinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Belgium is on high alert after the fatal shooting of two Swedes in Brussels. New video shows the moments of the killings, which happened some three miles from a stadium where more than 35,000 fans were watching a Belgium-Swede soccer match. The match was suspended halfway through. It was not immediately clear if the shooting was linked to the international uproar over the Israel-Hamas war. More than 8,500 migrants have arrived in Spain's Canary Islands over the past few weeks as authorities struggle to cope with a wave of migrants. The number of arrivals by sea to the Canary Islands has increased 80% compared to the same time last year, according to the Interior Ministry. The Amazon River fell to its lowest level in more than a century at the heart of the Brazilian rainforest as a record drought upends the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and damages the jungle's ecosystem. The port of Manaus, uh, the region's most populous city, recorded around 13 feet less of water today than they had a year ago, according to its website. When it comes to the Israel-Hamas war, information has been hard to verify out of Gaza. Lead cause of that, the loss of journalists on the ground. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, at least 15 journalists have been killed since the war began on October 7th. It could sadly just be the start. And it's where journalism finds itself right now, at a crossroads between newsroom cuts and bubbling violence at home and abroad, following years of political rhetoric that's ultimately endangering them. And it's on that state of journalism that I spoke with former Washington Post executive editor Marty Barron as he released a new book, Collision of Power, examining his time at the Post, the purchase of the paper by Jeff Bezos, and the role Donald Trump played. So you write about this really unprecedented moment in time where you have uh, the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, who buys one of the most prolific newspapers, the Washington Post, just as President Donald Trump takes office. Do you feel that this collision of power, as you describe it, was inevitable? 
Probably so, because the Washington Post had a history of holding power to account going back to Watergate and since then and even before then. That is the history and heritage of the Washington Post. That's its identity. Investigative reporting is core to that newspaper. And he knew that when he bought it. He read Catherine Graham's book about her time at the Post, her as owner of the Washington Post. She had clashes with the Nixon administration, of course, during Watergate. And so I think he anticipated that at some point he might have similar clashes. And as you detail and witness firsthand in many of the cases, the way that, that, that Trump really tried to bully the paper. What do you think would have happened had someone purchased the Post who didn't have the deep pockets of a Jeff Bezos? Yeah, well, the deep pockets were important in terms of investing in our future and launching initiatives. He, he also, before he invested, he actually changed the strategy of the Post to be more national and global and not regional. But also, it, it went beyond the deep pockets. It went beyond to the point that he, he resisted the kind of pressure. Trump was actually trying to sabotage his primary business, which of course was Amazon. I'm wondering why there are such varying depictions, really. You talk about some of the Post staffers saying that Bezos is a, a corporate villain, and yet you write that everything I've heard and seen tells me that Bezos honestly believes in an essential role for journalism and a democracy. For all the speculation that Bezos would use the Post to exercise influence, I never saw any evidence he had or would. Yeah, that's right. Well, when he acquired the Post uh, in October of 2013, people were nervous about that. Look, I mean, he's a wealthy guy. He's the founder of Amazon. There are plenty of legitimate questions about Amazon's business practices, its practices with regard to its workers, its intrusions into people's individual privacy. There are a whole bunch of legitimate public policy issues with regard to Amazon. It has business with the U.S. government. It provides cloud computing services, including to intelligence agencies. So I think people had a lot of worries, and, and particularly with regard to his uh, treatment of, of workers. So there were concerns that um, about his ownership of the Post and what that would mean for us, whether there would be huge conflicts of interest, whether he would try to exercise influence. But the reality is that I never saw that. He never did that. You talk about post-George Floyd and the criticism that you came under, in particular from some of the black staffers at, at the Post. Of that, you write, I had not been the good listener. I regularly urge others to be. Black journalists at the Post were telling me we had not done nearly enough, that their voices weren't being heard at senior levels. Of course, there's been a lot of discussions about diversity and inclusion since then. Do you feel that enough has changed, that we have enough diverse voices in the highest tiers of, of management at the nation's newspapers? Well, we need more. I mean, there's no question that we need more. And that's something I think uh, news organizations have to continue to work on. I do think post-George Floyd, people have worked in a very determined way to improve the situation. But overall, we actually, in the industry, in the, in the field of journalism, we just, we need a bigger pipeline. We need more people from communities of color actually getting into the field of journalism in the first place and being reporters and become from going from being reporters to being editors and going from being editors to being senior managers and the top executives. And uh, we have to work on that as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot more work to be done. Um, but I think that uh, certainly post-George Floyd, people have focused on that a lot more than they did before. And uh, as you say, uh, black journalists were insisting on action now, not they didn't want to wait any longer. Of course, Trump's administration was mired in scandal and controversy and perhaps Many could say that that crescendo on, on January 6th, and of that day, you wrote, this is what Trump had wrought. The press was now required to physically protect itself from fellow Americans informed by the President of the United States. Trump's unrelenting rhetoric condemning the press as the enemy had made this moment inevitable. It's been two and a half years since. Do you think that things have gotten any better for the press since then? No, I don't think they have gotten better for the press. Look, uh, Trump himself continues to attack the press. He continues to describe the press as the enemy of the people. He has argued most recently that NBC should be prosecuted for treason. I mean, these are incendiary remarks. People in the press have told Trump over many years that his remarks are going to lead to violence. They did lead to violence on January 6th. Certainly, the worst violence was directed at the Capitol and at potentially at members of Congress. But there was a lot of violence directed at the press as well. Uh, and that could very well get worse. You've been at the forefront of so many of the major headlines, even before uh, your, your time at the Washington Post, obviously. Was there a, a particular favorite story or a certain charge that you remember getting, just, you know, that, that you felt like this is career-defining? Well, my most gratifying story was actually at the Boston Globe when uh, 
we launched an investigation of the of abuse, sexual abuse within the Catholic Church, and really more important than the, the extent of the abuse, the actual cover-up by the church of that abuse. We published that story in uh, January of 2002. It had enormous impact on the church. It's had an enormous impact on how institutions deal with allegations of sexual abuse, institutions other than the church. It's had an enduring impact. The impact continues to this day, more than 20 years later. And the reason that means so much to me is because it affected the lives of ordinary people and the lives of people whose voices simply had not been heard. Our thanks to Marty Barron for sitting down with us. And still to come, Olympic champion Mary Lou Retton's road to recovery, fighting for her life in the ICU. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. The worst attack in 50 years. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. Reporting from the front lines. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Finally tonight, Olympic champion gymnast Mary Lou Retton is reportedly making remarkable progress as she fights for her life in the ICU. Her family says it's been a lengthy journey, but witnessing these improvements is incredibly heartening. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the very latest. The family of Olympic gold medalist Mary Lou Retton sharing her remarkable progress as the legendary gymnast battles a rare form of pneumonia. Retton's daughter, Shayla, telling ABC News, although she remains in the ICU, her path to recovery is steadily unfolding. Her breathing is becoming stronger and her reliance on machines is diminishing. When treating patients for pneumonia, reports that they're relying less and less on clinical assistance, whether that be machines or oxygen, are a great prognostic indicator that hopefully mean that they'll need even less assistance in the future. Support for the 55-year-old Olympian began pouring in last Tuesday when her family announced she was in the hospital fighting for her life. Retton's other daughter, McKenna Kelly, asking in an Instagram story for donations to cover her mother's medical bills. The campaign raising more than $400,000 so far. At 16 years old, Retton catapulted to fame at the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles, where she became the first American to win an individual all-around gold medal. Following her gymnastics career, Retton made cameos in various films and TV shows like Baywatch and the 1988 Christmas film Scrooged. Retton going on to compete on Dancing with the Stars in 2018. Her former partner, Sasha Farber, telling Entertainment Tonight he spoke with her last week. I know her very well, and she's like family to me, and she's a fighter. We hope she continues to improve. Our thanks to Eva for that. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live.
the crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shot. Mrs. Kennedy's there to stain her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from LaGuardia Airport, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. You're feeling good. Yeah, nervous, but good. Nervous? Of course. Oh my gosh. You're shaking. Yeah. Is this normal? Yeah. <laughs> My legs too. But really? I'm ready. Vamos. Carol G has been dreaming about this moment for decades. She's about to go on stage. Like now, my dream is getting bigger. Bye. Los quiero. To perform at a sold out show. Bye. Bye. At one of the largest stadiums in the US, just outside New York City. The reggaeton star has invited us behind the scenes on her historic Mañana Será Bonito tour. <laughs> to witness the 24 hours leading up to the big show. Is it surreal? Does it just feel That's like a, a dream? That's a question that I do every day to myself. What I am experiencing is it's really powerful for me. So you've won so many awards, tantos premios. You've won two Latin Grammys. You've been at the top of the Billboard charts. You've sold out shows, so many different achievements. Was there a moment ever where you said, Diandre, ya lo logré, I did it. This is it. This is what I worked so hard for. And when was that moment? Yo creo que esto. This right here. Sí, no creo que es el tope de mi carrera y espero que no sea el tope de mi carrera. Quiero llegar muy lejos, pero creo que el amor es real. Uf, yo puedo sentirlo. Creo que es una conexión real con toda la gente que viene acá. Ahí puedo decir que, okay, I made it. 
This is Carol G's first stadium trek across the U.S. She's known for her hits like Mi Ex Tenia Razón. Her album, Mañana Será Bonito, or Tomorrow Will Be Beautiful, is the first Spanish language album by a woman to hit number one on the Billboard charts. It includes a collaboration with fellow Colombian star Shakira. Which recently won her a VMA. Carol has gained more than 65 million Instagram followers and 19 billion views on YouTube. She's part of a new generation of Latino artists infiltrating the American music market, singing almost exclusively in Spanish. Before, artists like Enrique Iglesias and Ricky Martin had to sing in a mix of English and Spanish to conquer the U.S. charts. But not Carol G. What do you think has changed over the years? Like for me, I have to say, like Latinas, we have like this special energy of fun and love what we do, express in our music. Maybe we didn't have the opportunity to make them like see all this type of music and different cultures what we have. So it's so special to see how this vibe and our culture and what we have is getting like all the attention and people is loving it. They don't even know that like we were saying, but they just vibe with the music. Yeah. And that's crazy, that's special, I love that. Carol has risen to the top in a musical genre that is traditionally male dominated, reggaeton, ruled by stars like Puerto Rican powerhouse Bad Bunny and Colombian singer J Balvin, known for hits like Mi Gente. <laughs> Here you are, a woman, confident, performing reggaeton, talking about sexuality, talking about emotions. Did you ever face any obstacles along the way in this male-dominated industry? A lot. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Um, How did you handle that? I think I was so blessed to have like my father by my side since the beginning. And he was like really uh, strong with me, like working with my mind. All the time, like the first thing was, ah, oh, because you're a woman, this is not gonna work. This is not the way, you have to do it this way. But my idea of life is do what you love and you're gonna find always a way. Stop sign! <laughs> ¿Cómo estás? Hola, Hi. ¿cómo está? Hola, qué bella. Bella. I love it. I love it. ¿Y cómo fue la conversación? Con un beso. The night before the show, Carol taking a moment to appreciate what this tour means to her. Tens of thousands of people are yeah. going to do that so right I here. So I feel like super grateful that that's the intention of everybody. Like every night, I just go out of the stadium and I'm like, wow. And but the next day is another one, so I don't have like enough time for me mm -hmm. to to press like a pause button. Exactly. And stop that moment. That moment. And just in time. watch everybody. For many of her fans, the appeal of Carol's music is in how personal she gets. Her lyrics can read like a diary chronicling everything from her high-profile relationships to finding herself again after heartbreak. What do you think draws your fans to you? Is it is it that is that is it that openness that you have with them? I said it in one of my songs in Mientras me curo el cora, I said like está bien no sentirse bien, es normal, no es delito. Que I do songs about my experiences. And I don't care. I just express myself and I heal my heart. Like doing songs to show a little, like, realness is beautiful. Y me di cuenta que había un montón de mujeres que sentían un montón de cosas, había un montón de personas que se sentían así, no sabían cómo expresarlo y que ahora tienen cómo expresarlo con una canción de Carol G. Me suelto, yo tazo, 
salir del bloque. No me quieren partir y no tienen con qué. But it was her song, Bichota, that would become a rallying cry of sorts with her fans and become her nickname. What does La Bichota mean to you? To me, that's a good, <laughs> like, add to the question because the word Bichota is not like mine. It's a slang from Puerto Rico. La Bichota va a ser la dura, la, la que ya puede con todo, la que trabaja, la que se lo consigue, la que lucha, la que trabaja, todo. And I did the song Bichota, but I didn't know never that it was going to become my movement. Her boss lady brand goes beyond just her lyrics. She's performing on tour with an all-female band. Todas mujeres increíbles, super talentosas. Soy consciente de el límite de oportunidades. Mm. Es imposible hablar de un movimiento y no representarlo, ¿me entiendes? Aquí estamos todas. Son super bichotas. Carol G recently signed a deal where she will own her masters, a move other artists like Taylor Swift and Rihanna have made. Why was that important to you? Pues, como cantante, como compositora, eh, entiendo que en el momento que firmé mi primer contrato, pues las condiciones eran diferentes. Como que si yo soy la bichota, necesito que mi próximo contrato represente las cosas que hablo y las cosas que expreso. But her incredible musical career almost didn't happen. Coming up, how Carol G paved her unique path to fame. También me tomó muchos años, o sea, yo le puedo decir a la gente, yo empecé en el 2014. Y a mí me está pasando esto hoy en el 2023. And what she does in those final moments before her big show. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Nightline 24 hours with Carol G continues. Reggaeton singer Carol G's journey to stardom began when she was a child in Medellin, Colombia, born Carolina Giraldo Navarro. What was your childhood like? Espectacular. Um, like, my father is son of 14, so I have a lot of cousins mm. my age. We were, like, super close, and we used to travel, like, uh, como fincas, o, o siempre como una celebración era en casas diferentes. Entonces, recuerdo mucho como compartir mucho con mi familia. Y así, son, así somos los latinos. <laughs> así somos los, you know, yeah. like, latinos were like that. Her musical talent at a young age, undeniable. <laughs> She remembers watching the movie Selena as a kid. My father was like super specific, like you're gonna see this movie and I think you're gonna know what you want to be when you're como cuando seas grande. Mm -hmm. But after that I became like super, super fan of Selena. I have like the albums, the CDs, I have everything from her. Even a tattoo. Let's talk about your tattoos. I have Rihanna, Selena, uh, Selena and me here. I think it's the three women that I uh, admire the most. I have the name of my mom. But these girls, like, in my career and what I do, these are the girls that inspire me the most. As a teenager, hoping to be discovered, she posted videos of herself on YouTube, singing covers like Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly. But when her career didn't take off by her early 20s, Carol decided to leave music behind and move to New York to study business. I think I was losing, like, the passion when I was doing the things because I was, like, super tired of being so judged, being a woman and, like, specific in that way. So I was like, okay, like, maybe this is not for me. And I love business. So let me go and let's start like a different way. While in New York, an ad for a music conference would rekindle her dream. So she moved back to Colombia in 2013 to give her music career a second shot. In 2016, she signed a major deal with Universal Music Latino. And collaborations with big names like American artist Nicky Jam and Colombian singer J Balvin, also known as the Prince of Reggaeton, brought her international attention. También me tomó muchos años, o sea, yo le puedo decir a la gente, yo empecé en el 2014. Y a mí me está pasando esto hoy en el 2023. ¿Cómo me mantuve ahí? No sé, creo que quería mucho lo que hacía. Sí. Her debut album, Unstoppable, earned Carol G her first Latin Grammy in 2018 for Best New Artist. After years of hard work, Carol's music finally caught on with an American audience, leading to an appearance on SNL. To help us, we brought some backup. Prima! A song featured in the blockbuster movie Barbie. And even performing at Coachella Music Festival. Creo que nunca me había sentido tan orgullosa de ser latina. O sea, Enrique Iglesias, cuántos éxitos a nivel internacional no tuvo. Ricky Martin, Shakira, Celia Cruz, eh, Gloria Estefan. Es que son muchísimos, pero no estuvieron en Coachella. No fueron headliners en Coachella. Era como que súper importante para mí que yo pudiera representar eso. Entonces yo dije, 
voy a cantar 40 minutos de Carol G, voy a hacer un medley de 20 minutos de todos los artistas que hoy me tienen aquí. Mm. It's just hours before Carol takes the stage and thousands of fans have started gathering outside MetLife Stadium. We're ready for the concert. We've been waiting so long for this. Now she transmits love through her music, so I guess whether you speak the language or you don't, her beat, her vibe, just her. We'll bring everybody and every culture together. Just llegan con letreros, como que estoy aprendiendo español con tus canciones. Something as simple as music can change so much within a society. I feel more accepted as a bilingual person here in the United States. Backstage, Carol is in the final moments of her pre-show routine. So you're trembling now, but when you go on stage, does that just go away? Yeah. You forget all about it. Right away. Like at that specific moment when I'm like, I just go in in Tecuje and I start like singing and that's it. Like the nervous yeah. become like, I don't know, like powerful yeah. and yeah, and excitement and happiness for sure. All of her work has been leading up to this moment. An estimated 80,000 screaming fans await her. Carol emerging onto the stage. Confidently, powerful, and full of excitement. What's next? What's next for Carol G? I no know. Sé. No sé. No sé, y no quiero saber. It's okay. Ya, we'll no find sé out. qué viene, pero pues si miro a mi alrededor, pinta muy bonito y muy especial. Muchas cosas bonitas. Amén. Bringing Colombia to the stage in the city where she almost gave up on her dreams. La bichota, reminding the crowd that mañana será bonito. Tomorrow will be beautiful. Our thanks to Stephanie for that report. Carol G is one of the many young artists now changing the landscape of music. And Americans are listening and buying their music in record numbers. Revenue from sales of Latin music surpassing $1 billion for the first time last year. Some of those best-selling artists are featured in a new ABC special honoring Hispanic and Latin American Heritage Month. The Latin Music Revolution, Soul of the Nation presentation is now streaming on Hulu. ABC News, America's number one news source. Good to see you again. Thank you. Welcome back to East Rutherford. <laughs> For Tom Coughlin and Eli Manning, returning to the New York Giants practice facility is always special. It's been almost 20 years now since you were hired as head coach. How do we feel walking back in the building? 20 years? Come on. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> The two joined forces as head coach and quarterback in 2004, spending 12 seasons together. The Giants have won the Super Bowl. Those 12 seasons resulting in two Super Bowl titles and countless memories along the way. The memories just come pouring back. Yeah. You get the urge to start barking out orders at Eli at all? <laughs> I, was, I was late to this interview. He's, already, he's kind of giving me the look at it. Like, look, hey, five minutes it. early. But on this day, it's not about football. Just wherever you like. Where are you going to be? Two different charities, but working together. It's all about awareness. It's all about letting people know what these families go through when they hear those incredible words, your child has cancer. September is Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, highlighting cancers affecting those 19 years old and under. And while cancer in children and adolescents is rare, according to the CDC, it's one of the leading causes of death by disease for children in the U.S. Ahead of the upcoming Awareness Month, the Giants legends are filming this video. In life, it takes a team to get through the tough stuff. That's why this September, in support of all those families who have a child with cancer 
and those who've lost a child to this disease, we want you to show us your team. The theme is all about teamwork, a campaign urging viewers to take a selfie with people they lean on and post it with the hashtag, show us your team. Smile, coach. One, two, three. When you have cancer, you're not going through it alone, and, and you're not going to beat it alone. You're going to need a team of support from your family, your friends, your community, your nurses and doctors in the hospital. That's why Coach and I are, are forming our own team, and we're getting together, and it's about, you know, saying thank you to those people that are helping you. Since 2015, Manning has partnered with Hackensack Meridian Health in New Jersey for the initiative Tackle Kids Cancer, which raises money for pediatric cancer research and patient care programs. He represented them on the field during the NFL's My Cause, My Cleats campaign and last year on ESPN's Manning Cast. Uh, my Cleats are supporting Tackle Kids Cancer, which does uh, research for pediatric cancer at Hackensack Meridian Health here in New Jersey. Eli's work with them in part helped him earn the NFL's Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for the 2016-2017 season. It started with going to visit children in the hospital, try to lift their spirits, and it just became, well, what else can I do? How else can I be helpful? How can I make a bigger impact? And now, you know, eight years later, I've raised over $20 million. And as for what spurred him to get involved, he credits the man next to him. 